Eagle Flight, over the Eastern Pacific. I, Satan Mechratrig, Lord of Hell, Commander of the Legions of the Damned, do hereby declare my dominion over the Earth and all that it contains. Crawl to me, humans, knowing the eternity of torment that awaits you. Balls, said Lieutenant Michael Wong. The voice that had come over the radio link, booming in the cockpit of his FA-18E, had distracted him from paying proper attention to the cockpit display of his APG-79 radar. The new ISA radar was a vast improvement over the older APG-73, but that was, as always, a slight problem all of its own. Until the pilots learned how to take full advantage of the improved data flow, they could be swamped with it. Wong was experiencing that problem now. The resolution of the new radar was phenomenal, but it seemed to indicate that the wings on the target 60 nautical miles out in front of him were flapping. Full of himself, isn't he? Or should it be it? Lieutenant Anthony Squires was genuinely interested. He was renowned as being the Ronald Reagan Air Group's grammar geek. Try a that. Wong wasn't really interested. The targets in front of him were behaving oddly. They were slow, 180 miles per hour at most. They had a strong radar image yet seemed to have no infrared signature. That was an odd combination, to put it mildly. The bombastic message that had interrupted his concentration was irritating, no more than that. So what were those contacts in front of him? Birds? They were too fast for that, surely. The peregrine falcon was the fastest bird known, and that could just hit 180 miles per hour in a steep dive. These were doing that in level flight, so they had to be some form of aircraft. That was assuming the ISA radar wasn't generating a completely false image, of course. And who knew how the electronic systems were malfunctioning following the delivery of the message three days ago? There was one way to find out. Buster, this is Eagle Flight, 200 miles out, bearing 353. We have an anomalous radar contact some 60 miles out in front of us. Please confirm. There was a pause for a few seconds. Electrostatic discharges in the atmosphere were playing havoc with radio communications. But the system's filtering programs quickly cleared the white noise from the channel. Confirm contact Eagle Flight. Bearing 358. Range from Buster is 66.6 .6 nautical miles. Target speed 184 knots. Course 135 -er. For your information, Crown and Scepter are tracking also. They have locks. There was a pause, a series of crackles on the radio, then the message resumed. If targets are hostile, you are cleared to engage. Wong translated the message in his head. Buster was CVN-76 USS Ronald Reagan. Crown was CG-70 USS Lake Erie and Aegis Cruiser, while Scepter was DDG-93 USS Chung Hoon, one of the Arleigh Burke-class destroyers that now dominated the fleet's surface combatant force. Also Aegis-equipped, that meant whatever the targets were, they were now being tracked by three of the most advanced radar systems in the U.S. Navy. The lock part of the message was really interesting. That suggested the order to open fire was already being passed out. That didn't surprise Wong. Human reaction to the message had split neatly down religious lines. Those whose religion had demanded blind submission to the will of God had accepted it without a struggle and more or less laid down and died. They just weren't around anymore. The rest of the world's population had followed the example set by Britain's Prime Minister Gordon Brown. His reply to the message had been sawed off Baldrick, followed by a reassuring message to the British people that he had a cunning plan to deal with the situation. The British had enjoyed the joke, whatever it was, and collectively told Satan to perform some highly improbable obscenities on himself. They'd been the first only by a matter of minutes as most of the other countries in the world has replied with similar messages. Ever since then, the message had been repeated at regular intervals, almost as if the concept of human defiance was so completely unexpected that the powers up there couldn't comprehend its existence. Well, if that was the case, the powers up there didn't know the human race very well. The three days since the first reception of the message had been something of a standoff. Humans had waited for the next development, allowing the situation to mature in military parlance, while the only response to their defiance had been the repeated proclamations. No effort to force compliance, not yet at any rate, and no overt human resistance. Wong got the feeling that was all about to change. All members, Eagle Flight, increase to five or six zero knots. Say again, increase to five or six zero knots. Intercept targets in front, range, five eight nautical miles. Weapons are free, say again, weapons are free. Good hunting, Eagle Flight. The four FA-18Es accelerated out of cruise speed, 
building up to maximum subsonic. The E model had more range and fuel than the older A's and C's, but fuel status was always a serious concern to Hornet drivers. Wong had listened with envy to those who had flown the now-gone Tomcats or even longer lost intruders. Then he glanced down at his radar scope again. There were four targets, apparently blissfully ignorant of the Super Hornets bearing down on them. That was neat, one each. Eagle Flight, we are swinging around behind them. I have radar paints on all four, no infrared signature yet. Each Eagle aircraft, take a target corresponding to your flight position from the left. Use AIM-120, then close in for 20 mic mic. Not sure AIM-9 will work unless we can get a heat signature off whatever is out there. We'll get a visual ID first. At 12 nautical miles range, the U.S. Navy Hornets got their visual ID. The contacts were four giant creatures, jet black in color, looking like a hideous cross between a gorilla and a bird. Four limbs, two wings, flying in an unconcerned, oblivious line. Just what the hell are those? Wong wasn't sure which pilot had breathed the comment into the radio. Didn't matter. They all knew what to do. So did he come to that. Buster, this is Eagle. Targets visually identified large flying humanoids about the same size as a superbug. Wingspan at least twice as great as ours, probably much larger. Engaging. Eagle, this is Buster. Acknowledged. Targets designated as demons. Good luck, Eagle Flight. A few days earlier, the fighter controller might have added, and may God go with you, but not after the message and the betrayal it had represented. Wong switched the enunciator on his AIM-120s on. They were growling gently, a sustained, continuous note that indicated their homing heads were logged onto his selected target, the demon second from the left. The FA-18s were closing fast. The range was dropping to the point where the hits would be almost instantaneous. Eagle flight, open fire. Wong's pressure on the firing button was almost simultaneous with his order. A pair of AIM-120 missiles streaked ahead of his aircraft, curving after the demon he had picked out for his target. He'd been right. The gap was so short that the target couldn't have evaded even if it had wanted to. It never even tried. Demon Shingroleth was actually aware of the approaching fighters. He'd seen them when they were still 15 miles out, far beyond the range of any human eye, so he had assumed their presence was coincidental. He had other problems to worry about. A few inconsequential humans were of no significant account one way or the other. What concerned him was the way his skin was itching. It had started a few minutes before and was getting steadily worse. Maddening. He hadn't even worried when the four human machines had swung in behind his group and started to close the range on them. That had been when his skin itch had become really intolerable. Then the humans had done something really strange. Odd streaks of smoke coming out from under their flying machines. Surely they couldn't be resisting the all-powerful armies of the damned. The AIM-120s worked as advertised. They were good missiles, well-designed, well-tested, and they had a target that was proving cooperative to the point of suicide. No maneuvering, no electronic warfare, no interference. If the guidance had been capable of human thought, it would have been vaguely offended at being asked to solve a task so undemanding. The first missile exploded between Shingroleth's legs, just underneath his tail. The 50-pound explosive warhead was wrapped with heavy-gauge pre-notched wire that disintegrated into an annular hail of preformed fragments when the missile's proximity fuse set off the explosive charge. Some of those razor-sharp fragments slashed through Shingroleth's tail, severing it at the root and sending it spinning off in a long arc. Others ripped into his legs and genitals, tearing open the great arteries, sending his fire and acid blood spraying over his body and mangling his reproductive organs beyond recognition. Shingrilith's scream of demented agony was heard even in the sound-insulated cockpits of the FA-18s. The second missile did really serious damage. Its proximity fuse initiated it right underneath Shingrilith's belly. The holocaust of tungsten steel fragments ripped open his stomach and tore his abdominal cavity to shreds. Even in a mind crazed by the ghastly pain from the first hit, Shingroleth noticed the sudden drop in weight as his intestines dropped out of his body. Then his fire and acid blood, spraying from more wounds than could reasonably be counted, set fire to his flesh. Shingroleth tumbled downwards. All hope of control had gone when he had lost his stabilizing tail. By the time his remains hit sea level, all that was left of him was a fine carbon dust. Immediately on firing, Wong had firewalled his throttles, cut in reheat, and taken his FA-18 up into a steep climb. 
the last thing he had wanted to do was get too close to those things. As he rolled over at the top of the climb, he could see the havoc his attack had wrought on the demon formation below. His target had gone, its death marked by a black streak towards the sea far below. Another one of the formation had taken hits from four AIM 120s. For some reason, two FA 18s had fired on the same aircraft. Well, that sort of thing happened. It had meant that the demon had been quite literally torn apart by the storm of fragments and blast of the explosions. More than 200 pounds of the best explosives American dollars could buy had vented its wrath on the hideous creature, and all that was left of it was a shower of burning fragments. A third demon was staggering away. It had been the last to get hit and had escaped the eviscerating body hits. Instead, one of its wings had been torn to tiny fragments and it was going down in a helpless spin. Even as Wong watched, two of his F-18s were closing on it. Pragrathrath was desperately trying to control his descent. One of his wings had gone. It was just a mass of torn flesh and spurting blood. The only thing that was saving him was that his flight path was keeping the blood and acid away from his body. The fate of Shingroleth and Karnaskados had shown him what would happen when demon blood and body parts mixed. Two of the gray-painted human machines were coming after him. He could see them, but with his crippled wings there was little he could do about it. It was odd. There was a strange twinkling light coming from the front of the two flying machines. Then, Prygrathrath's lights went out. Squires had fired a much longer burst than was normal for the M61 cannon in the nose of his F.A. 18. He and his wingman had aimed very carefully, using the plane's onboard computer and continuously computed impact point sites to place all 100 rounds of their bursts square into the demon's face. The effect was more than either pilot could have hoped. The great, hideously malformed head had just disintegrated as the armor-piercing incendiary shells ripped through the skin and shattered the bones underneath. The demon's eyes, in fact every feature of its face, had been destroyed in the hail of cannon shells tearing through its structure. Once again, fire and acid blood spraying from the ruptured veins and arteries finished the job of destruction that fragments, explosions, and blast had started. The demon erupted into flames and dropped like a stone towards the sea below. That had left one demon, untouched, unharmed by the sudden, vicious attack. Quellerastus simply couldn't believe that the humans had dared to attack him and his colleagues, let alone that they had killed three of his flightmates with such contemptuous ease. Filled with unrighteous wrath at the effrontery of the attack, he swerved to retaliate at the pair of human flying machines that were coming straight at him. Now, they would learn what the wrath of a demon meant. He opened his mouth and gave a blast of terrifying hellfire straight at them. In Eagle One, Wong saw the fireball leave the demon's mouth and flip the ailerons over, pulling the stick back in a barrel roll around the jet of flame. It wasn't precisely a hard maneuver. The demon may have had powerful lungs, but they could only drive a jet of flame so fast. Compared with the problems posed by trying to dodge a multi-mock missile, the flame was easy to avoid. Even better, the jet of fire was a perfect infrared source for his AIM-9 sidewinders. Both enunciators were screaming with the demand to be let loose and Wong obliged them both. They streaked from his wingtip mounts, heading straight for the inferno of heat that was the fire-breathing demon's mouth. Quellerastus did the worst thing he could possibly do under the circumstances. He gulped in shock as the two missiles hurtled into his mouth. Once again, proximity fuses worked to perfection. Performed fragments slashed out, ripping through the slate-black flesh of the demon. Some went up into his brain, bouncing around inside his skull until all that laid within was reduced to a finely ground slush. Others sawed down through the demon's chest, carving into his heart and lungs. More fragments, from the missile Quellerastus had accidentally swallowed, tore the demon's neck apart, severing his spinal column and paralyzing him. That was a mercy for Quellerastus. It meant that he didn't feel it when his blood set his flesh on fire and he vanished within a ball of flame. Buster, this is Eagle. All four demons engaged and destroyed. Inform all Buster elements they blow up and burn if you hit them hard enough. We're on our way back. We're hitting bingo fuel out here. Eagle Flight, this is Buster. Come on home. The party is just starting down here. Wong relaxed in his seat. His Eagle 1 had two confirmed kills. Eagle 3 and Eagle 4 had one each. Not ace status yet, but a good start. National Command Post, Washington, D.C.
Mr. President, a message from the Ronald Reagan Battle Group out in the Pacific. They've engaged four flying demons, killed all of them. No casualties on our side. Whatever these things are, they aren't immortal or invulnerable. They burn and die, just like we do. President Bush looked dully at Secretary Gates. The betrayal that had been represented by the message had hit him deep, torn apart the faith that had kept him going even in the darkest years of his presidency. Then, with his opinion poll figures trending up at last, this had to happen. He shook his head, tried to clear the clouds of despair from his mind, and absorbed the information. As he did so, his eyes lit up for the first time in three days. Get word out to all our armed forces. Tell them to engage these, these things at every opportunity. Shoot first, hit hard, and keep hitting them. Let them know that we may go down, but it won't be without one hell of a fight. Them, sir. Them, everybody. Our forces, the religious leaders who brought that message to us, those who the message came from. I don't care who they are. Either they attacked us or they betrayed us, and I don't see the difference between those who promise us an eternity of torture or those who would hand us over to that fate. They're both our enemies now, and we'll fight them, all of them. Bush's voice had gained strength, and he made his commitment. We may have believed in higher powers once, but they forfeited any loyalty we may have owed them. Secretary Gates, get the word out. We fight. Sir, I have to warn you, this may well be committing a war crime. We haven't had United Nations approval for any action, and without a vote in the UN, we are committing an act of aggressive war, which is a war crime. I therefore rule that we must hold off any action until there had been a full meeting of the Security Council. I will also issue orders for the pilots involved in this incident to be arrested and brought up on war crimes charges. There was a rumble of discontent around the war room. Bush heard it, and that made up his mind. He looked at the JAG officer with contempt. Place this man under arrest. Remove him. Get rid of him. From now on, the United States will act in its own best interest and defend itself as best it can. Any other nations who want to join in this struggle are welcome to do so. There might be quite a few of those, Mr. President. Secretary Rice was carrying a mass of message flimsies. We're getting messages from other countries right now. First one is from Mr. George Yongbun Yo, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. Apparently a demon landed there, carrying a demand for Singapore's submission. What did he do? Nothing, sir. The demon's demand was wrapped up in some sort of parchment, and he dropped it on landing. Littering is a serious offense in Singapore, sir. And the Singapore police riddled the demon with bullets and then beat it to death. Anyway, Mr. Yeo says that Singapore is going to fight and they'd appreciate our help. He's got it. Who else? Another one landed in Bangkok, Thailand. That one didn't get very far either. It wouldn't bribe the police at a checkpoint to let it through and then got stuck in the Bangkok traffic jams. The army blew it away with tanks. Apparently, local street traders are selling bits of demon to the tourists. Anyway, same message from the Thais. They're going to fight, and they'd appreciate any help we can send. Only they're adding if we need any aid. We only have to ask. Nice of them. Well, people, it looks like the war has started. Let's try to do a better job this time round, right? HMS Astute on Sea Trials, North Atlantic. Any idea what it is? The sonar operator shook his head. The Type 2076 sonar system was the most advanced the Royal Navy had ever deployed. One admiral had tried to describe its capability by saying a submarine in Winchester could use that sonar to track a bus going around Hyde Park Corner in London. That comparison wasn't true, but the real capability of 2076 was a closely guarded secret. Tracking buses at that range was child's play compared with what it could really do. The waterfall display on the sonar panel was showing the target track. It was diverging from norm slightly, first one way and then the other, as if the unidentified contact was snaking in the water. It always came back to the same course, though, one that took it to London. Eventually. That was another problem. The target track indicated a speed of around 12 knots. Not the sort of speed that made much sense. Too fast for economy, too slow for a speed run. I'm not getting any blade beat, sir. None at all. In fact, I'm getting no machinery noise at all, no pomphologopaphlasmacin. The sonar operator got the odd word out without missing a beat. He was referring to the odd selection of pops, hisses, squeaks, and rattles made by machinery 
as it went about its daily tasks. An odd selection that was a clear signature to a passive sonar system. I'm getting broadband flow noise and that's about it. Biological? Whales, clouds of shrimp, schools of fish, all give strange sonar readings. Pomphalugo paflasmacin was the sonar operator's best tool to distinguish man-made equipment from the natural sounds of the sea. And there wasn't any. That would normally point to a biological, but the one thing these times were not was normal. There was a body in the submarine's freezer to prove that. The ship's chaplain had committed suicide when the full implication of the message had sunk home. Not at twelve knots, sir. A biological will either drift or move slowly at random directions. One holding twelve knots would be attacking something, and this one isn't. Then, there's its course. Straight for London, never changing. No, sir. This isn't a biological, but that doesn't change the fact that we can't pick up anything on our narrow-band, demodulated noise tracker. You don't suppose it could be? Lieutenant Commander Michael Murphy adopted an exaggerated expression of terror. The Red October. Across Astute's control room, the duty crew rolled their eyes in disgust, then shook their heads. That wretched author had caused so much trouble. No, sir, but respectfully, sir, we are on trials. Foss M may have slipped us a weirdness just to find out what we would do with it. Murphy nodded. Flag officer Submarines was known for doing things like that. Right, Atkins. We'll treat this like a hostile. His eyes flipped to the tactical display where a long oval marked the position of the anomalous contact. Passive sonar could give fine cuts on bearing, but its range data was much less precise. We need to find that up a bit. We'll establish a baseline. Make course 180, speed 34 knots. Hold for 20 minutes. Anybody want to take a head break, now's the time. We won't be tracking anything at that speed. That was true enough. Astute didn't have the phenomenal underwater speed of the American Seawolf class, but then few other submarines did. Astute was still fast enough for the flow noise over her hull to blank out her sonar. Murphy checked the plot again and thumbed the intercom. Captain to the bridge. Captain Phillips materialized almost immediately. Captains tended to do that when trouble was brewing. Problems number one? Don't know, sir. We have a highly anomalous contact. Behaves like a submarine but has the signature of a biological... It's maintaining 12 knots, course takes it to London. I'm establishing a baseline for range now. Very good, number one. Phillips studied the tactical plot with great care. When a new submarine ran sea trials, it wasn't only the ship that was being tested. Her crew were under the microscope as well. Very good, number one. I have the con. You take over the attack team. If this is Foss M playing games, we'll go along with it. The crew felt the vibration from the submarine's machinery build up under their feet. One advantage, one of many, held by the nuclear-powered boats, was that they never had to worry about fuel status or battery charge. The Royal Navy nuke drivers pitied their NATO allies who were stuck in diesel electrics and spent their lives with one eye glued to their battery charge meters. Astute was barreling through the water, putting distance between herself and the scene of her first set of track readings. Once she got a second set, the cross bearings would give her the range data she needed. Twenty minutes later, Astute dropped back down to her four-knot observation speed. The sonar team dropped their relaxed air and immediately got down to work, trying to reacquire the anomalous signature. That didn't take much effort. They knew where to look, and the weird flow noise was distinctive enough. Got it, sir. Range 18,000 meters. On the tactical display, a second long oval appeared. The computers eliminated the time delay that had taken place and then superimposed the two sets of reading. What had once been long, thin ovals now crossed and gave a single precise point. Then the screen blinked again as the computers applied the range data they had just calculated to the bearing figures already on file. A single green line now appeared on the tactical display, one that gave both range and bearing. All that was, in fact, needed for an attack. Phillips thought quickly. Stream toad array, sonar team check on passive for any emissions, anything at all. Every frequency band you can think of, whatever we're tracking, doesn't have to be using what we are. It took a few more minutes, but the result was worth waiting for. Got him, sir. Active emission, very high frequency, much higher than ours. Atkins' voice was triumphant. It's like a biological, well, more like a bat, really, but it isn't. Power too high. I'd guess it's a navigational or mine avoidance sonar, but it's nothing like anything we have on the books. That's why the computer didn't call it. Very good. Helm take us up to periscope deck. Sensors prepare to extend radio mast. We'd better call this in. Phillips disappeared into the radio room for several minutes. When he came back, his face was a mixture of grimness and elation. 
word direct from DOPS. A stir went around the control room. When Directorate of Operations gave the orders, things were happening. The situation is breaking loose. The spams shot down four baldricks a few hours ago, been a few other similar incidents around the world. The old stories be damned. The baldricks are not invulnerable, and we aren't going down without a fight. There's nothing friendly out here, so we can presume that any unidentifiable target we're tracking is hostile. Torpedo room, load two spearfish, tubes one and two, load sub-harpoon into three and four, helm, take her down to 200 feet, make speed 34 knots, course 163. Helm punched the figure into the computers. The tactical display flickered again, the green track turning to red, and a blue line superimposed on it. That gave the relative position of astute and the target. Phillips looked at the position. Make that 35 knots and 161. A tiny refinement that would put astute into a perfect position for a torpedo attack. Phillips watched the display as the carrot marking astute's position moved along the blue projected course line. Mentally, he was calculating angles and ranges. The computer could actually do that for him, but he preferred to do his own check. Drop speed to four knots, say again to four knots, bring bows to 010, open bow doors, tubes one and two, sonar, hit that thing with a low frequency pulse to check range, one pulse. Phillips took his authorization card from around his neck and inserted it into a slot in the sonar control console. By using active sonar, Astute was announcing her presence and position to the world at large. That was why using active sonar required the captain's explicit authorization. Once the card was in place, the ba woom from the sonar array in the submarine's bows could be heard throughout the boat. Ralaraspanathsis was swimming quietly through the ocean of this strange planet, his great tail swinging from side to side as it drove. As one of the corps of diabolical heralds, his job was quite simple. He had to go to the designated place where the humans gathered and give them the message that informed them of their fate. Not that their fate was ever in any doubt, but it seemed as if the powers higher up had got bored with playing their little games with this dimension and decided to wrap things up. Rolara Spinathsis actually slightly regretted that. This wasn't the first time he'd been on this planet, and he'd rather enjoyed the way the humans had cowered before him on his first visit. Still, perhaps his master would allow him to play with some once they were all in his domain. It was halfway through that pleasurable thought that the pain hit Rolara Spinathsis. His head seemed to explode, his ears crushed by a terrible pressure that shattered the bones in his inner ears. His forearms moved, almost of their own accord, covering his eardrums, trying to shut out the dreadful crushing noise. Then, almost before he could think again, the terrible noise was gone. Wow, will you look at that? Atkins' voice was awed. The contact was spinning in circles, threshing in the water creating a maelstrom of flow noise emissions. It didn't like that at all. Hit it again. Full power to the forward sonar transducers. The contact had been settling down when the second pulse hit it. If anything, the threshing was even worse than with the first pulse. That's a baldric, no doubt. Weapons, fire tubes, one and two. Target that thing. Taking four tons off the extreme end of the moment arm caused Astute's bow to dip. It didn't matter to the torpedoes. They were already out and climbing to the shallower water near the surface. Once there, they kicked up to 81 knots and ran out to the estimated position of the target. At that point, they dropped their guidance wires and dived vertically on the contact below them. A shaped charge can penetrate six times its diameter. That gave the pair of spearfish torpedoes a theoretical penetration of 126 inches. In fact, they did a bit better than that, blasting deep cavities in Rolara Spinathsis's back, severing his spinal column and burning deep into his vital organs. His body tissues, Vaporized by the blast, sprayed out and down, searing and cooking his internal organs, and bursting open the swim bladder that kept him afloat. Crippled and dying, he felt himself floating upwards towards the surface. Confusion filled his mind. He was a herald. How could they have done this? Well, there's no doubt about it. We just scored a baldric. A cheer went up around the control room. Ever since Prime Minister Gordon Brown had quoted Black Adder in his initial announcement, the British had taken to calling the denizens of hell, Baldricks. It had a nice, contemptuous air about it, one that was beginning to catch on. Number one, take the boat to the surface. We need to collect samples. Phillips looked through the periscope again. In fact, if we can tow that wreck in, so much the better. 
Environmental, keep a check on water conditions. The spams said the ones they shot down had acid blood. We don't want our hull plating corroded. The taxpayers would get perturbed. Tamanskoya Motor Rifle Division, outskirts of Moscow. Remember Bratishka, Rodina, Chest, Slava! Let the name of the Cherkovsky Tank Regiment chill the very fires of hell! The Americans had killed four of the demons, others had killed one each. Now it was time for the Rodina to strike its blow against these arrogant beasts who had dared to declare their dominion over humanity. The demon had appeared an hour or so earlier and was walking across the countryside towards the Kremlin. If the pattern from earlier encounters was holding true, it was making for Russia's capital. Well, it wouldn't get there, not if the Chertkovsky tank regiment had its way. Colonel Mikhail Suranov had worked on the presumption that the beast was heading for the city and set up a neat L-shaped ambush. The kill zone was covered by the 112mm guns on his tanks, and just to make sure, he had his smirch multiple rocket artillery systems dialed in. Berwana Klasnin had his message to deliver, as a herald that was his infernal duty, and he was going to do it. The problem was, word had started to spread that the humans weren't cowering in fear the way they were supposed to, before it had only taken a single appearance to throw them into panic. Now there was a whisper they were fighting back. Not just fighting back, but showing uncanny skill in doing so. That was a troubling concept. Berwana Klasnin felt a sudden itch on his skin. There were ten or more brilliant green dots on his hide, points where his flesh was beginning to swell. One of his arms moved to cover them. As he did so, the dot vanished from his hide, but appeared on the back of his hand. A beam of some sort? He never had a chance to work it out because a massive blow struck his chest and sent him staggering backwards. The first shot had sent the HVDU armor piercing fin stabilized bolt screaming into the beast's chest, sending it reeling backwards. An instant later, the nine other T-90S tanks of the first company fired in salvo, their shots striking home as almost a single blow. The Russian tank gunners had been told that the Thais had killed one of these beasts with their pathetic little M41s. The Russian T-90S could do better than that, surely. There was an unspoken message. It had better. And it could. The beast was down, battered off its feet by the depleted uranium bolts that had smashed into it. Even as the gunners watched, the beast tried to get back to its feet, but Second Company were waiting. A brief interval as their laser rangefinders locked in, then another salvo of shots. These ones struck low, shearing the beast's legs from its body. It rolled to the ground, trying to pull itself upright. What criminality was this? Berwana Klasnin couldn't believe what was taking place. He was a herald, one of those charged with carrying messages to the others. By all the laws and customs, he was granted immunity from attack, for how could wars be fought if neither side could talk? But these humans had opened up on him without warning. It was a hideous crime for which the wrath of the higher powers would be terrible. Berwana Klasnin shook his head. He was crippled, his legs gone, his green blood soaking into the earth. Even as he looked around, another salvo of shells struck him, ripping his arms from his body. He crashed onto his back, helpless and dying. Suranov looked up at the beast dying on the ground. It had taken 30 hits from 125mm guns to bring it down, and it wasn't dead yet. If these things' resistance to damage was as high as that, these beasts were going to be trouble. Tovarish Colonel, please ask your men to help me. I need to sit on the beast's chest. It was one of the politicians from Moscow. It didn't take long to help him up. A T-90 pulled alongside the beast, and the politician was unceremoniously hauled up into place. Somebody handed up a camp stool, and he carefully selected a spot overlooking the beast's head one clear of the bubbling craters where the armor-piercing shots had torn through the beast. Beast, before you should die, I believe you should know who it is you are waging war upon. I will therefore read you some of President Putin's speeches. Listen well and learn of your folly. I can almost feel sorry for the beast. An engineer sergeant placing the demolition charges around the great body spoke quietly, but his team heard and laughed. The word spread amongst the tank crews and the chuckles spread there as well. The politician appeared not to have heard. His droning monotone carried on unaffected. A few minutes later, the preparations were ready. Suranov looked up at the politician who was starting the third speech of his program. Tovarish, we are about to blow the beast. Please come down. But I must finish the president's speech to the Iron Workers Union. There was a hideous racking groan from the beast, 
muted only by its failing strength. Saranov got a clear mental picture of it begging to be put out of its misery, anything other than to have to listen to another speech. The colonel could see its point. Now, Tovarish, my orders are to destroy this thing, then bring samples back for analysis. The politician reluctantly agreed, and the charges were detonated. Looking around, something puzzled Saranov. Didn't the Americans say these beasts had acid blood? Because this one doesn't. James Randi Educational Foundation, Florida, USA. Thank you for seeing me at such short notice, sir. The woman was Thai, middle-aged, still poised, elegant and attractive. She also had the hardest, coldest black eyes James Randi, also known as the Amazing Randi, had ever seen. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, ma'am. Major General, sir, for many years your organization has run a million-dollar prize for evidence of people with supernatural abilities. That is correct, General. We were going to end the challenge in a couple of years, but now, after these events... Sir, that is why we wish to speak with you. The events of the last few days have changed everything. You and your organization have decades of experience in exposing frauds and discrediting psychics. You probably have more practical experience in this than anywhere else. My government, and quite a few others, I believe, need to exploit that experience. We believe that buried amongst all the frauds and impostors, there may be a few who really can talk to the dead. If there are such people, we need to speak with them very badly. We want you and your organization to find them for us. Mr. Randy, I do not exaggerate when I say that the whole future of the human race may depend upon us finding such people. Randy looked at the woman sitting before him. In that case, how can I refuse? National Command Post. Washington, D.C. Congratulations, Prime Minister. And yes, we gladly accept your offer of cooperation in analyzing the body your submarine is towing in. We have heard from the Russians. They also have samples they are prepared to share with us. The more information we have, the better. There appears to be significant differences between these recent kills and the ones shot down by our pilots. By the way, Gordon, are your legal people giving you trouble? Ours are claiming all sorts of strange things. Their latest one is that these are peace emissaries and we're committing war crimes by killing them. We have had some such troubles, yes. I suggest, Mr. President, that you tell your people what I told mine. In view of the circumstances, Britannia waives the rules. Cabinet Conference Room, White House, Washington, D.C. Condi, could you summarize the international situation at this point? Mr. President, so far, more than two dozen of these invaders, Baldrick's the Brits call them, have been killed around the world. The latest was off Tokyo, where a monster similar to the one killed by HMS Astute came ashore. It was engaged by the Japanese ground self-defense forces and destroyed. According to the Japanese ambassador, all that time spent shooting at Godzilla finally paid off. A laugh ran around the room, partly a release of nervous tension, but mostly an appreciation of the unexpected sense of humor shown by Ambassador Nishimura. Most of the Far Eastern countries are coming on board pretty quickly. China, of course, has taken an early stand. The People's Liberation Army, Air Force, and Navy have all gone to full alert. Europe's following the same approach. They're all shooting at any baldrics that appear on their territory. On the debit side, South America and Southern Europe appear to be in shock still. Christianity was deeply rooted there, and the message struck them very hard. The idea that they've been systematically deceived by the very being they worshipped has left them adrift. Secretary Rice paused for a moment. Coming from a religious background herself, she could empathize with the degree of bewilderment that was paralyzing so many governments around the world. The Middle East is a mixed bag. We'd expected the area to be virtually depopulated, after all. The word Islam means submission to the will of God, and we assumed that the populations there would just lie down and die according to demand. Well, that hasn't happened, not universally at any rate. It's hard to work out exactly what is going on, but it seems as if with radical Islam being discredited by the message, the alternative philosophy of assertive Arab nationalism is returning. The largely socialist Arab nationalist movements have been eclipsed by the jihadists in recent years, but now they're coming back and coming back strong. Of course, the Sunnis are blaming the Shia and the Shia are blaming the Sunnis for the message, and they both blame us. Business as usual there. 
Equally predictably, the Israelis have gone to work with a vengeance. Apparently, one of the Russian baldricks appeared there, homing in on Jerusalem, and the Israeli defense forces shot it to pieces. According to the Israeli ambassador, 120 millimeter shells are much more effective than sounding trumpets. They've sent word, by the way, don't use armor-piercing shot to take the baldricks down. Just whip straight through them. Heat, high explosive, and canister all work much better. You like the term baldric then, Condi? Department of Energy Secretary Bodman seemed to favor the expression as well. I do, Sammy. It has a nice contemptuous ring to it. But much more importantly, I think it is very important to distinguish between the mythological demon and the creatures we face in reality. There is little doubt that the monsters we face today are the source of the myths we have all read about, but I believe we must make the difference between the two very clear. There is nothing ghostly or ethereal about the Baldrics. They are very solid reality. As to what their powers are, that we must find out. On that note, we need some scientific input. Thank you, Condi. I have asked the Department of Defense to coordinate the scientific research into these Baldrics. Secretary Gates has resigned from his position as head of defense. I have appointed, subject to confirmation by the Senate, Senator John Warner to be the new Secretary of Defense. John. Thank you, Mr. President. At the moment, we know very little about these creatures. Factually, we have identified three separate types which have very different characteristics. The first are the flying baldrics we shot down off California. They're the same ones that were whacked in Singapore and Bangkok. Working on camera gun footage from the F-18s, we can size them at around 30 feet long from tip of horns to root of tail with a wingspan of around 60 feet. Warner gestured, and a picture was projected onto the screen at the end of the cabinet room. As you can see, they look rather like the traditional depiction of a demon or a cartoon devil. Horns, tail, pointed beard, two arms, two legs, two wings. This raises an interesting point. The combination of weight and musculature mean these things can't possibly fly. Just like a bumblebee? Education Secretary Margaret Spellings tossed the quip in, one that gained her a reproachful glance from the president. In a way, yes. You see, the musculature of the back doesn't give any great strength to the wings. It can't. The bone structure won't support it. The only way this thing can fly is if it weighs virtually nothing so its wings provide propulsion and lift, not steerage. The only way we can think of doing that is if the body contains a lot of very light gas, probably hydrogen. We think that is why they burned so fiercely when they were hit. The pilots reported that the creature's blood set them on fire. We can only think that there's some sort of body process in there where very acid blood reacts with a mineral to give off the hydrogen needed. That would allow the baldric to breathe fire as well. There are things about these flying baldrics that are reminiscent of humans. It's almost as if they were a parallel evolutionary path from a common ancestor somewhere. The second class we've run into are the aquatic ones. According to Astute, the one they killed was more than 100 feet long, about 20 feet in diameter, and has flipper-like legs, six of them. They did careful pH testing on the water as they closed on the corpse and detected no sign of acidity. Also, note, despite being hit by two torpedoes, it didn't burn. So, our working hypothesis is that this one doesn't have acid blood. The one that came ashore near Tokyo walked on its flipper legs, all six of them. Apparently, it fought by shooting jets of water at things. Anyway, the JMSDF will be sending over information as it develops. One thing they have said, apparently the flesh doesn't make good sushi. I'm not sure what worries me most about that, the fact that doesn't make good sushi or that somebody tried it. Either way, at the moment, we'll know more about the aquatic ones than the others soon. The third group are the land ones. These have just started to appear. According to the Russians, they're over 100 feet tall. They're tough. They walk on their hind legs using their forearms to strike blows. They have vestigial wings only no acid blood again. The ones that appear to have been killed so quickly, we have no idea whether they breathe fire or what. We're going to need names for all these types. Baldrick's good enough for a generic name. I agree with Condi. We have to distinguish between the mythology we've all read and the reality we have to fight. President Bush leaned back in his seat, rubbing his eyes. Does it seem to anybody that these Baldrick's are getting tougher? Certainly, sir. 
Senator Warner tapped the pictures of the three types of demons. There's a definite progression here. There's another thing. We have people going through ancient records, demonologies, grimoires, that sort of stuff. Now, the information in there is undoubtedly corrupted and distorted, but we're hoping it gives us some form of clue as to what we can expect. One thing we have noted, you'll note that these baldricks haven't come in blasting. We would, under the same circumstances, we'd be advancing behind a wall of missiles, tactical air and artillery fire. These just cruised straight into our defenses and died on them. We think we may have discovered the reason for this. One of our early readings found a mention of demonic heralds who were supposed to carry the word of their master to his new subjects. Apparently, they would just appear in a population center, announce that all within were now subjects of their master, and carry them off to hell. As far as we can see, nobody ever resisted. There's even a suggestion that by some sort of celestial Geneva convention, these heralds are immune from attack. Bush frowned. Attorney General Mukasey, has the United States ever signed an agreement to that effect? No, sir, we have not. Good. Doesn't apply to us, then. Tell everybody to keep shooting. A question, John. Does immune from attack mean that they can't be shot at or that they are immune to weapons fire? Our guess at this time, sir, is that the second lead to the former. People found their bows and arrows and so on didn't work against them, so they rationalized it by creating the former. Of course, we could be wrong on that. But the key point is, if these are the heralds referred to in the grimoire, the real armies of hell are still to get here. We have to stack our defenses ready. I agree, John. President Bush looks to his Treasury Secretary. Henry, we need supplementals. Huge ones. This is a war. We have to fund it as such. We're going to be spending serious money. Organize it. Elaine, Carlos, get to work shifting our industry to a war footing. Get the missile factories and tank lines on triple shifts. Tell Boeing we'll take every F-22 they can build. Cost plus basis. I believe the B-2 jigs and tooling are still in storage. If they are, get the spirit back into production. Same with the bone. What we can't build, we'll buy from abroad. Oh, and John, defense is fine, but nobody ever won a war by defending. We have to go onto the offensive and attack. Find out how. Throne room. Infernal palace of Dis. Hell. They have done what? The infernal voice boomed across the hall, making the thick red vapor boil and eddy as the banners of long-forgotten kingdoms twisted and furled in the smog. Your eminence, I cower at your feet. I know. Do it some more. Then tell me what you meant. Abigor cringed on the ground at Satan's feet, his tongue flicking over the great hooked claws. Sire, forgive me. No, but continue. Sire, they killed your heralds. My gentlemen. The scream of anger made the very foundations of hell shake. Across the fields of burning rock where the souls of the dead were forever held in torment, the demons looked up from their work and shuddered in fear. They killed my gentlemen. It is laid down by our immortal will that the heralds shall be forever immune from attack. Sire. Abigor whimpered and abased himself still further. If he had been human, he would have lost control of his bowels several minutes ago. We believe that one of the heralds may have lived long enough to say that. And what did those insignificant humans say to that? Do they cry for my forgiveness? Not that they'll get it. No, sire. It is reported they replied, screw you and the horse you rode in on. We don't quite understand that, sire. Then they must learn obedience. I blame this all on Yahweh. He was supposed to have softened this lot up, got them to believe anything and obey everything. I thought he had too. Abigor, you will rectify this. You command sixty of the nine hundred and ninety-nine legions of hell. You will take them and wipe these upstarts out. Sire, may I beg your indulgence for one moment of your time? No. But sire, the heralds are dead, and we do not know how or why. The impossible, the impermissible, the unforgivable has been done and we know nothing of this. Sire, we should find out before we invade, then we can inflict yet greater suffering and despair upon them. Greater suffering and despair. I like the sound of that. What do you propose? Sire, I suggest that I ask Dumos send the comeliest and most seductive of her succubi to Washington, capital of the greatest nation on earth. There is one there, peculiarly susceptible to her charms, who might be seduced into telling us what we need to know. Think, sire, of his grief when he learns his lusts have betrayed all humanity. 
McDonald's Restaurant, just off Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. Former President William Jefferson Clinton jogged up to the restaurant and headed through the doors, his Secret Service detail following behind. He stopped to mop his forehead, his sides heaving with the exercise. He carefully did not look at the two Secret Service agents. He guessed that they were unmoved by his evening routine. In fact, he doubted if they were even breathing heavily. Fortunately, the place was empty, or nearly so. It pretty much always was this late at night. Can I help you, sir? The young Latina girl behind the counter was too tired to recognize the former president. I'll have a double quarter pounder with extra cheese, two supersized portions of fries. Oh, and a small diet soda, please. Coming right up, sir. The girl got her order from the pass and gave it to Clinton. He paid his bill and went to a table. Hi, sir. Mind if a girl sits with you? Don't want to be on my own this late at night. Clinton glanced up. The woman waiting politely by his table had a mane of jet black hair that fell in curls halfway down her back. Great, luminous black eyes, and a mouth that promised everything imaginable without saying a word. I'm Sheba. Please, I won't bother you. You're such a big, strong man. I'm sure I'll be safe with you. A few feet away, the two Secret Service agents registered the scene with horror. How in hell had she slipped in there? It was appalling, a total breach of security, one which the senior agent had to do something about. Hey, lady, get away from here. Don't you know who? Sheba looked at him, her eyes pleading for understanding. Well, all right, I suppose it'll be okay. Clinton finished his snack, leaving the garbage to be thrown away by one of the Secret Service men. As he left the restaurant, the girl was trotting along beside him. Clinton kept throwing calculating glances at her. She was perhaps a little on the heavy side, but that mouth was so enticing. This is so wonderful. What is it? Sheba was stroking the great black-wheeled vehicle that stood on the road. A Chevy Suburban. It belongs to my bodyguards. Clinton threw another calculating glance at Sheba. Would you like to see inside? Oh, yes, please. Sheba peered in. The front seat was like any other automobile. Controls, a steering wheel, pedals on the floor. How many horses does it take? 335. Sheba blinked, trying to imagine the sight. The front standard, all the good stuff is in the back. He turned to his Secret Service men. Open up the back, please. But, sir. Open it up, please. Clinton's voice was insistent. The agent sighed and did as he was told. A lot of the equipment in the back was classified. Isn't that one of the new automatic shotguns? Clinton took the nod for an answer and reached in, picking the heavy weapon up. With slickness born of long practice, he spun around, racking the mechanism as he did. Then, with the barrel less than a foot from Sheba's stomach, he pulled the trigger. The long, roaring burst drowned out his scream, and the blasts of buckshot hurled her backwards across the sidewalk, rolling her over as she started to fall apart. The Secret Serviceman's faces were expressions of utter horror at the scene, horror that was replaced by revulsion as the figure sprawled on the ground began to change, its flesh going black, horns growing from its head, a tail sprouting from under the absurdly short skirt. Their reactions were, under the circumstances, commendable. They stopped their dive for Clinton in mid-lunge, spun, drew their Sig Sauer P229s, and each emptied all twelve rounds of 357 Sig into the writhing demon. Clinton had dropped the empty magazine of his shotgun, loaded another, and a second roar finished the job. The demon was dead, its bright yellow blood spreading across the sidewalk. It was a demon! Hey, Bill's killed a demon! The whispers from the crowd grew as they recovered from the shock of the violent confrontation. One man, obviously the worse for drink, staggered up and smacked Clinton on the back. Well done, Bill. Have a drink. Clinton grabbed the bottle in its brown paper bag and took a swig. The senior of the Secret Serviceman was speaking on the radio. Stay away from the body, please. We don't know what we're dealing with here. Then he turned to Clinton. Well done, sir, but how did you know? Clinton grinned, the easy, friendly grin that won him elections. I've been married to Hillary for 30 years. Believe me, after going through that... I have no trouble recognizing a fiend from hell. Oval Office, White House, Washington, D.C. Sir Newsflash just in. Former President Clinton has just killed a baldric at the McDonald's just down the road. Damn. That will cost us at least one more seat in the House. President Bush looked pensive for a moment. I don't suppose we could get my pappy to whack one? His public relations advisor shrugged. If one turned up in the right place, it could be arranged, probably. But that was asking too much. No, sir. Not that we can rely on, anyway. Bush's mouth twisted, 
a pity to be disappointed so late in the evening. How did it happen anyway? How did Bill, I suppose we'll have to call him Wild Bill, manage it? And what were the Secret Service up to? The details are very brief, sir. Apparently he just blasted the baldric with an automatic shotgun. Dr. Sir Leith, the National Science Advisor, is waiting outside. Perhaps he can give you some more details. A sigh wafted gently across the room. President Bush really didn't like being briefed by scientists. They tended to use such long words. Like any good politician, Bush knew that the time taken to say a four-syllable word was greater than the attention span of the audience. Trot him in. Bush leaned forward in his seat, giving the impression of studiously examining the papers on the presidential desk. Dr. Sir Leith, good to see you. A great achievement by the former president, but one that raises a few questions, I think. Indeed so, sir. Mr. Clinton was very lucky that the Baldrick in question was a new type, one that apparently has some unnerving capabilities. In accordance with your instructions, we've started naming the Baldrick types we encounter. For example, we've designated the flying Baldricks as harpies, the aquatic ones as leviathans, and the land-based one as behemoths. The one killed by Mr. Clinton was human-sized and gave every appearance of being a human female, a very seductive one. It changed appearance into what we assume was its real form only when blasted with several dozen rounds of double-aught buckshot and automatic pistol fire. Wait a minute. This thing was able to simulate people's appearance? It's a shapeshifter? That means it could be anybody. You, me, anybody could be killed and replaced by one of those things? Yes, sir, although things may not be quite that bad. The other thing is that this baldric, we're going to call this type a succubus, just materialized by the former president's table and started to speak to him. The Secret Service men thought they'd fouled up badly, but nobody saw that thing before it was standing next to the former president and speaking. It's as if it simply materialized there. That's appalling. It means nobody is safe. One could materialize here and now. Well, that all depends, Mr. President. There are pretty much two possibilities. The first is that the succubus really is a shapeshifter and can teleport around. If that is the case, then we can take the entire science section of the Library of Congress and toss it onto the landfill. Everything we thought we knew about the physical world is wrong. However, the other possibility is much more probable and something we can handle. Dr. Sir Leith paused for a second. This was going to be the tricky bit. This option is that the succubus doesn't change shape or teleport. It simply makes us think it looks the way it does. How can it do that? Here comes the long words, Bush thought to himself. Mr. President, are you familiar with the concept of quantum entanglement? Knew it, Bush thought. Four syllables at least. I've heard the term. That means no, Dr. Sir Leith said ruefully to himself. Oh well, here we go. Quantum entanglement is a phenomenon in which two or more objects influence each other at a quantum level even though the individual objects may be spatially separated. This leads to correlations between observable physical properties of the systems. For example, measurements performed on one system seem to be instantaneously influencing other systems entangled with it. Sir Leith looked at the president. He wasn't sure, but Bush's eyes seemed to be rotating in different directions. What this means is that one quantum state can duplicate itself, transit information on itself, if you like, to another without a direct contact. This has been experimentally demonstrated within a laboratory and we are just beginning to appreciate the implications of the phenomena. Now, the workings of the brain and nerves all use various kinds of energy fields. You've heard of brainwave measurement and things like that. We've been doing that for years. Now, theoretically, it's possible that the succubus can entangle its energy field with those around it so that it transmits information to them. In effect, it duplicates itself in them. So the succubus holds a mental image of itself in its mind and uses this ability to entangle the sense transmissions in those around it, so it duplicates that image in them. In short, all those around the succubus see it the way the succubus wants them to see it. It doesn't change shape, it simply changes the way people see its shape. And the teleport thing? Easy. The succubus simply transmits an image of itself that isn't there. It isn't invisible, it simply tells the senses in its victim that it isn't present. Now, if this is correct, we should be able to detect that energy field. There isn't a part of the electromagnetic spectrum we can't detect and measure and work out a way to stop it. Only we'll need a live succubus for that, and we haven't got one. Until we get one, we won't know which explanation is correct. We don't need a succubus, doctor. We've got the evidence we need. Bush grinned to himself. 
Just because he didn't like using four-syllable words and usually mispronounced them when he did, didn't mean he couldn't understand them. We have, Mr. President. This is Washington, doctor. The city with one of the highest crime rates in America. Knocking off fast food restaurants and shooting the staff is a daily event. Or was, until the places started installing video surveillance cameras. Now, if I follow your explanation properly, the entanglement thing you talk about works on the energy fields in the brain. Surveillance cameras don't have brains. The film should show us what is really there, not what it wants us to think is there. So, let's get that film. It took just under an hour. The manager of the 19th Street McDonald's had the interesting experience of FBI Director Robert S. Muller III arriving to collect his video surveillance tapes personally. Director Muller carried the tapes back to the White House where they were set up in the projection office just off the conference room. By the striking of the hour, the audience had assembled and the tapes were run. Right, here we are. We can see the former president and his two Secret Service men entering the restaurant. Will you look at that? Muller's voice was incredulous. A jet black figure, human sized but with a set of rounded stub horns and a long pointed tail, entered through the open doors of the restaurant, only a foot or so behind the rear Secret Service man. By the time the doors had closed, it was inside. He's getting his food, going to the table. The succubus had walked less than a couple of feet in front of the Secret Service agents. Both had looked directly at it, but neither of them had seen it. The succubus spoke with Clinton while he ate, then the two left together. A few seconds after they left, there were the brilliant flashes of gunfire outside. There we are, Dr. Sirleith. It doesn't teleport and it doesn't shapeshift. It just makes us think it does, so you can start to look for your energy field, right? Yes, sir. Bush relaxed in his seat running the implications of the scene in his mind. Dr. Sirleith, your quantum entanglement theory was very interesting and, as far as I can make out, plausible. Don't concentrate on it to the exclusion of other theories, though. I've seen that happen all too often. Gentlemen, we've proved something else today. We can rely on our optical sensors even if we can't rely on our own eyes and ears. That's worth spreading to the troops, to everybody, in fact. I doubt that this succubus thing that Bill killed so emphatically will be the only one that we run into there will be more, and we need to be on our guard against them. Closed-circuit television surveillance, remote surveillance so that the operator isn't within the zone of control of these things, is essential. By executive order, I'm making the installation of such equipment a tax-deductible expense as from now. See, that gets out as fast as possible. James Randi Educational Foundation, Florida, USA James Randi rubbed his eyes. The last few days had been tiresome in the extreme, ever since the announcement that all mediums were being tested so that their abilities, if any, could be used in the war effort went out, the Foundation had been besieged by applicants. The big names, of course, had refused to show their faces. They were scared spitless of the amazing Randy, and with good reason. He knew the tricks they used and how to expose them. Submitting to tests by him would destroy their livelihood. That reasoning hadn't helped them, they had found themselves being picked up by the FBI, bundled into the back of a Chevy Suburban, and brought down to the Foundation. A few hours later, they had been on their way back, their fraudulent claims exposed and discredited. Not one. Not one genuine medium in the whole lot. There was a time when that would have delighted me, but not now. We know there's something out there, but we can't get at it. It was easier being an atheist. Now I don't know what to believe. Guess that makes me agnostic. No, James, I know that the idea an agnostic lies between the extremes of atheism and religious fanaticism, but it does not. It is a separate line of thought. An atheist denies the existence of any sort of God, the theist affirms it. An agnostic believes that the existence or non-existence of a God can never be proven. The Gnostic believes that the existence or non-existence of a God is subject to rational proof. If I understand your position correctly, you were a Gnostic atheist. You denied the existence of a god and thought you could prove that your denial was correct. And I was wrong, General. Why, James? We know now that there is life after death. That is undeniable. We know that the afterlife is ruled by beings. Why do you believe those beings are gods? We have already proved we can kill their servants with almost absurd ease. Why cannot we kill them as well? They're probably more trouble than they are worth anyway. We don't like our gods, so we kill them. Now that's a soldier talking. 
No, James, it is not. A soldier fights for those who cannot fight for themselves. Today, we fight for all those who have died, who are being held in horrid slavery. We fight for all humanity, past, present, and future. You are part of that fight, don't forget it. In this war, you are as much a soldier as I. General, while we are speaking on this subject, may I ask something? How does the message affect you and your people? Few of you are Christian. On one level, James, the message does not concern us. I am a Buddhist. So are more than 90% of my people. The Lord Buddha was not a god, he was a man. A very wise man who laid down rules for living one's life as well as possible on an imperfect earth. Good rules that when applied mean one lives a good life. To us, being a Buddhist simply means following those teachings. I could give you a long lecture on what that means, but here is neither the time nor the place. When we meditate, we simply ponder the teachings of the Lord Buddha and try to seek enlightenment on how they can solve our problems. When we pray to him, we simply are asking him what he would do under these circumstances. Any question of gods or devils is quite irrelevant to that center core belief. In my country, we are animists. We believe that everything has a spirit that lives in it, a spirit we can talk to and who will talk back to us. So the message didn't affect us much. On another level, what does affect us is the assertion that all humans go to eternal punishment, no matter what they believe. The message made no distinction between the religions or stated that one would be exempt while another was condemned. All humans are subject to the same fate, so we fight. That's why governments pay us the big bucks. Which brings us back to where we started. We've been pulling in every psychic, every medium, every fortune teller we can find. When we've exhausted this country's supply, we'll start abroad. Yet, for all our efforts, we have not come up with one single person who can actually speak to the dead. What if there are none? What if the dead are indeed beyond contact? The general finished her whiskey and refilled her glass. Perhaps we are looking in the wrong place. Perhaps we should consider the possibility that so-called mediums cannot speak to the dead, but that those who can speak to the dead are not mediums. After all, let us suppose that one can communicate with the dead. What will we learn? That the dead are subject to an eternity of hideous torture, without hope of end or reprieve, that the same fate awaits us all. Now the grieving family of a dead person turns up on our doorstep. They want reassurance. They want to know that their beloved husband or wife, parents or children have gone to the better place promised, that they are happy in their afterlife. Would you tell them the truth? that a terrible fate has fallen on them, and that the same awaits their relatives? Randy shook his head. Such cruelty would be inconceivable. Thinking about it, the message itself was an act of diabolical cruelty, one that only a truly foul mind could conceive. When Satan had proclaimed his dominion over the earth, and proclaimed that all its souls belonged to him, regardless of virtue or cause, he had fully lived up to his reputation. So where do we look? The general sipped her whiskey, savoring its smoky taste. Imagine yourself as someone who can speak to the damned dead, know their pain and anguish, feel their agony, know that the same fate awaits you, and that there is no hope, that the fate ahead is what inevitably awaits you. What would you do? Randy thought for a second. I think I would go mad. The general looked over the rim of her glass. Quite. So shouldn't we start looking amongst the mad? Looking at those who hear voices, voices whose messages are so dreadful that they have driven the listener insane. All through history there have been those who have claimed they have heard voices that drove them to acts of rage or despair. They've always been treated as though they were insane, but suppose they were not. Suppose they really did hear voices, either accidentally or deliberately. In ancient times, such people were described as possessed, but in our arrogance we assumed otherwise. We assumed that they were sick, that they had a mental defect that we could treat. Perhaps they were not. Perhaps they really were possessed by the demons who now assail us. That they were victims of the hideous game we are now playing to its final act. So we should start looking amongst the mentally ill. That will be a long job. It will indeed, James, but it is one we can move fast on. We are looking for specific kinds of people, those who hear voices that drive them insane. I think computers can help with this. We need to have the records searched so that we can find the most promising cases. Then we can bring them here. 
Office of the National Science Advisor, Washington, D.C. Call for you, Dr. Sir Leith. It's from Florida. Thank you. Put it through. Sir Leith waited for a moment. Sir Leith here. Doctor, this is the James Randi Educational Foundation. Sir Leith recognized the contralto voice, one that had a threatening growl underneath it. The sound of a well-fed tiger that was eyeing a small animal with the thought that it had just a little room left in its stomach. Ah, yes, General. How is the research going down there? We've hit a dead end. Our initial concept was wrong, so we're changing tack. We're writing off the known mediums, etc., as source material. It's pretty obvious they're all frauds and confidence tricksters. Instead, we're going to start looking at people who claim to hear voices in their heads and are under treatment for such delusions. So you and the amazing Randy think that some of them really do hear voices? Sir Leith's voice was bitter. Scientists had never forgiven Randy for exposing tricksters whose acts had fooled scientific testing. Randy had pointed out that the skills needed to expose a fraud were different from those needed to conduct an experiment. It hadn't helped. If anything, it had made things worse. We do. What we need you to do is to get as much information on such cases to us as possible so we can start working through them. Also, I read the note about the search for energy fields. Can you get some instrumentation down here pretty quick? If we do start finding what we're looking for, we should be able to measure what it is they're hearing. I'll get the equipment sent down along with some experts to install it. Thank you, General, and good luck. Sir Leith leaned back in his seat. A new front had been opened against the forces that were threatening humanity. While the armed forces were picking off the baldricks who appeared on Earth, science and reason were striking at the very heart of their power. For the first time since the message, Sir Leith felt good. Marshall Field of Dysprosium, Hell His troops were formed up on the field, awaiting his inspection. Sixty legions, each with 6,666 demons, a total force of over 400,000 demons, if Abigor's own command staff were included. By far the largest force that Hell had ever sent to another world yet, it was only a tiny fraction of the army that Hell could deploy if it wished. There were 6,666 legions in Hell, a total of 44,500,000 demons under arms, a mighty host that had never in its history been deployed against a single foe. There had never been a single foe whose ability had demanded that level of force. Always those lower down the scale of existence had cowered in fear when the demons had arrived, genuflecting at the appearance of the creatures from a greater dimension. Mostly the armies of hell had never been needed. The heralds had been terrifying enough to put their victims into a state of catatonic terror. Only not this time. This time the creatures from the lower dimensions had the temerity to fight back. Even more than that, they had killed the heralds. That had disturbed Abigor more than he let on. If the heralds could be killed, what did that mean for the demons in his ranks? The heralds were deliberately created to be awe-inspiring, terrifying by virtue of their size and apparent invulnerability, yet the humans below had fought back and killed them. Individually, the demons in the ranks of his legions were much less formidable than the great heralds. They were formidable enough, that was true. Their tough hides were impervious to arrows and the blows of swords, yet would that be enough? What did the humans have that could kill so effectively? There was another point that worried Abigor. The heralds had been killed. What had happened to them? The rulers of hell knew what happened to those on the lower dimensions. Their creation and life built up a form of energy that, when they died, boosted them over the threshold and translated them to the next level of dimension. Unfortunately for them, the energy needed to surge the occupants of this reality level was much greater. That's why hell existed. The second deaths of the unfortunates from realities below were prolonged as much as possible, by millennia or longer. Nobody knew the limit yet, so that the energy released by their suffering would boost the rulers of hell up to their afterlife. The creatures from below suffered in their afterlife to provide the creatures of this level with theirs. But suppose the beings who lived in the reality above this one adopted the same philosophy. Was there a super hell that awaited Abigor and his kind? The infantry and his legions were crashing the butts of their tridents against the ground as Abigor rode past on his beast. Fifty-six of his sixty legions were his infantry. Abigor's host was one of the less mobile of its kind. He had only three mounted legions and one flying legion. The information he had was that the humans lived mostly in cities. 
That meant the war would be one of sieges, the cities fighting from behind their defensive walls in a series of last stands. That would put a premium on his infantry. His mounted and flying legions would only be of use in isolating each city before the infantry besieged and destroyed it. It had been done before. Abigor knew that human myths were full of stories of cities that had been besieged by hordes of monstrous inhuman foes. Now they would find out where those myths had come from. The horns sounded, their wailing drowning out the crashing cadence of the trident staffs. The legions did a right face, towards a black dot that had suddenly appeared against the roiling red smoke of the sky. The dot expanded, opening a gate into the lower dimension that had dared to defy the will of higher beings. This was the critical stage. The energy gradient ran steeply from the lower dimensions to the higher. It was relatively easy for the higher dimension beings to gain access to the lower, much harder for the lower dimensions to ascend. Only opening a portal could ensure easy access between the dimensions. Yet that same energy gradient meant that once a portal between the levels was opened, it would be very hard to close. Size also was a factor, and this was the largest portal that had ever been created. Just how hard would it be to close again? Abigor had an uneasy feeling that nobody had thought to ask that question. The portal reached its full extent, and the horns wailed again. Abigor led his host forward, into the black circle of the portal, and from it, into the brilliant yellow light and the clear blue skies of Earth. Headquarters, 1st Armored Division, Task Force Iron, Multinational Force Iraq. Have we got the Global Hawk feed set up? Major General Wilkins snapped the order out. The situation was breaking loose at last, and he didn't want to fall behind the loop. Sir, yes sir. Direct feed to us to Washington and to Moscow. The latter part was new, one of the hurried preparations that had been made over the last two weeks. There had been a frantic effort to link up the world's military headquarters so that the fight, if it started, when it started, would be properly coordinated. Task Force Iron also had a direct download from Russian satellites and other recon capabilities, but it was the RQ-4B Global Hawks that were the key asset. Nobody knew where the attack would come. On paper, it could be anywhere but Iraq had been a leading bet. The association of old legends and the fertile triangle of the Tigris-Euphrates was too powerful to ignore. High above the desert, the Global Hawk turned lazily, its long wings biting at the thin air. Its stabilized cameras focused on a strange sight in the desert of western Iraq, a black oval that had suddenly appeared in the stony wastes, one that spread even though it had no apparent substance. It wasn't even a shadow, it was more of an absence of anything. The camera zoomed in on the strange spreading stain that still grew beneath it. Well, that looks like it. Brigadier General Booth looked at the image with horrified fascination. If the guesses were right, he was looking at something humanity had discussed, described and occasionally cursed but never actually seen, the mouth of hell itself. The black shadow had stopped spreading and seemed to be holding its breath. Is that thing flat on the ground or perpendicular to it? Can't tell. Wilkins spoke quietly, the tension in the room seeming to dull voices. I think it's a different dimension entirely. We're not seeing it. We're seeing its shadow. I don't think it has dimensions or proportions as we understand them. Something stirred in the shadow and a line of figures started to appear. Zoom in on that. The order came from the commander of the UAV detachment that was operating the Global Hawk. The image enlarged in a series of jerks as the operator clicked up through the zoom scales. The group of figures resolved, one huge figure surrounded by a group of others. Then, Another smaller group appeared out of the shadow, followed by lines of others. What do you make of that? Wilkins wanted other opinions, other eyes looking at this. First group, the command group. Now we've got combat troops appearing. The analyst looked quickly at the emerging lines. They're coming out in a parade formation. If we only had the assets within range. The alert's gone off to the flyboys and the squids. We'll have jets here soon enough. And we've got the friends with their toy on scene. On the screen, the figures had continued to pour out of the portal, forming up into a huge square on the desert. The UAV operator dialed his cameras in again. Okay, that formation seems to be complete. I make it 81 ranks, each of 81 baldricks. They're subdivided into nine groups of nine ranks with a command section between each. I guess that gives us 6,666 down there. Appropriate number. About a brigade size formation then, and that would make the smaller subdivisions battalions. There were nods around the room. It seemed fair enough. Nine ranks of 81 meant 729 demons in a battalion. 
This was translating raw numbers into a structure that could easily be understood, and to the people in this room, what could be understood could be destroyed. Once structure, form, and numbers were evaluated and put into context, destruction was a matter of planning. Each line is a company with nine, nine Baldrick platoons. If that's it, this is something we can cope with. Booth spoke as if he was trying to convince himself. He needn't have bothered. The situation was changing even while he spoke. More coming out, sirs. On the television screen, a second square was forming beside the first, the stream of black figures emerging from the Hellmouth coalescing into a second square to the right of the first. Even as it was completed, a third square started forming to the left of the first. Still the figures poured out, new squares forming until the line had seven in all. Assuming the squares are all identical, there's almost 47,000 of them down there. The Baldricks aren't playing games, are they? Wilkins shook his head. Even as he did so, the line of seven squares started to move forward, and another wave of black figures poured out, forming into squares exactly as their predecessors had done. The command center was utterly silent as the imagery poured in from the cameras on the Global Hawk. The second line of squares was finished, moved forward, and a third row started, then a fourth. By the time the figures ceased to pour out, there were eight rows in all. Fifty-six of the black squares spread out on the Iraqi sand. Rows are divisions, the whole thing's a core. More nods of agreement, faced with the huge numbers assembling on the screens in front of them. Naming units seemed trivial, yet it was utterly important if the enemy was to be understood. Span of command is very large, seems to run in nines. Probably personal command. We're going to be looking at a slowly reacting army here. It's very low geared, big but ponderous. Suits us just fine. More nods around the room. The United States Army was built to fight large, ponderous opponents. It was beginning to look like it had finally found one. What are those? More figures were pouring out, larger ones. The UAV operator played with his camera controls, zooming in on the new arrivals. They were baldrick still, but sitting on a beast. One that looked vaguely like a rhinoceros with a great horn on its nose, but with a scorpion's tail arched high over its back and claws like a lobster. I guess those are the cavalry. We don't know how fast those things can move. Mark them down as priority targets. More coming. The figures pouring out of the Hellmouth were flying winged creatures, like the harpies shot down by the squids a couple of weeks earlier, but smaller. They landed and formed a last square. Seconds, then minutes crept by, but no more Baldricks joined the awesome parade in front of the Hellmouth. The Global Hawk wasn't equipped to pick up sound, but nobody watching was in any doubt that the desert was alive with the sounds of drumming and the hammering of feet. Hellmouth, east of Arutba, Iraqi Desert. Unnoticed in the noise and confusion, a small winged structure danced in the dust and glare. It was an odd little thing by anybody's standards, a lumpy fuselage with two longish wings, a tripod tail unit and a propeller was at the rear. Its name was an MQ-1B Predator. The Predator didn't have markings which was hardly surprising. Its operators, far back at Task Force Irons Command Center, weren't from the U.S. Armed Forces. They were Central Intelligence Agency. For almost five years, the CIA had been operating a clandestine force of predators, using them for covert assassinations of terrorist leaders and others considered undesirable. That role had abruptly ended with the message. Those who had taken the submission to the will bit seriously had died. The rest had thrown their lot in with the rest of humanity. Now, the U.S. Army and CIA had the strange but not unfamiliar experience of working with people who only a few days before had been their blood enemies. The change had meant the Predators had a new job, one which was of absolutely vital importance. It was essential to find out if human weapons, human technology could be sent into hell in return. More importantly, were those weapons as destructive there as they were proving on Earth? If the answer was yes, then humanity had a means of striking back at its foe. If not, then they would forever be condemned to an ultimately futile defense. The Predators were the vanguard of this exploration. The information they gained within the next few minutes would mark the start of the investigation. It was, quite literally, reconnaissance by fire. Its orders received. The MQ-1B obediently turned around and headed for the shadowy ellipse that marked the Hellmouth. Headquarters, 1st Armored Division, Task Force Iron, Multinational Force Iraq, Back in the command center, the CIA operative held his breath as the little drone approached the disk and became swallowed in it. Then the whole section erupted into wild cheers for on the monitor screen, 
images had emerged. Pictures of a vast plain, bare rock under a swirling red-orange sky, dust clouds sweeping backwards and forwards over the desolate scene. The image brightened and sharpened as the computer-controlled adaptive optics compensated for the wildly unfamiliar light levels and spectra, but the images were there. The operator manipulated his controls, getting the vision head on the electro-optical pod to pivot around. The pictures swirled, grotesque and unfamiliar but still vaguely recognizable. The imagery was coming back that had enormous consequences. Tell Washington and everybody else phase one is complete. We got the bird in and we're getting data out. There is something on the other side of that gate and we can get at it. The agent's voice broke into a chuckle. No huge letters of fire yet. Now we'll try and change all that. He played with the optical head again, looking for something important. He found it. At least it seemed important. Some sort of review stand at a far part of the field. The predator was closing in on it. The trouble seemed to be that it was hard to judge ranges in the red-clouded murk. A quick flash with the laser rangefinder built into the predator told him what he needed to know. The target was 4,000 yards away, easily within range of the two Hellfire missiles hanging under the predator's wings. He locked their homing heads onto the stand and fired them both. Marshal Field of Dysprosium, Hell. The parade was over. The army of Abigor had departed into the lower dimension, and the guests who had watched it leave were making their way off the stand. It had been quite an unusual sight. Never before had such a force been sent to a lower dimension to enforce the will of those above it. Defiance was unprecedented. Such a display had never been required. Now, with the mighty force appearing before them, they would be regretting their failure to submit. The demons who had watched the army leave never saw the two missiles streaking through the red murk towards them, or if they did, they never realized the significance of what they were seeing. The explosions destroyed the stand totally, sending fragments of wood and stone flying through the air, ripping into the hides of all around them. Blasts seared their skin, flaying flesh from bones, shattering limbs, tearing at bodies. What had just a demonic second before been a decorated review stand was now a pile of shattered wreckage, splattered with the green, yellow, black, red and white body fluids of those who had been standing on it. Those outside the blast area looked on appalled at the catastrophe that had suddenly enveloped the senior guests. The more astute of them started running towards the disaster, hoping to gain status and rewards by being the first to aid the stricken. Above the chaos, still unnoticed by those below, the predator turned around and flew back towards the Hellmouth. Headquarters, 1st Armored Division, Task Force Iron, Multinational Force Iraq, Phase two complete. Two solid hits. It's chaos down there. Wherever it is, whatever it is, our weapons work there. Look at that, people. Boy, have we just kicked an anthill over. The CIA agent's voice was triumphant. The camera on the Predator was showing a boiling mass of confusion where the target had been. He had no idea of who or what he had just killed, if indeed he had killed them, but there was no doubt of the destruction. The reviewing stand had gone, its position marked by a pyre of smoke and flame. There was just one thing to check, and that was coming up soon. The Predator approached the Hellmouth and flew through it. It took a second for the optics to readjust, but when they did, they showed the blue sky and yellow sand of the Iraqi desert. Phase 3 complete. UAV recovered. Confirmed we have a radar paint. The transponder in the Predator marked the position of the drone as it set off on its long flight back to base. It had done its job better than anybody could have hoped, and certainly far better than its manufacturers could have ever contemplated. Oval Office, White House, Washington, D.C. My fellow Americans. President Bush paused, then shook his head. No, my fellow humans. For today we all stand shoulder to shoulder against a threat that promised to engulf us all. Truly, in these desperate days, if we do not hang together, we will all hang separately. Today there are no Americans, no Russians, no Japanese or Chinese or Australians. We are all humans together, and it is to each other that we must look for our survival. We cannot hope for aid or help from others. We stand alone with only each other and the tools of our joint ingenuity to protect us. We have learned beyond any shadow of a doubt that hell and heaven both exist, but that the doors to the latter are closed to us. If we lose the fight in which we are now engaged, the entire human race faces only a screaming eternity. 
Hell and heaven both have, by both word and deed, declared their undying hatred of mankind united, and as such we return it tenfold. As of this day, we find ourselves embroiled in a war, the war, Armageddon, as it was never once dreamed in the worst nightmares of our forefathers, a war not between heaven and hell for our own salvation, but between heaven and hell and humanity, a war we must win completely and utterly if we desire the slightest chance of sparing untold generations of future men and women a literal eternity of suffering. We claim to be fighting in a war on terror. Now we find ourselves allied with our former enemies. They are our brothers in a wider struggle on all of those who would condemn humanity to an eternity of suffering. Once, mere weeks ago, I would have prayed to God to have mercy on our souls. Now I and all others on this earth know better. The being many of us once worshipped as a God has stated in no uncertain terms that there will be no mercy on our souls. To that God, to Lucifer, to all the angels and devils massing to rend and destroy the hope of humanity's future, I respond, you who would show us no mercy shall receive none in return. For the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve do not suffer betrayal. Today we struck our first blow at our oppressors. Acting on national intelligence information received from reliable informants, a predator aircraft operated by an intelligence organization struck at a major enemy leadership figure. It is believed the attack was successful and the target was killed. This is the first in a series of targeted assassinations aimed specifically at the enemy leadership. There will be more. They will not know where the blows will come from or when they will strike, but there will be more. In the war we are about to fight, we will take casualties probably more than at any time in our history, but in this war our fight does not end with death. I charge those who fall to spread the word in hell. Humanity is coming. We will not stop. We will not cease. We will not fail. To all those in hell, we say, hold fast, we are coming. No matter what it costs, no matter what the sacrifices we must make, no matter how long it takes, no matter who we trample on the way, we are coming for you. You will be freed. Your souls will be liberated from torment. You will be saved, not by prayer or submission to the will of some self-proclaimed deity, but by the force of our arms. No human will be left behind. I will say that again so there is no misunderstanding. Myths speak of rapture in which many will be left behind. This may be their way, but it is not ours. We serve notice. No human will be left in the clutches of those who would hold us in bondage for all eternity. On that promise, may our enemies rest in an uneasy and frightened sleep. Thank you, and good night. Throne Room, Infernal Palace of Dis, Hell. And exactly how did they spontaneously explode? Satan's voice had a silky, oily quality to it that was far more unnerving than any of his berserk rages. We don't know, sire. We found bits of metal in the wreckage, so we think it was one of the human machines, but we don't understand it. A machine? A human machine, you say? They invaded my territory and killed four of my subjects with a machine? The silky, oily quality was fading, replaced by the hysterical screams of rage. The audience found that immensely reassuring. It was business as usual. The unnatural calm had been horrifying from its unprecedented nature. A raving, screaming temper tantrum was much more familiar. And nobody saw it. None, sire. Although we do have a message that was transmitted by one of their warlords. It refers to a predator aircraft. And just what is a predator? Satan was struggling to keep his temper under control. A hunting bird. The voice came from a tiny minor demon on the floor. Satan glanced sideways and his glance mashed the speaker into a purple pulp that drained away through the stone floor. Does anybody else want to state the obvious? There was a sudden shuffling of cloven feet and demons glancing sideways at each other. The more astute of them were already trying to work out the best place to take cover when their infernal overlord decided it would be necessary to stage a massacre. There is another problem with that message. Asmodeus spoke carefully. The Warlord spoke of major enemy leadership figure. We assume that means an important person here. Yet there was nobody on that stand of any importance. A few relatives of Abigor, that is all. None in the leadership, and none of any importance. We do not understand this. Perhaps I can explain. Beelzebub was also speaking carefully. The Warlord also spoke of information received from reliable informants. There can be only one explanation for that comment. There are those of your Infernal Majesty's subjects who are in contact with the humans, 
and are passing information to them. A horrified gasp went around the hall. The whole concept was a nightmare to contemplate, yet was also eerily plausible. Who here had not sold information on an ally to an enemy in order to bring about a tactical advantage? But sire... Asmodeus was appalled, his voice terrified at even speaking of this idea. Nobody important was killed. Nobody important, perhaps. Beelzebub spoke almost as smoothly and calmly as Satan had done. Not in our terms, perhaps. But the traitor, or traitors who sold the information to the humans, may have been using them to settle a private score of his or her own. Who knows where treason might end? Even Satan was silenced by that thought. The hall was still, silent as the occupants absorbed the implications of what Beelzebub had said. Then, the glances that they were exchanging underwent a slow change from apprehension at what Satan might do next to suspicion at what their neighbors might be saying to these upstart humans. No matter how intense those suspicious glances became, they couldn't match the ones Satan was casting at them. Room 352A, Arkham Asylum, New York City, New York. The voices had been haunting Julie since her sophomore year of high school. Every time she'd tried to tell them to go away, they simply laughed at her. And when she denied they were real, they'd whisper to her, caressing her mind like an unwanted lover, telling her secrets, what was happening far away, what others were thinking about her, telling her things that were never wrong. And they were always right, always there, always just out of her senses, dripping across her mind like black grease. Even after she'd tried to kill herself, it hadn't worked. They'd told her that it was pointless, that someone was at the door just as she'd watched the blood stream from her wrists with morbid fascination. Even after the suicide attempt, when her family had tearfully waved her goodbye and she'd gone to Arkham for treatment, which hadn't worked, and incarceration, they were telling her things, what was happening outside. The conquest was on, they'd said. The infernal deal that had haunted her nightmares since she was five that had haunted every waking moment since the voices had first come, was sealed and complete. Heaven's gates were closed and locked, the whole of humanity damned without hope of rescue or reprieve. Her cell was locked, as always. The white walls were padded, and she was sitting on her cot in the corner murmuring to herself when one of the voices, Domicles Faratu, it called itself, whispered, Look to the door. She did. The lock on the door clicked and lifted. They're coming to get you coming to take you away, to experiment on you, to rape and torture and mutilate and humiliate you. The voices were never wrong. She hurled herself back into the corner, away from the strange people filing into the room. Then there was Dr. Becky, her presence a welcome familiarity that was dispelled by the presence of others, more people in uniforms and more in white lab coats. Domiklas Faratu laughed. Look at you, pitiful little girl. The floor reared up and she stumbled backward into the walls. Dr. Becky Skillman had worked at Arkham for fifteen years, and in all that time she'd never been visited by the government. Two men in suits with dark sunglasses, guns, and no sense of humor had knocked on her office door, shown her a pair of bright and very impressive badges, and asked her for a list of the patients at Arkham for whom treatment had done absolutely no good, especially the ones who heard voices. She wasn't one to deny the government a request especially not in this day and age. With the message, a quarter of the Arkham staff were gone, and the strange reports filing through the news were unsettling. There was fighting of some sort, the sort that reminded her of the nightmarish hallucinations of her patients. The men had been from the Secret Service and they'd thanked her cordially, gone, and then a half hour later were back with an entire platoon of men in fatigues with rifles asking to be taken to room 352A on the third floor. Julie Adams had been at the top of the list, and they'd decided to take her first. Before Skillman had a chance to ask any questions, they'd waved a piece of paper, subpoena or something like that, in her face, and were demanding the case files. Adams was an untreatable schizophrenic, and had only gotten worse through the eight years she'd been in Arkham. No treatment had worked, and they'd tried them all, from the newest drugs to some of the oldest tricks in the books, the sort that the staff all mutually agreed to keep quiet because people who didn't work at psychiatric hospitals just didn't understand. And now the government wanted to take her away? Skillman shrugged. Eh, not her place to question or worry. As they filed into the pure white cell, Adams was scrabbling against the back wall, face contorted in fear, 
the greasy tangles of her long black hair swabbing the wall. No, no, I'm not gonna let you take me! The soldiers impassively moved forward, seemingly deaf to the woman's harsh, pathetic screams. Reaching down, two deftly warded off her slaps and kicks and lifted her by the shoulders so that she hung between them like a rag doll. Brushing past Skillman, they filed back out of the room, Adams's screams echoing down the corridor. The two men in black thanked her and walked out, leaving her standing in the silent room, listening to the sick woman being dragged down the hall. Temporary Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, The Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. James Randy sighed and rolled his eyes. While the search teams were scouring the nation's medical facilities for the apparently insane who might not be insane after all, the fakes and charlatans had continued to pour into the Institute in unimaginable numbers. The publicity combined with the persuasive talents of the U.S. Secret Service and the FBI had achieved results that even his million-dollar prize had failed to attain. Privately, Randy kicked himself. He should have involved the Secret Service earlier. They'd even brought John Edwards and Sylvia Brown in over those two unworthies angered protests. It had taken only a few minutes testing to discredit that pair of mountebanks, after which they'd been unceremoniously ejected from the building. As Agent Stella Carter had remarked, hey, guess what? Sylvia didn't bounce. Up to now, that had been par for the course. There were still the palm readers and card players who waited in the antechamber for their turn, all dressed up in beads and eyeliner and all sorts of clothes that looked mysterious in smoky, underlit rooms, but just appeared absurd under fluorescent business lights. They were the routine dross that had to be inspected, just in case. Even so, there was hope for the plea for any real psychics or necromancers to come forward had brought in five or six possible hits, all quiet, shy people who worked ordinary jobs and lived ordinary lives. He was just about to call the next person in when his cell phone rang. He checked it. It was a 555-1000 number. He answered. Randy here. After a moment, he nodded and said, Will do. Please bring her in. At last. Randy sighed the words to himself. Ever since his discussion with that charming Thai general, he'd been waiting for the first of the medical subjects to arrive. Then, he squared his shoulders and opened the door to the antechamber and just stood there, looking out toward the outside door. It opened, and eight National Guardsmen marched in, wearing full combat fatigues. Two of them were carrying what appeared to be a heavily sedated woman, her glassy eyes half open and a bit of drool trailing down her cheeks. Behind them were three men in lab coats, looking like stereotypical doctors. As they reached where Randy stood, one of the men in lab coats strode forward past the soldiers and offered his hand. Randy shook it, and the man said, James Randy, Dr. Ed Bullmore, Psychiatry and Neurology at Cambridge. Pleased to meet you. The pleasure's mine, Dr. Bullmore. What do we have here? Bullmore spoke with a pleasant British accent. Untreatable schizophrenia patient from New York. Name, Julie Adams. Onset at age 16. Reported ability to read minds. He looked meaningfully at one of the soldiers who spoke up, sounding shaken. On the way over here, she told me about my daughter who drowned. No way she could have known about that. She was locked up for years before Kelsey was born. Randy thought for a moment. Bring her in. Briskly, the white-bearded man walked back through the door. He glanced over at his secretary. Jane, please request brain imaging at the nearest hospital ASAP. Play the DOD card if you have to. Neuroimaging Center, Arlington Hospital, Arlington, Virginia. Julie Adams woke up in a little tube of metal, found herself immobilized, and felt a little whisper in the edge of her mind. See, I told you so. Then she slipped back into unconsciousness. When she next woke up, she was sitting in a chair, leather straps holding her wrist to the chair arms. Sitting across the table from her was a grandfatherly-looking man, bald but with an enormous white beard. A voice danced across her vision and she said, James Randy? The man raised one eyebrow, dropped it, and continued to regard her over clasped hands. She struggled with the bonds. They told me you'd do this to me, they told me. He spoke, his voice calming and authoritative. Who told you? She'd never been asked that before. Before, they'd always assumed the voices weren't real, that she was crazy. She wasn't crazy, she just heard voices. They did. A warning buzzed across the back of her mind. Don't trust him. He's going to rape you. The man smiled. Have they ever told you who they are? These questions were completely foreign to her. Uh, I... no. His eyes twinkled through his spectacles. 
Well, Julie, we want to help you. We know they've hurt you. We're going to hurt them back, and we'd like your help. It was tempting. She'd always thought of them as enemies, even when they were telling her the truth. But they'd been enemies of her enemies, and so they had been her friends. But now, this man was offering his help to her. To her. Don't listen to them! Screamed a voice, and spots erupted behind her eyes as Randy morphed, grew. Black scales erupted on his face, horns growing from his bald head, his glasses falling to the desk, shattering. Furred bat wings unfurled, spread, brushed the walls and ceiling, looming over her. And now a smell like rotten eggs was strengthening. The room was darkening, and she could hear faint screams in the distance, like a chorus of damned souls. She was dimly aware of her own screaming, of the stabs of pain spiking through her. The thing across the desk was prodding her with a pitchfork, leering at her. It stepped backward and lustily licked its lips, grabbing a giant organ from between its legs and... The hellish scene shimmered and faded suddenly, and the previous scene returned with the bald, grandfatherly man looking concernedly down at her and two men with chiseled faces hovering right above her. One of the men said, Hold still, sister. You're almost safe. There was a prick in her arm, and then she was happy, floating free down toward blessed oblivion. Randy straightened up and looked over toward the door. The psychiatrists and a lab technician were filing through the door. Did you guys get it? Yes, James, we did, said Bullman. Before we hashed the room with electronic white noise, the electronic surveillance system we had set up caught a faint signal. It was a miracle we picked it up at all. It was right on the edge of the spectrum, covered by the ESM, but it was there, and we've recorded it. It has some strange properties, and we're sending the records to the physicists next door. They'll digitize it, feed it into our threat libraries, and we'll be able to monitor for it. Also, if we can feed the waveform into the computers controlling our own emitter systems, we should be able to transmit ourselves. Much more importantly, we've already figured out how to keep her and others like her safe and sound from any further interference. Randy cocked his head curiously. And what's that? Well, James, the signal in question isn't that much different from an electromagnetic pulse. You know, that thing the scare stories have claimed would wipe out electronics worldwide. We've known how to defend against that for decades, and the power levels are much lower here. So, building on that experience. Bullman grinned and pulled a shiny contraption from his lab coat. A hat made of aluminum foil. Recon Team Tango 15, Wadi Haran, Western Iraq. Control, we have a Baldrix column advancing along the pipeline route. Estimated battalion force with company level harpy cover. Very good. Engage and harass. Lieutenant Jade Broomstick Kim acknowledged the transferred her attention back to the mast-mounted site on her AH-6J helicopter. A deft touch on the controls and the aircraft rose slightly, so that the ball of the site just peeked over the ridge. The picture hadn't changed much, even though the column was mounted on the rhino lobsters, they were moving slowly. Well, slowly by United States Army standards, Broomstick guessed that by medieval standards they were fairly galloping along. That was excruciatingly slow when compared with the way the 1st Armored Division was moving up. A long rectangle of rhino lobsters, each with its rider and a small group out in front. They'd have to be the command group, the primary subject of interest, the cream of the crop in this target-rich environment. Eliminate the command structure first, leave the combat elements floundering around without orders. It was a process the United States Army called shaping the battlefield. Tango leader to all tango birds. Select Hellfire missiles. Target the command group in front. Ripple fire both missiles. Spaced out down the wadi, the three little birds gunned their engines slightly and lifted up still further. The column ahead was oblivious to their existence, even when the laser target designators locked into place. On her display, Broomstick could even see the designated targets starting to shift and scratch as the lasers irritated their skins. Then, a gentle squeeze on the firing button, and the first of the hellfires streaked off across the desert. Off to her left, a split second later, Tango 15 Bravo fired its first missile with Tango 15 Charlie following an instant after that. Broomstick had already selected her next target when she fired her second missile. As soon as she saw the explosion from the first hit, she swung the laser to her selected victim and watched the hellfire missile obediently switch targets. The explosions 4,000 yards away seemed an almost continuous rolling thunder as the six missiles devastated the command group. All Tango 15 elements. Job's done. Let's get out of here. 
We got a problem, LT. Broomstick looked across at the burning patch of desert where the Baldrick command group had been. Above it, the harpies were heading for the position of her three little birds, coming in very, very fast. Bug out. Everybody bug out now. Max speed. She rammed the throttles forward, swinging her helicopter into its high-speed position, trying to get away from the cloud of harpies that was closing on her. No good, LT. They're faster than us. Broomstick didn't acknowledge. She didn't have to. The AH-6 could do about 180 miles per hour flat out, and the harpies were closing the range. She pulled back and swung the nose round, flipping her armament selector switch to the pair of stingers mounted on the side of her cockpit. The enunciator tone was mixed. Even in the cold of a desert night, they were having difficulty locking on. It was no good. Whatever lock they had would have to do. She fired into the mass of harpies, watching as one missile went through the formation without exploding. The other struck home, and she saw a harpy briefly outlined in fire as the stinger tore into it. There was another flare as well, but Broomstick had no time to congratulate herself or anybody else. She was turning away, diving, obeying the old rule, no matter how little height you have, trade height for speed. Out of the corner of her eye she saw that Tango 15 Charlie had left it too late. The little bird was engulfed in jets of fire from the harpies, its fuel tanks exploded, and the flaming wreckage fell out of the sky to earth. She was back in the wadi, heading away from the cloud of harpies, grimly aware they were closing in on her. Control, engaged Baldricks. Command group badly hit. We are under attack by company strength harpies. Charlie is already down. Two harpies down. Issue is in doubt. Tell others. Don't close in on harpies. Duty done. Broomstick spun her helicopter again and went straight at the formation of harpies pursuing her her two miniguns blazing a long, long burst. It registered briefly that there were two piles of burning wreckage on the desert floor now, and that she was alone. Bravo had gone. So had at least two more harpies, torn apart by the stream of bullets from her miniguns. Then, there was a clank and silence. She'd run out of ammunition. The harpies were on her, clinging to the airframe, tearing at it with their claws, kicking at the skin with their hooves. One was clinging to the cockpit canopy, smashing at it with its claws, trying to tear its way in. She could see the demented, screaming hate on its face. She could smell the stink of jet fuel as the harpies tore their way into the little bird's structure. That was all she saw and smelt because that was when Tango 15 Alpha exploded. Three hundredth and Ninth Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, Arizona. She was an old lady, put away in her retirement home like all too many aged family members who were just too much trouble to look after. Her age showed in so many ways, her wrinkled skin, shabby appearance, general neglect. Another few months, a year or so at most, and she would have been gone, forgotten. Only now times had changed, and those who had written her off as a relic of the past now found they needed the gray lady again. What about this one? The AMRG clerk looked at the tail number and turned to the page in the ledger. This one's a good prospect, sir. She hasn't been stripped or cannibalized yet, and she was in good condition when she arrived. I'd mark this one down as a definite. Do it. We'll get a team down here to work on her. The draft notices are going out this morning. For once in its life, the U.S. government was beginning to move fast. The reinstitution of the draft had been authorized late the previous night with the highest priority being to get the maintenance and technical support personnel who had left the services over the last few years back into uniform. In a strange way, it was almost like the job being done here, inspecting the veterans and getting them back into service. The B-52G in front of them looked like an early candidate for a return to the colors. How many does that make? Colonel Deegan was in charge of this particular effort. A few hundred yards away, another team was going through the short line of 11 B-1Bs parked in storage. That team wasn't doing well at all. The bones here were in a hell of a mess. It was very doubtful if any of them could be repaired. The B-52s, that was another matter. Still, there had been some pleasant surprises. Tucked away in one corner of the airfield had been a B-52H, along with four B-1Bs and one of the surviving B-1As, all in perfect condition. What the latter was doing there was something of a minor mystery, but it had been rumored for years that more B-1As had been built than the official records showed. There are 43 B-52s in repairable status, sir. Of those, 20 require a medium level of remedial repairs. The remainder, well, they're a real mess. Take months, if not years, to fix them up. 
Shortage of engines is the main problem. They've all been stripped of those, mind you. We're not short of spare parts. That was true enough, Deegan thought. There were 45 more B-52s in the boneyard, but they'd been scrapped. The wreckage was still here, though. The wings shorn from the fuselage, the tails chopped off. I don't suppose there's any chance of fixing the wrecks? No, sir. The technical officer was quite firm on that point. The wing spar's been chopped and the forge to make new ones was scrapped decades ago. Those birds are gone. At best, they're spare parts for the rest. Deegan grimaced. Those planes were badly needed. The technical officer saw the expression and sympathized. Good news, though, sir. The tactical boys have been through the line of F-111s. There's 169 of them here, and they reckon we can salvage enough to equip a group, 50 or 60 if we're lucky. And the transport guys did even better. Lockheed Martin are coming down to refurbish all 20 of the C-5s we have here. In some cases, that would mean almost a new aircraft. It was an old joke. Repairing an aircraft meant lifting up its registration number and sliding a new aircraft underneath. Any word from the Rhino drivers? There were literally hundreds of surplus F-4 Phantoms here, and several teams were working their way through them, trying to find how many could be brought back into service. Not many was one guess, but times were desperate, and at least F-4 components were still in production. That was the second batch of draft notices going out. By tomorrow, a lot of airline pilots were going to be trying on their old Air Force and Navy uniforms again. The technical officer shook his head. Those teams had a lot of work to do, and it would be days before they finished. He scratched his head. The Arizona sun was beating down hard, and the aluminum foil lining his baseball cap was getting uncomfortably hot. Still, it was better than having some baldric invading his mind and turning his thoughts to jelly. Okay, sir. I think we're done with the bombers. You want to have a look at the KC-135s? See if any of those are fixable? Lead on. Deegan looked back at the B-52 behind them. Already, people were starting to go over her in detail, listing all the fixes needed. There were 84 B-52s in USAF service and another 9 in the Air Force Reserve. If they could bring that up to 120 with the aircraft salvaged from here, it would be a decisive step forward. Oval Office, White House, Washington, D.C. Did it pass, Dick? It did indeed. 99 in favor, 1 against. You can guess who that was. Effective as of 1800 hours Washington time, the United States of America has formally declared war on hell. Unconditional declaration, first time we've had one of those for decades. We've issued a conditional ultimatum to heaven as well, unless they open the gates and surrender those who close them for trial within 72 hours. A state of war will exist there as well. Civilian mobilization bill is through, reserves mobilization bill is through, first issue of war bonds will be released tomorrow. Next stage is to mobilize industry. We're making plans for that now. We've got the leaders of our major defense contractors up all night working out what they need and how we can ramp up production. At the moment, we're concentrating on getting ammunition supplies increased. We're expecting to use up our stocks of Hellfire and AMRAAM missiles pretty fast at the rate we're going. As for aircraft, we're hoping Davis Monthan will bridge the gap until upped production rates start to fill the gap. Ships can wait for the time being. Tanks and armored vehicles will be more important at least in the short term. Mr. President? Condoleezza Rice was punctilious about using the president's formal title when other people were around. Condi? President Bush turned around, taking quick note of the Secretary Rice's headgear. Nice hat. Rice smiled in appreciation. She'd been on the telephone to Donna Karen to have her aluminum foil hat designed professionally. After she'd been appointed Secretary of State, one of the satirists had said that her appointment marked the first time in its history when the United States had a Secretary of State who looked good naked. She thought that was a little over the top, but at least she'd always taken pride in her wardrobe. Good news, sir. The Indian ambassador has just told us that the Indian Air Force are sending a combat wing to Iraq. A squadron of Su-30 Mark I interceptors, two of Jaguar ground attack aircraft. Even better, the new Iranian government is opening up its airfields to us. That gives us some badly needed depth. General Petraeus was worried about how close our airfields in Iraq are to the invasion. Word from the Israelis, they're moving up from the east now. Their F-15s will be available to give top cover when we need them. The president nodded. One of the problems in this situation was that the bulk of America's F-15 fleet was grounded with structural problems. That left the country short of heavy fighters. Privately, he wondered if that was a coincidence or not. Just how long had the enemy been planning this assault? 
al habariya Iraq. The clear yellow light was painful to the eyes of beings accustomed to the comforting red skies and dust clouds of hell. Not that there wasn't enough dust here, but it was the choking clouds of silica, not the soft, warm touch of volcanic pumice. The accursed sand was getting into Hornaklish Darmar's hooves, rubbing even his hardened skin raw. Glancing across at the eight demons in his contubernium, he could see they were having the same trouble. When they'd first entered this world, they'd held straight ranks, lined up in perfect parade order, but that had been long abandoned. Now the Legion was straggling, spread out, its ranks tangled as the fitter or less feeling had moved ahead and the lesser spirits had lagged behind. It wasn't as if this area was actually worth the discomfort. On the long march from the portal, the Legion had seen nothing of any value, just the empty desert and the accursed sand. At least now they were approaching some sort of civilization, a collection of huts, so poor that they didn't even have doors, just some sort of blanket hung in the entrance. There were even one of the humans' weird four-wheeled chariots, a white thing with a boxy body at the side of the road, its front wheels crushed and broken, obviously abandoned as the humans had run from the approaching legion. Lords, have mercy on me. I beg you, forgive me for not submitting to you sooner. I was misled by traitors who denied you. Forgive me and accept my obeisance. Up in front of him, Hornaklish Darmar could see the human run out from one of the buildings, an older human, portly and dressed in a flowing robe. He dropped to his knees in front of the legion. Hornaklish Darmar saw the commander of his Octurnia go towards the man, raising his trident to strike him down. Hornaklish Darmar was on his knees, his head ringing from the terrible blast that had suddenly engulfed the human and the demon poised to kill him. The human had gone. Only his head was left, rolling in the dust, leaving a wet trail behind on the sand. The commander of the Octurnia had gone completely, just yellow smears on the ground behind where he had been. Several of his staff were down, screaming, ripped open by the blast. Hornaklish Darmar saw the other demons of the Legion edging away from the scene and the hut from where the man had come. Suddenly the sight alarmed the demon. There was something wrong. Now... Hornaklish Darmar was on his back, and he could see the yellow fluids leaking from his body. His instinct had saved his life, but he was still hurt. Where the truck had been was now just a crater, black, smoking, surrounded by the dead bodies of demons, tens of them, some smashed and pulped beyond recognition, others still demonic in form but dreadfully still. Yet others were worse that dreadful, writhing and threshing with the wounds ripped in them by shrapnel. He pressed his arm into the vicious rip in his skin, feeling the comfort the pressure caused, and looked at the scene again. It had been planned. He could see it now. The first man, the fat one, had caused the demons to crowd back against the truck, pack them around that second huge explosion. It had all been planned, very skillfully planned. Operation Iraqi Freedom Headquarters, Baghdad, Iraq General Petraeus stood before the transmission screen and waited for it to light up with the link from Washington. His briefing would be going direct to the command center in the White House and to as many of the growing list of allies as could be provided with the equipment. Mr. President, sir, my situation report. We have identified the enemy force as eight infantry divisions, three cavalry brigades and one airborne brigade. The enemy main body consists of four infantry divisions and is advancing towards Khan al-Baghdadi. It is preceded by one of the cavalry brigades, supported by an airborne battalion. The cavalry brigade itself is split into three columns, each containing three cavalry battalions, supported by three airborne companies. At the moment, we are falling back in front of that force. We have no wish to engage it at this time. To the north is a flanking force consisting of two infantry divisions. They're moving close to the Syrian border, again with a cavalry brigade in front, supported by harpies. We've been harassing that screening force overnight. I'm sorry to report that the 160th Aviation Brigade took significant losses. At least a dozen AH-6 and MH-6 helicopters were lost to harpies. We've learned from that. The harpies make helicopter operations too dangerous. We're going to have to eliminate them before we can send helicopter-based forces in again. However, their sacrifice was not in vain. We're driving their reconnaissance elements in on the main body, and we've severely hit their command and control structure. We believe we've eliminated a significant proportion of their battalion and brigade-level command staff. 
A brigade of the 1st Armored Division is moving into position around Al Qaim. It's a perfect kill zone. With their recon element driven in, they're heading into it blind. To the south is another screening force, identical to the one in the north. We haven't done much about that one yet, but the British are moving up a mechanized battle group to handle it. We had word from Al-Qaeda a few minutes ago. They hit one of the infantry divisions with a combined suicide and truck bomb attack. They claim to have killed more than 60 Baldricks, including a part of the brigade command group. We can't confirm the numbers, but a global hawk has confirmed the attack. Petraeus paused for a second. Sir, I still can't get used to feeling pleased about an IED incident. Overall, we're about to start the main phase of our defense. We're going to kick the northern and southern screening forces in and push them back on the main body. That will put them in a kill zone west of the Hor al Habania. As we compress them in that area, we'll be hitting them with artillery and all the tactical air we can bring up. If we stop them, we can drive them back across the desert all the way back to the Hellmouth. If we can't stop them there, the only way forward is through two narrow necks of land, north of the Bar al Mil and south of the Buhairat Atharfar. Those are also perfect killing grounds and give us another chance at them. They won't get through? President Bush sounded concerned. The heavily populated Tigris-Euphrates Valley was in the direct path of the advancing Baldrics. No, sir. We'll stop them dead. After a while, all their added numbers means they'll be piling more bodies into the kill zone. The days when an army could be swamped by sheer weight of numbers are gone. The way we're mauling their command structure, once they've started advancing into the killing ground, they won't be able to stop. The sheer pressure of the forces at the rear will drive them forward. General. Rice smiled an apology for the interruption. Be advised, we've just heard from the Russians. They're sending down forces from their southern military region. Armored divisions with battle experience from Chechnya, they're coming through Iran. They'll be with you in a few days. You can count on them for reinforcements. Thank you, ma'am. That's good to know. If you're speaking to the Russians, could you ask them for their Smirch rocket launchers? We need all the Salvo rocket artillery we can get here. Also, their Luna short-range ballistic missiles. We've got attack M's here, but we need something with a bit more reach. I'll do that. The Iranians are promising to send help as well. Any requests? Fuel. That more than anything. We're going to need all the fuel we can get. We can't cope with these Baldricks in a slugging match. We have to maneuver them to death. One thing my people here are asking, why here? For the sort of enemy we're fighting, this is perfect ground for us. No restrictions on maneuver, no civilians to get in the way. We can use every scrap of firepower we've got. So why here? Why not straight into New York or Washington? Come to think of it, why aren't we seeing more Hellmouths opening up anyway? Vice President Cheney leaned forward. We have a theory on that. We think that for some reason the Middle East is where is easiest for them to open the portal. It may be the only place they can open a portal. We don't know. But we think that it's no coincidence that all the reports of monsters, hells, battles between good and evil, etc. start in this area. We don't know, but that's our guess. Anyway, don't knock it. It's better we fight them out there than back here. Petraeus laughed. I've heard that before. Another question, a policy one. We're likely to start taking prisoners soon. What do you want us to do with them? Rice's voice was decisive. Ship them to Gitmo. I thought we were closing that place. We were, but plans changed. It's under international management now. It's being organized by the Italians. Bangladesh is providing the funding, the Germans, the guards, the Russians, the political speeches, the Belgians, the entertainment, the Japanese, the music, and the British are providing the food. Petraeus visibly winced at the thought. Ma'am, that's inhuman. Please, whoever thought that arrangement up, buy them a beer for me. Why, thank you, General. I'll enjoy it. Muncie, Indiana, United States of America. Muncie was a small town, typical of the American Rust Belt. Highly religious, conservative, with 65,000 people before the message and 50,000 after, the city had been ailing even before a quarter of the population had laid down and died. The manufacturing industry had been slowly abandoning the city for decades, leaving it with rusting, overgrown factories, a 23% poverty rate, and a hospital and university as the largest employers. The message had hit the town hard, too, as it had most of the rural, conservative American Midwest, leaving the local economy in shambles and even further down the toilet. Sharon McShirley, newly elected mayor, 
was sitting at her desk in the town hall wondering for the millionth time that day what she was going to do when the telephone rang. She picked it up. Hello, the mayor speaking. The voice was male and unfamiliar. Mrs. McShirley? Yes, may I ask who this is? This is Nathan Feltman, Secretary of Commerce for Indiana. Uh, Mr. Feltman, how can I help you? Mrs. McShirley, I was contacted not five hours ago by Secretary of Commerce Carlos Gutierrez. You know of the message? Of course. And of the developments in Iraq? Of course. It's been all over the news. Secretary Gutierrez has informed me that the United States is immediately shifting to a war economy. I don't know how things will work on the military side, but on the economic side, we're going to be ramping up production as fast as possible. I've already spoken with the mayors of Indianapolis, Gary Hammond, Fort Wayne, Evansville, and Anderson. Do you have a list of production overcapacity and unused assets in Muncie? Yes, we do. We need to compare our list with yours, and then we'll send the updated version to the U.S. Department of Commerce. They'll be asking corporations to buy them up and get working on military equipment. Given Indiana's central location, rail accessibility, and manufacturing history, we'll be up near the top. Feltman gave McShirley the fax number for the Indiana Department of Commerce, and within 20 minutes, the substantial list of old factories, closed-up warehouses, abandoned rail yards, and defunct properties was on its way to Indianapolis. A half hour and two double checks later, it was again winging its way through cyberspace to Washington, D.C., where an Undersecretary of Commerce opened it and copy-pasted its contents into a secure website, open only to the procurement officers of the vast national and international corporations which supplied the U.S. military with its equipment. The next day, McShirley was in her office when the phone rang again. Hello? Mayor Sharon McShirley? Another unfamiliar voice. Speaking. This is John Walker with Borg Warner Automotive. In light of the recent developments, we've decided not to close down the plant in Muncie. Instead, we're retooling it to provide transmissions for tanks. Well, that's certainly happy news. Thank you. The man hung up. McShirley got back to her paperwork, and within a half hour, the phone rang again. Hello? Mayor Sharon McShirley of Muncie. Speaking. I'm James Tarita of General Dynamics Land Systems. We have acquired an older factory in Muncie to build M1A2 parts, and we would like the cooperation of the local government in finding employees and in renovating and retooling the plant as quickly as possible. We'd love to help in any way we can. They discussed the details of the deal for 15 minutes, then hung up. McShirley heaved a sigh. Two in one day. Wow. The phone rang again 15 minutes later. It was General Dynamics Ordnance and Tactical Systems, wanting again cooperation, tax breaks, etc., to get another old plant up and running, this time to manufacture AIM-120C missile casings. McShirley was more than willing to cooperate. Before business hours ended, three more corporations had called. One wanted to acquire land to build a fourth railroad track south through the city. Apparently, it was working on a line south from Chicago to Cincinnati and the Ohio River to supply raw materials from the mines in Minnesota and Ontario down to barges on the Ohio. The second had bought two abandoned warehouses on the south side of Muncie and wanted to open up the old track yard to the warehouses to help supply the rejuvenated factories. The third was applying for a construction permit for the properties northwest of town that had so recently been slated for urban sprawl. 804 South Tillotson Ave, Muncie, Indiana, USA. Jim Schenkel had been a tool machinist for 40 years before being laid off from his longtime job in 2003. He'd elected to retire instead of pursuing another job, and for the past five years he'd followed the same schedule. Up at six, drink his coffee, read the morning paper over toast, an egg, and a glass of orange juice, tend his gardens until lunch, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, monitor his investments and piddle around in his workshop until dinner, eat a bowl of soup, then watch the news until 10. It was 1.30 a.m. when the phone rang. Groggily, he rolled over and picked up the receiver on the sixth ring. Hello? Jim? Jack Roberts here. Jack Roberts was his old supervisor at the ABB factory, before they'd all been fired and the place shut down. Jack? Why the hell are you calling me at... He squinted at the clock. 1.30 in the morning? Jim, you're rehired. We need you in tomorrow morning at 6.30. What the hell's going on, Jack? The factory's been started back up for the war effort. We need all the equipment repaired and retooled. The management wants the lines rolling in a week. The hell? I'm retired, goddammit. 
Like I said, we need you back. To be blunt, Jim, you don't have a choice. We'll send men out to get you if you can't make it on your own. I don't give a... He stared at the receiver, listening to the audible dial tone. The next morning at 6.30, he pulled into the parking lot of the ABB factory on the south side of town and stared. It was packed with cars, and people were streaming toward the factory. The factory itself was brightly lit. The loading docks were packed with semis, and parts were already starting to form small piles waiting to be taken inside. He parked his car and joined the flow of humanity heading back to work. That morning, the Star Press headlines read, Look out, Baldricks, here comes Muncie. That day, the mayor's office received eight more phone calls from corporations, and the first semis and trains started to roll into the city as construction equipment started to move away from the university, which had agreed to put its new dorm on hold for the time being to aid in the war effort, and toward the old, broken-down factories. Overnight, the city had been transformed. And it wasn't alone. All across the eastern Midwest, the Rust Belt was being deoxidized. Surveyors were entering old factories, cleaning companies entering and sweeping up dust, weeds being cleared and broken windows replaced. Lights that hadn't shown for decades were being turned on and replaced. Cars were parking in lots that were more grass than gravel and hadn't been touched by tires for 30 years. More and more trains were rolling out of yards and thundering down the immense but ailing network of tracks connecting American cities to each other and tractor-trailer semis were moving down the highways in huge fleets, carrying piping and wires and tools and other implements of the new war economy. If Satan could have looked up from hell and seen this, if he had wanted to learn about his enemies, if he had been capable of comprehending the vast network of the U.S. economy and felt the rage at betrayal coursing through the collective veins of that nation, he might have felt that he was seeing the first traces of life in the resurrection of a giant long dead. But in the next dimension sitting on his throne, lording over his sulfurous domain, and trying to figure out how fifteen of the senior generals in Abigor's army had spontaneously exploded, these thoughts never even occurred to him. Ignorance is bliss until the first bombs start dropping. Moscow, Russia And these changes were hardly unique to the U.S. In Russia, Vladimir Putin had immediately accelerated the redevelopment of the military, Old factories closed during the economic woes of the 1990s were being reopened. Old mines and oil wells were being rechecked for viability. The storage depots and military installations were being searched for equipment, tanks, armored carriers. Artillery that had been sitting in storage for a decade or more was being refurbished. New tracks were being laid, and the first of tens of thousands of new T-90S tanks were rolling off the final assembly lines, even as he walked toward this meeting flanked by security forces. Putin entered the church and crossed himself before the altar before he turned to the men gathered there, about ten in all, the heads of the Russian mob. He spoke first, taking charge, as always. Gentlemen, you are not stupid. You know why I've gathered you here today. They all nodded with varying degrees of alacrity. Putin continued. Now the human species faces a threat greater than anything it has ever faced in its past. We, I and all of you, face not just extinction, but eternal damnation. This is now our reality. He paused to evaluate what he saw in their faces. Blank, hard, determined. They share the vision, he reminded himself, just like every live human now. Therefore, in return for amnesty from prosecution for any crimes which may have been committed prior to the message, I would like to request that all of you cease from any illegal activities in which you may now be engaged. There was a small stir in the room. One, a fat man with an unlit cigar drooping from his lips, spoke. Sir, with all due respect, why do you take us for criminals? As he spoke, Putin fixed him with a lidless stare until the other man dropped his gaze. We are not stupid, you nor I. You know that I called you here today. You know that I am aware of who you all are in actuality and where you may be found. These things are not unknown to the government. Then why are we guaranteed amnesty? because the fabric of society must not buckle during this war. All of you are hard men. We need such men to help prepare our society for the terrors of a war on the very forces of hell. And we will need such men to administer the territories of hell once it has been conquered. I am asking all of you to become respectable, but I am not asking you to lose profits. That seemed to seal it for most of them. As he walked away, Putin allowed himself a thin smile. Russia would show the world what she was capable of, 
and Russia would play her part in fighting eternal damnation now and forever. The Fifth Circle of Hell Lieutenant Jade Kim tried to move. She was stretched out on some form of frame, her wrist secured by an iron shackle with a heavy spike driven through the palm of her hands. The pain caused by her moving was severe, but that was the least of her problems. She was submerged in a ghastly mass that seemed to be comprised of equal portions of mud, toxic waste, and raw sewage. She was drowning in it, only able to breathe by the occasional drafts of air as the movement of the foul swamp briefly exposed her face. She had no idea how long she'd been here, but she did know she'd be in this place for eternity unless she did something about it. Or worse, she might be hauled out for another dose of the treatment she'd got when she had arrived. Gang rape was so unimaginative, but she knew that if she hadn't already been dead, the internal damage the Baldricks had done would have killed her. Time for applying the lessons driven home at Seer School. The drill taught by the instructors, survive, evade, resist, and escape. Lesson in part four was that all bonds would loosen in time if worked on. Of course, she'd never been nailed down at Seer. The spike through her hand was the first problem. Until that was out, she couldn't do much else. She twisted her hand around, trying to get a grip on the spike, succeeded even though the effort sent waves of pain up her arm. Then she started to rock it from side to side. She had no idea how long she kept trying for, it seemed like forever, but suddenly she was aware the spike was moving slightly with her pressure. Encouraged, she kept up the effort, feeling the motion increasing as the spike worked free. Then at last it was loose and she worked it up through her fingers, exquisitely careful not to drop it. Who knew how deep this foul muck was and anything dropped would never be found again. But with the spike free, she had a lever at last. Still with painstaking care, she worked it around and pushed it under the iron bracket that held her wrist down. Once more she started to push, levering the bracket away from its frame. In time it loosened, and she took a deep breath. The way she had been taught, she crossed her thumb over the palm of her hand and wrenched. Her hand slid under the shackle, scraping skin off in the process, but her arm was free. That made levering the rest of the ironwork off her much, much easier. Her arms and legs freed, she was able to move, and she now had four spikes as weapons. The sight once she got her head out of the muck was grim, some sort of river meandering through the gray, foul-smelling wasteland. Enough to fill anybody with despair, which was, she supposed, quite intentional. There were rocky outcrops from the swamp, breaking the featureless plain, but they didn't matter too much right now. She'd survived and escaped. Now it was time to evade. She stood, sinking in the foul mess up to her waist, and started to make her way to one of the rocks. It would be a start, but she'd only managed a few feet when she bumped into another cross under the mud. Instinctively, she reached down to clean the filth off the face of the victim. Hi, LT. It was McInery the pilot of Tango 1-5 Charlie. Hi, Mac. Hold tight. I'll help you get out of this. With her spikes as levers, she was able to pry the shackles off quickly. Salvage the spikes. We're going to need them. She looked around quickly. It suddenly occurred to her that all the members of her unit would probably be close at hand. It didn't take long to prove that correct, and not much longer to get the six members of Recon Team Tango 1-5 out. You're out of uniform, LT. McInery noted the fact casually. Kim looked at him and laughed. The first time that sound had been heard here for longer than anybody could remember. So are you, Sergeant. She reached out and quickly drew three chevrons on his bare arm, using the mud that coated them all. There, that's better. You okay, LT? Robinson, her co-pilot on Tango 15 Alpha, spoke with pity in his voice, another thing that had never been heard for longer than anybody knew. Kim glanced down. The damage the demons had done to her was obvious, even though the wounds were healing unnaturally fast. Won't do much good for my future sex life. Then her voice caught and shook as the memory quickly overwhelmed her. It wasn't the size. It was the barbs. Then she shook herself. It was gone. Past. Now was time for the group to evade. Only something else got in the way. Or to be more precise, the supervisor of this area did. Eurakaflaxis was doing his routine rounds, amusing himself by disemboweling some of the humans choking in the swamp. In truth, he wasn't paying much attention to his surroundings. He'd been doing this round for millennia. He heard something. That wasn't unusual. Moans, screams, wails. All were quite familiar to him. Only this sounded like a human woman yelling, Take him down! Then six figures smacked into him, knocking him over and swarming on top of him. Jerica Flaxus couldn't believe it. 
They were humans. What were free humans doing here? They were slamming metal spikes into him, keeping him pinned down as he floundered in the mud. One of the humans was the woman he and his friends had enjoyed not so long ago. She had a spike in her hand and he could see the gratification in her eyes as she started her swing. Then, he could see nothing because they'd driven their spikes into his eyes, and he was blinded. Kim looked down at the torn, shattered body. Rage, hatred, and Krav Maga had killed Jerrica Flaxus, killed him dead. So started the resist bit of Seer. Well done, boys. Get him over to the rock there. They dragged the body over. Then Kim drove spikes through its hands, crucifying it against the outcrop. Then, she dipped her hand in its green blood and painted four letters over the scene. PFLH? McInery was confused. People's Front for the Liberation of Hell. Kim grinned savagely. That's us, boys. Let's tear this place apart. Wadi al Kir, Western Iraq. Memnon hissed softly and sniffed the remains of his companions. Grostith and Hezbatari had been flying next to him, soaring on the very ethers of this world, savoring the panic and the fear. It was like the sweetest nectar to their refined senses. These monkeys were clever little things, they always had been, but who would have imagined they would have come so far as to fly themselves in chariots of steel and plastic? Plastic. Memnon snorted in confusion. What was it? It was hard like metal, yet he could divine nothing of the earth from it. No metal, no ore. It had no elemental song within itself. It did not sing. It did not even hum. It was a dead thing, this plastic, that only told him its name and nothing more. Yet these chariots of steel and plastic had been so very deadly, yes. Unleashing arrows of fire and steel that tore through ethereal flesh with rude abruptness and unerring accuracy, his wingmates were overcome. Graustith barely had time to chant its challenge to the once born. The arrows tore him into this pool of viscera and smoking bone. Memnon groaned slightly as his ruined left shoulder began throbbing again, ephemeral essence gelling and congealing over the gaping wound where his massive leathery wings had been. The chariots had eyes and they were not fooled. It had taken all of his will to overcome the pain and panic as another human arrow of steel and fire had pinned him between his once proud wings. Hezbatari was dead as well, the leering face plastered against the cracked tree trunk to his left. The rest of the demonic form was sprayed in a smoldering mess splashed among the treetops and underbrush. You're a fool, Hezbatari. Memnon growled as he made it up to his cloven hooves and steadied himself. Above him he still heard the chariots roaring triumphantly as they raced away after having circled over his clearing these last few minutes. His senses smelled the approaching monkeys before he heard them, and he licked his lips. He smelled more plastic and steel, and he knew they were armed with weapons that wounded far worse than simple steel swords and spears. It did not matter. Briefly it was like the old days. He had the advantage. He had their minds before they even knew he was there. These ones were not like the others, the ones whose minds seemed shielded by something he couldn't explain. These ones, the ones in the long robes, were vulnerable still. He held their minds in his hands and carefully formed the image of himself, transparent, invisible in his own. They would see what he wanted them to, and that was nothing. He let loose a deep, throaty laugh like some predator from this world's bygone days. Memnon liked to play with his food. It was time for his pound of flesh. The first monkey peered over some underbrush, carefully keeping his crafted spear of plastic and steel before him like a talisman. Memnon stood imperiously, arms crossed and quietly waited as more of them approached tentative and fearful. Some whispered curses as they saw the charred remains of his wingmates blasted all over the clearing. Several were easily within an arm's length of the never-born as it watched them with cold satisfaction. Twelve of them in all moved in tight formation into the clearing. What an auspicious number, Memnon mused. Arabic. The language was Arabic. His gift of tongues was perfect as he listened to the monkeys musing and whispering as they examined the remains of his wing brothers. By the time the clouds overhead lifted and the sun shone down on these fields, the ephemeral flesh and bone would boil and hiss away. One of them lifted a box to his ears and spoke into it. He could feel the ether sparking around him and trilling with voices. They were communicating over distances without seeing their audience. He had heard of this phenomenon from those who dared venture into this plane. He did not believe it until now. Clever little monkeys, you have come far. 
He finally spoke, breaking the silence in perfect flawless Arabic save for the omnipresent low growl that undercut every syllable. Some of the Al-Qaeda men whirled around and began firing wildly. They could not see him. No matter. It was time for his pound of flesh. One of the humans stared dumbly down at his chest as a taloned claw erupted from his chest in a gruesome spray of crimson gore and bone. The soldier's eyes focused on the still-beating heart held in the claws like an obscene flower before dimming forever. Memnon shuddered in near-orgasmic joy as he felt the passage of the essence through him and into the depths of his realm. The fallen soldier's fellows screamed incomprehensibly in a panic, some fumbling for grenades and others were firing into the smoky form dancing along the edges of their perceptions. They heard the guttural chant of challenge from their unseen attacker, and some of them found their bowels turned to water, and fear gripped them as surely as the talon gripped the hapless soldier's heart. They had come to set up another roadside bomb, to strike another blow at the Satans who had invaded Earth, but it was they who had been ambushed. Memnon's eyes rolled into the back of his head like a great white shark's revealing black within black eyes, lifeless, like a doll's eyes, and he descended upon the children of Seth, and ravaged them as only the Neverborn could with divine fury and hunger. Their screams could be heard for kilometers, and then there was only a sudden still silence. Wadi al Jaram, Western Iraq. Now hollow fires burn out to black, and lights are guttering low. Square your shoulders, lift your pack, and leave your friends and go. Oh, never fear, man, naught's to dread. Look not to left nor right. In all the endless road you tread, there's nothing but the night. Sorry, sir. Houseman poem called A Shropshire Lad, about the kids who died fighting for Queen Victoria in far-off parts of the empire. How they left home and died for thirteen pence a day. His theme was that they couldn't see what they were dying for, or the point of it all. We're spared that. We know what we're fighting for here. Brigadier John Carlson glanced down at his watch. Today. When dawn comes, we will be fighting for everything there is to fight for. There's literally nothing we won't be fighting for. That's not true, sir. Simon Devere Cole, Carlson's ADC, was speaking equally softly. We're not fighting for God. Queen and country, yes. Our people, yes. The whole of humanity, yes. But not God. Never again. We stand for ourselves this day. On our own two feet. The men are saying it's about time, too. That's good. I wish there were just a few more of them. That was the truth. Carlson had the British Brigade here. The Royal Dragoon Guards, a regiment of Challenger II tanks, were dug in along the ridge line, with the 1st Duke of Lancaster and 1st Mersion, two battalions of mechanized infantry with their warrior armored carriers beside them. From the front, all that could be seen of them was the tops of their turrets peeking over the ridge. From behind, the tanks were sitting in open-backed revetments so they could fall back from this position to the next. Carlson looked up at the stars overhead. It was a trite cliché that looking up at them made man and his work seem insignificant, and now it was a false cliché as well. For today, man's works made the heavens themselves insignificant, and Carlson had just a regiment of tanks and two battalions of mechanized infantry, plus his artillery batteries, of course, and a lot of engineers. One advantage of a peacekeeping mission was that there were a lot of civilian development projects involved, and they had needed engineers. Those engineers had been hard at work for the last few days. Out in front, he could see the result of their labors. A shimmering river that stretched north and south as far as he could see, glistening gently in the moonlight. It was a beautiful sight if one didn't know what the Silver River was. To those who had seen what razor wire could do, it glimmered with evil promise. Yet even worse was what nobody could see until it was too late. The thousands of anti-personnel and anti-tank mines sewn across the front. Carlson's plan was quite simple. All good military plans were. He would break the enemy attack on the minefields and wire while his artillery poured fire into the mass of enemy hung up in front of him. As they broke through the mines and wire, as they surely would, his tanks would slaughter them while the infantry protected the tanks. The wire and the mines were his force multiplier, the thing that would allow him to stand against the force threatening him. He ran those figures through his mind as well. 93,300 infantry, 6,666 cavalry, 2,187 harpies, less those killed by attrition in the long march to contact. Against them, he had just over 8,000 men. The government in the UK had promised him more, but they were a long time coming, 
years of British underspending on defense had seen to that. Those years were gone, but even with the government printing all the money it needed for the war effort, it would take time for the added production to reach the front. The RAF had only four C-17 transports, and their first priority had been to fly aluminum foil out to the theater. Every man in his force now had his helmet lined with aluminum foil, and the people in the rear were handing rolls of the stuff out to the civilians. In a strange way, this was already shaping up to be one of the great logistics achievements of the war. A concerted effort to give every human on earth his own aluminum foil hat. Carlson chuckled. He suddenly had a picture of aluminum haberdashery becoming a study topic at Sandhurst. Sir, General Ferry Dunes Olfagari to see you. Devere Cole interrupted the train of thought. General, sir. Carlson snapped out the salute. The Iranian general returned it punctiliously. I think you will be pleased to see me, Brigadier. The English was excellent. I have brought with me the Shamshar Armored Division. Three of my regiments of T-72s, 324 tanks, are moving into position along your left while we speak, supported by a regiment of armored infantry, 108 BMP-1s. We have not the excellent position you have here, but the Global Hawks tell us the enemy will strike your position first. When they die on your wire, we think they will try and flank you. They cannot go to your right. The Hawar al hamar prevents that. They must go to the left, right into the guns of my tanks and artillery. We're more than pleased to see you, General. You're a sight for sore eyes. We're expecting to get hit after dawn. That glow on the horizon? It's the Baldrick's campfires. A thought occurred to Carlson. Have all your men aluminum foil for their helmets? We have plenty if you are in need. The Americans gave us enough, thank you. But I will spread word. If any of my units are short, we will come to you. If I may offer you some help in return, you are very light on anti-aircraft here. I have an extra anti-aircraft regiment. The Shamshar is a composite division, made up from what is left of all four of our southern armoured divisions. So many of our men went when the message was sent. We could not support all the units we had. At least it means we are not short of frontline equipment for those we have left. I would be honoured if you would accept the attachment of the regiment to your force. It has SA-8 missiles and ZSU-23-4 guns. Thank you. I am honoured to accept. General, I was about to have some tea, a little fruit. It is poor refreshment to offer a comrade in arms, but perhaps you would deign to join us? I would prefer a glass of the whiskey for which your Scots are so famous. Carlson lifted an eyebrow and Zolfagari smiled gently. The pact is broken. The commandments do not apply. Now we have faith only in our tanks and guns. Like any good ADC, Devere Cole had anticipated his brigadier's needs, and a bottle of 18-year-old Lafroig had appeared. He measured out glasses for the two officers. Oh, come on, Simon. Pour one for yourself as well. Thank you, sir. To the morrow and may the day be ours. Carlson's voice rang across the moonlit desert. And to our arms, may we bring honor to our countries and those we fight beside. Headquarters, Multinational Force Iraq, Green Zone Baghdad. General Petraeus stood in front of the great screen that showed the disposition of forces in Iraq. Viewed one way, what he was about to do was committing an act of mass murder. The thought made him chuckle quietly to himself. A long time ago he'd held a press conference and the subject of night vision equipment had come up. The American officer behind the podium had explained how the U.S. Army had night vision equipment that enabled them to fight a 24-hour battle while their enemy didn't have anything approaching that capability. One journalist had been greatly angered by that and had launched a tirade about how the one-sided night fighting capability wasn't fair. Well, what was happening now wasn't fair either. The screen showed the disposition and order of battle of the hellish forces in great detail. The Predators and Global Hawks were doing sterling work, tracking every move the Baldricks made. Zoom down far enough and the display could show how and where individual Baldricks were deploying and spending their time. It was painfully obvious that the Baldricks had no such capability. They were charging headfirst into a trap, unwavering, unconcerned with what the humans were doing. Petraeus was doing his best to help them. His aircraft had been carefully hitting the command structure of the enemy forces, slowly but surely breaking up their ability to adapt to changing circumstances. It was far worse even than that. The Baldricks were moving slowly. As a professional, Petraeus recognized them for what they were, an infantry army that moved like one, slowly, 
ponderously. They had their cavalry out as screens, of course, but it was a myth that cavalry forces could move much faster than leg infantry. They could in a tactical sense, but the difference strategically was marginal at best. The harpies had been more of a worry. There had been an effort to use them as an advance guard, but they'd been shot out of the sky by the F-16s based at Kirkuk and in Serlik. The small detachments, usually three at a time, hadn't stood a chance against the fast jets, and after a while, their commander had stopped sending them out. In contrast, the Allied forces were mobile almost to the point of insanity. They could slash at an enemy formation, disengage, regroup, and slash again, while their enemy was still wondering what to do about the first attack. Petraeus had moved the whole of his first armored division against the northern flanking force. Petraeus grimaced. The northern force was identical to that bearing down on the British brigade, but the British formation was the weakest of all of his combat groups. It was a calculated risk, nobody could be strong everywhere, and the British position was the easiest to defend in depth. If the Baldrics broke through there, Petraeus had two brigades of the 4th Infantry Division north of the battle area and the 82nd Airborne in Kuwait, ready to pinch off the breakthrough. In the center, Petraeus had positioned his 25th Mechanized Infantry Division, the 10th Mountain Division, and the 15th Marine Expeditionary Brigade. They were his stop line, intended to hold the main body of the Baldric force. Only Petraeus didn't intend to stop them. If the Baldric commander had anything like the command capabilities at Petraeus's disposal, he could have seen what the American general actually had in mind. The main body of the Baldric force would indeed be pinned on the American corps in front of Baghdad, but while they threshed there, the Allied northern and southern forces would be closing in on their flanks and rear. By the time they realized what was happening, the racing tanks of the first armored would be between them and the Hellmouth. It had all the makings of a military catastrophe. Petraeus knew that if he pulled this off, it would go down as one of the greatest envelopments of all time, comparable with those the Germans had pulled off at the start of their war with Russia. That was one of the things that made Petraeus uneasy. For all the scale of those early victories, the Germans had lost the war with Russia, and most skilled strategists knew that they had never really had a chance of doing otherwise. What was facing the Baldrics was an unparalleled military disaster, yet Petraeus knew in his heart that this was just the opening move. He had no idea of the military resources hell could throw at Earth, and until he had a handle on that data, he was fighting blind. All he could do was make sure the casualty rate was as lopsided as possible. Sir, message just in. The Iranian Shamshar division is arriving and taking up position to the south of the British. They'll be in defensive position by dawn. General Zolfagari has ceded operational command of the defense to Brigadier Carlson as officer in position. Thank you, Charles. Send my compliments to the general and my appreciation of an advance to contact well executed. There was more to that message than met the eye, and the recipient would know it. Ceding overall command to an officer of lesser rank had been a magnanimous gesture, one that spoke volumes about the character of the Iranian general. Privately, Petraeus promised himself that he would see Zolfagari received full credit for his part in this operation. Then his mind went back to the battle that was about to unfold. What could go wrong? What hadn't he foreseen? What were his options when everything dropped in the pot? He looked again at the huge display on the wall. Four new symbols had just appeared, the Iranian regiments covering the southern flank of the British brigade. Everything was set up. The pieces were in position. Behind the Allied lines, the truck convoys with their supplies of ammunition and fuel were waiting to support the lunge forward. With them were his reserves, striker brigades, more mechanized infantry. Again Petraeus reflected on just how unfair this battle was going to be. A human general would have known how and where the great ambush would be mounted. To a human, brought up on armored warfare and battles of maneuver, the Iraqi road network made the positions and deployments entirely predictable. The Baldrics painfully obviously had no concept of those matters. Truly, this was a Bronze Age army fighting a force from the 21st century. That didn't change the fact that this was a literally hellishly big Bronze Age army. I'm going outside for a few minutes. Get some fresh air. Petraeus spoke to his deputy, settled his aluminum-lined baseball cap on his head, and left the command center, his bodyguards following. Outside, it was still night, the stars shining brightly down. In front of the command building sat four of the hulking M1A2 Abrams tanks, silent shadows in the darkness. 
Petraeus walked over to them, absent-mindedly returning the salutes from their crews as he racked his brain trying to think of outcomes and eventualities that might have missed his attention. It was no good. As far as he could see, he'd done all he could. It was time to rest and let the battle unfold. Then he patted the massive sloping armor of the nearest tank. Well, honey bunny, it's all down to you and yours now. Headquarters, Army of Abigor, Western Iraq. Abigor stood over the wooden table looking down at the parchment scroll that was pinned to it. It was a map of the area, with thick lines drawn on it, representing his forces as they fanned out across the countryside. His plan was simple, three thrusts, each aimed at a major population center. The city called Kirkuk in the north, Baghdad in the center, Basra to the south. His mounted troops would brush any enemy opposition out of the way and leave the cities isolated. Then, his infantry would besiege them, cut off their supplies and starve the defenders. When the cities collapsed, they would storm the walls and ravage the inhabitants amid scenes of horror that would panic the remaining humans. They would stream away from his advance amid utter terror, and he would slaughter them while they did so. Humanity would die screaming for its defiance, as it should. Where to go next? Once the fertile crescent of the Tigris-Euphrates had been cleared, what to do? Keep heading east into Persia, or head west towards Jerusalem? Ravaging the area the humans called the Holy Land would be satisfying, and it would give Satan an opportunity to goad Yahweh over the fate of his chosen people. That made Abigor grin. How could the humans have believed Yahweh for so long? Accepting every bit of good fortune that came their way as one of his gifts, dismissing every disaster as a test or trial. Abigor couldn't help but think that humans must be terminally deluded. Perhaps that was why they were resisting now. They were hoping their Yahweh would change his mind and come to aid them. They were in for a disappointment if they were, it simply wasn't happening. Abigor tapped the parchment with a claw, thoughts irritating the outer edges of his mind. Just why did his commanders keep exploding? Obviously the humans had something to do with it. Putting things together, it had become obvious that the commanders exploded when the humans' flying chariots were around. Yet how? The chariots flew so high up they could hardly be seen. Sometimes the only clue they were there was the great white streak they left across the sky. How could they hit so precisely from so high? It was impossible. Abigor's customary scowl deepened. Perhaps it wasn't the humans after all. Promotion by assassinating one's superiors was a well-known tactic in hell, smiles upon as long as it was successful. A commander who couldn't even protect himself was unfit to be in a position of authority. And yet, and yet. Some commanders had noted another pattern. It was always the leaders who rode ahead of their command, their banners flying proudly that died. Some had started to hide themselves in their units, keeping their banners furled and marching on foot like the rest. It showed lack of pride and hurt the morale of the units, but those commanders lived. Problems. More problems. The truth was that Abigor wasn't quite sure where his units were or how much resistance they were facing. The distance he and his kind could read minds was limited to line of sight, and with so many dead commanders lost from his ranks, communications were spotty at best. He'd tried sending out small groups of the flying demons to get information on the positions of his units, but the human flying chariots had killed them. Those flying chariots were a nuisance. They'd made the demonic flyers too vulnerable to use except in large groups. Just how did humans get them to fly so high or move so fast? Some of them were so quick they arrived before their noise could be heard. Abigor stretched and walked outside his tent, his clawed feet clicking on the stones in the sand. Above him, the stars shone brightly, their light apparently amplified by the clear, dry desert skies. That was a unique thing about this dimension. Abigor's home had no stars, no planets, not like these. It was a place that existed in and of itself, self-contained and alone. Heaven was the same, another self-contained, isolated entity that was complete within itself, bubbles in a formless void. Idly, Abigor wondered what would happen to this planet once the humans on it had been harvested. It would make a nice private retreat for his personal use. Would Satan allow him to keep it? He had conquered it after all. In his heart, he knew that would not be the case. Satan wouldn't allow any of this realm to establish a presence outside it, for to do so would be to give them the chance of establishing a power base independent of his reign. This planet would be abandoned, left to develop without humans. 
perhaps to see another species of intelligent life develop and in its turn be harvested to serve the beings from the higher dimension. Abigor had heard that there were creatures living in the sea that were almost as intelligent as humans. Another problem, another worry that flittered on the edge of his mind. He and his kind were used to being able to read human minds and control their thoughts, even across the dimensional rift. Once he and one of Yahweh's angels had held a competition to see who could cause the most minor fatal accidents in one day. He'd won that, 106 to 102. But now, it was becoming harder and harder to find humans who could be affected by the demon's mind control. Something was getting in the way. Something was stopping the demons possessing the minds of anybody they chose. Already nearly all the important people, the leaders, their minds were closed off. Even the lesser people, the peasants, were becoming immune. It was so hard to find one who could be possessed now. Abigor shook himself. Why was he worrying? A few days and it would all be over. Humanity would be a panicked mass, fleeing for its survival, and a few days beyond that it would be gone forever. There wasn't any point in worrying about details. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia, Western Iraq. Time to mount up. Guardsman Bass finished the last of his tea and shook his mug over the sand. His challenger, too, was ready to move. One of the 56 tanks lined up along the ridge. It was still dark but the eastern horizon was glowing red as the sun approached. That's why the tanks were along this ridge. With the sun behind them, the Baldricks would be advancing with the glare of the dawn directly in their eyes. It was a small point, perhaps, but the officers were paid to think of things like that. He climbed up onto his tank and slid into the turret beside the 120mm gun, settling comfortably into the familiar seat. Boiling vessel on? The loader nodded. The tank was going to seal down. They'd fight that way. Nobody knew what the Baldricks would do when they found themselves under fire, so orders were to expect the worst and make sure the tea urn was ready to use. Bass felt his ears click as the positive pressure system powered up. The air inside the tank was at a higher pressure than that outside, so that if there were any leaks in the tank, the flow would be out, not in. They had rations, everything they needed without depending on the outside world. They even had some empty cases from the artillery, so they could relieve themselves without leaving their armored home. Saber 1 actual. Lieutenant McLeod's voice was calm, studied. All Saber 1 units, confirm sealed down. Bass thumbed his transmitter button. Saber 1 2, sealed down. Very good. Recon tells us the Baldricks are moving straight at us. There was immense satisfaction in the lieutenant's voice now. Straight at us meant straight into the minefields and onto the razor wire. We will be opening fire at 5,000 meters with Hesh. Aim shots only, boys. We can't waste ammunition. Hold fast. The last words were McLeod's family motto, repeated with almost boyish enthusiasm. Young officer's base thought, a little patronizingly, a little sadly. So keen, so likely to die. You heard our lieutenant. Load Hesh. Up. Oh. The one word meant that the 120mm gun was loaded, ready to fire. Bass leaned forward slightly and peered through his commander's periscope. Even in the brief time since they'd mounted up, the sun had risen enough to start lighting the battle area. Across the dunes, Bass saw a section of the horizon turn black. Baldrick's crossing it in strength, a great square of them. He knew the numbers, 81 ranks, each of 81 Baldrick's. This was the cavalry, their advance guard. As he watched, the great square changed, splitting into three rectangles, the two at the rear moving up either side of the lead so they formed an extended line. Then the rectangles split again, into three sections, one behind the other. The numbers played in Bass's head, 709 in each sections, almost 2,200 in each of the three closely packed waves. This would be a bloody day. Bass had read the intelligence on the Baldricks and of their wild primary color blood. So what color would the blood be? They're charging by battalion. Bass lays the formations that were approaching at steadily increasing speed. Range 17,500 meters. They're not holding formation very well. No discipline there at all. A critical point. A charge had to hit as a solid blow. A fist formed of every available asset. If the charging cavalry were ill-disciplined enough to allow their formation to break, the strength of the blow would be much reduced. F-14A Tomcat over the Albadia Al-Janubia. Western Iraq. Lion Leader, the enemy are moving. 
Engage airborne threats as detected. Lieutenant Hushank Sadiq looked around at the other Tomcats making up his formation. The last weeks had been strange. After decades of sour hostility, the airfields around Desful had seen a constant stream of C-5 and C-17 transports landing as the Americans shipped in supplies of spare parts for the Iranian Air Force. Not just spares, stocks of AIM-54C missiles for the F-14s that had done without for so long, and even better, American technical service teams, Tiger teams, to bring the Tomcats back up to full serviceability. Aircraft that had been stripped hangar queens for years had been towed out and were being repaired. Sadi's Tomcat had been upgraded by a team led by a retired Navy maintenance chief who had been drafted out of his civilian job. Now, more things worked on the aircraft than they had for years. Be advised, Indian Air Force Su-30s are closing on your position from Omidia. Another change, Iran's airfields were crowded with aircraft from all the surrounding countries, a weird mixture of types and technologies. It was lucky the American AWACS birds were up, keeping sense of it all. F-15s approaching from King Khalid military city. The American controller tactfully didn't mention that the F-15s had been Saudi until quite recently. The Saudis had been terribly hit by the message. A huge percentage of their population had just died. Typical of the Sunnis, thought Sidi, who then mentally kicked himself. The time for that nonsense had gone. It didn't matter anymore. How could he rail against unbelievers when everything he had believed in was a proven, demonstrated lie? Anyway, the Americans had repossessed the Saudi Air Force, although it did seem that, even before they had done so, a surprising number of Saudi pilots answered to the name of Bubba, or Jim Bob. We have the first target group on scan now. They are stacked behind leading ground element. Estimated number approximately 950. Lion group will engage. Fire at will. Sadiq swelled with satisfaction. His 24 F-14As were Lion Group. They would fire the first shots of the Battle of Al-Badiyah Al-Janubiyah. 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division, Tel Ash Shair, Northern Iraq. It's starting. Colonel Sean McFarland looked at the electronic displays in his command center. He'd zoomed in on Al-Badiyah Al-Janubiyah, where the map was showing the first of the Baldrick formations moving up. They were leading with their cavalry down there, just like they were doing here. McFarland zoomed out, moved his point of display up to Tel Ash Shair, then flipped the display mode from synthetic to raw video. The pictures from the Global Hawk showed the Baldrick cavalry shift from a solid block to a column of three long lines. The British had placed their faith in wire and minefields to stop the initial push, but McFarland was relying on his artillery. It wasn't as if he was short of it. Command Sergeant Major Frank L. Graham picked up the microphone. All ready first units. Now hear this. The enemy is moving. These are the bastards who thought we'd just knuckle under to their wishes. Well, they're wrong, and we're going to show them just how wrong. We're going to teach them what American values stand for. We'll show them the meaning of truth, justice, and the American way. And by the last of those, I mean, of course, mindless, indiscriminate violence. There was a chortle of laughter at the crack. So show them just how much violence old Ironsides can do when we put our minds to it. He put the microphone down. The MLRs and Paladin batteries are waiting, sir. Just give the word. Cavalry Legion. Right flank of the Army of Abagor. al badia al Janubia, Western Iraq. Vishara Koramal kept his beast in hand, trying to keep lined up with the other members of his unit. It was hard. The great beast wanted to surge ahead, their claws snapping in anticipation of biting into flesh, their tails arched up, ready to strike. Ahead of him, the first rank was already breaking into a gallop, the beasts covering the ground with great loping strides. The second rank were into the trot, waiting for the order so they too could start their charge. Vishara Koromol's third rank was still at the pace. Their turn had not come yet. Far ahead of him, he could see a strange, shimmering cloud that seemed to stretch across the battlefield. Odd, but then this human world was full of surprises. It wasn't the way they'd expected it to be. It was time. His beast broke into its trot as the lines in front shifted to the gallop. The waves had spaced out, the gaps between them lengthening as the beasts accelerated to full speed, their riders letting them have their head in the race to gain the honor of being the first to crash through the enemy lines. Then, the surge and the pounding in his rear end as his beast went into the gallop, its head stretching out as its muscles pushed it faster towards the enemy. Vishara Koramal sneered at the enemy in front, 
Instead of forming up in the open where they could fly their banners and show their defiance like proper warriors, they were hiding behind the hill crests. Not that hiding would save the humans. In front of him, the first wave was nearing the shimmering river. Then the earth opened up and swallowed them. F-14A Tomcat over the Al-Badiya Al-Janubia, Western Iraq. Fox 2, Fox 2. Fox 2, Fox 2. Fox 2, Fox 2. Lieutenant Hushank Sadi was one of 24 pilots making the ritual chant as the missiles streaked away from his Tomcat climbing up, high into the stratosphere as they started their deadly course. This was what the Tomcat had been built for, taking on a massed formation of enemy aircraft and blasting them apart with long-range weapons. It was, after all, what their American Tiger teams had said. It was all very well to win a fight, but much better to kill your enemy before he knew the fight had started. The radio crackled again. The Su-30s were opening fire with their long-range missiles. They didn't have the multi-target capability of the Tomcats, not quite. They could engage four targets at once instead of the Tomcats six, but they were firing their R-77 missiles in a stream at the mass of harpies. As the first four hit, the radar would automatically switch to the next four, and then the next. Sadi realized something else. The harpies would be looking at the huge salvo of missiles aimed straight at them, not upwards to where the AIM-54s were already hurtling down. Off to the south, the American F-15 formation was already closing to follow up the initial long-range pounding. Over a hundred kilometers away, Increscalitran saw the sky in the far distance turn into a white cloud one that lengthened towards the flock of harpies with incredible speed. This had to be the fire spears thrown by the human sky chariots. The harpies had all heard of them and quietly discussed them. There was word that three of the great heralds had been destroyed by the fire spears. If so, what could the smaller flyers do against them? He watched the fire spears approaching. Then the whole world seemed to turn upside down. His eyes blurred, defocused from the shock, Increscalitran looked with horror at the chaos wrought upon the harpy flock. One of his wingmates had taken a direct hit from a fire spear and had been blown to fragments. Others around him had been caught by the blast and fragments and were fluttering down, crippled, wings torn apart, some already burning where their bodies were being seared by their blood. Even as he watched, the members of his flock were dying as more fire spears tore into them, the explosions adding to the chaos in the flock. Hundreds were dead and dying as Increscalitran tried to absorb the havoc that was being wrought. In the chaos, he saw a fire spear coming for him. Panic-stricken, he dived and turned away, trying to accelerate as fast as he could, but the fire spear obediently changed course and followed him. That just wasn't fair. I love it when a plan comes together. The voice in Sadie's earphones was a mixture of professional satisfaction and awe. The sky where the harpies had been was a mass of explosions and fireballs. Lion Group, return to base, maximum speed. Reload and get back out here fast. Don't worry about fuel. We've got tankers up if anybody gets short. Tiger Group. That was the Indian city, he thought. Close on what's left of that harpy formation and slaughter it as soon as the F-15s have finished. Don't hang around. Don't get close. Zoom and boom. Watch out. The F-15s will be there as well. Sidi thumbed his transmitter. Eagle Eye kill totals. There was a laugh in the controller's voice. Bloody fighter pilots. Hard to say lion leader. In that mess, it's hard to work out who's killing what. We have lion group down for 121 kills. Tiger group for 290. Panther group is about to engage. Good luck, lion leader. Look forward to seeing you back here. It made sense, said he thought. The Tomcats were long-range killers. They had no place getting mixed up in a wild furball. But the fighter pilot in his soul screamed in protest still because what a furball it was going to be. Behind him, the area of sky occupied by the harpies redoubled in its fury as the salvos of AIM-120Cs tore into it. Cavalry Legion, left flank of the army of Abagor, Tel Ash Shair, northern Iraq. Zoranka Lirtagap jabbed his heels into the neck of his beast, urging it onwards, towards the enemy who was supposed to be trying to stop the legions of Abagor. His beast responded gallantly, straining every muscle in its body to get ahead of his rivals and be the first to start the slaughter of the humans. Dawn was well advanced, the sky turning from black to blue, only it wasn't. Zoranka Lirtagop took time to glance upwards. There was a weird white cloud rising from behind the humans, a cloud tinged red from the rising sun. 
The appearance of a cloudy red sky for one second made Zoranka Lurtagap homesick, but the clouds shot through with streaks of intense white fire. Suddenly, Zoranka Lirtagap saw the streaks of fire were curving through the air, and the curve was going to end with him. The mathematics were simple and deadly. Just under 25 kilometers away from Tel Ash Shair were 29 M270A1 MLRS rocket launchers. Each had 12 rockets. Each rocket had 644 shaped charge multi-role submunitions. 12 times 29 times 644 equaled 224,112. Getting on for a quarter of a million submunitions were descending on the 6,600 strong cavalry legion that was charging across open terrain. The United States Army had a name for what was happening. They called it Steel Rain. Zoranka Lurtagap was staggering around amid the wreckage of the cavalry charge. His beast was down, threshing on the ground, screaming with the agony of holes blasted through its body. Great craters seared by the fury of the shaped charges that had blasted raw copper plasma into its body. They were something that the beast had never experienced before. All around it, others of its kind were in the same condition, screaming, legs, claws, tails blasted off, their faces melted, their bodies ripped open and their organs hanging out. Some were dead. They were the ones who had been fortunate enough to be hit so hard that even the tough body and lust for war that was bred into the beasts could not allow them to survive. Between the bodies of the great beasts, their riders were strewn, some dead, some screaming from their wounds, all hurt in a way none had ever experienced before. It really didn't register in time. The screams from overhead that drowned out even the shrieks and howls of the shattered cavalry charge. The explosions did catch his attention. They were large enough to attract anybody's. They rippled across the killing field, tearing apart the force pinned down there and finally bringing peace to the crippled beasts as they were blown apart. Just over 12 kilometers away, the 18M109A6 Paladins had dropped into the steady firing rate of four rounds per minute the rate that conserved ammunition and broke armies. Their shells arched over the Abrams tanks and Bradley armored vehicles of the 1st Brigade and slammed into the mass of struggling baldricks below. On the ridgeline above, the tankers and mechanized infantry watched in slightly bored interest as the baldric cavalry died. There was nothing to be really interesting here. They'd seen MLRS and artillery at work before. The artillery observers actually had something to do. They watched the patterns of shells landing and data linked a stream of information back to the guns, directing fire onto any pockets of survivors. In the middle of the mass of artillery fire, Zoranka Lirtagap was learning new lessons and learning them very fast indeed. He was learning that he was helpless, that there was no defense against the shells that were moving backwards and forwards across the killing ground. He was learning that artillery and the controllers who directed it had no mercy no compassion for the creatures they were slaughtering. They were just targets, to be erased as quickly and conveniently as possible. Zoranka Lirtagap had learned one other thing. He was a creature of hell, but these seemingly puny humans could create hell any time they wanted to. For the first time in his long life, Zoranka Lirtagap knew what sheer, unadulterated, panic-stricken terror felt like. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia. Western Iraq. Now that is a sight. Guardsman Bass swung the turret of his tank so he could watch the scene in the minefields. The meter-long bar mines had been designed to knock out tanks, but they worked against the Baldrick's rhino lobsters very effectively. The first wave had been blown apart by the mines. Bass had seen one rhino lobster have both its left legs torn off by the mines. As it had collapsed to one side, it had landed on another and been killed by it. But the problem with minefields were that they were declining assets. Every mine that claimed a victim thinned out the field. The second wave had done much better than the first, for a time at least. Quite a few of the rhino lobsters had made it through the minefield, and then they'd hit the razor wire. Razor wire was nasty stuff. Lift a piece carelessly and it could remove a man's fingers. There were dozens of interlocked coils down there, and even as Bass watched, he saw the rhino lobsters tear into it and become entangled in the mass of razor-sharp edges. They screamed and threshed as the wire sliced ever deeper into them, and their efforts only got them more entangled and inflicted yet more damage. Some of the riders tried to help their mounts, grabbed the wire to lift it clear, and these ones learned the terrible truth as the wire sliced their fingers to the bone. 
Behind that second wave came the third, and these had learned. Most of them followed the paths of the rhino lobsters that had made it to the wire. They climbed over the creatures from the second wave, escaping the first entangling coils of wire, but got bogged down in the rest. Others followed them, and by simple weight and mass they crushed down the wire with the bodies of those in front of them. By sheer weight of numbers, the enemy cavalry had breached the wire and were through. Get ready, boys. Lieutenant McLeod's voice came over the radio. The artillery lads are opening fire. Get ready to pick off any of them monsters that get through the barrage. Bass settled down into his tank commander's seat, then took a look through the scope. The blood in the minefield and on the wire was green. SU-30 Mark I Tiger Group Leader Over the Al-Badiya al, al Western Iraq The world rotated around Wing Commander Gurkha as his SU-30 hit the top of its climb and he rolled smoothly over. The survivors of the massacre were far below him, their bodies barely visible. His radar could see them, though. He'd lost them as he'd climbed out, but now he'd reacquired. The devastating missile salvos had destroyed hundreds of the harpies their bodies dissolving in fire as the missiles ripped into them. Once there had been so many that they'd swamped the memory on the radars, but now the situation was clearly defined. There were barely two targets left for each of the Allied fighters, and Gurkha had already killed one of his. He'd picked his target for the next pass already, one harpy flying west, its nerve broken, running for its life. It didn't stand a chance. Gurkha pushed his throttles over and went after it in a long, smooth dive. His gun sight carrot showed the predicted impact point of his cannon burst. It was sliding towards the harpy, the diamond embracing its back. Then it turned red, and Gurkha squeezed the trigger, blasting burst of 30mm armor-piercing incendiary ammunition into the harpy's body. For a second or so, nothing happened, although Gurkha could swear that he saw lumps of black flesh flying off the body. Then it flared into orange fire, burning and spinning for the desert floor. Tiger group, time to go home. Call your boys off, Tiger Leader. The squids want to play. Gurkha looked around. Already the American F-15s were heading south, their missile racks empty. Acknowledged. Head for Dingbat, Tiger Group. Gurkha mentally translated that. Desful. Some Russian transports have landed with missile reloads for you. Good luck and don't mix with any naughty ladies. All Tiger aircraft break off, head for Dingbat. Gurkha looked hard to the west. There was a black cloud approaching. Eagle Eye contacts to the west. We have them on radar, Tiger Group leader. More harpies, covering the ground force main body. Sea Eagle Group will be handling them. Out. The out had a definitive note to it. The SU-30s were out of missiles and very low on cannon ammunition. Eagle Eye up there in his AWACS wasn't interested in them anymore. His attention was steering the group of FA-18s from the three carriers offshore into the new harpy cloud. Headquarters of Marifalazes. Commander. Northern Flank. Abigor's Army. The cavalry have gone. They're through, then. Order the flies to pursue the humans and cut them up on the way. The infantry will follow through. Advance on this place the humans call Kirkuk. Ravage it. Abigor will be pleased. No, noble master. The messenger dropped to his knees and crawled across the floor to Marifalez's hooves. I must tell you, the cavalry have not broken the humans. The cavalry are dead, all of them. The humans killed them all with their magic. What is this insanity? Humans do not have magic. Marifalazes's voice dropped to a menacing growl. This is not a good time to jest. It never was, thought Falabrednausa. Being a messenger was a very chancy and dangerous profession, especially where the recipient of the message was a duke. They'd been known to eat messengers who brought bad news. Sire, I fear to contradict you. Good. Marifalazes interjected the comment with silky menace. But the humans do have magic. They have used it against the cavalry. They can call down thunder from the sky and drown their enemies in fire. They have destroyed our cavalry. It is a horrible sight. Our cavalrymen dead on the ground, torn to pieces by the fire. The surviving beasts on the ground screaming with pain as they die. Marifalaz's attention was drawn by a thunder in the skies overhead. A roll of thunder followed by a deafening, hideous scream. Sire, that is the war cry of the humans in their sky chariots. A great battle is raging while we speak. The flies fight for their lives against the sky chariots. There is magic there, too. The humans throw burning spears that never miss. Our flies do well against them. 
The answer had better be yes, was the reply running through Falabredknaus's mind. But he was a messenger, and it was his duty to speak the truth. No, sire. They die as the cavalry died. The human sky chariots are so much faster than they are. Our enemies cannot hear them come, for the cowards give their battle cry only after they have launched an attack. They travel faster than the wind. They climb faster than any of us have ever seen before. They are afraid to fight us in honorable combat, so they kill by the hundred with their fire spears without ever coming close. Then... They sit above our flyers and dive on them like hawks. Our flies are worse than helpless against them. Marifalas is grunted and turned his attention to the parchment map on the table before him. It wasn't much help. It just showed the positions of the cities and his best guess at the locations of his troops. Why had the humans chosen to fight here? There was nothing important to fight for here. The nearest great cities were far away. All there was here were these rolling hills with the strange black strips the humans built across them. As he stared at the map, Marifalazes got the feeling he was missing something very important. Twenty minutes later, Marifalazes strode out of his tent towards the commanders of his remaining legions. Overhead, the sky was covered with strange, crisscrossing white clouds, although he didn't know it, the contrails from the F-16C Vipers of the 332nd Air Expeditionary Group. The lawn dart pilots had, to put it mildly, been having a field day. Marifalases didn't know and didn't care. He had more important things to think about. Get the legions moving forward, all of them. Two waves, seven and seven. Tell all the infantry the suffering of those who hang back will be legendary even for hell. Marifalases picked a piece of Falabridnaus's flesh from his teeth. He'd finally worked out what he had been missing breakfast. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia, Western Iraq. Isn't this what they call a target-rich environment? And that, Guardsman Bass thought, was the understatement of the century. The first wave of the enemy attack had been smashed. It had died on the mines and razor wire. The few survivors had been torn apart by the artillery. That had seemed like a victory until the whole horizon had turned black with enemy infantry. The enemy line was almost ten kilometers long, the rising sun glittering gold off their bronze tridents. It was a terrifying sight, one that told Bass just as surely as if he could look into the mind of the enemy commander himself that the Baldricks had never seen wire and minefields before. Look into the mind of the commander. Bass rolled the words over in his mind. It would come. It would come. The ability of the Baldricks to enter people's minds and create illusions had been a nasty surprise, but it had been discovered. Once something was discovered, it could be investigated and measured. That meant it could be understood, and once the scientists understood something, they could duplicate it. Once the scientists had duplicated it, the engineers would take that work and turn it into practical tools. Once the engineers had created the practical tools, the armorers would turn those tools into weapons. And once the weapons were available, the soldiers would use them. That was the way it had always been. That was the way it would be now. Bass lays the enemy line, waited a carefully measured ten seconds, then lays it again. The computer in the tank thought for a microscopic second, then translated the two readings into a speed readout, one that made Bass raise his eyebrows a second. Right, lads, they're advancing at 15 kph. The brass better know about that. Another guiding human principle, Bass had no doubt the same piece of data was being transmitted in by dozens of other tank commanders, but it was better for an important piece of data to be transmitted a thousand times than never transmitted at all, because everybody thought everybody else had done so. The fact that Baldrick's on foot could move three times faster than a human was very important. Third Legion, Southern Flank, Abigor's Army. Kriko Yanklawas jogged forward, most of his attention devoted to the enemy in front, the rest to the leader of his contubernium. Like most of his fellow demons in the ranks, he was holding his tripod underarm, the points angled upwards so he didn't stab the demon in front. There might be time for that later. He and his fellows were lucky. The ground in front of them was clear. They wouldn't have to pass through the hideous scene where the human magic had destroyed the cavalry legion. Word that the humans had magic had spread through the ranks like wildfire, the stories growing with each retelling. They could make the ground rise up and swallow their enemies, the stones come alive and crush their victims. 
They could conjure up snakes from the ground that would wrap themselves around their prey and slice them apart. That story was true, Kriko Janklawas decided. He could see the great circular holes in the ground where the snakes had come from. He could see something else. The ground ahead of him was littered with strange-looking bars, painted gray-yellow so they were hard to see against the sand and rock. There were a lot of them, though. Curiously, Kriko Janklawas glanced to one side. There were a lot fewer where the cavalry had ridden to its death. Even as he watched, a demon in the front rank stepped on one of the bars, and the explosion threw him in the air, spraying yellow body fluid as his legs spiraled away from his body. The bars were human magic. Kriko Janklawas realized the truth as additional explosions added their noise to the death toll that was already far higher than the greater demons had expected. He didn't care much about the expectations of the greater demons, though. What he did understand was that stepping on the bars was death. He'd heard about human explosives, how they could blast even a lesser demon apart so that all that remained was stains and rags of flesh. If they could do that to a lesser demon, what could they do to a minor demon like him? Kriko Janklawas had just seen the answer, and it didn't please him. So there were a lot fewer bars where the cavalry had died. Kriko Janklawas did the obvious and started to edge sideways, being careful not to step on the bars, heading for where the ground was just littered with the scraps of flesh and mutilated bodies of beasts and their riders. All along the ranks of the legions, the other demons were starting to do the same. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia Aljanubia, Western Iraq. Here they go. Bass watched with interest. There had been a ripple of explosions as the advancing horde reached the outer edge of the minefield and the first victims stepped on the bar mines. The mines had been intended for anti-tank work, but their fuses had been adjusted so they'd be set off by much lesser pressures. That had worked. A handful of baldricks had died, but the rest were starting to funnel in towards the area partially cleared by the cavalry charge. Bass laced them again. The advance had slowed right down as the baldricks tried to pick their way through the minefield. Poor sods. Bass thought, he could almost feel it in his heart to be sorry for them. Almost, but not quite. Watching through the high-powered optics of his Challenger 2, Bass could see the ranks of Baldrick stretching, bucking, and surging. He knew what would be happening in there, the NCOs and officers trying to prevent the lines drifting into the cleared zone, trying to force the Baldricks to keep moving straight ahead, accepting the losses from the minefield. Idly, he wondered what the Iranian division was thinking, hidden far off to the left, but doubtless watching what was happening. He'd heard they'd cleared minefields by marching infantry through them. Looked like the Baldricks were doing the same. Overhead, Bass heard the scream of shells. Outbound! The sound easily distinguishable from the ominous inbound. He wondered quickly how long it would be before the Baldricks learned to tell the difference. He looked again through the optics seeing the shell's impact on the mass of baldricks hung up on the flanks of the cavalry graveyard. The artillery forward observers were doing their job, directing the artillery in on the flanks, trying to compress the advancing army into a huddled mass. That was happening already in the graveyard. The baldricks lucky enough to be facing that area were moving in, but the ones to either side were sliding in also, and the resulting congestion was slowing their movement to a crawl. The Spams called this shaping the battlefield, a typically melodramatic term in Bass's opinion, but descriptive enough. Anti-Aircraft Battery, Brigadier Carlson's Headquarters, Al-Badiya al, al Western Iraq. There are Satans approaching, raid count 20. The Iranian lieutenant wrapped the report out in Farsi, then translated it to English for the benefit of Sergeant Major Harper. Prepare to engage. With respect, lieutenant. Might I suggest we wait for a short while and let the situation develop? The Iranian frowned slightly, more from curiosity than annoyance. Sergeant, we have modernized OSA-M missiles here. We have more than 20 kilometers of range. Harper settled back slightly. He'd been expecting some of the harpies to leak through the fighter screen. No fighter cover in history had managed to eliminate the threat of just one or two survivors getting past. The sheer numbers of harpies had meant more than that would although this was a larger group than he'd expected. Lieutenant. Harper's voice was very quiet so nobody else could overhear. How long have you been in the army? Three years, Sergeant. I've been serving my queen for twenty. Let me give you a little advice. We blast those harpies now, when they're twenty kilometers away, and the brass will think our job is easy and move us somewhere dangerous. Now, 
We wait until they're five kilometres away and the brass is really sweating, then blast them. We get to be heroes, get a commendation and possibly even a three-day pass. And we get to keep this nice, soft billet. I see. The lieutenant was impressed and I felt a little honoured at receiving such a free gift of valuable expertise. Truly there was much a young officer could learn from a veteran such as this. We will hold fire until five kilometres. Harper nodded fractionally so the officer gave the orders to his men, adding the explanation he'd been given as if it was his own idea. He could see his men nodding as the logic appealed to them. At five kilometers, the four OSA-M missile launchers opened fire, pushing 24 missiles at the 20 harpies now closing in on the base. One harpy made it past the missiles only to be sawn apart in mid-air as the ZSU-23-4s caught it in a crossfire. Back in the battery command vehicle, the telephone rang. Carlson's voice was on the other end. Well done, Lieutenant. That was getting us a little worried. I'll send a commendation to General Zolfagari. He paused slightly. You left it a bit late, didn't you? Needed to get a proper tactical picture, sir. We've only six ready rounds on each launcher and I didn't want to get caught reloading. Very wise. Carlson paused for a second. We gave you Sergeant Major Harper as liaison, didn't we? Please tell him I would like a few words with him later. Local 3751. Attack medium caliber systems. Mesa, Arizona. Look, it's like this, C. The plant is going to triple shift work whether we like it or not. We've talked with the bosses and this is what we've come up with. Morning shift from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Afternoon shift from 2 p.m. until 10 p.m. Graveyard shift from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. Graveyard pays double time. Shifts switch around monthly so everybody gets a crack at the double time. What about weekends? Forget them. Everybody works four days on, one day off. That'll be staggered, so there's a full shift working the plant all the time, 24-7. Four days on, one day off? That's not fair. Shut up, Al. The boys on the front line don't get one and five off. Why should we? A mutter of agreement ran around the room. What happens if we don't approve the deal? Mexicans. Or the army gets the submunitions from Israel or wherever. Anyway, I'll put it to the vote. All those for accepting the management offer? Hands went up all over the room. And against? A scattering of hands, mostly those the organizer recognized as those who voted against everything. It's carried. New arrangements start tomorrow. Management will tell you which shift you're starting on and your day off. A few hundred yards away, another meeting was being held, one where the workers' spouses were being gathered. Once it would have been an all-women gathering, these days a few men were there as well. So, that's the new arrangements. Look, the guys on the production lines are going to be working their asses off. They don't need to be worried about problems at home. So if there is a problem, deal with it. Don't go whining. If you can't deal with it, see us here at the Union. We can help. Above all that, help each other. You older women, you've been through this before. You know the problems the young mothers will face. Be there for them. Even if it's just babysitting so she can get out of the house and have some peace for an hour, do it. Watch out for the oldsters as well. Nobody will be around as much as they were, so we all have to look out for each other. We know nobody else will. Don't think some guardian angel will be looking out because we know they're the enemy as well now. Across America and the world, the same meetings were being held, the same messages given. Under them all was another simple, deeper message. The whole world was at war. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. I see you finally got your new office. Julie Adams looked totally different from her first visit here less than three weeks ago. Her hair was washed and shining. She was wearing skillfully applied makeup and was smartly, fashionably dressed. As with all the latest fashionistas, she was wearing a chic aluminum foil hat that covered her head and extended down the back of her neck. Producing elegant headwear out of aluminum foil had proved a challenge, but the French and Italian designers had come through with flying colors. Julie's aluminum hat had more to do with her change in appearance than her clothes or makeup. For the first time in many, many years her eyes were quiet and rested. She looked at the world with peaceful confidence, not abject terror. They're nice, aren't they? The amazing Randy was sitting behind his desk, sorting through the letters received by his unit trying to pick out the genuine prospects from the fakes. It was a harrowing job. Our general bullied the decorators until they did what we wanted. 
by the way, the walls are foil lined. We've got monitoring equipment here and we can't pick up any extra dimensional signals. So it looks like we're safe. I guess the next set of building codes will stipulate aluminum foil in all walls and ceilings. Julie shuddered at the memories of what Domicles Ferratu had done to her. Randy smiled again, understanding her expression like any skilled cold reader. Julie, would you like to get your own payback? Punish Domicles Ferratu by hurting him the way he hurt you? Sure, of course. Can I? Come to the laboratory. The two went into the next room. There was a comfortable reclining chair with some electronics behind it and a swinging table with a microphone. Don't ask me how any of this works. I'm a conjurer, not a physicist. It's quite easy, James. One of the men in white coats was talking. The Baldrick mind control works by quantum entanglement. Essentially, they transmit their mind signal to a victim and force its mind pattern to match theirs. When we intercepted the Baldrick signal, we identified both the Baldrick's pattern and that of Miss Adams. So we just reversed the procedure and we're going to try and entangle its mind pattern. The catch is it's much easier for hell to transmit to us than us to transmit to them. So, since we're not short of raw electrical power, we're going to boost it upwards until we can transmit to hell. If we've done this right, you can speak into this microphone and broadcast straight into Domiclus Ferratu's mind. Thank you, gentlemen. I still don't understand how it works, but you've done wonders, that I know. If this goes well, what we plan to do is to open a new radio station transmitting to everybody in hell. And Julie, you'll be our first newsreader. Now settle down and start to try. Julie slipped into the chair and pushed her headset on, earphones and a simple microphone. Behind her, the system specialists started to ease the power up, seeking the threshold that would tell them they had breached the barrier between the dimensions. In her seat, all Julie could hear was the signal's hum, slowly increasing in pitch and intensity. Then, suddenly it stopped. There was an eerie silence at the other end, and Julie could sense the suspicious questioning as Domicles Ferratu felt a new presence in his mind. Remember me, Domicles Ferratu? I'm Julie Adams, the woman you got your kicks from torturing. Well, I'm back, only I'm in your mind now. I can get into your head, but you can't get into mine anymore. So guess what, Domicles Ferratu? It's my turn to have some fun and yours to suffer. Let's see. Where shall we start? Oh, yes. Here's a good one. We're coming for you and all your kind. You had the impertinence to invade us, and we're slaughtering your kind here. You don't stand a chance against us. We're coming for you, and we're going to free all of our people you hold and hand those of you that survive over to them. We're going to hand you over and watch all our people do to you what you have been doing to them. There's a new order coming, and we're the ones on top. So you'd better start running Domicles Ferratu because we're coming for you and we won't stop. Not now, not ever. You've pissed off the human race Domicles Ferratu and, oh boy, what a price you'll pay for doing that. Oh, and tell that freak you have in charge there. He'd better find a good lawyer. He'll need one for the war crimes trial. The system powered down and Julie took her headset off. There was an enthusiastic round of applause. Randy laid an approving pat on the shoulder. Impertinence. That was great. I guess you'll be taking the job then, Julie. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. The woman was crouched behind a rocky outcrop on the edge of the Styx in the Fifth Circle, watching the scene unfold in front of her. Luck was an amazing thing, wasn't it? For thousands of years, she'd been purposefully moving through Hell, taking account of the humans who suffered here, some worthy of her attention, others, weaklings, worthy only of her contempt. Of course, given the billions of souls, there must be billions now. She could only rely on her instinct to guide her. And now, this. Just as she was in the area, some new arrivals had escaped with apparent ease, had tackled the demonic overseer with impunity, stabbed and bludgeoned it to death with skill, and had just crucified it to the rocks in front of her. Such open defiance was unprecedented and dangerous. In ten thousand years she had learned many languages from the screams and gibbering cries of the tormented. So with only a little difficulty, she recognized what they were saying. The woman was speaking to a man, something about resistance. She smiled to herself. If only they knew. As they turned to go, she stepped out from behind the rock. Hello? The two newcomers whirled, the bronze spikes they carried up and ready. The woman smiled and spread her arms, revealing herself unarmed. I have seen what you have done. Excellent work. The apparent leader of this group was a woman, short, already healing from the gang rape. She gestured to her companion and he lowered his weapons, though they still stood cautiously at the ready. All were in excellent physical shape, 
save for the quickly healing wounds and scars. Who are you? A fellow resistance member. Suddenly the woman felt a stab in her back above the kidneys. She almost fainted with terror. Had a demon caught her for the spikes against her were certainly the bronze of a trident. She turned slowly, looking over her shoulder. There were more newcomers behind her, one armed with a cut-down trident, the other with a club made from the section of haft that had been removed. The woman was shocked. She'd been so pleased at tracking this group, she hadn't seen they'd spotted her and had set up an ambush. Now the leader of the group was speaking, her voice hard, cold, suspicious. There's already a resistance? Of course there is. There has been a resistance in hell since it began. Well, take us to its leader. The woman again spread her arms. I will certainly do that. But first you must tell me your names. When we meet the leader. Okay, then follow me. We're going to the rim between the fourth and fifth circles. And she turned and stepped into the waist-deep muck, wading past the still-bleeding corpse of Jerrica Flaxus. The six newcomers followed her at a distance. The woman didn't notice, but two of them dropped out of sight, following from the flanks. Over her shoulder, the woman said, If I duck under the mud, you do the same. As long as the demons on patrol don't see us, we'll be fine. The Tango flight members exchanged glances. That remark was more telling than the woman had realized. It should be the demons who lived in fear. First rule of establishing a liberated area, those who stayed out of it were safe, those who entered it died. Obviously what she meant by resistance wasn't what they meant. Kim started to form a mental picture of what the resistance here really was, probably groups of escapees hiding out, spending their time avoiding capture. Kim had in mind something far more ambitious. The Galaxy Turkish Bath and Massage Parlor, Bangkok, Thailand. The succubus slipped into the bar carefully, keeping in the dark as much as possible. Once it had been easy to fool the humans, but no more. Now fewer and fewer of them seemed vulnerable to mind masking. This group seemed to be, though, all women, that was good. Massacring them would cause great alarm and misery. There were a group of them by a long wooden table at the end of the room. The succubus kept her self-image clearly in her mind, a young Asian woman dressed as these were, short skirt, skimpy top, baseball cap perched on their heads. A couple of women were dancing around a pole on a small stage, under a sign that said coyote dancing. Well, they could wait until last. The succubus went up to the group by the table, picked the one at the end and drew back her clawed hand ready to plunge it into her victim's chest and tear out her heart. Then she paused. She'd never realized quite how big a half inch could look when it was pointing straight at her face. Now I know what you're thinking. Can you kill me before I pull the trigger? Well, seeing as this is a 50 caliber Action Express Desert Eagle, the most powerful semi-automatic handgun ever made, you have to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? The human woman chuckled. I've always wanted to say that. The succubus looked around carefully. She was the center of a ring of gun barrels, all aimed at her, all obeying the third law of gunfighting. Calibers measured in inches should begin with a point four or greater. It was pointless, over. She let her image drop, and from the lack of shock on the faces of the women, she realized her illusion had been just as pointless. These women had recognized her as soon as she had entered, and they'd trapped her. So kill me. She'd failed. It was hopeless. Death was the consequence of failure. Perhaps not. Sit down. Don't try anything stupid and we won't shoot. Why did you do this? It was my mission. Dumos sent me to seduce a leader and bend him to our will. So Dumos is your pimp? The woman with the desert eagle put a mountain of disgust into the word. That doesn't explain why you came here to try and kill us. I failed. We were told that politicians here were easy to seduce, but I couldn't make mind contact with them. I hoped killing you would buy enough favor to save my life. People here no longer are deceived by our mind mask. The succubus thought for a second. What is a pimp? Somebody who lives off the money we earn. I do not get paid. Then you're a sex slave? The women in the bar were genuinely shocked. They frequently told their tourist clients they were poor women, tricked into a life of sin by unscrupulous brothel owners, but that was just a line to get some sympathy money. They were all Bangkok girls, born and bred in the city. Country girls couldn't compete with them and didn't try. Not one of the girls in the bar had ever actually met a real sex slave. Aren't you? Noi, the girl with the desert eagle, was horrified and insulted. 
No, we are businesswomen. We are free professionals and paid as such. Why, last week I made more money than an office lady makes in a year. Look, what's your name? Luga Sharmanaska. Look, Luga Sharman, do you mind if we call you Luga? Nobody has the right to go around telling you who you can have sex with, not unless they pay you for the trouble. It sounds to me like this Dumos person has been treating you pretty badly. You'd be better off staying with us than going back to him. Her. Dumos is a female, a greater demon. There was another round of indignant snorts. That's disgusting. A woman treating you like this? A man, perhaps, I can understand. They always want it for free, but another woman? That's sick. You should be free to make your own living. It's your body. I could make a living doing it here? Luga Sharmanaska's voice was uneven, curious, confused. The women in the bar laughed, although that didn't affect the way they held their guns. You bet. A real demon whore? There'd be men lining up out the door to do you. You could look like yourself or like their favorite actress or whatever. You'd make a fortune. Why a couple of months and you'd own a bar like this? Less if an American warship pulled into Pattaya. A chorus of happy sighs ran around the bar. To the women, an American warship full of walking ATMs was their idea of the great cornucopia. Noy continued. Look, Luga, the last time an American carrier pulled in for a week, I made enough money to buy a new pickup truck. Cash down. Lynn over there paid for a whole year's college tuition for her younger sister, and Dip bought a house for her parents. How do you think we all ended up with American guns? Tourists are profitable enough, we all make a good living off them. And this Dumos person makes you do it for nothing. It's not just disgusting, it's unprofessional. Well, what can I do? Luga Sharmanaska almost wailed out the question. The girls did a quick conference. Come with us. We'll take you to the army. They'll look after you. They know if they don't look after our friends, they'll never get any in this city again. I'll get my truck, and we'll go around to the cavalry depot in Thonbury. Five minutes later, one succubus and five ladies of the night were piling into Noy's pickup truck, Luga Sharmanaska having been strongly cautioned not to scratch the paint with her claws. A ten-minute drive took them to the depot gates, where for the second time in an evening, Luga Sharmanaska was surrounded by guns. Hi, boys! Noy's voice was bright and friendly. Sisters, you do know you've got a baldric in the back there? Of course. Her name is Luga. She wants to surrender, so we brought her here. We don't trust the police. I can understand that. I'll have to call the officer of the guard. Another ten minutes, and the group were telling their story to the officer of the guard, making it very clear that the succubus was under their protection, and if she was hurt, nobody in the Second Cavalry Division would be welcome in a Bangkok bar again. Most of the troops had gulped at that threat and mentally promised to guard their prisoner with their lives. Within thirty minutes, the Thai MOD was on the telephone to Washington. Headquarters Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. Well, it's a step forward, but it doesn't really get us that far. I thought Julie did well. She did, and we told her she can use the equipment anytime she likes to torment Domeclesferatu. But it's one-to-one -one communication. It's using a telephone, and we want to use something like a radio. We want to transmit to everybody, and this system just can't do that. It needs a mind pattern to lock into. Like I said, it's one-to-one. -one. But Baldrick's can deceive large numbers of people at once. Sure, but we don't know how. We're a long way out from knowing that. The telephone on Randy's desk rang and he picked it up, mouthing an apology as he did so. As he listened, his eyebrows lifted. Well, this might change things. That was the Ministry of Defense in Bangkok. We've got a defector. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia. Western Iraq. How shall a man die better than facing fearful odds? For the ashes of his fathers and the future of his buds. It's showtime, boys. Guardsman Bass put the tank intercom down. Like every good tank commander, he had anticipated the order, getting his Challenger 2 ready to move well before the word came down from Regimental HQ. It hadn't taken that much anticipation, in fact, just a modicum of skill and experience. Skill and experience was something that the long-term professionals that made up the British ranks had in abundance. The Spams may have the shiny toys, the British tankers said, but the Brits knew how to play with them. In the valley below, the Baldrick army was slowly extricating itself from the tangle caused by the minefields and wire. What had started as a serried mass of infantry was being distorted and funneled into a confused mass, made all the worse by the pounding of the AS-90Ds. 
The 155mm guns were lobbing their shells into the mass of infantry still seething through the gap in the wire torn where the Baldric cavalry had died. They were concentrating on the mass targets, but that meant the infantry was slowly penetrating the first line of defense, breaking through in a thin, steady stream. They were beginning to move across the valley floor, making their way towards where the challengers were sitting in wait behind the rippling sand and gravel dunes. Even with the snarled mess down by the wire holding up the bulk of the baldricks, Bass was appalled by the sheer number of them coming towards his position. Intellectually, he had heard the number that was expected, nearly 100,000, but he had never imagined what 100,000 infantry swarming towards him would look like. Now he knew. It was a sight few had ever seen before, even where human armies were concerned. The mass of baldricks were something that belonged out of human prehistory. Mark your targets as they come. The voice over the radio was calm and collected, the boyish pitch already well controlled and only barely a reminder of how young their officer was. It didn't matter much. Everybody knew a junior officer fresh out of Sandhurst was still being trained in his craft. This one was doing well, Bass thought. If he survived, he might go far. Even while he thought that, his hands were selecting a group of baldricks as his target. Lays them. A brief pause. 5,003 meters, boss. Another brief pause, and then Lieutenant McLeod's voice cut in again. On my word, boys. Hold fast and... Shoot! On the way! Third Legion, Southern Flank, Abigor's Army. He had survived the snakes. He had seen their silver bodies stretched out on the ground, tape-like creatures that were threatening even in death. Those who had stepped on their bodies had screamed in agony as the snake teeth cut their feet apart. Demon skin was strong, but the silver snakes were stronger. He had avoided the yellow bars as well, taught by the fearful fate of those who had been careless enough to step on them. He had threaded his way through the maze on the ground, catching only minor injuries from the fragments as more careless, or less fortunate, as Krico Janklawas was quickly beginning to realize, on a battlefield they were the same thing, had stepped on the bars and been blown apart. Krico Janklawas corrected himself. The lucky ones were blown apart, the unlucky ones just had their legs ripped off and lay screaming on the ground. The bars weren't the only magic in the ground here. Something else was hidden in the sand and gravel. Something nobody saw until it was too late. Something that threw a metal ball up into the air so that it could explode and throw out a slashing rain of fragments. The humans had a touch of true evil in their magic. The balls always exploded at about waist height, and the ones caught by them were the unluckiest of all, for they were rarely killed just disemboweled and castrated by the blasts. Their screams were truly dreadful. That was the worst thing of all. The overwhelming noise. The sensation that the bath of sound they were immersed in was itself a weapon hammering them flat with repeated waves of blasting. The explosions of the mines. The flat crack of the balls as they were thrown into the air and exploded. Worst of all, the howl as the human mages created thunderbolts and hurled them into the mass of troops advancing on them. They mixed with the screams of the dying, and those who wished they were dying, in an all-embracing cacophony, and the war cry howls of the humans in their sky chariots overhead, hunting down the surviving flies. Krico Junklawas had never heard anything like it before. If anything, the sound was worse than the magic that was being thrown at him. Its pressure on his head made it almost impossible to think straight. He lifted his head slightly. The human mages were up to something new. A ripple of lightning flashed along the ridge crest ahead of him. His eyes focused on that ridge. There were strange boxes scattered along it, and the lightning seemed to have come from them. Before that could really register, the bath of sound that enveloped him was punctuated by ear-splitting screams. More human battle cries, Krypto John Klaus presumed. How could such puny creatures give out such cries? Off to his left, a tight knot of demons had penetrated the wire, using the body of a dead beast as a bridge. As Krico Janklawas watched, one of their leaders seemed to be hurled backwards, disintegrating into a fine spray of mist and parts as he did so. Most of those around him fell, spurting yellow body fluid from wounds torn by fragments from the magic bolt. Along the line, Krico Janklawas could see forty or fifty more such explosions as the magic bolts tore into the demonic ranks. For the first time, he sensed that moving forward was impossible, that he could not do it and survive. All along the line, the same idea was beginning to filter into the minds of his fellows. The advance was faltering. 
Although he had never experienced anything like this before, the simple instinct of self-preservation cut in, and Krikojanklawas took cover in a convenient dip in the ground. He was just in time. Another salvo of the screaming bolt slammed into the ranks where the demons had clustered, spreading more death and destruction. At that point he noticed something. The human mages were hurling their bolts where the demons were most tightly packed. The area effect of their blasts ensured multiple kills for each bolt. Kriko Janklawas began to wonder if his survival in this human-created hell, he used the phrase without any sense of irony, was due to the fact that he was in a thinly populated section where most of the demons were already down. The human magic was being concentrated on a section of the line far away. Even the terrible noise seemed to have slackened a bit. That gave Kriko Janklawas an opportunity. He had already spotted another better dip in the ground ahead of him, so he leapt up and sprinted across to it. On the way, he discharged his psychic force into his trident and aimed a bolt at the ridgeline ahead. The blue bolt shot out. It would take time for him to recharge, but at least he'd taken a shot at the mages. Then, he was in his new hiding place, trying to find another one that was both better and closer to the enemy. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia, Western Iraq. What the blazes was that? Bass shrugged. Something had hit his tank. It seemed like some sort of ball lightning or something. It had come from the mass of infantry they were pounding. No idea. Any damage? No, boss. Computers flickered for a second, but that's all. If I didn't know better, I'd say we got hit by lightning. If we did, the system hardening worked as advertised. Bass looked across the line. It seemed like quite a few bolts were coming in from the direction of the enemy. The old book said that demons could throw lightning bolts, didn't they? Looks like we just got hit by one. Ahead, down in the valley, a group of baldricks had penetrated the wire in his sector. Load Hesh. Up. Shoot. On the way. The tank lurched as another 120mm Hesh round went down range, and Bass saw it plow into the group he'd selected, blowing one baldric into fragments while those around it went down wounded. The thought crossed Bass's mind that he was currently firing the biggest and most expensive sniper's rifle in history. It also crossed his mind that snipers couldn't possibly stop a massed attack like this. He had to give the Baldricks credit. The ground in the minefield and around the wire was carpeted with their dead, yet they were still pushing forward. It took gutsy infantry to do that. Make that a definite on the ball lightning. Bass had seen another challenger getting hit by a ball of lightning and briefly lighting up the way a ship's mass sometimes did in an electrical storm. St. Elmo's fire it was called or something. He switched to the platoon net. Lieutenant, sir, we're taking incoming fire here. Some sort of electrostatic bolt, like lightning or EMP. Doesn't seem to be dangerous to us, but worth reporting. Roger that, Bass. For your information, other tanks and the crunchies in their warriors are also reporting the bolts. Hold fast. Bass switched back to the tank intercom and picked out another Baldrick target. Once again, his 120mm gun crashed, sending the Baldricks flying. Their casualty rate down there was appalling. The AS-90Ds were still pounding them with their 155s while the tanks added precision fire to the execution, yet they were barely making a dent in the mass of Baldrick's still moving forward. Bass got an uneasy feeling that the battle was not going well. 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division, Tel Ash Shair, Northern Iraq. They may not know what they're doing, but my word, do they have guts. Colonel Sean McFarland watched the slaughter on his display. The Global Hawk was relaying real-time video of the battle as it developed, sending back pictures of the Baldrick Horde as they floundered under the lash of artillery fire. The MLRS batteries were inflicting incredible losses on them. Every time they fired, whole sections of the Baldrick front just vanished under the steel rain. There were two problems with that. The batteries fired about once every eight or nine minutes, and that just wasn't often enough. The other was that they had already dumped more than a million DPICM bomblets into the target area. With a 2% failure rate, that meant there were already 20,000 dud rounds scattering the battlefield. That would make it a hazard for years to come. Still, the gap between the MLRS salvos was being filled by the Paladins. All 54 guns in the first armored were now pouring fire into the enemy army. A human army would have broken by now, given up, known that getting through the artillery fire was impossible, and saved their lives by pulling back. The Baldricks weren't doing that. Not yet at any rate. McFarlane knew they would, sooner or later. They were fighting the United States Army on its terms, on its ground,
giving it exactly the target the army was supremely good at destroying. The Baldricks would either run or die. Even as he watched, a new element was added to the massacre. The Bradleys of his mechanized infantry were firing tow anti-tank missiles into the enemy formation, picking out the groups the artillery missed and cutting them down. The tanks were silent. McFarland intended to hold fire with them until the enemy were 2,000 meters away. The 120mm smoothbore didn't have the accurate range of the British rifled 120mm, so the Bradleys had to take over the long-range precision fire roll. McFarland looked at the mass of infantry threshing in the kill zone and shook his head. They had to stop, didn't they? Cavalry Legion, left flank of the army of Abigor, Tel Ash Shair, northern Iraq. They were hunched up, backs bent, heads down, looking for all the world as if they were trying to walk through some ferocious storm. Same grim determination to find shelter. And that wasn't a bad comparison, thought Zoranka Lirtagap. That's what they were facing a storm that slaughtered everything in its path. Ever since his beast had been killed, Zaranka Lirtagap had been advancing with the infantry against the hideous magic of the humans. He caught his breath. Suddenly the sky behind the humans had turned white again, white shot with fire as their fire lances sped towards the floundering demon advance. He watched the sight with fear in his heart, then sighed slightly as it descended on the flank of the line, far from his position. It happened again the same rippling cloud of explosions that left no demon standing when it cleared. Anything was better than the fire lances, even the magic bolts that screamed and caused the ground to erupt under their feet. There was something new. From a position in front of them, more human chariots had appeared, barely visible with just a small box over the ridgeline. For all their skills, the humans were cowards. Zoran Kalirtagap consoled himself with that thought. They didn't stand proud and fight. They hid in hollows and dips in the ground to kill. And kill and kill and kill, thought Zaranka Lirtagap grimly. Oh yes, they were very good at that. The boxes fired fire lances at a group of demons on Zaranka Lirtagap's right. The targets scattered, but it did them no good. They'd been lucky enough to escape the fire lances and the bolts, but these new weapons were different. As Zaranka Lirtagap watched appalled, the fire lances changed course to follow their targets. Even those who forget their honor and took cover in dips like humans could not save themselves. The fire lances were following them into the cover they had sought. It was more than flesh and blood. Even demonic flesh and blood could stand. The leading demons started to edge backwards, even as the ones behind continued to push forward. The advance ground to a halt in the chaos. The Royal Dragoon Guards, Albadia al Janubia, Western Iraq. Air raid warning red, red, red. The scream over the radio was just in time. A group of about 30 harpies had managed to assemble themselves from the massacre in the skies over the battlefield and attacked the tanks sitting on the ridgeline. Bass could feel his tank lurch as a group of them landed on it, heard their claws scrabbling at the armor. His radio went dead. At a guess, he thought the antenna had probably been ripped off by the harpies. Then he heard a ringing noise, the sound of machine gun fire bouncing off armor plate. The warriors were machine gunning the tanks in an effort to drive the harpies off them. Bass looked through his vision box. Some were masked by clawed hands trying to rip them open, but he could see Bravo 3 was also covered with harpies, the tracers from three warriors converging on it as the infantry protected the tanks from the sudden assault. On a sudden thought, Bass looked up and made sure his hatch was firmly clamped shut. One harpy was driven off the tank by the fire. It exploded in the air as the warrior fired a few rounds from its 30mm Rardin gun into it. Others were dying as they were shot up by the warrior's coaxial chain guns. That was creating a new problem. Bass could see Bravo 3 was starting to smoke, the acid from the harpy's blood probably. The paint on the challengers would resist the acid, but there were other things out there that could be vulnerable. The tanks were backing up. Bass hadn't received any orders, but with his radio down, it was a fair guess they were out, so he joined in the movement. Like the other tanks, he popped his smoke launchers, the choking white fumes driving off the remaining harpies. By the time the Baldrick swarmed over the positions he had once held, the challengers were back behind the next ridgeline. Headquarters, British Brigade, Wadi al Jaram, Western Iraq. Brigadier John Carlson looked at his map. His front line had been driven in, the tanks and armored infantry pushed back to the next defense positions. 
That left the baldric spread out between the wire and the next defense line in a vast disorganized mass. He picked up his radio. It was already set to the right frequency. Now, General Zolfagari, now's your time. Put every gun to them, sir, every gun. Getting a bit Wellingtonian, aren't we? The Iranian general's voice was urbane and slightly amused. Then his division spoke for him. Outside the sky to Carlson's left turned white as the massed batteries of Iranian BM-21 rocket launchers opened fire, pouring their rockets into the Baldrick's flank and rear. Under the white cloud was a black one as the T-72s gunned their engines and started their charge at the enemy. Third Legion, Southern Flank, Abigor's Army. The onslaught was totally unexpected. The enemy were in retreat, covered by the fog they had conjured up. Then, somehow, they had poured a new mass of fire into the right flank and rear of the demon forces. Kriko Janklawas looked over to the left and saw the black cloud as something crossed the ridge line. He focused his eyes and almost screamed in horror at what he saw. The humans have iron chariots! He wasn't the only one. Others saw the more than 300 T-72 tanks pouring over the ridge line, moving terrifyingly fast through the sand. They saw them spit fire, the blaze rippling along their front line as the shots went on their way to tear into the demonic ranks. Every demon sensed the new chariots and knew the truth. They were made of iron, not just any iron but some sort of super iron. The demons recoiled from their old enemy, it was just too much. After the pounding, the mines, the wire, their nerve finally broke. Headquarters of Marifalazes, Commander, Northern Flank, Abigor's Army. Marifalazes had learned much about war in the last few hours. He had learned that cavalry could no longer charge an enemy. He learned that artillery was the great killer no matter whether the targets were demons or humans. He had learned that his soldiers were helpless against tanks. He had learned that humans were the supreme masters of mass killing and were only too keen to practice their art. Now he learned that the moment an army disintegrates and changes from a defeated force to a panicked mob can be measured with exquisite precision. The French army at Waterloo disintegrated at precisely 8.15 p.m., the Union army at First Bull Run at precisely 4.20 p.m. Mara Falazes saw his army disintegrate with exactly the same precision. As the great iron chariots of the humans emerged from their hiding places, his army dissolved into chaos running for the rear. The iron chariots followed them, and they could move much faster than even the panic-stricken demons. That was when he had his next lesson. An army suffers heavier casualties when it breaks than it does when it stands. M1A2 Abrams, Charlie III, Tel Ash Shair, Northern Iraq. There was thirty dead and wounded on the ground we wouldn't keep. Now there wasn't more than twenty when the front began to go. But Christ, along that line of flight, they cut us up like sheep. And that was all we gained by doing so. The M1 crested the ground smoothly, the great barrel of its gun held in place by the stabilization system. There was hardly any need to use it. The Baldricks were running for the rear the Abrams tanks spraying them with fire from their coaxial and turret-top machine guns. In the driver's seat, Specialist Brungard saw a wounded Baldrick fall to the ground in front of the racing tank. The 70-ton Abrams didn't even lurch as it drove over the body. Brungard thumbed his intercom button. Hey guys, guess what? Baldricks go crunch too. Wadi Abu Tahir, Western Iraq, late afternoon. Memnon snorted in disgust as he watched the young human die. He stared into those cow-like eyes as they fluttered, and the hands feebly clawed at his infernal flesh. He could feel the soul within stirring now, as the meat caging it finally ceased its life functions. He casually allowed the corpse to slide out of his grip, and he was quiet for a long moment, listening. The humans were about in large numbers, and he was no fool. His wings would take time to regenerate, and his flesh was still aching from his wounds. Their spears of plastic and metal spat hot, burning bolts that could wound even his great personage. This was not the way it was to be. Go find them and challenge them, he was told. They will cower before you. He had found the humans, but their chariots of steel and plastic were far too powerful for him. He had lost two wingmates already, and he was in no condition to meet them again. Not yet, anyway. Memnon smiled cruelly. When he did, there would be blood. 
enough to drown a thousand human infants, and then the pain would come. Sweet, melodic pain. Memnon's eyes fluttered, and the never-born knew that it was time to rest. His prey had been bested, and he had claimed a lair for himself. At least long enough to heal the wounds and allow his spirit flesh to sing to the domain he called home. This wretched place of cloying life and limited matter was not to his liking. He was his own being, and he needed rest. Just for a little while. Memnon growled and curled down onto the floor next to the corpse of the boy. He looked with contentment at the place that surrounded him, for sprawled out across the couch was an older woman, head turned completely around and leering at him, while a younger woman was impaled on a broken piece of furniture, scream frozen on her face. All were small offerings to the Morning Star and his prince to watch over him in this moment of weakness. He would repay them with more flesh and blood when he was whole again. Wadi Abu Tahir, Western Iraq, just before dawn. A single eye snapped open at the sound of the teapot whistle, and Memnon spoke. For disturbing me in this moment of respite, you shall know such wonders of pain. I will make a cathedral of your bones and sinew, and your agony will be my choir, pathetic human. He snarled coldly at the young Arabic man who now shared the high-roofed barn that was now his den. A man dressed in plain khakis and a billowy white shirt opened at his chest, who nodded politely to Memnon and knelt cross-legged across from him as he delicately poured himself a cup of tea. The steam rose lazily from the ancient chipped porcelain. It had been brewing on the stove and the smell wafted over to the groggy demon. Peace and blessing be upon you, fallen one. Your absence still saddens my patron. Memnon paused. He stirred more now, unfurling like some obscene spider, long leathery limbs reaching out as he rose with eyes like cold embers pinning the young man with a predatory gaze. Slave of the nameless one. Memnon inclined his head with bitter sarcastic politeness as he smelled the clean scent of the angelic. Care for a cup? The angelic asked with a childlike innocence as he sipped his own. For a brief moment he closed his eyes and seemed to savor the tea, like one savored the sensation of forced coupling. You're all whores to your senses, you know that, don't you? Memnon chuckled darkly, his cloven hooves clomping on the packed earth floor like a caged bull as he paced back and forth before the kneeling man. This world is delight and rapture. It is the fulfillment of all and the joy of bliss. The young man sighed as he inhaled the aroma from the teacup. Memnon said nothing. They like to talk, they like to taste, they like to savor these slaves of the nameless. What is the purpose of this world if not to delight in its wonders? You must remember surely how bright it is in our ethereal realm. How the chorus of praise and supplication a constant backdrop to the Great One above us all as he basks in our light of selfless devotion. He continued in a soft whisper like leaves on silk. What manner of slave are you, eh? Cherub, perhaps? Memnon asked silkily. How frail he looked just sitting there. It stirred his predatory urges like a woman's breast called to a male. Memnon clomped forward a bit, talons gleaming dangerously. The angelic inclined his head and closed his eyes and listened to intently for a moment. He looked absolutely beautiful like a statue carved of perfect alabaster. There was not a blemish on his skin, and his body moved with a sublime grace that would have made a human weep. Was it a wonder that these bastards had their way with the women of this wretched place, while his kin had to forcibly take what they wanted? Was it any wonder they were always the ones the Nameless sent in his stead to speak for him? Always put your best face forward, they say. They were such supple and elegant heralds. How could the humans resist worshipping the Nameless One when these were the ones he sent in its name? If the humans could only see what they actually worshipped, now that would be worth the price of admission, no? It is so... quiet here. The Angelic announced with tears welling in its eyes. No maddening chorus always haunting your every thought. No cries of baseless devotion, no shrieks of joyous revelation. Just silence. There was a sadness there, deep and abiding. Memnon could stand it no longer. It maddened him to see this abject weakness paraded before him. Slave! He roared. There was a rip and whirl of taloned hands and leathery limbs flashing forward, and the angelic merely raised his head as if offering his throat to his attacker. But it gestured with its hand, and Memnon was catapulted off his feet and landed in a heap against the far wall of the shack, shaking the entire frame to its core. 
The angelic was off his feet and had crossed the room in a single stride in between heartbeats, and he had a flawless alabaster hand wrapped around Memnon's throat. Without a grunt of effort, the angelic hoisted the still-stunned harpy off his feet and held him high above him. The eyes were no longer human but white within white, and there was a low sound growing around him like a chorus of women slowly building up tempo. I am Apolloin, servant to Gabriel Lan, seraph of the hosts of Michael Lan, devout servant and herald of he above all others. You will listen to my words and heed them. I listen. Memnon managed to choke out. Are you certain? Apolloin asked tightly, and there was a cold smile on his face. Oh yes, they were beautiful, but they were also terrible in their wrath. These humans worshipped the Nameless with such zeal and spoke of his perfect love, never really discussing that when the time came for punishment, it was these beautiful angels that delivered death and destruction without hesitation or remorse. In the end, human morality was just as alien to this beautiful creature as it was to Memnon. Yes, Apolloin, I attend your words, Memnon stammered. We are watching. Tell your prince that. The one above all has spoken, yet he sees vile, repugnant defiance from humanity. The great chorus must not be disturbed. The chanting must not cease. Your ilk were given this world, and we see nothing but abhorrent failure. We do not want to take a more active role. Uriel awaits on the ether like a sword of Damocles. Uriel, Memnon exclaimed. Last he moved upon man, the land of Kemet wept bitter tears. Do not force our hand. Cow them, stop the defiance. Should they find a way to disrupt the chorus, we will end this charade once and for all. Gabriel jerked Memnon down to face him, tusk to nose. Clear, foul one? Apolloin replied like ice and hurled the Neverborn back through the wall of the shack. Corrugated tin and sheetrock gave way, and Memnon found himself running before he even realized he was touching ground again. Peace be with you. Apolloin whispered into the dawn wind and calmly sat back down to enjoy his tea. He was disturbed in his tranquility by a roar and a clattering noise that shook dust from the ceiling of the hut and spoiled his tea. Dawn had still only half arrived, but standing at the door, he could see a hulking brute made of square boxes sitting in the road. Two more of the same were behind it and three smaller brutes. Apolloin looked more carefully. There were twenty thin black rings painted around the long tube that stuck out of the upper box. Then there was a squeaking noise, and something opened from the top. At first Apolloin thought it was one of the foul ones, but then he saw it was a human. With his eye for beauty he saw her as comely, and buxom even by the standards of the daughters of Ham. Lieutenant Keisha Hooters Stevenson didn't feel comely. She was gray with exhaustion. Her hair under her communications helmet was matted, and her scalp stinging with sweat. She and the crew of Alpha-11 had been on the move all night, at first chasing down the fleeing remnants of the Northern Army. Later they'd split away, and were now swinging west and south across the rear of the Baldric Army. If it had been a human force, there would have been supply columns to devastate and rear area units to destroy. But here there was nothing, until they'd come to this tiny village. Here, they had to wait until the great ships of the desert, the Oshkosh heavy expanded mobility tactical trucks, could catch up with them and bring them new supplies of fuel for the greedy gas turbines and ammunition for their guns. Although Stevenson thought, they didn't need ammunition for all their kills. The road wheels and bellies of the Abrams and Bradleys were stained green and yellow with baldric blood. It was a dirty little secret of armored warfare that tanks killed infantry with their tracks just as often as they did with their guns. There were other dirty little secrets as well, of course. One of them, she had found, was that her physique wasn't perfectly suited to the inside of a cramped armored vehicle. Put quite bluntly, her breasts got in the way. Back in her first unit, their impressive size had got her the nickname of Hooters. Women in the army reacted to things like that one of two ways. They either got offended, kicked up a fuss and were eased out, or they sucked it up, gave back as good as they got, and were accepted. Stevenson had been one of the second group, but that didn't help her now. After being thrown around inside a fast-moving tank all night, she was sore, tired, bruised, and battered. And she had seen so much killing over the last twenty hours that she was a veteran with a veteran's lack of patience for stupidity. Still, the dawn chill felt good after being sealed down for so long. She looked around the village, saw people slowly coming out of the buildings to look at the great American tanks. 
she checked them over carefully, noting the glitter of silver from their covered heads. The word was spreading fast. Cover your head with foil if you don't want a baldric stealing your mind. Even out here in the back of beyond. The breeze sure did feel good, though, even though it gave her a shrewd idea of just how bad she must smell. She slipped the shoulder straps of her top off to get full benefit from the cool air. That caused a stir of disapproval from some of the men in the village, although she did note they kept staring at her to remind themselves how offended they felt. In his doorway, Apolloin saw the gesture and felt perturbed. She might be comely, but such brazen behavior was immodest. He stepped away from his doorway into the street, projecting an image of love and friendliness with all his might. Cover yourself, woman! And his kindly voice echoed across the street. Screw you! Stevenson's voice was harsh, for she was a veteran and didn't suffer fools gladly. And the horse you... Shit! Baldrick, 20 degrees left. Canister! She dropped back into the turret of her tank, by long practice ending the fall in her commander's position. The turret was already swinging to bear on her mark. Up! Uh, shoot! The gunner saw the crosshairs merge with the figure standing silhouetted against the rising sun. On the way! The blast of canister took Apolloin full in the chest, hurling him backwards and tearing at his body. Incredibly, it didn't kill him, although there was no way he would have survived wounds that terrible. It was the burst from the 25mm Bushmaster chain guns on the Bradleys that finished him off. Confused by the sudden vicious attack and in agony from the wounds, Apolloin died in a spreading pool of white blood. A few minutes later, Stevenson and her crew were looking down at the body, now revealed in its true form, a white humanoid with wings. Not the same as the ones we've killed so far, LT. Stevenson's crew were punctilious about addressing her correctly when others were around. Inside their tank she was Hooters, just as the gunner was Baldy, the loader Crab, and the driver Biker, but for them, using her nickname where outsiders could hear would be disrespectful. Not the same at all. I guess this is one of them angels. Doesn't matter. We declared war on them, too. She raised her voice slightly. Did anybody see where this one came from? One of the village women pointed at a barn-like building. Crab went over and looked inside, then came back, his face grim and as white as the body stretched out on the ground. You better take a look at this, LT. Stevenson went into the hut and looked for what seemed a long, long time. When she came back, her eyes were blank. Well, that puts paid to any idea about them being good guys, doesn't it? We need a camera crew up here to film that. Suddenly, she shook with rage. Damn him. He sat there drinking tea surrounded by that horror show, slaughtered an entire family, and then drank a cup of tea. Don't sweat it, LT. We've done good here. Nobody believed they were on the side of righteousness anymore, not after the message. Baldy was speaking from the barrel of the 120mm gun, where he had just finished painting a white ring to match all the black ones. Far away in the rocky wasteland, Memnon heard the crash of the gun and crackle of gunfire and decided he'd better vacate the area. Very quickly. Headquarters. Randy Institute of Pneumatology. The Pentagon. Arlington, Virginia. Next. James Randy sighed. It sounded so good using the enormous expertise his educational foundation had built up in detecting fraudulent psychics and mediums to try and find the real thing. It was hard to believe that the James Randi Educational Foundation was now the front line in humanity's fight against its enemies. Neither consideration changed the fact that the day-to-day -day reality of the task was boring. He had another candidate for testing, a young woman who called herself Kitten. No capital, he noted. Important thing, that. It was essential to make the interviewees comfortable. He heard the door open and glanced up. Years of expertise and self-control kept his face expressionless, but he knew this day at least would not be considered boring. Two people had entered the room, one a young man dressed all in black with a vaguely military-style coat that reached down below his knees. A goth, although that wasn't what had added interest to Randy's otherwise routine day. With him was a young woman, another goth dressed in black with her hair down around her shoulders, her long dress low-cut and held by thin shoulder straps. The young man was leading her around by a dog leash attached to a collar around her neck. You must be Kitten. Randy's voice was even. Would you like to take a seat? The girl paused for a second until the man with her gave a quick nod. Then she sat down. I'm Kitten, yes. You too, sir. Please sit down. The young man did so. Kitten, why are you here today? I read your advertisement asking for people who can contact the dead to call you. I can do that sometimes. I can also see into hell. 
I see. What's hell like? Some parts of it aren't too bad. Imagine a really destroyed city, one where all the buildings are smashed, the streets ruined, like those pictures of those World War II German cities after the Allied bombing, freezing cold, raining all the time, people gathered around burning garbage to keep warm, the only food available, trash from skips, and no hope, everybody knowing that it'll never be any different, never going to get any better. That's where I'm going when I die. I'm lucky some parts of hell are much, much worse. How long have you known this kit and been able to see these things? As long as I can remember. I'm not quite normal, you see. In fact, I'm very far from normal. Randy's secretary came in with a file and handed it over, being very careful to keep her face straight. Randy looked at the psychiatrist's report. It described Kitten as a paranoid schizophrenic with apocalyptic delusions, but added that she was perfectly well compensated, and despite her condition, was able to function in society without medication. In fact, the shrink had concluded, functionally she was the most well-adjusted person he dealt with, and that included his own staff. Randy allowed himself to smile at that. Then he flipped over to her birth certificate and he couldn't stop the look of surprise. Um, your birth certificate has you listed as male? I was born in the wrong body. I'm having it put right surgically. I've had these done already. She waved at her chest. We're saving up for the big operation now. Well, if you do well here, my government will pay for that operation for you. Behind them, General Asani had entered the room, as silently as always. Randy found it perturbing how she could move with so little disturbance. We have the best surgeons in the world for that type of operation, and my army will see you get the best of the best. Quite. Obviously, if your claims are proved, you will be very important to us. Randy hesitated, not quite certain how to address Kitten. Please use either she or it when referring to me. I don't want to be called he ever. Kitten spoke firmly and decisively on that point. Randy nodded. He could respect somebody who stuck to their guns regardless of public opinion. That's fine with us, Kitten. Now, did you sell your vision services to people to contact their relatives, that sort of thing? Kitten shook her head. How could I tell people what had happened to their friends, their family? It would be cruel. I've told close friends that I could see into hell, but that's all. That's very good. Right, Kitten, we are going to carry out some tests on you. We think we've detected how people can communicate across the dimensional barrier, and we can measure it. So we're going to see what happens when you try and look into hell. Sir. Randy switched to Kitten's friend. We have a very comfortable waiting room, or if you like, one of the guides can give you the Pentagon tour. Sir. Kitten spoke deferentially. I do this much better if I'm comfortable, and I'll be much more at ease if Danny is with me and holding my leash. So can he come in, please? If that's what you wish, of course. Randy dug into another file. We're going to ask you to try and contact these people. They are the crews of some helicopters that were lost in Iraq almost a fortnight ago. If you'd like to study these pictures, perhaps you can get through to them. He handed the pictures over. They were of Lieutenant Jade Broomstick Kim and the rest of the crews of Tango 15. Headquarters, Multinational Force Iraq, Green Zone Baghdad. Once again, General Petraeus was standing before the great screen in his command center, only this time it was linked directly to the Pentagon, the White House, and an increasing number of capitals around the world. The screen showed President Bush, Defense Secretary Warner and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, but he knew that many, many more people were watching than that. Sir, we have the initial reports from the battles on the flanks in. We have successfully routed both flanking forces. In the north, the 1st Armored is already outflanking the Baldrick main body and moving into positions to its west. In the south, the Iranian Shamshar Division under General Feri Dun Zolfagari is also outflanking the enemy, and we expect it will link up with the 1st Armored sometime tomorrow. At that point, the enemy main body will be completely encircled. Our casualties have been remarkably light. A Challenger main battle tank, a Bradley fighting vehicle, two Hemet trucks, and of all the soldiers involved in the fighting, only 25 have lost their lives. As far as we can tell at this time, all our losses were victims of harpy attacks. Enemy casualties? Secretary Warner spoke urgently. We're not into body counts, sir. Not after Vietnam, and the enemy dead are so smashed up it's impossible to tell how many there are. Details of the pursuit through the night are also only just coming in, and it appears the enemy believed that fighting would stop at dusk. We didn't oblige them, of course. We kept going and made it a 24-hour battle. During the process, 
we overran a lot of baldricks who had settled down for the night. So I cannot give you a figure I would be confident with. An estimate? A guess? Anything? At a conservative estimate, I would say the enemy cannot have lost less than 60,000 dead, probably many more. What's left of the flanking forces is falling back on their main body. That main body is still advancing on the center of our line. We expect them to launch their attacks in a few hours. We'll be concentrating all of our air power to sweep the sky clean of harpies. Once we've done that, the ground forces can repeat the punishment we handed out yesterday. If anything, the balance of forces is more favorable to us in the center than it was on the flanks. Once the harpies are out of the way, we can start using our helicopters over the battlefield again. How are your munitions supplies holding up? Warner's voice was concerned. Very well, sir. We are well supplied here. We built up a good stockpile in case Iran invaded us, and they built up an equal stockpile in case we invaded them. Some, not much but some, of the stocks are interchangeable, and the Russians are flying in more. There's a couple of IL-76s here now unloading rockets for the Iranian artillery. Secretary Warner, sir, may I ask how the production ramp-up is proceeding? We're okay for ground forces ammunition, but we're running through AIM-120s at a terrifying rate. After tomorrow, we're going to be real short. Not well, General. The problem is that so much of the need is interrelated. The AIM-120 is a good example. We're accelerating production of the missile as fast as we can, but we're short of guidance systems. We've got AIM-120 airframes backing up out of the door waiting for the guidance modules. Raytheon have come up with a partial fix. They've designed a new weapon, the Air-120. Essentially, it's an AIM-120 with a simple inertial stabilization system that keeps it flying straight and level. They've packed it with a warhead that's three times more powerful than the AIM-120 and given it a fast burn motor for high speed. It can be carried on a standard triple ejector rack in place of a single AIM-120. Raytheon will build as many AIM-120s as they can get guidance modules for, and the rest will be Air-120s. It's the same across the board, I fear. We'll get it straightened out, but we're running off stocks until we do. On the screen, Petraeus nodded. It was more or less what he had suspected. White House Conference Room, Washington, D.C. Thank you, General Petraeus. Dr. Sirleith, what are the results from our investigations of the Baldrics? They're going to start flooding in fast now, sir. We've had only limited samples to work with to date, but now, with all this in Iraq, that's going to change. And we've got the succubus that defected. We could learn a lot simply by dissecting her. No way. Director of National Intelligence Donald McLean Kerr jumped straight on the idea. She's the first live Baldrick we've got our hands on. We need to talk to her. She knows how hell is organized, what its chains of command are, what its social and political structures are like. We're not dealing with a different country here, or even a different world. We're dealing with an entirely different dimension. We need to know how that dimension works, what its economy is like, if indeed it has an economy. We need to know what sort of enemy we are fighting and what his resources are like. We can't get any of that from her dissected corpse. And suppose she won't tell you. Dr. Sirleith jumped straight back. We could always waterboard her. How do you know she can't breathe water? Secretary Rice's voice was droll. Exactly my point. Sirleith was getting impassioned. Military and political data is all very well. Economic information too. But first we need to know much more about the Baldricks themselves. How do they work? Can we get some idea of what powers they take for granted but seem magical to us? I'm sorry, Don, but investigation of the Baldricks themselves must come first, which is rather unfortunate for her, of course. Gentlemen. The room quieted as President Bush spoke. You are forgetting that this succubus came over to us on a promise that she would not be ill-treated. We did not make that promise, but it was made to her on our behalf by our allies. We cannot go back on our word. We must not. She didn't defect voluntarily. She had a ring of guns pointed at her. I know. If she'd fought, she'd still probably have killed some of those women. She chose not to. Sir. General Petraeus spoke from the screen. There is a practical side to this as well. We have one defector who came over on a promise of good treatment. How we treat her may very well decide how many more Baldricks decide to surrender, or even better, defect. If they get the idea that surrendering is a way out from certain death facing our tanks and artillery, it might end this war more quickly. It may very well mean fewer of our people get killed. Treating surrendered enemy personnel with extreme brutality has never worked to the favor of those committing such acts. I agree. 
Secretary Warner added his emphasis. We've danced on a thin line during the war on terror and shot ourselves in the foot doing it. We should not repeat that mistake. General Secretary Warner, your practical comments add weight to my instincts on this. Dr. Sirleith, you may investigate the succubus using non-invasive methods provided they do not inflict harm upon her. You may, with her consent, take blood samples, etc. But there will be no dissection, is that clear? Sirleith nodded, unhappily but still a nod. Mr. Randy, how is your end of this going? Very well, sir. We made a breakthrough today. A young... Randy hesitated and then decided to keep going. Woman came in. She can see into hell. We have her trying to contact some of our deceased personnel now. Hunting through psychics and mediums was a false step. None of them turned out to be anything other than common mountebanks and tricksters. But we have found some interesting cases under psychiatric care. Also, our advertisements have brought in a few people with promise. We have another young lady who can get into the mind of a demon, and she's exploiting that right now. As soon as we can work out how to expand that from talking to one demon into talking to all of them at once, we'll launch Radio Free Hell. Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, United States of America. Luga Sharmanaska was utterly bewildered. She'd been on Earth not so long ago, a mere couple of centuries, but she'd had nothing like these experiences then. How had all these machines suddenly appeared? She'd flown for hours in a huge sky chariot, one loaded down with crates of more things called supplies. The crew had been nice to her, of course. That was inevitable. They'd offered her food and drink, and she'd accepted it, even though it wouldn't quench her appetite much. Her body craved raw meat, preferably torn from a still-living body, and the things she'd been given didn't even come close. Just what was a hot pocket, anyway? She could have adapted more easily to the sights around her if there weren't so many of them. The city she had been assigned to was bad enough, all those tiny chariots racing around, but this great field was full of the huge sky chariots. Even as she watched, a different one was coming into land. To her incredulous eyes, it changed even while it did so, its swept back wings suddenly swinging forward to reach straight out. Then it touched down on the long black strip and started to slow. Immediately a band started playing, making her jump. Yeah, bands do that. The Air Force policeman watching her was sympathetic. Of course. Her mind mask didn't work anymore, but the miasma was still doing its job of creating sympathy with the humans around her. It's the 32nd Tactical Fighter Wing standing up. That's the first F-111 to rejoin the Air Force. None of that made much sense to Luga Sharmanaska. She did note one thing, though. The sky chariot that had brought her was painted light gray. The one that had just landed was a cloudy mix of gray and orange-red. It never occurred to her that its paint job was an exact match to the skies of hell. A long black ground chariot had pulled up, and she was escorted into the back seat. The driver looked at her with hate that quickly faded to mild affection. The door closed behind her and the chariot pulled away. Luga Sharmanaska couldn't see where the horses were hidden. Still, it didn't matter. What did matter was that she was safe. She quickly recalled the split second of blind panic when she looked at the ring of guns pointed at her and knew death was but a split second away. Miasma had done its work. Luga Sharmanaska didn't know it, but the panic had kicked her glands into working overtime and secreting human pheromones that created sympathy for her with everybody around. That had bought her just enough time. She'd worked her situation out with speed and hedged her bets by surrendering. If the demons won, she would have fulfilled her mission and penetrated the enemy leadership, gaining vital information. She would have done her duty and be rewarded. If the humans won, and looking around her Luga Sharmanaska had an unpleasant feeling they might, she would be the first defector and would also be well rewarded. No matter who won, she would be safe. Sacramento, California Norman Baines sighed and rubbed his eyes and glanced at his watch. He'd been sitting in front of his computer for about ten hours, plowing through a week's worth of reports for his job. He didn't actually have to work forty hours, as long as it looked like he did. Time for breakfast. Victor, one of his cats and self-appointed overseer, gave a roar of approval as he hopped down and padded after Baines towards the kitchen. Two other cats, Roger and Clarence, soon joined him as they all gathered around their communal bowl. Baines peeked through the kitchen blinds and gave the sky a glance. No eternal darkness yet, he said with a wry grin. His boys looked up at him curiously. 
Looks like the betting pool is still open. With that, Victor, Clarence, and Roger bent down to their dry food. Fixing a bowl of nondescript bachelor chow, he wandered over to the couch and turned on the TV. He sighed at the empty beer cans on the coffee table. They were his way of coping with the betrayal he'd felt after the message came out. A man in his late twenties, Baines had been very active in his church. A faithful man, but also fairly rational. And, as Dawkins had said, extraordinary claims required extraordinary evidence. He'd gone to services once, but it had seemed hollow. Now he spent his days processing reports for his job from his home computer, enjoying the relative safety of his home. Picking up the remote, he flipped through the channels. Hey kids, it's Bill Nye the Science Guy here. Be sure to keep your foil hats on at all times. You can never be too safe. Let's see how science protects you from the ball drip. The top 10 signs that annoying guy in your office might be a demon. Number 10, instead of decaf, he drinks brims. And if you act now, we'll throw in a fifth digital camera for free so you can monitor your home for demons 24 seven. Coming through the desert in West Iraq. If you come to East Compton, I'm gonna bust a cap. Don't bring your demon shit up in my hood. The crypts are rolling large and we up to no good. Bane sighed and looked at Clarence, now bathing himself on the recliner. I don't know if it's more disconcerting that he's rapping about demons or that it's a good tune. There was a loud knock at the door. He walked over and picked up a digital camera. Opening the door, he turned it on and looked at the screen. Humans. He looked up and his eyes widened. It was in fact two men in suits and two men in army uniforms carrying automatic weapons. Norman L. Baines? One of the suited men asked. Y yes sir. Baines stammered. It was a strange feeling to be unused to talking to someone else. He hadn't said five words to a human being since the message. He stuck out a foot to prevent Victor from making an escape. My name is Robert O'Shea. I'm with the Pentagon. This is my colleague, Dr. Watts. May we have a few moments of your time? He stood solidly, implying that his request was nothing but. Dr. Watts, however, looked like someone who would rather be anywhere else. Um, sure. Come on in. Baines shook himself out of his momentary daze and ushered the men in, hurriedly moving dirty dishes and stacks of books and papers out of the way. One guard remained at the front door and the other simply nodded to O'Shea and began to move through the house. Please, sit down. Baines gestured to a dingy sofa. O'Shea sat down, but Dr. Watts remained standing, studying one of Baines's bookcases. How can I help you guys? We wanted to talk to you about your book, Mr. Baines. O'Shea opened his briefcase and pulled out a thick, collated document bound in plastic. I... I never... Baines took the book and his eyes bulged as he read the cover, The Science of Hell, by N.L. Baines. But this wasn't published. Where... How in the hell did you even get... He looked at O'Shea. Charlie gave it to you, that bastard... That's right, Mr. Baines. Your brother gave this to us. Don't be hard on him, though. The president recently signed an executive order requesting all knowledge of demonology and demon history be surrendered to our department. Had Lieutenant Baines withheld this document, he could have been tried for treason. O'Shea leaned in closely, his eyes scrutinizing Baines inch by inch. Where do you get your information, Mr. Baines? Baines's mind swam. He'd had this same feeling in graduate school when he showed up for his final on archaeological methods after spending the night cramming for medieval literature. What, uh, I just kind of read up on it. It's a hobby, you know? A snort from Dr. Watts drew Baines' attention to the bookshelf. This is the key of Solomon. Baines shrugged. In Latin, that's a bit more than a hobby, Mr. Baines. Baines felt his hackles rise. And what, I'm supposed to trust that dipwad Mathers to translate it correctly for me? Watts wasn't listening as he pawed through more books. O'Shea, look at this nonsense. A field guide to demons, a dictionary of angels, dragon magic, secrets of the Vatican, Norse runes and magic. He shook his head in disgust. He's just a nut. We're wasting our time. Baines was on his feet in an instant. O'Shea was startled that this mild-mannered scientist could look so enraged. Now you listen to me, you pompous, self-assured G-man prick. I don't come into the Pentagon and tell you how to polish your desk and shuffle your papers, so don't tell me what I know in my own house. He took the books out of Watts' hands and pointed at the couch. By the way, you're right. Most of what's in these books is ridiculous superstition and nonsense, collected by centuries of nut jobs. However, his voice began to change into the voice of an excited professor, and O'Shea was briefly reminded of his history professor back at NYU. Watts rolled his eyes. For example? Baines sighed condescendingly. Kihabet aris audiendi audiet. 
All right, Captain PhD, take a look at this. Baines walked over to a wall and pulled down a large hanging rug with a flourish revealing a large chart. There were handwritten notes, string, and pictures all over it. Both men stared blankly, as though unsure if Baines might turn into a baldric at any moment. This, he pointed to the chart, is just about every book ever written about Judeo-Christian demons in hell set chronologically. He pointed to lines connecting them. As you were so kind to point out, they're about 85 to 95 percent crap, but they have common threads, and those threads migrate over time. He traced the lines with his fingers. You can see here's Old Testament pre-Christian stuff, and it trends onward, and then bam. He stopped at a prominent zig. Constantine and the Roman Empire. Changes opinions, but some things stay the same. We also have shifts during the Dark Ages, and a big shift with Dante. But if you look hard enough, you can sift through the crap and find out what makes sense. Makes sense? Robert, this man is a geologist. Dr. Watts got up and walked toward the opposite wall. He scratched some paint from the wall, revealing silvery metal underneath. And his entire house is wrapped in aluminum foil. I'd wonder if anything doesn't make sense to him. Wait a second. Baines raised a hand. I did my house like this because I have an aluminum allergy. You got a better idea? And for your information, doctor. Again, he spat out the word. I only work as a geologist. You have my book. You have my file. You know what I've studied. But it's obvious you're here because you want to know what I know. Baines spoke slowly and with purpose, as though he were waking up from a dream and finding the real world was a much better place for once. It makes sense to me, Watts. And remember, he figured out how demons could fly before we knew they existed. O'Shea stood up and walked towards the chart. His fingers traced various threads, and as he looked at Baines, he felt he was seeing the man for the first time. He may be a little crazy, but you should see the people Randy is getting. He pulled out a cellular phone and pressed a button. He's a keeper. He closed the phone. Norman, how'd you like to go to Washington? The front door opened and soldiers came in with boxes and handcarts. Baines waved them off. Whoa, 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 back the truck up. He glanced warily at O'Shea. I've got a job here and you still haven't told me who you're working with. The agent handed him a card. Department of Intelligence and Military Operations. Netherworld. Demon? Kudos to your acronym department. You're kidding me, right? His smirk faded as he looked at his living room. There were two government agents, two armed soldiers, and four more soldiers loading his entire library and home into boxes. Have I been drafted? Not exactly, Norman. It's kind of like eminent domain. You've been forcibly hired. O'Shea stuck out his hand and smiled for the first time. Welcome to government work, Mr. Baines. The pay sucks, but you get to kill things and nobody will call you crazy. Baines felt weak at first, with everything moving so quickly around him, but he then gave O'Shea's hand a firm pump and said resolutely, I'll go get my lightsaber, and then we can go. Then he thought for a second. What about my cats? O'Shea sighed quietly. You have carry boxes? They might as well come too. Nothing could be crazier than the way things are going right now. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. The six newcomers followed the woman along the banks of the Styx. She moved swiftly and surely, as though she'd been along this way a thousand times before. As they waded through the mud, she spoke back over her shoulder. You're lucky they put you here in this part of the Styx. This ring is ten miles across. You could have been walking for several days to get to Dis. What's Dis? Jade Kim asked. Satan's capital. His palace is there. All the administration is run out of there as well. It surrounds the whole of hell like a wall. And you're taking us there? Kim's voice was loaded with suspicion. Of course, said the woman. That's where the Resistance is headquartered. Tell us about the Resistance. The woman smiled. It's hard to know where to start. You see, the Resistance has a long history. It's been around almost as long as I have. And how old are you? And who are you? Kim's growing suspicion and dislike for this woman made getting an answer very urgent. I've been dead for 10,000 years. The woman laughed at the expression on their faces. Why are you so surprised? Once you're dead, you're effectively immortal. Aging is slowed by orders of magnitude, and you're healthy and robust so the torment doesn't put you under. As for who I am, you may have heard of me. My name is Rahab. That's right, that Rahab. The woman's voice was bitter. I betrayed my country to help the Israelites and their God, and he tossed me down here anyway. So if there's been a resistance for all these years, why hasn't hell been overthrown? It can't be. This is it. There's nothing more. We can't overthrow the order here. All we can do is try to disappear, 
save ourselves from torment. That's not as hard as it sounds. Hell is a big place, and it takes a long time to move around in it or communicate. I've just finished a two-month walk from Dis down to Cositis, up to the first ring, and back. The fact that there are constant patrols is a real problem, and though they don't really go out of their way to look, if they see anything untoward, they light on it immediately. And one demon is more than a match for four or five people. Then how did we manage to take down that baldric? To be blunt, you got lucky. He came down for a spot of torture and fun, and you surprised him before he could react. If he'd seen you guys free before you were on him, he'd have called for some help and then zapped you with lightning from a distance. Once again, the members of Tango 1-5 exchanged glances. The picture they were getting was that the so-called resistance wasn't resisting at all. At best, they were an escape group, an underground railway that tried to keep themselves away from the pits that made up the rings of hell. It seemed as if the people here had accepted the line that this was the ultimate end of things, that any effort to change it was doomed to futility. Kim looked around. They were on the edge of the river, if it could be called that. It was more like a rippling strip of clear water through the mucky water surrounding it. Ahead of them, through the vile, thick mist, they saw a tall stone tower looming. Rahab turned and put a finger to her lips, then sank lower into the mist, crouching into the mud. She moved forward slowly. Kim followed suit but kept looking around. The tower moved closer and closer and she looked up. At the top, suddenly, a flare burst into existence with a foomp. The light from the signal fire lit everything around them in a dull orange glow, making the mist look a bit like tomato soup. Abruptly, their guide ducked under the muck. Kim caught a glimpse of a towering silhouette looming through the mist before she followed suit. Except, she didn't duck all the way. Instead, she sank down as far as she could go while keeping her face above the surface of the mud. Simultaneously, she shrank back toward a clump of stringy, greasy grass. The baldric passed within five feet of her. It was mounted on what looked like an oversized rhinoceros with a scorpion tail arched overhead. A rhino lobster. She recognized it an instant later from that last mission in Iraq, which was wading through the swamp. Looking neither left nor right, the baldric reined his mount forward when it sniffed and started at something, and kept moving until the mist had swallowed it. The baldric itself had been huge, twice the height, and probably four or five times the weight of the one they'd killed back there. Rahab surfaced from the mud as the rest of the Tango flight members came up for air. If you'd attacked him, you'd have had no chance, she said. Though that was all, the words had clearly been aimed at Kim who had her own thoughts on the matter. It was very easy to think of 10,000 reasons why something could not be done. It took a different mindset to think of the way it could be achieved. Kim had her own ideas there. She'd thought of two ways of taking the mounted patrol down already, although much depended on what could be found locally. She'd seen the black outcrops that spoke of coal and coal meant powdered carbon. This whole area was volcanic, and that meant sulfur. Now, if there was only some saltpeter around, they had the start of an IED. Keep a lookout for yellow deposits, she whispered to her people. Ahead of you, LT. Already been looking. There's some in the rocks. We're two for three so far, and there's some pretty crystals that might be good for fragments. They moved on for a while before Rahab broke silence and asked, So what are things like back topside? McInery piped up. We were all pilots in the 106 special operations in Iraq when the message came. Lost a tenth of the regiment, then didn't do much of anything until the Hellmouth opened in western Iraq and we got sent out to take a look at the Baldrick advance. Took down the command structure of a regiment, then got outrun by harpies and taken down. The woman was smiling bemusedly. You lost me at message. Kim exchanged glances with McInery. You don't know about the message? No, not about this message. It wouldn't have been the first, you know. Basically, God said that heaven was closed and told everyone to lay down and die. So those people who really believed laid down and died, and the rest of us had no idea what to do. Then the Navy shot down some baldricks, I mean, some demons, and showed us they could be killed. So we started to fight, doing pretty good, too. There was a bridge coming up out of the thinning mist now, next to the road they'd been waiting beside for some time. Rahab turned and said, Stay low and follow me single file. She crouched and moved beside the road to the base of the bridge, then slipped underneath. The members of Tango Flight followed suit. There, bolted to the base of the bridge, was a rope that stretched across the river beneath the arch of the roadway. 
The woman took hold of the rope and started pulling herself hand over hand across the river. Kim looked at McInery, shrugged, and followed. On the far side, Rahab crouched and hissed. Okay, this is the most dangerous part. The walls that separate the fourth and fifth circles of hell are right up on the other side of this embankment, and they are constantly manned. The guards are vigilant, and they will see you if you poke your head up. So you stay low and follow me as fast as you can. Kim nodded. Seer, still in the evade part. Rahab turned and crouching ran to a rock outcropping sticking up several dozen meters away. She looked around, then beckoned. Single file, the escaped soldiers followed, making sure to stay crouched. They followed her from formation to formation, putting distance between them and the bridge as quickly as possible. At one large boulder, they stopped, and Rahab pointed back. Just at the edge of vision, the bridge stretched back into the mist covering the far shore of the sticks. Across it snaked a long, black column of baldrics. It was following the road up the embankment to the plain and across that to the city, whose high walls were visible even here. When they moved on after a short rest break, the column was still marching with no end in sight. They must have found that body you crucified. See how they react? Rahab's voice had a mixture of conceit and spite in it. Kim looked at her steadily. Apparently she couldn't see the baldric column was marching out and not in. At length, the woman led them up the incline and onto the plain, one that was littered with what looked to be bonfires, although from the distance it was hard to tell. She moved purposefully forward, and as they followed her, Kim got a chance to more closely examine the bonfires. They weren't bonfires. They were what looked like burning coffins of all things. On some, the lids were half off. She could hear groans and cries of pain drifting out of them. Rahab stopped at one coffin, which was glowing dully. What sort of metal is it? McInery idly asked. Bronze. Everything here is bronze, said Rahab as she bent down and casually lifted the lid off. The hissing sound as the metal seared her flesh was audible. Kim gasped. What the hell? The woman shrugged. It'll heal in no time, she gestured. In you go. Kim looked down. The coffin had no bottom. Instead, it was a stairwell. The top two stairs were afire, but the rest looked cool enough. Hesitantly, Kim stepped in and gingerly hopped down to the third stair before crouching and continuing down. There was certainly pain in her feet, but it wasn't unbearable, and the cool stone on them felt good. The rest of her team followed, wincing and grunting as they crossed the fire. Then the woman jumped into the coffin, grabbed the lid, and swung it back on. It fell on with a dull clank, and what little light there was vanished, save that cast by the flickering flames above. There was a flare and more light. The woman was holding a torch, one she'd obviously picked up from the stash Kim could see on the fourth step. She descended and brushed by them, then took the lead. They followed her for what seemed like miles before the tunnel opened into a room. As they stepped into the cave, Kim realized that her feet didn't hurt anymore. The room was well lit by torches ensconced in the wall, and there were some chairs and a sleeping pad in the corner. She sat down and gestured to some chairs. Please sit. For the first time, Kim began to relax and felt the adrenaline slowly draining out of her. She recognized the signs, end of patrol-itis, something that had killed more soldiers than most other mistakes. Assuming that the danger was over because they were about to re-enter their base, the getting ambushed when their guard was down. Kim kicked herself hard, mentally. Danger was never over down here. She could never let her guard down, especially with this woman. Anyway, continued Rahab, you need to tell me about this message and everything that's happened since. And they did. They told her about the message and the people's death, the declaration of war on hell and heaven. Yahweh's in on this too? Wondered Rahab out loud, and the opening of the hell gate in the wastes of western Iraq. When they were done, the woman sat for a long time in silence. Then she said, If you will excuse me, I will be gone for a couple of days. I will be back to take you to our leader. Then Rahab stood and exited the room. What do you think, LT? Kim looked around at the room. We're like rats in a trap here, and I don't like it. And I don't trust that woman. Her main priority appears to be keeping out of the way of the guards and not getting caught. I can understand that, LT. So can I, but Uncle Sugar doesn't pay us to sit around. She must guess that and knows we are set on stirring things up around here. 
That could easily mean things get pretty precarious for people who just want to keep their heads down. I'd say it's a 50-50 bet she's arranging to turn us in right now, if she isn't actually part of the security system. There were nods. A fake resistance movement that drew in likely recruits so they could be quietly killed was a tactic as old as the hills. The company had been running similar things in Iraq before the message had come through, and Satan was known as being the Prince of Lies. Yeah, LT, and she's pretty bitter about Yahweh sending her down here. That could easily translate into her working with the other guy. So let's get the hell out of here. McInery spoke decisively. Kim agreed. It was against the grain to stay in one place under these circumstances. They made their way back up to the surface and out. Then they moved as fast as they could to put as much ground between them and the hiding hole as possible. A few hours later, well concealed from any observers on the walls towering high above them, they came to a stop. What next, LT? First priority. Find a way of attacking and killing one of those big baldricks on a rhino lobster. An ID should do it. They're supposed to be so invulnerable taking one down will be a real blow. That bridge. Now if we could blow it under a baldric column. Kim laughed at that one. We'll need something more than gunpowder to do that. What did you think of that column, by the way? They were marching out, LT. Being pulled out of here for something else. The only thing I can think of that would warrant that kind of movement is fighting us. Agreed. A sign our boys are doing well back there? Then her face froze. There was a voice playing in her head. Hello, is this Lieutenant Jade Kim? Hello? What's the matter, LT? Got voices in my head. Sound like us. Human. Hold one. This is Kim. Identify. I'm Kitten. I'm in the Pentagon. I've been asked to try and find you. Authenticate 286. Kim snapped the numbers out. There was a long pause and Kim was about to give up when the voice came back. Sorry. We took some time to find the security number from the night you were shot down. Authentication is 205. Jade Kim tried to stop herself cheering. Guys, we're through. Somehow the brass have found a way to get word through to us. I think we're back in the army. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. There was no restraint in the laboratory. The cheering could be heard outside the doors and all down the corridor. Randy stuck his head around the corner, beaming at the sight of his staff dancing up and down. I take it something worked? Kitten got through to those helicopter pilots. They're on the line now. How solid is the contact? Very, sir. Kitten spoke respectfully. It's comfortable to hold and there's no fade. Ask her where she is and what her situation is. Kitten's eyes defocused while she spoke with Kim. She says she's in the fifth circle of hell. She and her unit have escaped from captivity. They've started to set up a resistance. They've already killed a baldric. The resistance is called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Hell. She says they need supplies if we can get them to her. Is there a resistance already? Escape prisoners and so on? Another long pause. Yes. But Kim says she doesn't trust them. Their main priority is keeping their heads down and avoiding recapture. Her plan is to keep them at arm's length until she and her unit have stirred things up enough so that they don't have any choice about joining the insurgency. She also says there are signs of major troop movements out of hell itself, suggesting more forces are being readied for the invasion of Earth. She's asking how well the army is doing up here. That's my girl. General Shatton had entered the room quietly. Tell her we're kicking ass and taking names. We've won the first two battles big time. Then, Kitten, find out what Kim's supply priorities are, please. Tell Kim we can't promise we'll get stuff through to her. But if it's possible, we will. Once again, Kitten's eyes defocused. First priority is webbing so they can carry stuff. Then, she wants C4 explosives. Or better if we can send it. M24 claymores, AT4 anti-tank rockets, and radios. Detonators of as many types as possible. She says an M82A150 caliber sniper rifle would be nice as well. Shatton finished writing the list on a pad. Can we get back through to her any time? I think so, sir. It should be easier to reopen the link than it was to find her. Very well. Tell her we'll be back in touch. We don't want to keep this link open all the time. It's a security risk. Very good, sir. Kitten's eyes blanked out again, then returned to life. She's gone, sir. I wished her luck on your behalf. Thank you, Kitten. Shatton's voice was kindly. I just hope we can send her a bit more than good luck. Headquarters, Army of Abagor, Western Iraq. It had been dusk when the flyer had arrived. Abagor had been standing outside his tent, 
basking in the last rays of the setting sun when the flyer had staggered in. A very badly wounded flyer, its body dreadfully burned along one side, its damaged wing causing it to fly unevenly. As it approached, Abigor saw that it had lost an eye from the same burns that affected the rest of its body. Your Excellency, I bring word from General Marifalazes. Abigor looked at the battered flyer. Was this the best Marifalazes could send to bring news of his victory? It was insult. Abigor paused for a second. A deliberate insult? Was this Marifalazes' attempt at deposing him? What word? His voice was curt and irritable. Sire, terrible news. The army of the North has been defeated. It is in full retreat, heading south. The enemy are pursuing it in their iron chariots. They move fast, sire, faster than the swiftest beast. As our infantry run, they are being crushed by the chariots. It is a disaster, Marifalas says. Beware of the fire lances and the iron chariots, for our forces are helpless against them. Defeated? Abigor was stunned by the news. How? The humans have terrible magic, sire. They cause the ground to erupt and swallow our infantry whole. Their fire lances tear them apart. They can call up thunder at will, and their breath leaves nothing but the dead where they breathed. In the sky, their fire lances seek us out no matter how much we twist and turn. One touch from them is death, sire. One passed close to me, did not even hit me, and look what its fire did. Abigor listened in shocked disbelief. There was no way this story could be faked. No duke would admit to so crushing a defeat. No demonic army had been defeated. Not since that defeat, the one before time had properly begun. Abigor had been at that battle and known defeat then. He remembered its taste and suddenly after countless eons his mouth was filled with it again. Come to my tent. Tell me all that you know. He saw the flyer hesitate. You have nothing to fear. That's what they all say, the flyer thought before they kill the bringer of bad news. An hour later, Abigor was trying to absorb the flyer's description of the battle. He had his own battle plan marked out on his map. It was essentially a larger repeat of Marifalazes' attack. Cavalry first to break up the enemy line, then the infantry in a thick mass to swarm over the wreckage and finish the enemy off. He had his twenty-eight infantry legions in a huge block, seven legions wide, four deep, the ranks massed tight and deep. By all that was traditional, it should have been invincible. Marifalazes had thought that. Now his army was dead or running. They hid behind the hill, you say? Abigor's voice was thoughtful. Sire, they did. They were lined up behind the ridge where they could not be seen by our force. Only after our army had been almost destroyed by their magic, and we flyers slaughtered by their sky chariots, did they venture over the crest and charge us. Even then they did not dare to fight in honorable hand-to-hand -hand combat, but let loose their firebolts at us from a distance. Only when our comrades lay wounded and helpless did they close on us, and then they crushed the wounded under their chariots. The wounded flyer dropped back to his knees again, still not quite sure he could believe the fact he was alive and uneaten. Abigor thought the information over. He had to change plans. His original was an open invitation to a massacre by the human mages. His mind mulled the information over. His original front was over a mile long with the ranks extending almost two miles backwards. If he lined his legions up in single row, they would form a front almost five miles long. His mind chewed away. The human magic slaughtered by area. Why stop at lining up his legions side by side? There was no need for the legions to maintain their block, 81 ranks deep. Suppose each legion formed three blocks 27 ranks deep, and those blocks were lined side by side. Why that meant a front approaching 15 miles wide? Abigor stared at his map. With a front like that, he could extend beyond the range of the human mages and their magic, envelop their flanks and roll them up. It was brilliant. It was also, of course, against every concept of demonic warfare. Battles were decided by massive blows aimed at the center of the enemy force, the two masses colliding and slugging it out. This idea of thinning his lines and enveloping the enemy was wrong, somehow. Yet the humans were wrong. They didn't fight like warriors. They lacked the spirit to close in to hand-to-hand -hand combat range. That hadn't always been the case. There had been examples in the past when humans fought demons hand-to-hand. -hand. They'd always lost, of course. He wrote the new orders down on parchment, and then added another thought. The enemy mages had to be on that ridge line. If they could be prevented from casting their spells, that would be a major part of the enemy's defense gone. So he added another line, 
ordering all the infantry to keep firing their tridents as rapidly as they could recharge them. It didn't matter if they hit anything, just to keep that ridge crest under continuous fire. Then, he turned his attention back to the flyer still cowering in a corner. You, what is your name? Some of Oning Kranfat, sire. I need you to take these messages to the Legion commanders. It must be done tonight. Abigor was about to issue the usual blood-curdling threats when he stopped himself. This one had flown in with the messages, although terribly wounded. Hell ran on fear and terror, but surely nothing could be worse than what this flyer had already faced. Tomovonin Cranfat, you have already served me well, and I thank you for everything you have already done. I see your wounds and know how much this must cost you, but these messages must get through. To Abigor's astonishment, Tomovonin Cranfat drew himself up. Your wish is my will, sire. And he left clutching the parchments in his unburned hand. Behind him, Abigor felt another wave of surprise. Could it be that it wasn't necessary to terrorize everybody in sight in order to get things done? That praise and trust could sometimes work as well? Headquarters, Multinational Force Iraq, Green Zone Baghdad. They're moving. The great screen in General Petraeus's command center was showing a sudden surge of activity in the Baldric army that lay along the Wadi al-Gudrat. Formations were beginning to move, shifting sideways, the deployment changing. Far over their heads, the Global Hawk was faithfully recording everything they did, but what it could not do was tell General Petraeus why they were doing it. That he had to work out for himself. A night attack, sir? An aide spoke with unease. It was hard to make a guess based on intentions with so little to go on. Could be they're moving sideways, though, not forward, extending their line. I'd guess this move started when word of what happened on their flank started to trickle in. Perhaps they're trying to replace the flank cover we destroyed yesterday. Captain David Tall was jumping in with both feet as usual. Could be. Petraeus repeated the same words absent-mindedly. Any other suggestions? This was his school for captains, the time when his aides were invited to give their opinions on what the situation on the display actually meant and what should be done about it. Later they would compare their opinions with what had really happened and learn. I think they're scared. Captain Ellen Yarborough flushed slightly as the general looked straight at her. Why do you say that, Ellen? Because they don't know what hit them yesterday. They're still trying to piece it all together. Look what hit us over the last 24 hours. Cavalry, phalanxes of infantry. I mean real phalanxes, general. Only those harpies were anything even remotely modern. Now look what hit them. Tanks, MCVs, artillery, MLRS. It's completely outside their terms of reference. So they don't know what hit them. What they do know, sir, is what we did to them. I bet the commander over there has reports coming in and he's trying to make sense of them. He's noted we kill wholesale, not retail. So he's thinning his troops out, trying to reduce his casualties by giving us less to shoot at. He's also extending his front and might hope to outflank us, but that's a secondary thing. Anybody have any comments on that? Petraeus looked around. It means he's pretty smart. They didn't fight smart yesterday. Tall looked around at the group gathered around the screen. Oh, yes, they did. Another officer, Captain Keith Renshaw, cut in. They fought very smart in their own terms. Can you imagine trying to stop that attack with spears and bows? They'd have stomped straight through us. And they kept going even while we slaughtered them. Can you imagine a human army taking a battering like that and keeping up the advance? I can't. Important point that, Keith. Petraeus spoke approvingly. They showed a lot of guts. They didn't change plans, though. That tells us something about how fast their command structure can handle changes. Ellen, you make a good point as well. The commander over there is responding to what happened, doing so pretty fast. He paused and looked at the display again. It had updated to show the Baldric positions moving further sideways. Whether he's simply reducing the richness of the target environment or has thoughts about outflanking us doesn't matter. What he's doing gives him the option and we have to allow for it. Any suggestions? Ellen? The critical point is here, at HIT. If HIT falls and it's right on our front line, our extreme right flank, he can cross the Euphrates and come down between the river and the Buheirat Athathar. Cut us off from our supply lines. We have two brigades from the 4th Infantry Division in reserve. I suggest we order one of them to move to cover that area, position them east of Aqaba with the divisional M270s in support. That way they can either block the Baldric advance, or if they don't cross the river, swing and hit their left flank. Comments? 
Petraeus looked around. Sounds good to me. There was a mutter of agreement. That's because it is good. Gives us plenty of options. One change, the MLRS launchers stay where they are. They have the range to support the fourth from their present positions, and we might need that firepower. 25th Mechanized and 10th Mountain can provide most of what we need, but I want to keep one battalion of M270s on a ready-to-shoot basis in case of unexpected developments. Thank you. Petraeus turned back to his display. The Baldrick line was definitely extending and thinning. Yarborough had been right. They were learning fast. Not fast enough, though. Demon Conference Room, The Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. Donuts and coffee, ladies and gentlemen. And, um, other lady. There was a quick stir as people descended on the refreshments, trying not to be seen as too keen to grab the iced donuts. Luga Sharmanaska looked at the plates with a distaste and a certain element of despair. It had been a week since she had eaten, and her body was screaming for raw meat. These balls of fried plants were of no use to her. You don't like donuts, Luga? I eat meat. Fresh meat. Not vegetables. Donuts aren't vegetables. One of the women present, a dedicated vegan, didn't like the way this conversation was going. Donuts are made of flour, yes? Flour is from plants. Plants are vegetables, so donuts are vegetables. I gotta try that on my doctor. One of the men spoke quietly, but the vegan lady still glared at him. Robert O'Shea was speaking to the Pentagon kitchens on the telephone. They had some standing ribs down there, and he asked for the largest to be sent up. Beef all right, Luga? Human is better, but any meat will be good. She noted the expression on the faces of the rest of the people in the room. You do not eat your dead? No. It was a short, clipped phrase. How strange. So you just waste them. Luga Sharmanaska shrugged, and then her eyes lit up as the raw meat arrived. She grabbed the joint and ripped at it with her teeth, tearing off large lumps and swallowing them. The vegan lady nearly fainted. There was a general agreement that they'd learned a first important thing about the Baldricks. Their table manners were appalling. If we might get started. O'Shea looked at Luga Sharmanaska, who was still grunting, snorting, and tearing at her meat. He couldn't help thinking it was a charming sight to see somebody enjoying their food so much. First item, communications. We can communicate back up to hell on a one-to-one -one basis, but that's all. Luga, how do we open a portal? You can talk to people back home. Then you can open a portal. Just add more power. Get more of your mages to add their power to the message. First, you can get messages through. Then, with more power, the message opens a gate. It's easy. As long as you use a Nephilim to contact. What's a Nephilim? The vegan lady wanted to keep Luga Sharmanaska talking in case she decided she wanted some more meat and created another display like the previous one. The stripped bones were still on the table to remind her of what that sight had been like. Idly, Luga Sharmanaska picked one of the ribs up, cracked it open with her teeth, and sucked out some marrow. Nephilim are humans with demon ancestry. A long time ago, when we were here before, we mated with humans. We succubi still do. Sometimes there are offspring from such matings that are both human and demon. Now the demon ancestry in a Nephilim is mostly very small, but enough remains. We can contact them even from our dimension. Luga Sharmanaska thought carefully. How could her information be valuable without giving away too much? We can make you see what we want you to see, but we must be able to see you for that. But with Nephilim, we can contact and make messages without seeing. Is that how you come to Earth? Yes. We contact a Nephilim and use our mind mask to establish a message link. Then our leaders add more power and form a gate we can step through. Luga Sharmanaska looked around and saw the growing affection in the eyes of the people around her and gratitude for her assistance. She was doing well, and her stomach was full at last. Only one person present didn't like her, and that was the woman who had complained about eating meat. Luga Sharmanaska eyed her and wondered, purely academically, and without any intention of actually trying, what she would taste like. Observation Room. Demon. The Pentagon. Arlington, Virginia. What do you think of her, Robert? James Randi looked at O'Shea, his eyes twinkling slightly. Well... She's not the sort of girl I'd take home to meet my mother. O'Shea thought for a second. On the other hand, she eats humans, so I might take her to meet my ex-wife. But, in her way, I thought she was quite pleasant. Randy smiled and shook his head. This was why the James Randy Foundation always filmed their tests and trials. It was amazing what one could see when a situation was played back. Watch this, Robert. 
It was a film of Luga Sharmanaska eating, her teeth ripping at the meat, blood spraying around her, running down her chin. She was looking around, half suspicious that somebody might take her food, but it was obvious that her eyes were also assessing the chance of eating one of the other members of the meeting. Quite pleasant, Robert? O'Shea looked appalled. I don't remember it like that. Oh, I noted she was a bit gross when she was eating, but nothing like that. That's why we record all of the tests we do, see things that get missed first time around. We've noticed how that succubus seems to get on everybody's good side very quickly. Nobody had much bad to say about her. There's something we need to look at here. But we all had our foil caps on. O'Shea sounded defensive. I know. Anyway, it seems like we need to investigate this a bit more. Robert, something your people can look at. I need to get going and get more power pumped into our links to hell. Headquarters, Army of Abagor, Western Iraq. The great beast saw Abagor approaching and clicked its claws in greeting. As befitted Abagor's status, his great beast towered over the lesser beasts ridden by the cavalry brigade, and its black skin swirled with iridescent colors that caught the rising sun and sparkled into a shimmering halo. Abagor returned the salutation of his great beast and swung up onto the animal's back. Over his head he could see the viciously curved tail straighten and then fall back to its natural position. The great beast was ready to move, to attack the humans that dared to defy its master. Ahead of him, Abagor saw his legions start to roll forward, the thinned ranks looking pitifully slender by the standards of demon warfare. The legion was designed to fight as a solid mass, its 81 ranks adding mass and weight to the charge that would strike the enemy with the force of a battering ram. Abagor had knowingly sacrificed that weight, given up the power of his charge in favor of hitting the humans along a much broader front. Ahead of him, he could see the humans had done it again. They had formed up behind the ridge line where they were shielded from the trident bolts of the demon infantry. They had to be up there, though, for this was the day of the great battle. Overhead, Abagor could see the strange white clouds the human sky chariots left behind them as they searched out the remaining flyers. He could hear the sound of their battle cry, a strange roaring scream punctuated by thunder-like explosions as their fire lances tracked their targets and blew them apart. There were more sky chariots here than Abagor had ever seen before. They filled the sky above the battlefield, dipping down to slash at the flyers who floundered helplessly below them. Casualties up there must be terrible, Abagor thought. Even as he watched, three flyers fled westwards back to the Hellgate. A sky chariot was in hot pursuit, closing the range on them with terrible speed. Oddly, this one was silent, and if Abagor hadn't been watching, he wouldn't have known it was passing. Only after it had passed did Abagor hear the thundering crash and roar of its battle cry. The sky chariot swerved after the flyers, and it gave forth a rasping moan that filled the sky with bright lights. One flyer exploded, there was a brief pause, then another rasped and a second flyer died. The sky chariot zoomed skywards, rolled over and slashed down at the third. It too died as the lights engulfed it. Still, it was the ground forces that were important. Flyers were important for terrorizing a fleeing enemy, but in a real battle, it was the cavalry and infantry that counted. Abagor urged his great beast forward, keeping close to the infantry as they surged forward. He could sense the uneasiness in the ranks. The infantry felt exposed without the thick mass of the ranks that usually surrounded them. And the cavalry were staying back. Normally they led the charge, the shock of their weight and speed breaking through the enemy lines. Now they were being held to wait on events. If the army started to fall apart, it would be their job to stem the breach and hold the line. Abagor suddenly stopped himself. He was thinking about what would happen if he lost. Something had changed in him the previous night, when he had listened to Tomo von Inkrenfat's account of how Merafalazis' army had died. Defeat had ceased to be unthinkable. Now it was all too real a possibility. The sky to the east was changing. Suddenly, the rising sun was shining through the streaks of the human fire lances emerging from far behind their lines. Their mages had to be at work already. The front line of the advancing infantry lowered their tripods to the horizontal, and let fly with a withering barrage of lightning bolts. The ridge crest was at extreme range, and many of the bolts had dissipated before they made it there, but enough hit the line to disrupt the concentration of the human mages. Abagor was sure of that. Yet it did not seem to affect the fire lances as they arched over and raced down into his infantry. 
The rippling sea of explosions engulfed a whole section of his front line, devouring it, shredding those unfortunate enough to be caught in its hot breath. That was how Abigor found himself thinking of it. It was the humans breathing death over his infantry. They were faltering, looking around, seeing the wire ahead of them, and realizing what was to happen. Abigor drove his great beast into the middle of their ranks, urging them forward, firing his tripod, and hearing the wailing screams as yet more human magic was added to the chaos. Headquarters, Multinational Force Iraq, Green Zone Baghdad. Pumpkin One reports receiving heavy inbound fire, sir. The Baldricks are firing on the ridge line as they come in. Fire is ineffective, sir. Petraeus nodded. The truth was he wasn't that interested at this point. His artillery was tearing huge gaps in the Baldrick attack, although the reduced density of targets meant the death toll was lower than it had been yesterday. Standing in front of his screen, he could see the Baldricks surging forward, taking their losses from the deadly MLRS barrages and the minefields. They hadn't reached the wire yet. Not that it mattered to him. The brigade commanders along the front knew what they had to do, and Petraeus had left them to get on with it. They had enough on their plate without their commanding general peering over their shoulder and second-guessing them. Petraeus had enough to do as well. In addition to handling his core artillery, he had to keep supplies of ammunition and fuel flowing towards the brigades. He had truck convoys scattered all the way between the front line and Baghdad. Keeping them flowing forward was a job in itself. He had staff handling that as well. His part of the battle was to stand here in front of this screen and spot things going wrong. There's a flight of C-17s coming in from Con U.S. carrying reloads. Make sure our fighters screen them from any harpies surviving out there and have the fighters report when the harpies are cleared out of the way. The Apache crews will want to get their licks in. Sir, yes, sir. That had to be one of the Marines, Petraeus thought. Still, it was better than the Rangers. That constant hua got on his nerves after a while. Getting the AH-64s into action was going to be critical for more reasons than one. The 25th Mechanized Infantry Division, known on the radio as Pumpkin, was already tearing the Baldricks apart. They had the firepower and mobility they needed. The Baldricks in front of them were going to die. It was simply a question of how many of them would do so before the rest broke and ran. Not that there was anywhere for them to run to. In the west, the Shamshar Division and the 1st Armored were rapidly closing the gap that was the Baldrick's only escape route. No, 25th Mechanized were going to be all right. The problem lay to their north, where the 10th Mountain Division, call sign Mango, held the line. They were a light infantry division. They didn't have the armor that had dominated the battlefield so far. They did have four brigades rather than three and more artillery, but their force structure was light. Petraeus had put them on his right for two reasons. One was that they covered a more inhabited and built-up sector of the front where the armor would be at a disadvantage. The other was a more ruthless one. Petraeus had to find out how human infantry would fight against the Baldricks. All the reports so far said that the Baldric infantry were larger and stronger than humans, and they took a lot of killing. Could human infantry stand up to them? It was a question that had to be answered sooner or later, and sooner was better than later. Hence the importance of getting the Apaches back over the battlefield. They were an important part of 10th Mountain's firepower. Sir, Mango reports the Baldricks are moving to attack them. Should we divert artillery support from Pumpkin? Petraeus thought for a second. Negative. Keep battering the troops attacking Pumpkin. We can destroy that attack fastest, then we can thin out Pumpkin's positions and shift forces to support Mango. 10th Mountain had its artillery, and that would have to do. The 25th Mech and 4th Infantry Division's artillery was concentrating on the Baldricks assaulting Petraeus's left, over 100 Paladin self-propelled 155s and 60 MLRS launchers. The sheer volume of fire they were pouring into the advancing Baldricks was enough to stop even an army from hell. Or so Petraeus hoped. Gee, sir, will you look at that? The Marine's voice had lost its dispassionate inflection. In the middle of one surging mass of Baldric infantry, Pinned up against the wire was a single jet-black figure that towered above the rest, mounted on a rhino lobster that dwarfed the others. I guess he must be important. Petraeus raised his voice slightly and addressed the fire direction center. Put an MLRS battery onto that location soonest. Frontline, Army of Abigor, Western Iraq. Abigor saw his infantry surging against the river of silver threads that strung across the battlefield. 
Some of his demons had tried to grab the threads with their hands, only to scream in anguish as the razor edges bit through their flesh to the bones. Others had tried to force their way in through the coils, only to become entangled and slowly sliced apart. The momentum of the attack was broken, and all the time the shrieking howls of the enemy magic drowned out any attempt at thought. The infantry had to get through the threads. There was no other choice. He saw the answer over his shoulder. On their way through to the threads, they had crossed a field covered with bars that exploded when a demon stepped on them. Many of them had been killed, and their mutilated corpses littered the ground. Others writhed in pain from the traumatic amputations the bars had caused. Yet, Abigor thought, even the dead and the half-dead could still serve him. Get those bodies. Throw them on the threads and use them as a bridge. The noise was too great for his words to carry far, but some heard and started to collect bodies and throw them on top of the coils of threads. Others saw what was happening, understood and copied them. Soon the wire was sagging under the weight, and the first of the demon infantry was running across, clear of the wire and into the open ground beyond. Sire! There are problems on our left! One of the lesser demons, a legion commander by the look of him, carried the message but could barely make himself heard. The left, Abigor thought, ten minutes fast ride away. He had better get there and find out what was happening. Take over here. Keep driving them forward. Then he turned his great beast's head and started the ride up to his left flank. This was a problem he hadn't thought of. In the traditional formation he could see all of his forces. In this new style of attack, he could see only a small portion of the battle at any one time. He was spending all his time running from one crisis to the next, trying to solve each one before it became a major problem. Time he should have been spending in finding the enemy commander so Abigor could have the pleasure of killing him. There was another shrieking howl, and the terrifying ripple of explosions that were the trademark of the fire lances. Abigor felt the blast and the sting as stray fragments at the end of their trajectory flicked at him. Behind him, the area where he had just been had vanished under a rolling cloud of dust and smoke. Abigor had already seen enough fire lance breaths to know that nothing was left alive in the area he had been in just a few minutes before. Then it struck him. He might not have time to find the enemy commander, but the enemy commander had found him. Headquarters. Multinational Force Iraq. Green Zone Baghdad. Missed him. The Marines sounded disappointed. Don't sweat it, son. It was only a chance. He's heading north. Guess on his way to hit. Sit, rep. Mango 4 is in hit, sir. They've dug in. They're all west of the river and there's only one bridge out. Petraeus knew what that meant. If Mango 4 tried to evacuate the city, there would be a massacre as they piled up before the bridge. Sir, Mango 4 requests permission to blow the bridge. They say it won't do them any good and taking it intact might help the Baldricks. Tell them to do it. We can throw an assault bridge over easy enough. The Baldricks don't seem to have heard about combat engineering. Sir, with the bridge gone, Mango 4 won't be able to... I know, so did they when they suggested it. Order Cherry 1 up on hit. Tell them to form up to the east of Al-Ramadi. Outskirts of hit, western Iraq. We just got this place quieted down as well. Corporal Tucker McElroy looked out at the advancing Baldricks with certain level of disgust. A year earlier... Hit had been torn to pieces by gangs of terrorists and insurgents, whose attacks and murders spared no one. Then, the Marines had moved into the city as part of Task Force 17 and cleaned the city up. It had come back to life and its economy had been improving every day, so much so that a week before the message had changed everything, the city had been handed over to Iraqi security forces. Now the Baldricks were coming. Not as many as there had been, that was for sure. At first, their long ranks had been a terrifying sight, but Mango 4's artillery had got to work as the Baldricks had stalled in the minefields and on the razor wire. By the time the Baldricks had swarmed through the artillery over the wire, their neat ranks and serried formation had gone. In its place was a stream of Baldricks in groups of varying size making their way towards the outskirts of the city. McElroy heard the 120mm mortars coughing as they lobbed their first rounds at the larger of the groups, the Brigade 155s were still pounding, the Baldricks hung up on the wire. By now, the leading groups of demons had reached the great divided highway that swung around the outskirts of Hit. It was time to do some real soldiering. A few yards away, Charles Foss was scanning the nearest group of Baldricks through the powerful scope on his M82A3 sniper rifle. Well, it wasn't actually a sniper rifle. Officially, it was an anti-material rifle. There was even an urban legend that it was illegal to use it against humans, but that wasn't true. 
Anyway, the targets this time weren't human. Foss checked his ammunition. The tips of the 50 caliber bullets were green on white. That meant they were Ralphos slap rounds, multi-role armor-piercing explosive incendiaries. They'd been pouring into Iraq for days now. The joke was that they had still been warm from the production line in Norway when they'd been stuffed into a transport and flown here. The infantry formations had been given priority for their issue. They needed the firepower. Magazine in place, Foss squinted through the scope again. The Baldricks cleared ground fast, at least twice as quickly as a human. One figure in the nearest group seemed to be the driving force, urging the others forward. Foss put the crosshairs on his forehead, just between the horns and gently squeezed the trigger, just the way he'd taught his six-year-old son to shoot. Never pull the trigger, squeeze it. The heavy Barrett rifle kicked, and the Baldrick went down. Damn! Foss swore to himself. The Baldrick was down, his head mangled, but he was still moving. What did it take to kill these monsters? A second shot was the answer. It fixed the leader once and for all. Foss swung his scope to the second in the group and fired again. This one went down hard and finally with the first shot. The rest of the Baldricks went to ground, confused by the inexplicable outbreak of sudden death that had struck them. That was a fatal mistake. The mortar team saw the group stop moving, and a pattern of 82-millimeter mortar bombs blanketed their position. By that time, Foss and his fellow snipers were seeking fresh targets. Inside the fortified house, McElroy looked over the sandbags that blocked the doors and windows to see the Baldricks rapidly closing in on the forward defense line. They were over the inner ring road, less than 200 yards away, running into an area of plowed sand where a new city block had been planned. Those plans had been abandoned and would probably never be revived now that half the city's population had laid down and died as demanded by the message, and the rest were refugees being sheltered further east. But the blocks either side of the cleared area had been built, and then they'd been fortified. Human infantry would have seen the deadly danger of that open ground and avoided it. To the Baldricks, it was an alley into the city, and forty or more piled into it. They'd been the first group through the wire and minefields, the first to cross the open ground and get close to the city, the city that was defenseless. To their astonishment, they could see the buildings in front of them. The humans hadn't built walls or moats to keep attackers out. Just the threads, the exploding bars and their horrible magic fire lances. McElroy gave a last check. The Baldricks were in a three-cornered ambush with infantry squads on both flanks and another in front of them. Worse, from the enemy's point of view, McElroy had dismounted the Browning 50 caliber from their Humvee and had it on its tripod, firing through a narrow slit, its green and white tipped bullets waiting to bite. Fine, the Baldricks were in a trap. Time to spring it. Open fire! Let them have it! Defense Perimeter Charlie. Hit. Western Iraq. Just how many of these bastards are there? McElroy was distinctly aggrieved. Despite the fight they were putting up, he and the rest of his squad were being pushed steadily back by the sheer weight of numbers that were being thrown against them. They'd bled the attackers badly on Perimeter Alpha. The Baldrick seemed to have no idea of fire and maneuver. They just walked straight into the machine gun fire. Only the waves behind the first group had simply climbed over their dead and kept on coming. I heard over a million. Private Jerry Lynx repeated the rumor with grim relish. And it looks like most of them are here. If you mean right in front of us, right now, I'd say you're just about right. There's more of them than we've got bullets. And that, McElroy thought, was the pure, unvarnished truth. Oh, the 50s were cutting the Baldricks down all right, and the snipers were having a field day, but there weren't enough of them, and they were being swamped by the numbers coming through. More than just the numbers, the bastards were so damn difficult to kill. The truth was that the M16s just weren't cutting it. McElroy had put a whole 30-round magazine into one Baldrick, and the damn thing had still torn Jim Cookie Fields apart before it had gone down. Explosives were doing most of the work, grenades from the M19 automatic launchers and the M203s. That and the claymores, human or Baldrick, the spray of fragments from a claymore shredded them nicely. Here they come! There was a crescendo of firing from the block to their left. A mad minute as Baldwin's squad poured fire into the Baldrick assault teams before leaving via the back of their building. That would leave McElroy with an exposed flank, and he'd have to fall back as well soon. 
To his front, he saw black figures suddenly detach from the building in front and run out across the street. He took a careful bead on the leader and fired as fast as he could squeeze the trigger, watching shot after shot slam into the Baldrick's chest. It was staggering but still coming forward. McElroy felt he would have better luck if he spat at it. Off to his left, the squad machine gun snarled out a burst, and the Baldrick McElroy had wounded went down. There was a crash that shook dust from the walls and wrecked ceiling of the block. The last of the unit's claymores had gone off. The front of the building caved in. The Baldricks were a lot stronger than humans, and the flimsy construction of Iraqi walls wasn't even close to being strong enough to hold them out. McElroy had lost some of his people first, when the walls the Baldricks pushed down had trapped the men behind them, but they'd learned that lesson. Now they were in hastily prepared positions at the rear of the room, firing up and out at the Baldricks as they loomed over the wrecked structure. Baldricks weren't actually that much taller than humans. McElroy guessed that they averaged between seven and eight feet tall, but they seemed to be much bigger, especially when they were coming straight at you all teeth and claws. He had a fresh magazine in his rifle. That was the good news. The bad news was that it was his last one. He'd run through his basic ammunition load in just a few minutes. He saw the green spurts as the bullets tore into the chest of the leading Baldrick, but, as McElroy had expected, the damn thing just kept coming. Everybody out! He heard the rest of his unit scramble out the hole they'd knocked in the back wall of their block. McElroy paused just for a second, tossing a hand grenade at one of the Baldricks. The black monster caught it and looked curiously at the small metal egg. The sheer incongruity of the sight caused McElroy to delay for a second and that killed him. The Baldric he'd just shot slashed at him with his claws, ripping through his body armor and tearing his chest open. McElroy screamed as the Baldricks fell on him tearing him apart and stuffing meat from his body into their mouths. Then the grenade went off and he, along with the Baldrick who had been holding it, died. Jerry Lynx heard the screams and explosion and knew that he was now in charge of what was left of the squad. The building they had been defending backed onto another with a narrow alley down the side. That led into the divided highway that ran through the center of Hit and hopefully to the open ground the other side. He turned and hosed out fire from his M16. Then he and his men dropped flat as an automatic grenade launcher thumped out a burst from the building's opposite. Down the alley fast, the grenadier will keep them back. They were being pushed back, certainly, but they were bleeding the Baldricks at every step. The time to fight it out, room to room, would come later. And that, Lynx thought, would be a bloody day. Lynx fired another quick burst and saw a Baldrick flinch. The M16s might not be killing them, but they could hurt. Off to his left, he heard screams, human screams. Was it the grenadier who'd held on to give his squad cover? Lynx didn't know and didn't have time to think about it. He and his men emerged from the semi-shadow of the alley and saw the most welcome sight of their lives. A Bradley was sitting on the road, its turret trained on the alley they had just come from. They could guess what was coming and scattered to either side. There was a rasping burst from the chain gun, and this time the screams were Baldrick. M16s may be ineffective, but 25mm armored piercing high explosive was not. In the back, fast! The Bradley commander snapped the order out. Lynx and his men piled into the back and the ramp closed behind them. They were safe at last, behind armor. Where are we going? Defense perimeter Delta, the other side of the clearing. We're holding there. No more falling back. Just how the hell are we supposed to do that? These 16s ain't worth shit against a Baldwin. You'll get sacks of grenades and AT-4s issued when we get back to your position. Once we're in Delta, we'll do it Stalingrad style. Room to room. Headquarters. Randy Institute of Pneumatology. The Pentagon. Arlington, Virginia. Do you believe her? If I'm in the same room as her, probably. Randy chuckled. There had been some discreet experiments going on. Put a subject in the same room as Lugasharmanaska, measure their initial reaction to the succubus, and then watch as that changed. Their prejudice started to soften within five minutes, and by thirty minutes at most, they were friendly. What do you think, mind control? Can't be. We know roughly why their mind control works. They have the ability to entangle pathways in our brains, using a bio-generated electrical field as a carrier wave. Your work with Julie and Kitten shows we can do the same. Only we can't generate the bioelectric field as a carrier. We also know that electrically conductive headgear blocks out the signal. 
Humiliating, isn't it? For years, people who were being persecuted by demons tried to warn us and tell us how to block the signals, and we laughed at them, ridiculed them, then locked them up and doped them to the eyeballs. The tinfoil beanie became a symbol of cranks and nutcases, and all along, they were right. Anyway, we've all been scrupulous about wearing our tinfoil beanies, yet Luga gets the same reactions every time. Must be something else. We'll keep trying until we get there. Nicely switched away from the subject, Robert. Now do you believe her? Robert O'Shea thought for a second. No. That stuff about breeding with humans can't be true. We're different species, and different species can't breed together. That's a basic definition. The question is, why is she lying? And if she is, why don't we just hand her over to Dr. Surleith and let him get some real information from her? She might not be lying, Robert. Just because she isn't telling us the truth doesn't mean that she's lying. She may honestly believe that what she is telling us is true. It may be true. It's just that we don't understand what she is saying. Randy paused. I've had that with people who honestly believe they had psychic abilities. They were so convinced they were telling the truth that they just couldn't believe there were other explanations. Parents were the worst. They got the idea their child was special in some way, and which parents don't believe that. And they couldn't accept that there were rational reasons why the kids were getting the results they were. We had one little girl whose parents honestly believed she had x-ray vision, even when we filmed her moving her head as she read a book blindfolded. Once we had sealed off her normal vision, her ability stopped dead. And don't get me started on dowsers. Look, I'm a conjurer, not a scientist, but I'll say this. Luga's given us something to work with. It may be true, it may not be, but it's something we can test. We have a theory from her. We can test that theory against reality and come up with the disconnects. Then we can learn by explaining those disconnects. And the first disconnect is how everybody feels warm and fuzzy towards Luga Sharmanaska when she is quite literally a demon from hell. Randy stopped and knocked on a door. There was a mumbled come in from inside. Norman, how are you settling in? And how do your cats like the Pentagon? They're getting overfed already. And I didn't know the Secretary of State likes cats. That's a well-kept Washington secret. Did all your stuff get here safely? Sure did. I'm getting it set up now. Any chance of meeting Luga Sharmanaska? Not at the moment you can watch her, but we're trying to keep a limit on who actually sees her. She seems to have an uncanny effect on people around her. I don't see why. I've seen her pictures. She looks like something out of a nightmare. But then, given the habits of the succubi, I suppose she should look gross. What do you mean, Norman? Succubi are supposed to mate with humans to collect male sperm, then mate with their male equivalents, the incubi, and transfer that sperm to them. Incubi then mate with human females and impregnate them with that sperm. I guess that's about as close to a dictionary definition of yuckiness as we're ever going to get. Randy turned to O'Shea, who was standing in the door with his mouth hanging open. Well, it is a different dimension from ours, Robert. But that might explain how the Nephilim Luga Sharmanaska was talking about could arise. They're not hybrid human demons. They're corrupted humans somehow. Score one for the succubus. I'd rather not. The thought of waking up next to that thing is just about the most horrible thought I can imagine. O'Shea paused for a second. Except waking up next to my ex-wife, I guess. Thanks, Norman. Those were mental pictures I could have done without. My next week's sleep is likely to be permanently ruined. I aim to please... Um, Dr. Randy. It's James, Norman. And I've never been any sort of doctor. You want to be formal, you could call me the amazing Randy if you like, but James will do just fine. Randy gave Baines a gentle grandfatherly smile. James, where are we going from here? Luga Sharmanaska gave us some clues on how to open a portal to hell. I'm going to get my people together and we're going to try it. If it works, score two for the succubus. If it doesn't, we'll learn from finding out why. By the way, spread the word. Dr. Sirleith is on his way to Baghdad. The army is collecting corpses of baldrics for him, but the Air Force won't fly them over here. Dead baldrics decompose pretty fast and the smell is dreadful. Even through a body bag, so the Air Force boys won't have their nice clean transports fouled up by them. So if dead baldrics won't come to Sirleith, Sirleith will have to go to the dead baldrics. Randy left and went down to the corridor. Outside the conference room his team was using as a laboratory, four armed marines were on guard. That was new, but when Randy went inside, he could see why. The room was stacked with packages wrapped in green plastic. Small packages, rectangular in shape, about two pounds each, Randy guessed. He had a sudden premonition that had nothing whatsoever to do with pseudoscience that smoking in this room would be a very bad idea. 
There was other equipment around, boxes, odd shapes, and two vicious-looking rifles. Sir, General Shatton will be with us immediately, sir. Randy nodded. In the background, he could hear music playing, Cheryl Crow's voice sounding incongruous amongst the electronics, weapons, and piles of high explosive. These, in the days when heaven is failing, the days when Earth's foundations fled, they follow their military calling, and now they fight to save our dead. And now they fight to save our dead. Their shoulders hold the sky suspended. They stand and Earth's foundations hold, whom God abandoned these defended, and they saved the sum of things today. And they saved the sum of things today. I hope you don't mind, sir. Kitten was stretched out on a couch, her boyfriend sitting beside her. Some music helps me relax. No problem, Kitten. You know what's going to happen here? Kitten shook her head. This room is shielded against electromagnetic radiation, so anything we pick up is you linking to hell. The scientist spoke carefully. When he'd got his PhD, a highly classified one as it happened, in electromagnetic propagation, which was a euphemism for some of the more spectacular aspects of electronic warfare, he'd never envisaged working on anything like this. We're running those signals through a massive amplifier and blasting them out. According to our information, we push enough power into the transmission, and the visions you can experience will be converted to a real portal that we can step through into hell itself and step out of to get back here. He was interrupted by the military members of the group snapping to attention. General Shatton had entered with an army major in tow. He returned the salutes and looked around at the room with satisfaction. I see the checks came through with the Semtex. This is Major Warhol. He'll be training the A-teams who'll be organizing the insurgency in hell. Major, this is the team trying to get through for your people. Thank you, General. The expression on Warhol's face was one of stunned disbelief. If I may summarize my mission, I and my people are going to use an interdimensional rift created by a masochistic, paranoid, schizophrenic transsexual acting on information received from a turncoat succubus to invade hell. Start an insurgency with the aim of destabilizing the whole setup there subverting the rule of Satan and eventually organizing an internal coup to overthrow him. That's it in a nutshell, Major. Shatton's voice was amused by the horrified expression on the Major's countenance. When I selected special forces at the point, they told me there would be days like this. What do they recommend, Major? Cyanide, sir. A laugh ran around the room. People, we're ready to get started. The scientist was trying desperately to get back into control. Once the portal is open, we don't know how long we can keep it open, so we have to move fast. General? Yeah, when it opens, everybody start throwing stuff through as fast as you can. Just throw it through, leave the people the other side to catch and store it. One question, Bob, why can't we keep the portal open? The Baldricks don't seem to have any trouble. Imagine it like this, General. A very fast-flowing stream with a pair of old saloon doors. The kind that swing both ways in it. The Baldricks upstream, us downstream. They can push the doors open easily enough, but to close them, they have to pull the doors against the flow. To open them, we have to push against the flow, but that same flow will be constantly trying to push them shut again. Kitten, I think there's going to be an incredible strain on you once the portal opens. Even with electronic boost, your fighting forces we have no way of understanding. Don't worry about how long you can hold on for. Just do the best you can. If you can give any warning when you're going to lose it, please try. But if you can't, don't worry. Remember, you're a unique resource at this time. You're worth more than pretty much anything else we have. Kitten nodded. Right, people, let's get going. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. The six members of Recon Team Tango 1-5 crouched behind a large rock outcropping beside high walls that separated the Sixth Ring from the Fifth. On the other side of the rocks was the gate, no less than fifty feet high, and probably much higher. It was open and a steady stream of baldricks were pouring out of the sixth ring and setting off across the fifth to where a distant set of gates offered access to the fourth ring. Kim looked over to McKinnery and hissed, What's your count, Mac? I'm at 5,220, LT. 29. 38. Aye, 47 now. How many command units? Gerald Bubbles Tarrant chimed in. That's a little more than seven battalion-sized units, and we've seen eight big guys on huge-ass rhino lobsters. I think they're battalion commanders, LT. Kim nodded. That made sense. And they were still pouring out from the city in ranks of nine abreast with no end in sight. It was like being caught at a crossing by a 200-car train. Her gaze softened as she started to think about the wide skies and waving grain of her Midwestern home. She slapped herself softly. 
No thoughts of home now. She was in hell and she had a job to do. 5760. 5769. Mac, how many? 5,778 and counting, LT. Bubbles? Here comes the ninth big rhino lobster. This'll be nine battalions of 81-9 Baldrick platoons. They kept counting for another couple of minutes, and then there were no more Baldricks. As the tramping feet died off into the mists of the sticks, Kim looked over at McInery. You have 6,666 Baldricks, including the command groups. Aye, LT. Right in line with what Bubbles has got. Damn, that's a whole brigade. There was silence for a minute, then Bubbles asked, So, LT, what are we doing now? Now we move away from the city, stay in the region, and find a relatively safe place to get some rest and wait for more contact. Aye, sir. They darted one by one from boulder to boulder, heading away from the city across the coffin-dotted plain. Around them, the groans and cries of the damned rose into a haunting chorus as the unquenchable flames... What powers them? wondered Kim idly for a moment before pulling herself back to the present, balanced by the supernatural healing powers of their new bodies. Nearly an hour later, they were again at the shore of the sticks. The soft mud oozing gently through their toes belied the roar of the waterfall ahead, and the thick pea soup fog was getting heavier as it mingled with the mist thrown up by the falling water. There was a horrible stench in the air, and the mist tasted of sulfur. Kim led Tango 1 5 toward the cliff. The mud thinned at last and gave way to rock. The land rose into a jagged, twisted badland around the river basin as the river gained speed heading toward the gorge. They clambered over the slick rocks and around monolithic boulders until Kim stopped. They were standing on a low peak with a commanding view of the surrounding terrain, at least as far as the mist let them see. Ahead of them, the broken terrain dived down into dimness. To the right, the sticks plunged down the gorge. To the left, the cliff edge stretched off into the mist, with a subtle curve that just evaded the eye. And behind them, the badlands stretched for what must have been several miles. They were surrounded by a ring of low, jagged boulders. Kim nodded. Here's where we'll make our base of operations. We're staying here until command contacts us. Her eyes defocused and she relaxed visibly. McInery was next to her and grabbed her muddy shoulder. LT? Hey, LT? She tensed up again with a start. That was the brass in Washington. They're going to try to get us some equipment. Lieutenant Kim. It was Kitten again. Kim tried her best not to fade out and lose the contact. Yes? Mac, I'm still talking to them. Hold on a second. General Shatton is wondering if where you are is a safe place right now. Yes, we're safe enough. Okay, good. We're going to try an experiment here. If it works, I'll see you in a moment. Or something will be happening. Kim felt a giggle in Kitten's voice. Nobody is quite sure what. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. I'm through, sirs. Kitten spoke with an unaccustomed level of authority in her voice. Lieutenant Kim says they are in a safe place right now. The attending scientist nodded. Are you ready? Taking a deep breath and closing her eyes tightly, Kitten nodded. We have Kitten's signal recorded and digitalized, right? The question was a rhetorical one only. Nevertheless, one of the electronic techs checked the files in the signal's analysis computer confirmed we have it. Like nothing we've ever seen before, but we do have it. From his pocket, the scientist pulled what looked like a TV remote and hit a couple of buttons. Across the room, the digitalized version of Kitten's bioelectrical signal was being fed into an amplifying system that had been modified from a deception jammer. The result as the technologist started to increase the output power was immediate. Kitten began to shake visibly, rattling the chair she was lounged on. The tendons in her neck were standing out in strain. Her boyfriend held her tightly and was about to say something when everyone in the room jumped. A black ellipse was starting to form in the room. It was hard to say where it was. It seemed to be at once parallel with the floor and perpendicular to it. It was also hard to say what it was. It seemed black and almost infinitely absorptive, yet it also glared and irritated the eyes. A shining shadow didn't make sense, yet that was what they had created. What is that? Must be a projection of something our senses can't cope with, so they're doing the best they can. Can't you hurry up? Kitten's boyfriend almost snarled out the words. Can't you see how much you're hurting her? Still not quite believing his eyes, Randy picked up the paper airplane he'd brought and threw it. It traveled through the portal and vanished. A split second later it came back out, stained and smelling of sulfur. General Shatton didn't hesitate. 
He grabbed a Barrett M107 rifle from the pile of shiny military toys, a bag of electronic equipment, then tossed a Warhol, grab some more and follow me over his shoulder before stepping into the shadowy circle and vanishing. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. Kim suddenly felt awake again, but the daydream wasn't gone. In fact, it seemed to be superimposed on her vision. She passed a dirty hand over her eyes and squinted, trying to get it to go away. Her mind was playing tricks on her. She got the sense that something was forcing its way through to her. Then, a black ellipse started to form, one that defied easy description. Hold on still, guys. I think I'm still hallucinating. You too? Asked Bubbles, who was blinking rapidly. Kim spun around and looked at her surroundings. All normal, and she was feeling fine. Then she turned back again, and there was the tunnel. You guys see it too? Yes. 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 Said the others at once. As they did so, a paper dart flew through the ellipse and hit Kim on the forehead before fluttering to the ground. Perplexed, she stooped and picked it up. A paper airplane? Then the anvil dropped and she threw it back through the ellipse. After a few seconds, a man stepped through, an M107 Barrett over one shoulder, a large bag in one hand. Kim and her companions snapped to attention. Lieutenant, you're out of uniform. General Shatton looked around, a foul, stinking swamp covered with a yellowish mist that stunk of sulfur and fouler things. He was standing on a rocky outcrop amid an atmosphere of desolation and misery that told him, more clearly than anything else could, that he was truly in hell. Sorry, sir, that joke was old the first time I heard it. Anyway, this is the uniform of the day around here. Skin and mud. You need uniforms, we've got a lot to get through to you, and we're not sure how long we can hold the portal open for at any one time. Another figure emerged. This is Major Warhol, Special Forces. He'll be liaising with you and providing technical and operational assistance. Welcome to hell, sirs. First thing, intelligence. We've counted five brigade-sized units moving out of the lower reaches of hell, heading upwards. There's a lot more baldricks coming your way, sir. How are things going up there? Dave Petraeus is doing a number on the invasion force. He's literally shredding them with artillery and armor. The Baldricks are losing in six-digit numbers. Shatton paused for a brief second. Their command structure is shot to hell. You and your teammates did a damn fine job. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. Major Warhol was already on the other side of the portal, and the military personnel were forming a line and starting to hand off crates of ammunition and explosives, piling it through the portal as fast as discipline and urgency could make possible. All hands to the pumps. Get this stuff through as quickly as possible. Maximum urgency. Randy looked at where Kitten was shivering on her couch, obviously in great distress. Everybody, this isn't just a military business. Throw stuff through if you can't hand it. He paused for a second. Is it safe to throw Semtex? Sure is. Thanks for the help. The stream of equipment being passed through picked up speed. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. All of you stand to and help us unload these supplies. Shatton snapped, then turned and passed his rifle to Kim. It's an M107, hot off the production line. We got you Semtex instead of C4. It's 30% more powerful. She in turn handed the rifle to McInery, who leaned it against a boulder. The stack of equipment grew until they had received six webbings to carry things in, two slightly modified 50 caliber assault rifles, 30 crates of ammunition, 180 kilograms of Semtex with all the requisite electronic fusing, two dozen M24 Claymore mines, the same number of AT-4 anti-tank rockets, six pairs of night vision goggles, and 12 outfits of dark combat fatigues. Behind them, the portal started to shimmer. Shatton guessed that kitten was finally losing her grip. Anything else you need, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. We need to change our allocation so our dependents get all of our salary. We don't need money here. But you're dead. With respect, sir, the contract with the Army says nothing about till death do us part, and obviously it hasn't. Sir, this is hell. We are not short of lawyers down here. Kim grinned broadly, perfectly well aware of the size of the demolition charge she'd just thrown into the Army bureaucracy. Shatton returned her grin. Lieutenant, you've enabled me to fulfill a life's ambition. When I hand your perfectly reasonable instructions over to the proper authority, I can finally make those REMFs at PayCorps suffer as much as the troops on the front line. Good luck, Lieutenant, and kick some ass down here. Then he and Warhol stepped back through the portal and were gone. Kim surveyed the equipment and smiled. Okay, guys. We don't have to eat. We don't have to sleep. We heal ten times faster than ordinary humans. And we're the United States military. 
Her smile widened into a full-toothed grin. Let's go blow up some Baldricks. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. I'm losing it. Kitten's wail cut across the room. The elliptical portal started to shiver as General Shatton and Major Warhol stepped out. A second or so later, it collapsed completely. I'm so sorry. Don't be, my dear. Shatton's voice was comforting and quiet. Look, we got all the stuff they needed through to them. They passed some intelligence that was very important back to us. And above all, we've made solid contact. You did better than we had any right to expect, so you go and have a rest. You deserve a medal for what you did today. Sir, you should have let me go through first. Warhol's comment came as Kitten and her boyfriend left the room. Major, sometimes a commander has to lead the way. Try it with noodles one day. Try to push a cooked noodle across a plate, then try and pull it across. See which one is easier. We're going to be literally asking men to go into hell itself. Now, when we do ask, they'll know that we went first. Shatton brushed at his uniform. It was covered with foul-smelling mud and a disgusting greenish slime. I'm going to wash and change, if this smells as bad as it looks. It does, said Randy reassuringly. Then that's an early order of priority. I guess the lab boys will want to analyze this stuff as well. I brought back some samples, sir. Warhol held up what looked suspiciously like a jam jar filled with the mud from hell. Well done. And that applies to everybody here. We're in a position to strike back at last. Defense Perimeter Delta. Hit. Western Iraq. What the hell is that? The first layer of buildings was acting as a sieve, forcing the Baldricks to break up into small groups as they forced their way through the alleys and narrow streets before breaking out into the open ground that marked the gap between the now-fallen Perimeter Charlie and the disputed Perimeter Delta. That open ground, traversed by a divided lane highway, was the new killing ground, and the carpet of black bodies was growing as the 10th Mountain Division's armored cavalry units swept it with fire. The problem was the steadily growing number of bodies in army camouflage that were joining the Baldrick dead. Now, there was something different happening. A white pickup truck was tearing down the roadway, swerving around the bodies that littered it, and heading straight for a large group of Baldricks that had just emerged from the buildings. The Operation Iraqi Freedom veterans of 10th Mountain guessed what was about to happen. They'd seen exactly the same tactic tried out on the Bradleys and Abrams tanks as they'd done their thunder runs through Baghdad. It had failed then, but the Baldricks didn't have heavy armor supporting them. The suicide bombers then had died screaming, God is great, but it was unlikely that they made the same call now. Death to God was more likely. It made little difference. The truck plowed into the group of Baldricks and exploded, scattering fragments of steel and Baldrick for dozens of yards around. Even here in Delta, the blast was stunning. Come on, follow me! Link screamed out. The last Baldrick push had seized a building that was a Delta strong point, and it was up to him to retake it. While everybody was stunned by the suicide, Bomber's blast was as good a time as any. He was pressed up against the wall one side of the door. He swung past and kicked it open. In a well-timed drill, two of his men threw a pair of hand grenades each inside. Then the other pair raked it with fire from their M16s. Lynx rolled through the door. Two of the Baldricks inside were dead or dying on the floor. Two more were still standing, although obviously torn up by grenade fragments and bullets. Lynx pushed up to his feet and slammed into the nearest Baldric, knocking the wounded monster off its feet. He and three of his men piled on top of it, pinning its arms down, slamming their K-bars into its eyes. The Baldric screamed and threshed, one of its clawed feet catching an infantryman in the stomach and disemboweling him. Across the room the remaining Baldric turned and ran, out of the door and into the open ground beyond. He made only a few yards before smoke trails erupted around him, and he vanished into the concussion of RPG-7 warheads exploding. The Irregulars in Hit had joined in the fight, and the RPG-7s they carried in place of rifles were lethal. Lynx looked up. The terrific noise of the firefight was joined by something else, a rhythmic throbbing that shook dust from the ceiling and caused the shelves on the wall to bounce. Over his head, the sky suddenly turned black and red as a hail of unguided rockets passed overhead to slam into the buildings opposite. It's the Apaches! Lynx's voice was triumphant as the four helicopters swept low overhead, their 30-millimeter chain guns hammering at the Baldricks caught in the open. All along the line, 
The AH-64Ds of the aviation unit were sweeping the killing zone with gunfire and rockets while overhead F-16s prowled, ready to take down any harpies that appeared. Headquarters, Army of Abagor, Hit, Western Iraq. Abagor watched the human sky chariots pouring fire into his troops. Some of them were simply saturating the area with fire lances. Others were using a magic fire lance that would turn in the air to follow its prey. Seeker lances, he thought. What else could they be? Sire, our demons are falling back. What? Abagor contained his urge to destroy the messenger. He had learned how futile that could be. They have lost eight in ten of their number, sire, and the humans will not retreat from us. They cannot hold, and now the Sky Chariots have arrived. The Iron Chariots will not be far behind. It is over. The messenger bowed his head and waited for death. Abagor looked across the roofs of Hit, where the Sky Chariots were attacking the remnants of the legions deployed here. He had had such hopes of this outflanking move, but in his heart he guessed the humans had been ahead of him all the time. Yes, it is over. Spread the word. Order the legions to fall back and regroup. Regroup with what? The messenger was tempted to ask, but he held his tongue. Surviving this message was good fortune enough for one day. No need to tempt fate. Headquarters. Multinational Force Iraq. Green Zone Baghdad. The Baldrick attack was collapsing. General Petraeus could see the truth now, unfolding on the giant screen before him. He had raw video up. It showed the black line that had pressed up against his defenses melting away, beginning to stream to the rear as it collapsed. Up at hit, the issue had been close for some hours, and the brigade holding the city had been battered, but they had held, and now the enemy was in retreat there as well. Petraeus switched over from raw to synthetic video, the pictures of the battle replaced by blue and red military symbols moving slowly as the Baldrics retreated and the human formation started their advance. Not that there was anywhere for the Baldrics to retreat to. The armored spearheads had already linked up behind their lines and blocked the retreat to the Hellmouth. The back door had slammed shut. There was nowhere for the Baldrics to run to. Executive Office, Pima Air and Space Museum, Tucson, Arizona. The sound of R-3350 engines starting up woke Daniel J. Ryan, Executive Director of the Pima Air and Space Museum, up from an exhausted sleep. For weeks, it seemed as if his whole museum had become a research center, digging out old documentation that allowed the aircraft stored at the Amarg Boneyard down the road to be brought back into service. His prized restoration experts had suddenly found themselves wearing Air Force blue uniforms and preparing aircraft to go to war again. Amarg was slowly beginning to empty as the aircraft capable of being returned to service were brought back to operational status and the rest were stripped of what parts they had left. He got off the couch in his office hearing the whine of the R-3350s outside pick up in volume. He shook his head and headed for the executive bathroom. His mouth tasted foul after what had passed for a night's sleep, and he desperately wanted to clean his teeth. He checked his tinfoil hat was on safely, a gesture that had almost become a reflex amongst the human population over the last few weeks, and then headed for a shower and a shave. Half his job involved being the public front for the museum, and that meant looking well-groomed whenever he could. His wife was bringing him freshly pressed clothes over each day, and he couldn't let her down by not shaving, even though the R-3350s were making his mirror shake and his hand unsteady. Finally, he was ready to face the coming day, and he went back to his desk. He'd pulled a cup of water from the dispenser, and the R-3350s were causing concentric ripples on the surface. He looked at them for several seconds before the significance sank in. Ten seconds later, he was out his office door and running for the flight line, shouting, Hey, bring my B-29 back! Flight line, Pima Air and Space Museum, Tucson, Arizona. I'm sorry, sir. Technically, the aircraft still does belong to the Air Force, and we're repossessing it. We'll be taking your KB-50 as well, as soon as we can get it flyable and converted back to a bomb carrier. And, of course, we will be taking all three of your B-52s. But these are museum pieces, Ryan spluttered, aghast at the thought of Pima's superb collection of aircraft being dismantled. They can still perform useful roles, sir. If it's any consolation, the commemorative Air Force and the New England Air Museum are losing their B-29s as well. 
Not to mention Wright Patterson losing Boxcar and the Smithsonian parting with Enola Gay. There's more than 20 others as well, although there are only five B-50s and they're in pretty rough condition. Except yours, of course. Still, we should have enough to make up a mixed B-29-B-50 group by the time we've finished. But they're obsolete. Ryan's voice was weak. Not so much so, sir. They still haul bombs and are fast enough and fly high enough to keep out of harpy claws. And we're not sure how well jets will adapt to the conditions in hell, so we're hedging our bets. Behind him, there was a roar, and the B-29 took off, heading for its new operational base. Ryan could barely stop himself crying. What else are you taking? Oh, not much, sir. Your F-111 and your A-10, of course. You've kept the planes here in superb condition, I must say. We may want some others as well, depends what we can find elsewhere. We don't want lots of single aircraft, but if there are enough to make up a small group... I suppose you'll want our replica right flyer? Ryan spoke bitterly. No, sir, not under current plans. But we would like to talk to you about your B-36. Executive Office, Alexander Arms Corporation, Radford Arsenal, Virginia. Mr. Alexander, sir, it's a Colonel Matthews from the Defense Logistics Agency. Alexander's secretary sounded urgent. Put him through then, Jeannie. There was a click on the line. Bill Alexander here. Mr. Alexander, it's Colonel Matthews here from the DLA. If you haven't heard already, you will be fairly shortly. Our M-16s and M-4s aren't showing up very well in Iraq. Don't have the stopping power to finish off a Baldrick, so we need to change approach fast. You're making 50 Beowulf M-16s for the Coast Guard. Well, you can start expanding that production line right now. We need you to start mass-producing 50 Beowulf upper receivers with a 24-inch barrel right away. We'll issue them and mate them with in-service lower receivers. We'll be faxing you the paperwork later today. Take this telephone call as authorization to start work. How many? Our initial production target will be one million sets of parts needed to convert in-service weapons. For your information, the new rifle will be the M16A6 and the M4A5. The room was swimming around Alexander's eyes. We're a small company. There's no way we can make that number of rifles. And the ammunition? Matthew sounded more than slightly irritated. Then license other producers. Talk to ordnance. They may have facilities you can take over. Listen, man, this country is awash with weapons producers. If you can't meet the production targets, make some arrangements. Our boys have died out there because their rifles didn't do the job, and you know where they go when they die. You're a manager, so get the lead out of your pants and start managing. Don't make us write more letters to mothers telling them their kids died because they didn't have the tools they need. Understand? Alexander didn't have a chance to answer before he heard the telephone bang down. He stared at the receiver in his hand for a long moment that was only interrupted when his fax machine started to spew pages out. Genie, get me a list of all our subcomponent suppliers. We have to jack production up soonest. And get me the heads of Bushmaster, DPMS, Olympic Arms, Colt, FN, and any other rival you can think of. Headquarters, Boeing Military Aircraft Division, St. Louis, Missouri. The voice was impossibly British. I say, is that Mike Graham, T-45 project manager? It is. To whom am I speaking? Sorry, old chap. James Kendrick here, Hawk 200 project manager at BAE Systems. We've had some calls from our respective governments asking us to put our heads together and come up with a new aircraft for our forces. Excuse me, I've heard nothing of this. There was a ding on Graham's computer indicating a top priority email from Corporate HQ in Chicago. He read it. My apologies, I've just been told. No problem. Everything is screwed up. Anyway... Basically, the RAF want a cheap light fighter to make up numbers, the Navy wants one for their carriers, and your chaps want some for everybody. So, our governments have decided to combine your T-45C trainer with our Hawk 200 light fighter and produce a single-seat radar-equipped fighter for everybody. My bosses think it's a pretty good idea, one that should sell well, so we need to get cracking. Can we arrange for our design team to come over there? Sure. Or would you prefer us to come over to you? Really, we'd rather come to you if you don't mind. Have you ever tried to get a decent stake in Britain? Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Blasted rock, pools of mud and other less wholesome liquids, gauzy wisps of orange fumes, the odd crucified body. Hell wasn't anything pleasant to look at, even through a window. Standing in front of that window was an army officer facing out towards a room occupied by a mix of civilian and military engineers, along with a sprinkling of figures in Air Force, Army, and Marine uniforms. As the last straggler slipped through the door set in the far wall, he began to speak. 
Gentlemen, ladies, my name is Major Warhol, and welcome to Section 12 of Demon. I'm sure we'll be assigned a mouthful of an acronym soon, but for now we've just been calling it the Hell Lab. He stepped to one side and waved an arm at the window behind him. To get straight to the point, sooner or later we're going to have to fight in hell, and from what limited intel we've gathered so far, it's a hell of an environment. He winced slightly at the awful pun, then shook his head with a sheepish smile before continuing. It's going to do a number on our gear, and long-term exposure isn't going to do humans any good either. That's where we come in. We've put together a mock-up, our own personal hell in a jar based on the intelligence we've received so far, and we're going to be testing our gear in it. That's for the servicemen among you. The rest of you. He nodded towards one of the engineers closest to the window. Are here to fix whatever doesn't work, or failing that, to devise something new to fill a gap where our existing equipment doesn't cut it. We've got five other rooms like this one, with different speculative environments, and we'll be updating all of them as we learn more of the makeup of Hell. At the moment, we've only got actual data on one part of Hell, one segment of the Fifth Circle. However, it looks like Dante's Inferno was a pretty accurate description, so until we know more, we're working on that basis. We've got people here digging through other old records as well, so we'll refine the picture as we go. Across the hall, there's another team that'll be doing the same with Heaven once we know something about it. He singled out a lone man in a suit with a nod. Agent Carson accomplished the only strike mission so far into Hell, albeit remotely. He's at your disposal for questions, and the CIA was kind enough to send the Predator he used for the strike along with him. Carson's lips cracked in a wry, sardonic smile. He'd sat behind an operator's terminal and sent in a drone, but that made him a celebrity. I'm told we're free to disassemble the Predator, but the agency would like Agent Carson back in one piece. Or at least if we do dismantle him, can we number the pieces so the company can reassemble him? Also, please remember, he's a star on the war bond sales pitches. A chuckle ran around the room, accompanied by a snort from Carson himself. Major Warhol let the room settle for a few seconds before he started back into the briefing. Air Force types, the wind tunnel's still under construction, but once it's up, you'll have down-checked aircraft of more or less any make you need in the hangars on base to test in a hell-conditioned wind tunnel. Sorry to give you the cast-offs, but we're short there as it is. Some of the birds are types we don't have in the inventory anymore, but we've repossessed from museums. Feel free to test those to destruction. Infantry, there's a target range with variable density cloud generators to simulate atmospheric conditions. Armor, you're going to be a bit limited for a while. We're not going to have room for a half dozen large-scale hell jars for you to play with, and the one we will have won't be finished for a week or two. Warhol signaled with his hand, ordering a guard to open another door. A group of a dozen Arabs filed into the room dressed in loose white robes. A rustling murmur passed through the briefing room's other occupants as they turned to look at the newcomers, several frowns flashing into place. Before anything could get out of hand, Major Warhol's voice called out again, louder at first to cut through the whispered speculation. I'd like to welcome Abdullah Rashid, formerly one of the Iraqi insurgency leaders and now head of the Demon S-12 insurgency team. I know, he shouted, cutting through a rising babble of voices. That many of you will be uncomfortable working with him and his men, but the fact remains that the Iraqi insurgents have had quite a lot of experience in running insurgencies recently, and their people fought alongside ours and hit. We're allies now. His lips quirk in a thin, humorless smile. And there'll be others joining us as well, including some explosives experts from the provisional IRA. They are probably the best in the world at their particular art. They should be. They fought the British for long enough. If I hear of them being frozen out of discussion here, I'm not going to be a terribly happy man, and none of you want that. These teams will be focusing on the best ways to manufacture explosives, weapons, IEDs, anything they can think of that can be made and used in whole or in part using hell native resources and conditions. Warhol surveyed the assembled men and women for a few more seconds, and then nodded to himself. All right, dismiss. Actually, one thing I forgot. Everyone, if you'll please inspect the walls. He waited for a few seconds for people to turn and look. Scattered around the walls of the room at regular intervals were glass-fronted cabinets loaded with shotguns and submachine guns. On each one was printed in tall red letters, in case of baldrics, break glass. Another chuckle ran through the room, albeit a somewhat nervous one. We don't know the limitations of the Baldrick's teleportation and portal abilities yet, so we're going to assume they could pop up in here. Familiarize yourself with the locations of the emergency arms cabinets and with the weapons. There's an Earth environment firing range on base. Feel free to avail yourself of it if you want to brush the rust off. I'd hate to lose any of you to something as silly as a lone Baldrick raider. Dismissed. He pauses for a moment, then grins. And I mean it this time. 
Break into teams and let's start figuring out how to raise hell. Oval Office, White House, Washington, D.C. My fellow humans. President Bush looked into the camera and gave a careful, friendly smile. The truth was that he was actually feeling reasonably happy at this point. His approval rating had gone over 50% for the first time in years. You have all been following the events in Iraq, where Allied forces have engaged a Baldrick invasion army estimated at over 400,000 strong. Much of the fighting has been obscure due to the area it has covered. But now, I'm able to give you some accurate information on what has taken place. Bush looked down at his desk briefly. The retreating enemy hadn't yet encountered the blocking force that was between them and safety. That was a nice surprise that was waiting for them. The Baldrick army has been defeated. Not just defeated, but destroyed. Our troops and those of our allies, most notably the Iranians under General Faridun Zolfagari and the British under Brigadier John Carlson, have beaten back the enemy and inflicted enormous losses upon them. We believe that the total of their dead is in excess of 300,000, a number that is rising hourly as our forces pursue the defeated enemy back to the very mouth of hell. Our own losses so far are just over 600 dead. Most of these were suffered in the battle for the town of Hit. There, a brigade of the 10th Mountain Division held the town against an overwhelmingly powerful force of Baldrics and drove them back fighting room to room in the process. In doing so, they proved that not only do our armed forces have superior equipment to our enemy, but our men are better trained, braver, and more resourceful than their Baldrick counterparts. Now, however, we must look to the future. We have learned that the force that struck us represents only a small portion of the forces that the enemy has available to him. Beyond that, we know that the forces of Yahweh still exist and must be numbered on the list of our enemies. Already we have killed one of them, one responsible for an atrocious massacre carried out against defenseless civilians in the peace of their home. Our forces have achieved wonders. General Petraeus has won a victory that will forever place him amongst the great captains, but this is not enough. We must mobilize for war. Our armed forces depend on armored vehicles for their mobility and for defense against Baldrick attacks. Those armored vehicles need fuel and the battles over the last few days have shown how much they require. We must give them priority for supplies of gasoline and diesel fuel. Accordingly, I have given orders for fuel rationing to be instituted here in the United States. Each licensed driver in a family will be allowed to buy no more than 20 gallons of automobile fuel per month. Government help will be provided for carpooling and other requirements. There is a crying need for more vehicles to carry the supplies needed to our troops Therefore, most private automobile production in this country is to be converted to military use. Heavy truck plants will, of course, be converted to produce military trucks. Car and SUV facilities will be converted to produce light armored cars or aircraft, depending on their level of technology. The only exception to this will be factories producing electric cars or small commercial vehicles. We have talked much about replacing gasoline-powered automobiles in our society. Now our hand has been forced. In the last two days, 600 of our men and their allies have sacrificed everything they had for us. They gave their lives, knowing what awaited them beyond death. Now we must match their sacrifice and bend every will, every nerve, every muscle in a great national crusade that will see our enemies driven into the dust and humbled. Thank you all and good night. President Bush turned off the microphones and stared at the office wall. He just told the American people that they couldn't drive around anymore the way they used to. Ah well, it had been nice being popular again for a while. Ibn Sina Hospital, Baghdad, Iraq. These things smell dreadful. Couldn't we have chilled them? We did, Doctor. Unfortunately, dead baldricks appear to rot very fast indeed. As far as we can tell, it's daylight that causes them to decay, not temperature. Ultraviolet sensitive, then. Would that tie in with reports of their sensitivity to lasers? A doctor in the observation gallery sounded very thoughtful. They do seem to be sensitive to most of our technology, from ultraviolence to infrared. A chuckle crossed the gallery. The Baldricks were running west, with three armies in hot pursuit and another closing in from the north. Suddenly, they seemed far less frightening. Dr. Sir Leith nodded and looked at the Baldrick corpse stretched out on the dissection table in front of him. This is a big one even by Baldrick standards, nearly three meters tall, weight 200 kilograms. 
Before your army shot large pieces off him, yes. Another ripple of laughter ran around the operating theater. The relationship between Iraqi and American had eased to the point where they could make jokes about each other without fearing consequences. On the other hand, the Iraqi nurse flushed slightly. Even now she felt ill at ease receiving public attention. Let's have a look at the x-rays. Sirleith had them set up on the overhead displays. Is everybody seeing what I'm seeing? It's very human. One of the watching doctors spoke hesitantly. Human but not human, as if it was a human body seen through a nightmare. Exactly. The body is laid out almost identically to ours. The single upper arm and upper leg bones, the two bones in the lower arms and legs, the same number of ribs, of vertebrae. If we go by bone count and position, this thing is human, but of course we know it isn't. The bones themselves are twisted and distorted, and there are things here that have no equivalent in our anatomy. Not just superficial things either, like the horns and tail. There's these things as well. Sirleith tapped the body where what appeared to be huge muscles ran down its back. They were so large they made the creature's spine look as if it was in the middle of its body rather than its back. The creature's stunted wings stuck out of them, reminiscent of broken branches from a snowbank. Fifty percent of its body mass, would you say? There was a ripple of agreement. I thought they were muscles that allowed it to fly, but they're not. This thing can't fly. Did histology come up with anything? Dr. Sirleith, we find this hard to believe but we think they are electrocytes. The samples we took show them to be very similar to those in the electric eel, but they are much larger and many times more numerous. The electric eel generates 500 volts at one amp. If these cells work the same way, the baldric should be able to generate 5,000 volts at 10 amps, almost 100 times more power. That would explain much, especially their ability to fire bolts of lightning. Let's have a look inside, shall we? Sirleith took an electric carving knife. He'd already found from bitter experience that surgical scalpels had a very short life when faced with baldric skin and sliced into the dead baldric. The smell was far worse once the skin was opened up and inside, the internal organs were already decomposing into slush. From what we can see here, it's the same as with the bone structure. The internal organs are human in placement, but wildly different from us in shape and appearance. We have no real idea of the fine detail of function, of course. For example, this looks like a liver, but is it? What else does it do? Thoughts, people? It is as if it was human but became corrupted. The Iraqi nurse was speaking slowly. Almost as if this was once human, but something got at it, corrupted its DNA. It's worth noting that the other bodies are very similar to this. If this is the result of DNA being corrupted, then the corruption was done systematically. The process has created a new species. Did this evolve from us, or is it parallel evolution? Another Iraqi doctor watching the dissection spoke. He was slightly guarded. Incredibly, he'd heard that there were Americans who were still dumb enough to believe in creationist stories and deny the scientific truth that stared into their faces. It was so strange. How could a people who could create such wonders also believe in things so foolish? Still, he didn't want to upset one of them. They had guns as well as strange beliefs. Surly thought carefully. I'd say it's parallel evolution. They started out as the next level up version of us, and something happened to them. Either they've been infected with something that messed up their DNA, or they've been engineered to look like this. Genetic engineering needs technology. Yet another Iraqi doctor. And we know they don't have it. We think they don't, doctor. It's very probable they don't, and we certainly haven't seen it yet. But we can't rule out the possibility that there's pockets of technology somewhere. However, genetic engineering doesn't need that high technology. Just patience and breeding experiments. Look at dogs. A Rottweiler and a Chihuahua were engineered from the same ancestor. These could be the same. I wish they'd let me dissect that succubus, Surly thought. Then we'd have something to compare this with. Right, well, let's look a bit more before this one decays to nothingness. Outside Gary's Shoe Store, Lakeview Mall, Chicago, Illinois. But it's Una Ropa Putin. Maria looked at the top her school friends were urging her to buy. If she'd worn it back in Honduras... Her mother would beat her, and old women would whisper accusations behind her back. But here? Look, girl, you're an America now. Halter tops, mini skirts, and fuck me pumps get issued at the border. Get used to it. Shauna's voice was severe, but she was laughing underneath it. Maria looked dubious, but she could see her friends were right. Dress standards were different here. She'd only been at the school six weeks, and this was her first time hanging out in the mall with her new friends. She didn't want to embarrass herself or them. 
What she didn't know was that she was far from the first new arrival from Central America who joined the school, and all the girls with her understood how difficult the adjustment from the highly conservative lifestyle she'd come from was. The immigration department might run assimilation classes for new arrivals, but the high school girls had their own, much more efficient program. She should have guessed from the way they were speaking, the group had two African-American girls, three Anglos and two Latinas. They were speaking in a strange mixture of Spanish and English, switching from one language to the other in mid-sentence with unconscious fluency, the whole mixed in with ebonic slang. Viewed objectively, it was an awesome display of bilingualism. She held the blouse up against herself again. In truth, it was quite modest by the standards of teenage girls at a mall and was on sale, 80% off. And it did make her look nice. She pushed her hat a little back on her head, trying to make up her mind. All the girls were wearing the fashionable, kepi-style caps with aluminum foil built into the crown and neck. That was one thing that had changed since the message. Now, everybody wore caps, all the time. The stores here were full of them, some cheap baseball caps with foil inserts, others much more expensive. Maria finally made her decision. She'd take the top. She took it to the counter, and as she started to pay, her friends broke out in a round of applause. She'd just done something her mother would not approve of, and that was her first step to becoming a real American teenager. Hey man, are you, like, going to get some more donuts? One of the Anglo girls, Marcy, was speaking to Philip Phelan, the shift supervisor of the mall security guards. He smiled a bit weakly at her. It was a joke all the rent-a-cops on duty here had to put up with. But she was a customer, so her jokes were, by definition, funny. Afraid not, ma'am. Krispy Kreme ran out of original glaze, so I'm going to have to make do with Pop-Tarts. Poor baby. Marcy's voice was sweetly consoling. The red light comes on again in an hour, so I'm told. Why, thank you, ma'am. I'll bear that in mind. Marcy watched Phelan continue his rounds, a shadow of concern crossing her mind. He was way too far overweight, and she could see him wheezing slightly. It reminded her of her father before he'd had his first heart attack. He really should be sitting comfortably behind a desk, she thought. Then she frowned slightly. There was a ripple in the air down by the food court. Something overheating? Or a fire? She was just about to call attention to it when the ripple changed to a black dot, and then to an ellipse. She'd seen what stepped out of that ellipse on news programs, on film of the fighting in the Middle East, but she'd never expected to see something like it in her local mall. A baldric, fully nine feet tall, complete with horns, tail, and trident. Eyes glowing red and small pointed beard seeming to bristle at the stunned shoppers. There was an eerie silence as people tried to absorb what was happening. A silence that was interrupted by a crack and brilliant blue flash as the baldric discharged his trident at a woman pushing a baby carriage. The crash as the woman went down, convulsing from the massive electrical shock, broke the spell. Run! Shauna grabbed Maria and started bundling her forward. Years of threatened shootings in high schools had led Americans to learn a vital lesson. When trouble is breaking out, get as far and as fast in the opposite direction as possible. Maria didn't have that inbred instinct and had to be shown. Her friends half pushed, half dragged her towards the exit adjacent to the mall's Macy's store. Across the mall, the shoppers were dispersing in different directions, depending in which exit was nearest. The silence was replaced by the sound of screaming from the chaotic mob of people. In its midst, the baldric grabbed another victim with the claws of one hand, ripped him open with the other, and threw the disintegrating body into the mass of running people. Then, it looked around, its eyes fixed on a group running for the Macy's exit, and set off after them. Philip Phelan didn't run. Unfortunately, he didn't have a gun either. The mall rent-a-cops weren't allowed to carry them. He did have a taser and he used it, helplessly watching the barbed metal spikes bounce off the skin of the baldric. The monster had already carved its way through three more people, throwing their dismembered remains around, and Phelan believed that his job was now to buy as much time as he could for the rest to get clear. The monster reached out for him, almost lazily, its great claws reaching for his throat. Phelan had drawn his baton, and he swiped at the grabbing hand, knocking it to one side. Then he slashed back in the opposite direction, hitting the monster in the throat, causing it to stagger for a second. For one delirious moment, he actually believed he had a chance of winning the encounter. Then he felt the claws on the baldric's other hand sinking into his abdomen. They hooked around the bottom of his ribs and the last thing that Phelan ever felt was him being hurled into the air as his chest came apart. 
The baldric watched the fat old man land in the food court on the floor below and looked around for another victim. A middle-aged woman had stopped running and was facing him, holding both hands out as if she was praying. A ridiculous idea, but who knew what these humans would try? Then there were a series of bright flashes from the woman's hands, and the baldric felt six jabbing pains in his chest. He paused for a brief second, then started after the woman. Lady, you got reloads? No. She wailed, looking at the monster bearing down on her. Run! The man speaking had another handgun out, one a lot bigger than the woman's little Keltec 32. He was in the correct position, M1911A1 in both hands, right hand pushing, left hand pulling, and his nine shots made a perfect group on the Baldrick's chest. Then his slide locked back on empty, and he followed the woman running for the exit, the Baldrick now streaming green blood from the wound in its chest, closing rapidly on them. They were saved by the shoe salesman from Gary's shoe store, who had been a mighty athlete in his day. As the Baldrick crossed in front of his store, he ran out and took it in a perfect football tackle, slamming it off its feet and into the guardrail. The railing, more decorative than ornamental, cracked free of the floor and for a moment looked like it might give way under the impact, but it held and the fighting human and Baldrick bounced off it back onto the floor. The Baldrick managed to tear at the human's face with one hand and that gained him enough of an advantage to throw him off. The shoe salesman was blinded, crippled by the injury, and didn't have a chance of evading the slash that tore out his heart. By that time, the man and woman who had shot the Baldrick were safely away. Out in the car park was a Ford F-150 pickup truck, covered with NRA stickers. More significantly, both its driver and passenger were hunters who had come in for some supplies at the Northwest Face store before going off on a trip. Bill Redfield saw the people pouring out of the exits and managed to stop one as he ran past the truck. What's going on? Baldrick's in the mall. They're killing everybody. The man tore himself free and continued running. Can't get in through the doors, Jim. Too many people coming out, like running into an avalanche. The cafe! Hit it! The coffee cup cafe was on the ground floor level with the car park, and better, it had a terrace and windows that were a rare interruption in the otherwise blank mall walls. Jim Caldwell slammed his truck into gear and floored the accelerator. He was doing over 60 miles an hour when his truck plowed through the terrace tables and smashed open the windows beyond. Redfield and Caldwell and their truck were in the mall. A few seconds later, they were running into the main concourse holding their hunting rifles. Escalators up! The screaming said the Baldricks were on the top floor. They sprinted up the escalator in time to see a single Baldrick. There was only one, tearing a man apart outside a shoe store. The Baldrick stood up and started to close in on the people struggling outside Macy's, but Caldwell dropped to one knee and took aim. He had an old M1 Garand, sporterized and fitted with a scope. Across the width of the mall, it was murderously accurate. He squeezed out his eight rounds of 30 6 and heard the characteristic ting as the clip was ejected. The Baldrick staggered with the impacts, obviously finding it had to stay on its feet, but it was still obviously determined to get into the crowd of humans. That wasn't bad tactics either. Once mixed in with humans, the usefulness of the hunting rifles would be much diminished. Redfield stopped that happening. His favorite game was elk and moose, and he had the rifle to match. A Weatherby Mark V Deluxe chambered for 416 Weatherby Magnum. With its scope, it had cost him almost $3,000, and his wife had given him the silent treatment for three months after she'd found it in the gun safe. He dropped flat and took careful aim, squeezing the trigger and feeling the brutal recoil as the rifle sent the heavy bullet tearing down range. He didn't stop to see what the result was. He was working the bolt to feed the second round into the chamber. By the time he got his eye back to the scope, the baldric was sitting down, the wall behind it splattered green with its blood. Redfield fired again, seeing the baldric jerk as the bullet plowed into it. There was no doubt, it was down for good, but he still had a single round left in his rifle, and the thing was still moving. He worked the bolt again, then took careful aim at the monster's head. It burst very pleasingly as the bullet struck home. Redfield straightened up, pleased with himself despite the pain in his shoulder. Caldwell was looking at him. Remind me never to poke fun at that cannon of yours again. Across the concourse, it was hard to believe it was over. The baldric lay dead barely ten feet from where Maria stood crying. She was in shock, from terror and the deafening explosions that had brought the monster down. She and her friends had been at the back of the crowd trying to escape, and they would have been the first to die if the baldric had reached the crowd. 
Maria knew it, but all she could think of was that in the panic, she'd lost the bag holding her new blouse. Now she'd lost it, it seemed enormously important to her. Behind her, she felt a hand on her shoulder. Hey, Maria. It was Kelly, one of the Anglo girls with Maria's shopping bag. You dropped this. Second lesson on being a mall rat, never ever let go of your loot. Across the mall concourse, two men in hunting clothes stood up. There was silence for a second, then an eruption of cheering. One of the men waved, the other held his rifle above his head. The cheering redoubled. Maria found a microphone stuck in her face. KVTW News. What did you see? I saw the devil coming to kill us, and an old security man attacked it with a stick. It killed him, but he saved our lives. Era el hombre más valiente que nunca haya visto. The television reporter turned to another person, a woman who was staring at a tiny semi-automatic pistol in her hand. Ma'am, what do you think? She looked dazedly at the camera. I think I need a bigger fucking gun. Military Attaché Offices, Royal Thai Embassy, Washington, D.C. Major General Asani settled back in her seat to watch the early morning news. She knew what the leading item was likely to be, but the U.S. news networks always amused her. She flipped the television mounted on the wall to Fox and waited for the headlines. She wasn't disappointed. The death toll in the Baldrick attack on the Lakeview Mall in Chicago continues to rise. At least 10 humans are reported to have been killed when a lone Baldrick materialized in the shopping area of the mall and started to indiscriminately kill shoppers. Hero of the hour was 56-year-old security guard Philip Phelan, who saved the lives of a group of teenage girls when armed only with a baton, he defended them from the Baldrick. Now, from the scene of the attack. The general pursed her lips for a second and asked herself the same question that was puzzling people in government offices across America. Why had this happened now? Was it linked to the crushing defeat of the Baldrick army in Iraq? If so, it appeared to be opening an entirely new front in the war. Almost absentmindedly, she flipped channels to CBS. An incident in a Chicago mall turned violent yesterday when two gunmen opened fire with assault rifles on a Baldrick that was visiting the shopping plaza. The gunmen, both members of the NRA, had brought their guns into the mall in flagrant violation of the operation's no guns policy and started shooting without warning. More than 10 people were killed in the attack. The general sighed quietly to herself. The American media never changed, she thought ruefully. Perhaps it was better that nobody believed a word they said. Still, that comment about the NRA started a chain of thought in her mind, one that rotated around the phrase, a well-organized militia. Her country already had one, the Tahan Fran, and it was a key part of their defense against terrorism. She nodded quietly to herself and picked up the telephone, dialing the office of the Secretary of Defense. Hello, this is Major General Asani here. I would like to speak with Secretary Warner this morning, if possible. Outside the White House, Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. The television cameras had been waiting outside the White House since early morning, hoping to catch one of the cabinet members in a limousine just after the imposition of gasoline rationing on the rest of America. So far, they had been sorely disappointed since the only footage they had got was one sequence of Condoleezza Rice on a bicycle, and John Warner jogging into the building. The cameraman was about to give it up as a bad job when he felt a tap on his shoulder. A small, nondescript van was pulling into the White House driveway, and significantly, it passed through security with hardly a moment's delay. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. White House Conference Room, White House, Washington, D.C. You all got the warning about the television cameras then? President Bush glanced around the assembled members of the cabinet, reassured by the nods he received. Right, let us continue. Just what happened in that mall, and why did it happen? Secretary Michael Chertoff looked down at the brief he had been given. The eyewitness accounts are pretty confused, as one might expect. As far as we can make out, the Baldrick just appeared within the mall and started killing people, more or less at random. It carried on doing so until it was shot dead. And that's pretty much all we do know. The Homeland Defense Secretary looked up at the meeting. It's critical we don't confuse what we think with what we know here. We can make all sorts of guesses, but the amount of hard information we have is very limited. We can really screw ourselves up if we start thinking our guesses are facts. There were a series of nods around the table. In some ways, it had been an unnecessary comment. Not confusing facts with deductions from those facts was a caution that everybody knew. In another way, 
The warning was timely and vital for, although everybody knew the principle, they forgot it with dreadful regularity. People treating their opinions as facts was called the Rumsfeld syndrome in this room. Another fact for the pile. Secretary Warner spoke quietly as was his usual practice. That Baldrick took a lot of killing. It got hit 15 times with pistol fire. Okay, six of those were 32s, but the rest were 45s. Also, 11 rifle caliber hits. Only the last three really hurt it. Not quite so, John. Secretary Michael O. Levitt consulted his brief. My people tell me that the 30 aught six hits would have killed the Baldrick eventually, but the 416s really hurried things along. This fits what we're getting back from Iraq, I believe. It does, Mike. Baldrick's appear to die from bleeding out. They can take quite devastating hits, but if they don't cause massive blood loss, they can keep going for some time. Some of our snipers report that Baldrick's have kept going after taking 50 caliber bullets to the head. On the other hand, fragmentation damage rips them up and causes extensive bleeding that finishes them quickly. Very interesting. Bush was a little annoyed. This was all very well, but it didn't answer any of the key questions he needed to deal with. But why did this happen? How likely is this attack to be repeated? And what can we do to stop them? If this thing just appeared in the middle of a mall, it can appear anywhere, can it? In one corner, General Shatton coughed gently. If I may be permitted, sir, we have brought along about the only expert we have on how and why Baldrick's think the way they do. If I may be permitted to bring her in? Bush nodded. General Shatton left for a moment, then returned with a companion whose appearance stunned the room into silence. It was about six feet tall and was wearing a cape-like red robe which did not hide the fact that it was naked. Its skin was the sort of shiny black normally associated with insects, except around the head where it faded to a corpse-like white. Its hair was pinkish blonde with two red-tipped horns emerging from its lank folds, its mouth large and vivid red. The eyes sunk deep in shadow, their yellow gaze darting around from one person to the next. On closer inspection, it was female. That's a baldrick. Are you insane bringing that thing in here? Secretary Warner's voice almost cracked with the shock. Ladies, gentlemen, this is Luga Sharmanaska, a succubus who has defected to us. She has provided us with a significant amount of intelligence over the last few days. Secretary Chertoff, you stress the need for facts, not opinions. Luga is the only person who can give us facts. Take a seat, my dear. For want of any more appropriate attitude, President Bush dropped into his genial Texan host mode. Luga Sharmanaska took a vacant seat, appreciating how those nearest to her shifted away. You heard what happened yesterday afternoon in Chicago? No. Her yellow slitted eyes darted around again, measuring up the people in the room with her. Show the film, please. Luga, this is film taken through our video surveillance system at the mall. It shows a baldric, I mean a demon, attacking the crowd. Luga watched the film without any real interest. So? So why this attack and why now? Why not? Luga Sharmanaska shrugged, a curiously human gesture. This is nothing new, just another berserker attacking. Odd your people fought back, though, usually they do not. Wait a minute. Secretary Rice jumped on the last phrase. Usually? You mean this has happened before? Luga Sharmanaska was almost impatient. Of course it has. How many times have you had mass killings in your schools or parks? How many times has an isolated community been mysteriously wiped out? Always it was either us or Yahweh. Sometimes our berserkers would do it themselves. Other times they would possess another human to do it. She stirred slightly in excitement. That was always very good because we would let the person see what they had done and know they would be punished for it. Their despair was joy to us. Yahweh did things like this? Of course. Impatience had become scorn. Most were his to keep you frightened and depending on him. Ours were just for sport. Bush glanced around the assembled cabinet, gathering in the expressions of horror and disgust on their faces. What must it be like working daily with a monster like this, listening to these horrors? Always the attacks were on schools and malls. The question was soft. He was controlling his voice very carefully. Of course, that is where fear and terror would be greatest. Luga Sharmanaska paused for a second. You were very wise keeping your guns out of such places. It hid them from us. But you can go anywhere and appear anywhere? No. Impatience returned again. We need Nephilim to home in on. In malls and such, there are large concentrations of people, so the homing signal is strongest there. So you can only appear where there are concentrations of people? 
That is what I said, is it not? So the timing of this attack has nothing to do with the fighting in Iraq? What fighting? Bush glanced at General Shatton, who shook his head. They'd told Luga Sharmanaska nothing of the battles in the Iraqi desert. Your army invaded us. We defeated it totally, wiped it out at little cost to ourselves. What isn't dead is running, and don't think this will end there. We fight to win. Defeated? Which army? Luga Sharmanaska was stunned. She knew humans were unexpectedly powerful, but to defeat an entire army? Led by who? She gathered herself, noting the renewed confidence in the humans. Her shock had cost her ground. No, this attack has nothing to do with that. The Duke who launched it may not even know the war has started yet. Hell is a big place and communications are very slow. By messenger, mostly. Many parts may not have got the word yet. The interrogation went on, pushing Luga Sharmanaska for added details of the Berserker raids. In the background, one of James Randi's observers was filming the whole process. Demon Conference Room, The Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. Notice something odd about this film, Robert? About a demon in the conference room? Nothing at all odd. I'd guess in some previous administrations, there were several. I've always wondered about Robert McNamara myself. He's a good candidate for a fiend from hell. Not bright enough. No, look at how this meeting starts. See how everybody is disgusted by Luga Sharmanaska, repulsed by her. Combination of hatred, loathing, abomination, abhorrence, you name it, every negative emotion imaginable. Now look at these scenes at the end of the meeting. What do you see? Doesn't look very different to me. The president is being charming, but if looks could kill, Condi's laser gaze would have fried poor Luga on the spot. Right, and what is it we've noticed about people meeting Luga Sharmanaska? Everybody accepts her and gets sympathetic, warm, and fuzzy about her. Oh, I see what you mean. The cabinet didn't. And they all had their caps on, so it isn't mind control. Whatever it is that she does, it didn't work there. Must be environmental. Must be. How does that conference room differ from ours? It's a lot bigger, of course, and more expensively equipped. That's all. And its air is screened. General Shatton cut in from one corner. General? The air is screened. It's continually drawn out, filtered, and recycled. There's quite an airflow, but it's through vents in the floor, so people don't notice it. You can throw a tear gas bomb in there, and the air will be scrubbed clean before it hurts anybody. The air gets scrubbed clean, all the time. James, pheromones sound likely to you. Um. Uh, Scents used by humans to modify behavior around them. For example, women who are ovulating use them to be particularly attractive to men. Pheromones from pregnant women make people around them feel warm and fuzzy. It's part of our nonverbal communication system. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. Why this is, I cannot tell. But I know this and know full well. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. Exactly, James. A lot of our subconscious likes and dislikes are determined by pheromones. We're only just beginning to get into what they do and the field's opening out. It may well be that our sense of smell is vastly more important than we ever gave it credit for. The conference room is big. That means Luga Sharmanaska's pheromones didn't have time to build up the necessary concentration before they were swept out and scrubbed out. Does that mean we have to wear a gas mask before we speak with her? Might not do any good. There's some evidence that pheromones work by skin absorption as well. The upside is that pheromone effects are insidious, but if people are aware of them, they can filter them out, recognize, and discount them if you like. There's another good thing about this, too. What's that, Robert? I doubt if Luga understands what it is that makes people agreeable around her. I bet she just takes it for granted that they will be. That means she must be a very confused succubus right now. Did you see her face when the president told her about our victory in Iraq? She was shaken to her very roots. She's shaken up in more ways than one. Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. John Warner sighed and rubbed his eyes. The logic laid out by the charming but ice-cold Thai general was undeniable, especially with what they'd learned from that foul monster General Shatton had brought into the White House. Baldrick's could teleport into any large group of people, so there had to be guards everywhere. That meant a militia, well, the Constitution provided for that, encouraged it even, and there were enough guns floating around in America to arm it. His pen sketched doodles on a pad. Of course, the term militia was out. Too many negative connotations these days. His eye rested on picture of the American Civil War and the letters USV, United States Volunteers. That wasn't right, though. 
these people would be defending their homes. Local defense volunteers. That had a good ring to it and glossed over the fact that they were going to be drafted. Every man and woman between the ages of 18 and 50 who wasn't already part of the armed forces, that was what the new draft would bring in. To be armed and sent as patrols to sports stadiums, schools, malls, anywhere people would be gathering. Average strength on any given day, 25 million. One more burden for a nation that was already working long hours with little rest. Yet the benefits were already showing. New M270A2 rocket launchers, M2 Bradleys, M1 tanks were starting to flow from the production line. Aircraft were the problem. Production would take a long time to ramp up, and bringing retired old aircraft back from the graveyard could only achieve so much. His phone beeped. Mr. Secretary, a Ms. O'Leary to see you. She's your 11 o'clock. Warner sighed again. What did she want? Miss O'Leary, how can I help you? Secretary Warner, I understand you'll be needing a lot of guns, needing them quickly, and they have to be powerful enough to take down a baldrick with a minimum number of shots. That is so. More than you can possibly realize, he thought. I own a small custom gun producing company. We make a derivative of the M1 Garand in 458 Winchester. Our production isn't great, but we can expand a bit, and we know other companies that can do the same. There are quite a few others, including Springfield, who make the M1A, a semi-automatic version of the M14, who can retool to make 458 Winchester versions of that weapon. Between us, we can make a lot of these rifles. They're accurate at longer ranges than the 50 caliber M16s you're introducing, and they don't use the same industry resources. We can use furniture makers for the wooden stocks, etc., and the parts are milled, not stamped. There's lots of small engineering companies that are hurting right now. They aren't into the high-tech stuff our modern weaponry requires. But for something at World War II levels, they're perfect. And they want in on the war effort. And in on the profits, Warner thought. But she was right. And this would help arm the local defense volunteers. And it did make use of small industrial capacity. An excellent idea, Miss O'Leary. Let's talk money on this. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. Condra Kerntolis rode his beast carefully along the banks of the Styx. Something worried him about this area. Not so very long before, his beast had been alarmed by something along just this stretch of road. And then there was the mysterious death of Yerika Flaxus. They'd found his mangled body, studded with stab wounds and crucified on one of the rocky outcrops. The letters PFLH had been scrawled over his head, in his own blood. Nobody could make sense of it, or them come to think of it. PFLH? No sense at all. Somebody was up to no good that was certain. Crucifixion pointed to Yahweh and his people, but they rarely came down this way. He had heard that a delegation from Yahweh was on its way to visit Satan, but who knew what for? Wise demons did not involve themselves in the affairs of those so high up for when giants fought, midgets got trampled. The most likely bet was that one of the dukes was making a power play trying to expand his influence over the netherworld at the expense of Condra Kerntolis's duke. Now that would make sense. Something weird had been happening recently. The number of souls that had been arriving in hell had suddenly accelerated, rising by orders of magnitude. They'd been dispatched to the various regions of hell, of course, but at every level the numbers were being hidden so that their essence could be used by the lower-level demons instead of restricted to those of higher caste. Was that why Jerica Flaxus had been killed? Had one of the dukes or greater demons found out that human life essence was being diverted and settled for that public punishment? But if it was an example, why was there no indication of what it was an example of? That question distracted Chandra Kerntolis so that he never noticed the thin wire stretched across the pathway. His beast saw it, but the threat it represented didn't register. The prime characteristic of a beast was its unthinking ferocity. Caution was not a desired attribute. As a result of their inattention, neither was quite aware of what happened next or the skill with which it had been planned. The wires were attached to push-pull detonators fixed to four claymore mines, placed so that their victim was the center of an X defined by the cones of cubical metal shrapnel they generated. The wires also tripped a timer switch on four one-kilogram blocks of Semtex that had been buried under the path's surface. Condra Kerntolis tried to make his brain work, he was surrounded by flying mud and dust, his body ripped by wounds that sprayed his green blood around. His beast was down, 
its front legs and one of its claws torn off, its body broken and bleeding. Even as he watched, the path surface erupted, shredding the already dying beast and throwing its parts around. The connection was inevitable. Whatever the reason for the death of Jerica Flaxus, he was also to be its victim. The mud and mist stirred and three figures emerged. Humans. Condra Kerntolis cudgeled his dying brain into absorbing this data. Humans had done this? How? They were cattle, prey to be milked of their life essence, nothing more. They had killed him? How? A human female knelt beside him and he heard her voice. Somebody told us you couldn't be killed. Guess they were wrong, huh? Condra Kerntolis tried to reply but couldn't. As his vision faded out, one question tormented him. What happened to demons when they died? Watchtower, Banks of the Sticks, Fifth Ring, Hell. The thunder, strange and mysterious, had echoed around the Fifth Ring. Naxalavorsides looked over the rim of his tower. There wasn't much to see, just the seething of the mud in which the humans spend eternity on the edge of drowning. Just to be sure, he fired off a flare, lighting the area around the tower a bit better. Still nothing. He shrugged. Strange noises were not unknown in Hell. It was nothing to worry about. His shift would be over soon, and he could go back to his normal life. The regular legions were all being called away, and the jobs of the guards were being taken over by civilians such as him. This was something that he did not like at all. The second blast was very definitely something to worry about. It was stunningly close. Naxalavorsides felt the superheated air blast at his skin, felt the shockwave pummel him. More importantly, he felt his watchtower lurch as a major portion of the stonework on one side was blown away. His tower was collapsing, and he realized what that meant, even though he couldn't comprehend how it had been done. It wasn't the fall that killed Naxalavorsides. It was the wreckage of the watchtower landing on top of him that did the job. A few minutes later, the two, three human strike teams joined up and set off for the next target. The division wall of the sixth ring, hell. Kerflumpus always enjoyed stretching his legs, even if just to torture a few humans here and there. Now, he was marching out of the sixth ring into the fifth as he proudly threw out his chest and swung his arms. News had been all over about the crushing defeats inflicted on the insurgent humans, and his legion was mobilizing to move out and continue the pursuit of the shattered human nations, to spread out and batter their world into submission. The prospect excited him. They said that the sky and the human world was different, that it was light and dark, instead of the dull orange and brown striation. Well, now he would get to see it, and to experience crushing the humans and driving them before him, to taste their panic, blood, and flesh, as a member of the Second Army to pour from the portal into the human's plane. Kerflumpus was in the second platoon of his legion. Ahead and to his left, the commander, a greater demon, was swaying with the gait of his great beast as it stepped off the Styx Bridge. Its arched tail curled over his head, and he was sitting in the saddle with a bored look on his face when, with a sigh, his head exploded. Kerflumpus caught it out of the corner of his eye and swung around with horror, as every other demon in the unit did. Suddenly, something similar happened to the demon next to him. There was a whistling sound, and then they were both staring in horror at the fist-sized hole that had opened up in his chest. Spattering green blood all over Kerflumpus, he staggered a few steps and fell over the parapet of the bridge into the slow-moving, murky sticks below. All across the bridge, it seemed that demons were falling at random every ten seconds or so, and the situation was proceeding nicely toward absolute pandemonium. The head of the legion was held up at the forward edge of the bridge by the dead commander, milling about with no idea what to do. The tail of the legion was crowding into the bridge with no idea what was going on. Meanwhile, the legion ahead of them was marching off along the road into the mists of the fifth ring, with no idea what was happening behind them. There was obviously some wizardry at work here, heretofore unknown in hell. In sheer, undiluted panic, Kerflumpus charged his trident and loosed it off the bridge. He was watching the head-sized ball of magic zip across the river toward the far side when the air punched him, blanking out all sound as he was thrown up, spinning in midair. All around him he saw other demons thrown up, some weakly flapping their vestigial wings. It was almost comical, and it was the last thing he saw before the masonry fragments and shrapnel shredded him. Across the river, Lieutenant Kim whistled as the bridge blew. It was more spectacular than she'd expected. 
the initial flash of detonation was impossibly fast, and the blast wave ripped apart the bridge as though it were made of sand, sending Baldrix flying. She nodded back at McInery and Tarrant. Good work placing the Semtex, Mac and Bubbles. The two were grinning ear to ear. Behind them, two of the other three members of Tango 15 were setting down the M107s. Good shooting to you guys, too, said Kim. It hadn't really taken much. The Baldricks had been tightly packed on the bridge, and all they'd had to do is fire into the crowd. The 50 caliber Mark II 13 bullets had done a fabulous job, as usual. After surveying the scene for a few minutes and letting the two pilots, both avid big game hunters before their units were called to Iraq, pick off a couple of more bad guys, and the commander of the next brigade sized unit, Kim hoisted a satchel of webbing onto her shoulder. It had about two dozen more bricks of Semtex, the detonators, and several boxes of ammunition. Okay, boys, we're done here. Let's head out and get the next ambush set up. Adjusting her webbing straps so they didn't chafe her through the mud caking her body, Kim led Tango 15 back down the sticks toward their supply cache and the rope bridge they'd strung across the river. Once on the other side, they would set about making the Disdisprosium road a hell within hell, one that Baldrix would fear more than they feared Satan himself. Kim already had a name for it, La Route Saint Joie. Palace of Satan, Infernal City of Dis, Sixth Ring of Hell. The banners of kingdoms long conquered swirled in the red mist as Acropolopos approached the diamond throne of Satan. He had always known being a messenger was a bad idea, and now he knew that his life was a couple of minutes from ending. Oh, mighty prince, he began. Overlord of the innumerable legions of get on with it, snapped Satan irritably, clicking his claws against the hewn gem. What news have you brought me of Abigor's brilliant success? Sire. The messengers from Abigor are silent. I bring news not of Abigor, but of terrible happenings much closer to your throne. Well, what is it? Hurry up, my time is not your kidling's plaything. The messenger swallowed and groveled. My lord, I do not know how to say this. The bridge leading to the road to Dysprosium has been destroyed. Satan stopped clicking his fingers. What? His voice was quiet, which was even more terrifying than the hysterical fits. Repeat yourself. Acropolis was shivering uncontrollably. Your invincible eminence, the bridge across the Styx has been destroyed. Those legionaries who were there report that it burst into many pieces with the roar of ten thousand demons. Flying stones killed many and... What? asked Satan, cutting him off with a word. Do my advisors think to be the cause of this... outrage? Still silkily smooth and quiet. The court was silent, save for the shuffling of feet as some of the more perspicacious demons positioned themselves so that the inevitable rage would not claim their lives. Speak! roared Satan. I command you all speak! One demon timidly cleared his throat. Um, sire, none of us can think of any explanation save... He trailed off, but not in time to save himself. Save what? screamed Satan, bawling his hand into a fist and pounding it on his throne. Save, uh, save, perhaps most improbably, a bit of stray human magic. Satan's glare squashed him into an unimaginably horrible pulp. You will all find us the cause of this outrage. You will ensure that it does not happen again. This is our domain. Our immortal, invincible will decrees that no human mage shall ever work his magic once more in this infernal pit. As the court demons hastened to obey, Scrambling around the wide hall, Acropolis took the opportunity to scuttle unnoticed away. As he hurriedly left the palace, he promised himself to try again to join the legions. Messengering was too hazardous a job. Fifth Ring, Hell The road, large flat paving stones laid atop a low causeway of dirt, wound through the foggy swamps. The half-muted groans of the eternally drowning souls crucified in the mud, echoed dimly through the stinking air. Mechanary surveyed it with a grim smile. You think we can actually blow the causeway, LT? Kim shrugged. Why the hell not try, Mac? Bubbles, you got the Semtex? Aye, LT, right here. Let's lay it. Kim directed the other members of Tango 15 Recon Flight to lay eight Semtex bricks on each side of the road, spaced several hundred feet apart. The bricks were pushed down into the soft earth, no more noticeable than large rocks. As Tarrant finished pushing the electronic detonators into the last brick, McInery hurried up to where Kim and the rest of Tango Flight were standing. 
LT, we have contacts coming from that direction. He waved behind him. How many, Mac? Didn't count. Just saw the torches and heard the voices. In the distance, dim chanting floated through the mist toward them. Everyone off the road, she hissed. She grabbed the last bag, slung it over her shoulder, and waded into the bog after the others. They made toward a low granite outcropping just within view of the road. As they hurried behind it, stumbling past several submarine crucifixes, the chanting grew louder. P. Yesu Domine, Dona Is Requiem. The tramping of the feet, all in step, grew, and the first torchbearers appeared through the mist. Kim suppressed a gasp. They were not baldrics. These were honest-to-God cherubs, dressed in pure white that seemed to glow like pearl through the thin fog, and they were chanting something. Was it Latin? Whatever it was, Kim had enough of a musical ear to note that the singing was perfect, the pitch exactly correct, the timing exquisite. She couldn't have emulated it herself. When trying to sing, she hit all the right notes. She just hit them in the wrong order. In the midst of the cherubs, all chanting, all bearing torches, and all wearing swords at their sides, were greater humanoids head and shoulders taller than the others, with flawless skin and damningly, White wings folded across their backs. Mac, how many you count? Whispered Kim. I got seven angels LT and 77 cherubs. We're at war with heaven and hell both, right guys? There was a mutter of affirmation from beside her and a brisk, quiet, Let's take them. From one of the big game hunters, who had been a devout Catholic up until the message. Kim nodded and thumbed the detonator. The concussion knocked the breath out of her, even at this distance. The blast tore the heavenly emissaries apart, spattering white and red blood and body parts along with the dirt, mud, and chunks of rock. After, where there had once been a road, there was a giant gaping hole filling with vile, gurgling swamp water. The group of angels and cherubs was scattered in many pieces through the surrounding swamp. When she got her breath back, Kim was last in line as Tango Flight trooped away from the carnage as fast as they could, quietly jubilant. Then a stray thought crossed her mind. Boys, we're going to need some more Semtex. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. Rahab looked at the dead beast and its rider in horror. The beasts and the demons who rode them were invulnerable. Everybody knew that. Those few who had tried to kill them had died deaths that were terrible even by the standards of Hell. Yet those new arrivals had killed this pair. She knew who had done it all right. Nobody else would have the gall to even try. And if that wasn't enough, the letters PFLH written on the beast's side in its own blood were enough. Were they insane? Rahab's stomach clenched with fear at what was likely to happen. Once these deaths became known, there would be revenge, reprisals. The demons would come down here by the Legion, searching every inch of ground for those who had done the deed. In the process, they would find all those who had escaped from the pits over the millennia and at best return them to torment. Thousands of souls doomed to return to their agony because these six decided to upset the natural order of things. When she had left them in the underground room, Rahab had been sorely tempted to arrange for them to be found by the guards and return to the pits. She had dismissed the idea, believing that their comments and stories had been just wild boasting. Now she guessed they were not and she bitterly wished she had betrayed them. Condemning six souls was better than dooming the tens of thousands of escapees. She'd been searching for them for days, trying to catch up with them and bring them into shelter. Now she had found this. She agonized over the decision, what to do. At that point, another fact penetrated her bewildered mind. She had seen no flares from the watchtower that lay close at hand. Fearfully, she made her way to where it had stood, only to be appalled by the sight that loomed through the mist. The watchtower was a blasted stump, its wreckage spread all over the paths, some of it sinking into the mud. And on the stump were the letters PFLH written in the blood of the watch demon. What else had these mad humans got in mind, and what to do about them? In Rahab's mind was another question as well. Was it time to join them? And did she have any choice in the matter? Somewhere in the desert, western Iraq, late afternoon. The sand collapsed underneath his clawed feet, sending him tumbling downwards into a ravine he had never seen. Memnon had been staggering through the desert, at first with purpose, trying to make his way back to the hellmouth and deliver his message, 
but all plan or intent had long since been burned out of his brain. The sun had seared him, brutally, without mercy, sending his body temperature soaring and fogging his brain with mists that owed as much to hallucination as the shimmering heat haze. The bitter cold of the nights had been worse, if anything, than the roasting heat of the sun. There were parts of hell where the souls of humans were roasted in coffins or blasted around on superheated winds. Now Memnon knew the sufferings they endured. He'd also had a plan, to keep going until his wings regenerated and he could fly the rest of the way. That plan too had died. His wings were regenerating, although slowly. They were growing back twisted, malformed, useless. Memnon guessed that the fragments of iron that he could feel in his back, the legacy of the fire lance that had torn his original pair off, were interfering with the growth patterns and leaving him with these poor apologies for wings. Whatever the reason, he knew that he would never fly again. Never soar through the comforting skies of hell, looking down on the great city of Dis that surrounded the pit where human souls were forever condemned to suffer. Nor were his mutated wings the only parts of his body causing him grief. His stomach was an empty pit, chewing at the very center of his being. His last meal of human flesh was long forgotten in his screaming need for raw meat, yet in this endless expanse of sand there was no sign of food. Nor was there water and his throat was closed tight, swollen with the thirst that was adding its measure of suffering to the madness that was slowly but surely taking him over. He rolled down the sandbank, seeing the sky rotate above him, the hated yellow sun glaring down as it laughed at his suffering. His body stopped its roll, impacting on a strange irregular mass that yielded on his impact. Memnon looked harder at where he had ended up. It was a gully through the sand, perhaps one carved by flood water and not yet erased by the wind. It was not the sand that had stopped his roll, though. It was the bodies of dead demons, perhaps half a dozen of them, piled in the bottom of the crevice. Had they crawled here for shelter and died? Or had their wounds overcome them? Memnon pushed at the bodies, feeling one firmer than the rest. That is what kicked his mind into action. Here was meat. He ripped off a large chunk from the firmest corpse. The others were already far advanced in decay and sank his teeth into it. His throat was too swollen to swallow at first, but a thin stream of fresh blood from the meat eased it enough. Then, the implication of that thought struck Memnon at the same time as there was a faint, racking groan from the body he was eating. The demon was still alive. It took only a second for Memnon to fix that. His claws lashed across its throat, killing it. It was probably a merciful act. Memnon filled his stomach with fresh meat, and the blood eased his thirst a little. It was then he heard a strange sound, a thumping from the sky that reminded him of clawed feet marching down the road from Dysprosium. There was a great bridge on that road, one over the river Styx, where a demon could stand and drink in the sufferings of the humans below. He would like to stand on that bridge again. The thumping grew worse, and to Memnon's horror, a human sky chariot flew over a hill, obviously searching the ground. It was not one of the sleek ones, the ones that had mutilated and maimed him, it was an uglier, more ungainly monster that had a strange rotating structure over its head, as if its wings spun around instead of flapping. The sky chariot slowed down abruptly, and its nose started to swing backwards and forwards, searching the ground ahead of it. Memnon knew what it had spotted, the pile of bodies in the ravine, and it was checking to see if they were dead. He paused, then froze. Perhaps if he played dead, it would go away. The shame of that thought made him want to weep, but he remained motionless anyway. There were a series of explosions, very fast, and streaks of fire from under the sky chariot's nose. They ended in the ravine and walked along it in a series of small blasts. Memnon willed himself to remain still. If he got up and ran, the sky chariot would kill him for certain. If he stayed still and silent, he might survive, and he did have the message to deliver. The blasts stopped well short of him. It had only been a very short burst. Memnon realized that it had been intended to scare any living creature in the mound into moving so that it could be killed. He congratulated himself on defeating the cunning plan, and again when the sky chariot turned and flew away. Soon the desert was silent again, and Memnon could start moving. He left his ravine. It took much longer to climb up the sandy banks than it had taken to descend, and started off again, heading west towards the setting sun. He didn't even have a clear idea of where he was anymore only that the portal home was somewhere to the west. He wanted home so badly he could taste it, 
anything to get away from this hideous planet and the humans with their deadly chariots. Sometime later, he had no idea whether it was minutes, hours, or days for his whole world now concentrated on the effort needed to pick his feet up and lay them down again. To keep up his slow journey west, he saw a strip of black, a human thing that they laid across the desert so that their chariots could move faster. Memnon's heart stirred for on it were familiar figures, infantry demons, also heading west. From a rocky outcrop on top of a hill overlooking the black strip, he summoned up his energy and focused his far-seeing vision on them. The sight of a defeated army was a pitiful one. It always was, always would be. Memnon had seen a defeated army before, in the skirmishes that constantly went on in hell, as the great dukes jockeyed for position, there were defeated armies often enough. This was something else, something that went so far beyond pitiful that Memnon had no words to describe it. The infantry had thrown their tridents away and were staggering as they walked west. Some supported others, helping them along, and that amazed Memnon, for in hellish armies the demons lived or died by their own strength. Even as he watched, he saw one fall to its knees and try to collapse in exhaustion, but the two nearest helped it to its feet and half carried it onwards. He had never seen anything like that before, nor had he heard anything like it, a moaning, half-wailing sound of demons in dire distress. Then he heard the same dull thudding noise, only this time he knew what it was. The sky chariot was coming back. He looked and saw it, black against the sky and with three more of its kind in company. They were heading in fast, obviously knowing precisely where to go, and as Memnon saw, what to do. Two fire lances erupted from each of them, swinging out towards the column of misery he had been watching. The fire lances streaked in, too fast to see properly, and terminated in explosions, all eight equally spaced along the column on the black strip. He could hear the explosions from where he lay and heard the screams they caused. The sky chariots didn't leave it there. They were closing on the column, and Memnon saw them rake it with the same weapon he had experienced earlier. The same rapid series of explosions, the same red streaks ending in smaller bursts on the ground. Only these ones were in the mass of living demons, and he saw them flayed by the bursts, chopped down. Two of the sky chariots flew parallel with the column, peppering it with the explosions, tearing at it. Some demons tried to escape by running sideways, but the sky chariots followed them and chased them down. Each attempted escape ended the same way, the demon vanishing in the dust of the blasts, to be seen torn and dead when it cleared. It didn't take long for Memnon to understand that the sky chariots were playing a game, competing between themselves to see who could kill the largest number of escapees. What sort of people were these humans? Memnon was bewildered by what he was seeing. The army was defeated. Anybody could see that. What was to be gained by this slaughter? In hell, battles were fought until one side had lost, then stopped. Sometimes a battle would never start. One commander would see he was clearly outmatched and stand no chance of winning, so he would concede the issue. He had never seen this before, this relentless pursuit and destruction of a beaten enemy. The sight made him shift with rage, boiling anger at human cowardice seething within him. Even destroying the retreating foe, they stood off and killed from a distance. They never closed and fought their enemy honorably. He controlled himself. He had no desire to be a target of the Sky Chariot's games. Finally, when all on the Black Strip was still, the four Sky Chariots made a final pass over the scene of carnage and left. Memnon was about to leave his cover in the rocks that topped his hill when he saw dust on the horizon. He shrank back into his rocky shelter and watched. The cloud materialized and Memnon saw something that chilled his heart still further. A long column of iron chariots, some big, some smaller, with a sky chariot flying on each side. He watched, appalled as they drove over the demon corpses stretched out on the black strip, grinding them into green and yellow smears on the black surface. Then, once clear of the remnants of the column Memnon had watched, they peeled off the black strip and spread out in a circle the long tubes pointing outwards. He was fascinated by the sight. As far as he knew, nobody had ever watched the humans in their iron chariots when they weren't killing. He saw humans climb out of the iron chariots. Oddly, the smaller ones seemed to have more humans than the big ones. They walked around. He could see them unloading things from the chariot and pass them around. Then more chariots arrived, great ones that dwarfed even the bigger iron chariot. Some had tents on the back, others great cylinders. 
The tented ones started to unload boxes, the humans breaking them open and passing the contents to each other. Strange things, pointed cylinders that gleamed in the sun. They put the cylinders inside the iron chariots and seemed to be happy at the labor. Others were passing around other things from the boxes. But it was the great cylinders that confused Memnon. The chariots carrying them pulled alongside the iron chariots, and somehow the humans connected the two with a long snake. Were the two chariots mating? Memnon shook his head in disbelief and continued to watch what happened beneath. Alpha 1-1. Somewhere in the desert. Western Iraq. Before dusk. That's it, Hooters. We're out of gas. Or as near to it as makes no difference. Got a little in case we have to maneuver, but we go no further. We don't have to, Biker. This is where we're supposed to wait for the supply trucks. We clear of the stink? That was a lesson the tankers had learned early. Dead baldricks rotted fast in the sun, and the smell was dreadful. It was so bad back where the baldric army had been broken under the hammer of artillery fire and the anvil of armor that there was serious question whether people would be able to live there again. The smell seemed to seep into the soil. We're fine, Hooters. Baldy had stuck his head out and sniffed. The flyboys and the Apaches did a good job on this lot. Okay, take five, guys. Crab, Baldy, stay on overwatch while Biker and I stretch our legs. She picked up the M4 carbine from its clips and heaved herself out of her commander's hatch. It took a moment's effort to scramble down the outside of her tank, and then the sand felt good and solid under her feet. This sounds crazy, LT, but you know, I'm kind of getting to like the desert. It seems to grow on us, doesn't it? It does, Jim, it truly does. There's a grandeur here, something elemental somehow. They'd both noticed the crews of the other Abrams tanks and Bradley infantry combat vehicles also dismounting to stretch their legs and drop the nicknames. You ever seen a desert before? Nope, I'm from Vermont. Just a rubber who spent the week in the city and the weekend in the hills. Then my guard unit got called up and here I am. Rubber? Stevenson looked curiously at her driver. He didn't look like a contraceptive. Rich urban biker. Where'd you come from, LT? New Jersey. Bayonne, to be precise. Joined the guard to work my way through college and found myself here in the sand pit instead. Then the message came. Your old LT laid down and died and I was the only spare officer available. Can't say I'm surprised. He always was a sanctimonious old bastard. When we were at camp and he visited a local knocking shop, he'd get on his knees and pray for forgiveness first. Cracked the girls up, it did. Stevenson whooped with laughter and hooked her head. Don't it always go to show? Them that talks the talk don't walk the walk. Right, Jim. We better give the others a chance to stretch. She'd timed it just right. By the time her crew had got their break, the big Oshkosh ships of the desert had arrived and were driving into the lager. Critically, all the fuel trucks were there. Their load of fuel was desperately needed. She watched carefully as the hoses were unreeled and the fuel trucks started gassing up the Abrams and Bradleys. Other trucks were unloading boxes of ammunition. Hey, LT, you need reloads? Sure do. She looked at the barrel of her tank. They'd stopped using a single ring for each baldric kill. Now they had a one-inch band for ten and a quarter-inch band for singles, plus their single white band as well. Right. Can give you ten sabot, twenty heat, and the rest canister. I'd like more canister if you've got it. Not much use for Sabo. Sorry, LT. We're running low. We're sharing out the heat and canister and making the numbers up with Sabo. The brass tell us they're flying 120 in direct from home and more's coming from Europe, but we're still running low here where it counts. Okay. Slightly resigned, but there it was. Nobody said war had to be easy. Stevenson and her crew started breaking open the crates and bombing up their tank. They were interrupted by the sound of a Black Hawk landing. Captain Stevenson. She turned around slightly irritated. She assumed the mistaken rank was a comment on her dress. She was wearing a tank top and had left the top of her BDUs in the tank. The desert may be grand, but it was still hot. It's Lieutenant, er, sorry, sir. I'll get my blouse right now. She did a double take. Colonel Sean McFarland was standing in front of her. Well, when you do, you get to pin these on it. He handed her a small box containing double silver bars. Congratulations. You've done a fine job out here. Sir, thank you, sir. Stevenson looked at the bars in her hand. You'll take over this combat group. You done good, Stevenson. Especially for somebody thrown in the deep end the way you were. The whole group will be staying here tonight, the way the pocket is shrinking around what's left of the Baldricks. There's too much danger of friendly fire if we don't take things carefully. Big jump up, sir. Stevenson was nervous. What amounted to a company command was a challenge to put it mildly. Same for everybody, Stevenson. Army's growing fast. We're taking cadre out of units to help train new outfits as fast as we can. You stay alive. 
You'll have a battalion in a few months. Well done, Captain. McFarland wandered off, apparently at random, but to those under him, it always seemed that he would turn up at exactly the time needed to spot a problem developing. Around the laggard combat team, the dusk started to settle, and the flashes of artillery fire grew more distinct. Somewhere in the desert, western Iraq, night. Abigor huddled in the rocks, looking out across the desert. If his instincts were right, the hellmouth was very close. The last few days had been a horror. The human sky chariots had hounded his force as it had disintegrated. They'd never let up, their curious rotating wings beating the air, the thumping of their weapons always so deadly. His army had started retreating, what was left of it. Then the retreat had become a rout. Still the humans hadn't let up. They'd pursued him until the rout had become a panic-stricken flight for the rear, and the defeated army had become a helpless mob that had been slashed into ever smaller pieces. Then, when he thought he had finally escaped, he'd seen more of the human iron chariots in front of them, blocking the retreat. That was when he had understood at last. The humans didn't fight their battles to make a point. They fought them to destroy their enemies. He'd noted something else. In hell, armies fought their battles bottom up. The foot infantry would get killed, but rarely any of higher rank. Commanders had better things to do than kill each other. Anyway, how could one negotiate a deal with somebody one had just killed? But the humans fought their battles top down. They started by killing the enemy commanders and then slaughtered the decapitated mass that was left. There was a corollary to that. They fought that way because they didn't intend to negotiate with the losers. How could they have understood humans so little? Abigor shook himself and cautiously looked around. The humans could see in the dark. Shots could come out of nowhere. Still, it looked safe enough and there wasn't far to go. The Hellmouth was so close now, just a few more hours away. Central Belfast, Northern Ireland. Inspector Richard Doherty was a veteran police officer, having been in the Police Service of Northern Ireland, or Police Service of Northern Ireland, incorporating the Royal Ulster Constabulary George Cross, to give it its full name, since 2001, and had served in the Royal Ulster Constabulary for 12 years before the change of name. He was one of the 20% of the service's officers who were Catholic, well, ex-Catholic, and it was about 15% since the message, though as a veteran RUC man he thought of him as an 8%er, 8.3% 8 of the old force having been Catholic. The message had hit Northern Ireland harder than the mainland. Around a quarter of the population had just lain down and died, or committed suicide, including many of the province's religious leaders and some of the political ones. Sadly for the police, about 10% of the service had been amongst those who had died. Like many of his co-religionists, he represented the fact that Catholics had been promoted in numbers well out of proportion to the percentage of total officers. He still remembered the days when becoming a police officer or soldier was a very dangerous choice for a Catholic. Not only were you likely to be shot in the back or blown up while carrying out your duties, but your family was also at great risk. Only now, times had changed. The appearance of the armies of hell in the desert of Iraq and a baldric attack in America had really stepped up the level anxiety for the public. To reassure the population, the PSNI had put a strong armed presence on the streets of the province. Backing them up were a couple of regular army infantry battalions, who would soon be joined by the recently reformed home service battalions of the Royal Irish Regiment. Men and women known as Greenfinches, who had served in these battalions had flocked back to the colors when the decision to reform them had been announced. Fortunately, the army still had enough equipment and uniforms in storage in Northern Ireland to equip them. The inspector was in charge of a police support unit of 12 officers, mounted in a pair of armored Land Rovers, known as the Tangy. Once upon a time, the Tangies of the RUC had been painted gray. Now they were painted in the same orange and yellow checkered Battenberg high visibility scheme worn by similar vehicles on the mainland. Doherty shook his head as he saw a man and a woman, both carrying Armalite rifles, walked past as they did their shopping. One of the first acts after the British government had declared a state of emergency was to repeal all existing gun control laws. Illegally held weapons were now appearing openly on the streets. It was quite amazing how many of them there were. But then, the various groups of Irish terrorists had been notorious for burying stashes of guns all over the countryside. Few years ago we would have been arresting that pair. Or worse, Sarge. 
Doherty commented. That's right, to be sure, Sergeant Chris Ryder replied. I don't think I'll ever get used to seeing ex-provos or loyalists walking about with their guns openly. Yeah, I know what you mean, Sarge. If I had my way, half of them would still be in the maze. Murderous bastards, the lot of them. Those rifles won't do them much good anyway. I hear that a full 30-round magazine of 556 five, rounds only slows a baldric down. Doherty had every reason to be bitter about the terrorists. One of his friends had been shot in the back by an IRA gunman while administering first aid to a woman injured in a road accident, while another had been crippled by a blast bomb thrown by a loyalist mob. Suddenly a series of loud screams caught the attention of both officers. Doherty and Ryder turned towards the sound, just catching the sound of two pops, pistol shots. They were just in time to see one of the police support unit personnel, Glock 17 still in his hands, being eviscerated by a three-meter-high demonic apparition. Jesus, I mean bloody hell. I mean, oh shit. Doherty exclaimed as he watched the Baldrick kill a civilian who was too slow in running. His mind seemed to be running in slow motion, and he had time to reflect that the message had eviscerated the English language's stock of forceful expressions. Get the rifles out of the tangy. He yelled to the remainder of the unit, then, Run! to the nearest civilians. Doherty and Ryder both drew their pistols and opened fire, even though they knew that the 9 by 19 millimeter rounds would probably do little more than piss the Baldrick off. The Baldrick turned as he felt the new stinging impacts. He turned and saw two more of the humans dressed in green and wearing those funny hats pointing their outstretched arms at him, as if praying or begging for mercy. He marveled at their apparent stupidity. Praying had not saved the last green-clad human. The two police officers retreated towards the tangies, changing the magazines in their pistols. Several other members of the unit had also opened fire, but to Doherty's horror, he could see that although the Baldrick was bleeding from multiple wounds, it had not even been slowed down. All he could do was continue to fire until he ran out of ammunition, and hope for the best. At this point, an armed civilian joined the battle, engaging the Baldrick with an AK-47. The demon paused, ignoring the police officers for a moment to take hold of the civilian, tear out his heart and throw him through the air. Finally, the two officers assigned to the task managed to get the six HK-33 rifles that were held in lockboxes in each Land Rover and threw them out. Doherty dropped his Glock and grabbed the rifle from the policewoman with a great deal of gratitude. He had no hesitation in selecting full auto, raised the rifle to his shoulder and opened fire. Now that the surviving officers were armed with rifles, even ones firing 556 by 45 mm NATO rounds, the Baldrick finally began to show that it was feeling the effects of the gunfire. It began to stagger back under the effect of the massed gunfire, especially now that several armed civilians had joined the fight. Two of them had pump-action shotguns, and the heavy slugs produced the first real impacts on the creature. They drove it back, the bullets pounding on its body. Finally, it collapsed to the street, dead. Doherty and Ryder advanced on the body cautiously, changing the magazines on their rifles. To their relief, it was very dead. Score one for the good guys. One of the armed civilians was loading his shotgun with more heavy slugs. He looked sadly at the street where a police officer and two civilians were down, in crumpled, lifeless heaps. Cost us, though. Then he grinned at the police officers. Still... It's good to see true fighting Irishmen all on the same side at last. Cabinet Office, White House, Washington, D.C. We must anticipate that there will be further attacks of this kind, in view of what that monster told us. Secretary Warner was interrupted by a tangible shudder that ran around the room. Memories of the succubus's presence at the meeting were all too fresh. These attacks have been going on for a long time, and we see no reason why they should stop now. In fact, with the destruction of the Baldrick army in Iraq, they might well pick up in tempo. So as a line of defense against such attacks, I propose the formation of a local defense force that will protect areas where there are large gatherings of people, malls, sports meetings, etc. The personnel will be drawn from all citizens between the ages of 18 and 50 who are not currently serving in the armed forces. Obviously, we'll give priority to people whose industries are not needed for the war effort. They can serve one of their work days. We'll arm them with the new 458 rifles we're putting into production. I propose the new force be called the Local Defense Volunteers. Local Defense Volunteers. Secretary Rice's voice was thoughtful. LDV, 
You know what they'll be called, don't you? The Look, Duck, and Vanish? Look, Duck, and Vanish? Warner thought for a second. I suppose so. How did you come up with that? The British had a similar force back in World War II. Originally, they called it the local defense volunteers, but they changed it to Home Guard because of the misinterpretation of the acronym. How did you get local defense volunteers anyway, John? President Bush's voice was curious. I was looking at a picture of the Civil War, and it made me think of the U.S. volunteers. The new group is for local defense, so I put the two together. What's wrong with U.S. volunteers? Bush was curious. Sounds good to me. We can revive all the names of the Civil War units for the local forces, add a sense of history to the undertaking. We can even call on some of those reenactor people to start them off. They'll have to use their own guns to start with, of course. I'd love to see the effect of a mini ball on a baldric. Rice's voice was droll. They might like the smell of black powder, though. Lots of sulfur in it. So we'll get the bill written and push through. U.S. volunteers it is. So decided? Bush looked around. There was a unanimous nodding of heads. So be it. Next issue? Aircraft production, sir. We're getting the B-1 production line set up now. It'll be starting work in around three months' time. Expect to see the first aircraft off the line this time next year. It's good we kept the tooling. The first AT-45Cs are coming off the Boeing line now. They're a minimum change armed version of the T-45C. They'll keep the line running until the single seat D model is ready. F-111s and B-52s are re-entering the fleet from davis Monthan now. A lot of older aircraft as well. We've got some like the F-4 being assigned to wings, more as placeholders than anything else. The rest we're going to use for tests to see what sort of aircraft can fly in hell-like conditions. Any F-102s? Bush spoke with a mixture of nostalgia and enthusiasm. Yes, sir. Nine were preserved. We can make two flyable. Not enough for issue, so we'll be using them for experiments. No, you won't. Bush spoke firmly. This is a presidential directive. Get those two flyable F-102s down to Andrews and designate them the presidential fighter flight. And get somebody to check me out on them. It's a long time since I flew a 102. In the background, the Secret Service presidential bodyguard detail went white at the thought of a president flying a death trap like the F-102. The president might think he was going to fly one, and the aircraft might be sitting at Andrews with a pretty paint job, but he would get in the cockpit over the Secret Service's collective dead bodies. From the expressions around the cabinet room, they weren't the only ones with that in mind. Pindar, under the MOD main building, Whitehall, London. Prime Minister Gordon Brown looked across the table at his new deputy prime minister. God, he'd have to remember not to use that name again. That grinning idiot got on his nerves. He'd strangle him if he asked Brown to call him Dave again. Well, it was the price of coalition politics, he supposed, and there was not a great deal he could do about it. The PM did reflect on the fact that Deputy Prime Minister David Cameron did rather remind him of a poor clone of his late, unlamented predecessor. Who could have imagined that Tony Blair had been so devout? It had come as quite a shock, even to this son of the manse. Given his Scots Presbyterian upbringing, his father had been a minister in the Church of Scotland. The message had hit Brown hard. He felt angry and betrayed, but could not help wondering if this was some kind of supreme test by God, or maybe the creature claiming to be him was in fact not the supreme being at all, but some kind of imposter. The latter had certainly been the opinion of the moderator of the Church of Scotland when Brown had spoken to him. In the first couple of days after the message, there had been a great deal of uncertainty in the United Kingdom. Those who were most religiously devout, around a tenth of the population, had died. Some had just laid down and given up. Others had committed suicide in a variety of imaginative ways. Some religious leaders had spoken to the Prime Minister, demanding that Britain surrender to the inevitable. Those that were still alive were now residents of HMP Belmarsh, which was rather empty now that most Islamic fundamentalists were gone. While a smaller proportion of the population of Britain had died, the deaths had been largely concentrated in a few areas. Parts of Leicester and Bradford had become ghost towns, and at least a couple of the smaller western isles had been totally depopulated. Clearing up the bodies before they decayed and caused a disease outbreak had been quite an undertaking. The government had called in the army, who had assisted in clearing up the corpses and building the funeral pyres used to dispose of them. Facing economic and social chaos on a scale never before seen, Brown had declared a state of emergency and had signed Queen's Order II, 
mobilizing the entirety of Britain's armed forces. Entirety included all reserve forces, service pensioners, and all cadet force personnel over 16. Britain was going to need everybody who could hold a rifle or train others to do so. One largely unknown fact was that the Army Act and its counterparts covering the RAF and Royal Navy allowed for the reintroduction of conscription without any new act having to be put before Parliament. In his second speech to the British people, Brown had announced the immediate reintroduction of national service for everybody between 19 and 55. Finding enough equipment, uniforms, or personnel to train the millions of men and women who would now be inducted into the Army, Navy, and Air Force was another matter, and would take some time. The next step had been to examine existing emergency powers bills that had been prepared for potential wars and see what was applicable to this particular situation. While all of the anti-terrorism-related emergency plans were up to date, those doing the research were rather alarmed to find that the last time the plans for general war, the closest scenario to this one, had been updated was 1992. This set of plans and emergency powers bills had served as the basis for those that had just been rushed through Parliament, along with a declaration of war on hell, which along with Britain's devolved Parliament and assemblies, was now prorogued, the remaining members having dispersed to their constituencies. At least now with Parliament prorogued, Brown would now only have to deal with his cabinet and the three first ministers, though they could be something of a pain. At least many of the government's emergency powers overrode much of their authority. The prime minister realized that the minister of defense was speaking and tried to look like he had been listening all along. And the news from Iraq certainly seems to be good. The Baldrick attacks on Allied forces have been totally defeated, and their army is in headlong retreat towards the Hellmouth. Admiral of the Fleet Lord West was saying, Damn all good it will do them because the American 1st Armored Division and the Iranian Armored Division have cut off their line of retreat. Appointing Admiral West as the new Secretary of State for Defense had come as a development of the horse trading that had taken place during the formation of the coalition government. The service chiefs, as well as the conservatives and liberal Democrats, had made it very clear that they had no confidence in West's predecessor, Des Brown, so he had to go. The Admiral was already the Parliamentary Undersecretary for Security, so he had experience of working in government, he had great experience of military matters, and was highly respected by both the services and politicians. The 4th Mechanized Brigade has performed very well against the Baldrick Army. I think our retention of rifled guns for the Challenger too has finally proven its worth. The Admiral said, continuing his briefing. They've demonstrated an ability to strike the enemy at a greater range than the smoothbore guns on the American tanks. That's certainly true. General Sir Richard Dannett, the Chief of the General Staff, agreed. Our Hesh rounds have also proven to be somewhat more effective than the heat rounds used by the Abrams, though we do need something like the canister round they have. There was a canister round produced for the old Challenger one, and if we have any left, they may be compatible with the Challenger too. Talking of shells, ammunition is one thing that Major General Binns has expressed concern about. Admiral West told the Prime Minister. A great deal of ammunition was expended in stopping the Baldrick attack, and while the stockpile in theatre is in no danger of running out just yet, he is beginning to run short. I take it we are moving further supplies to Iraq? The Prime Minister asked. Yes, Prime Minister. West confirmed. We are moving stocks of ammunition from the UK and Germany to Iraq. The remainder of the 1st Armoured Division is moving to ports of embarkation in Germany in case it is needed in Iraq, and we have alerted 3rd Division to be ready for possible deployment, though we may need them at home. Immediate reinforcements for our forces in Iraq will come from Afghanistan, where the threat has disappeared overnight. In fact, the senior surviving Taliban commander has sent a message to the commander of ISAF, offering the support of his men in fighting the war. Iran has agreed to assist in the movement of our troops and other contingents of ISAF from Afghanistan to the theater of operations. The Prime Minister nodded, indicating that he understood. What progress is being made regarding the restarting of tank shell production? Brown asked. I don't think that we can rely on supplies from South Africa. As memory serves, they were somewhat shoddy anyway. We have sent a ministry team up to the site of ROF Bishopton, along with some chaps from BAE. It seems that the factory is still largely intact, so restarting production should not be too difficult, if a bit expensive. West replied. Fortunately, the plans to build houses on the site were delayed, so no demolition has taken place, and most of the equipment is either there or was put into secure storage. The initial estimate given by my people is that the factory should be up and running within two months. Good. 
the PM replied. I trust there will be no problems regarding finance, Alistair. He asked the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Not at all, Prime Minister, Alistair Darling replied. Defence and industrial projects related to the defence of the realm will get all the money they need. The Bank of England is printing more money so that we can continue to pay our bills. That does, of course, risk the most appalling economic downturn when the war is over. Gordon Brown laughed the first time he had done so in a long time. Only if we win, Alistair. If we lose, then I don't think it will be a problem. He turned back to Admiral West. Admiral, if at any point BAE drag their heels either over Bishopton or increasing production of aircraft, tanks, rifles or whatever, tell them that should they continue to bugger us around, Her Majesty's government will nationalize the company and sack the management, thus making them eligible to be conscripted into the army. Certainly, Prime Minister. I shall certainly look at sending them somewhere nasty if that happens, West said. I'll deploy them to Iraq, Dannett commented. My soldiers need more equipment as soon as possible, so I'll not have them putting their lives at risk any more than they are already. There is one thing that we do need to ask your permission to do, Prime Minister. The SA-80, along with all rifles chambered for 556 five, NATO rounds, have proven to be less than effective at dealing with baldricks. They will kill them, but it takes a great deal of ammunition and has resulted in soldiers being killed before the baldrick dies. We have found that the 338 Lapua round used in our sniper rifles is far more effective, so we would like to start immediate and rapid development of a rifle chambered for this round to replace the SA-80. My staff have identified the old SLR as a suitable basis for this weapon, so we would like to arrange for production facilities to be set up as soon as possible. An urgent operational requirement, I take it, General? Brown asked. Then by all means do whatever is necessary to get this weapon into the hands of our soldiers. On another matter entirely, I've heard that the Americans have managed to make contact with some of their soldiers in hell and are in the process of starting an insurgency. Are we engaged in a similar undertaking? He saw the chief of the defense staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Jock Stirrup, smile in a very cat-like way. We most certainly are, Prime Minister. Our special forces people are working very closely with the Americans on this. If possible, we'd also like to try to contact any of our personnel who have ended up in hell. We believe that if we can organize all of the ex-military personnel who have ended up in hell, or even just a small proportion of them, then we may be able to get quite a rebellion going. Apartment in Queens, New York City, New York. He carefully wrote out the name and address on the plain manila envelope with his black sharpie. It whispered across the surface as his elegant but simple strokes spelled out the name, James Randy. He stopped for a moment. The quiet, dulcet tones of the classical music in the background was swelling up now, and he listened. He ignored the palsied shaking of his left hand. There was no time for fear. His eyes drifted down to the small pile of photos stacked up next to the open envelope. The top photo was a wide-angled shot of an African village, thatched huts and low-hanging solitary trees with scrub brush everywhere. It was almost cliché as if he had taken a photo of an African village set in the back lot of Paramount. He only wished that were true. In the wide-angled shot there were plumes of black smoke rising up in several locations throughout the center of the village. His thoughts, unbidden as always, drifted back to that moment in time. His eyes lost their focus on the photo, and he was no longer in his quiet home in a nondescript neighborhood of Queens. He was stalking through the deep scrub brush of the African village. The heat was oppressive, and the sweat clung to his body, unwilling to leave and unable to really cool him in this sub-Saharan warmth. He had heard of the atrocities committed here in Darfur, and like many of the Western journalists here, he was losing hope that anyone cared about the Africans dying in the wastes of this forsaken place. As he walked into the village, he was painfully aware of how alone he was here, and how exposed should rebel or government forces decide to descend on this village and finish what they had obviously started. He could already hear the lamentation of the women. It was a mournful yet desperate dirge that refused any succor or solace. It was the wailing of the women, the gnashing of the teeth of the men that must have attracted it here. The sounds of death in the old ways. The way people used to mourn before things got so civilized. But he was getting ahead of himself, wasn't he? He stepped between huts and abandoned carts, weaving through the debris and the occasional crater caused by some form of ordnance. 
Perhaps the government had sent another of its Russian-made bombers up north to deal more death to these villagers. It had happened before. His camera whirred and clicked in rapid-fire sequence as he took his shots while moving through the village, a discarded doll, a shoe left in the dirt, blood smeared across a doorway. It was all a flowing narrative, and he was capturing it as best he could in this miserable heat and squalor. The smell struck him as soon as he approached the town center, and he immediately knew what the fires were. People were burning. He pulled his camera up before him like a weapon, fingers tense as he prepared to take his shots. He stepped over a dead mule, the flies already swirling in angry buzzing clouds. His eyes narrowed on the ruined town center. The market was on fire, and there were people trapped within some of the flaming wrecks. A lot of people. The bomb struck at midday when many of the villagers were gathering what they could for dinner. The people who did this knew precisely what they were doing when they carried out the attack. He began snapping photos, lens quietly clicking as it focused in on the flailing limbs of the trapped and burning, capturing the expressions of pain and anguish. The lost hope was stamped across the faces of relatives. He had to keep taking the pictures because if he stopped, even for a moment, he could actually begin to comprehend what he was actually seeing, and he would lose all sense of composure and self-control. People were trapped in the rubble and being burned alive, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. He captured, with numb resolve, the desperately futile attempts by relatives and good Samaritans to douse the flames with buckets of water or dirt. He continued snapping pictures as they worked furiously. Suddenly, a young girl rushed up to him and began tugging at his arm and speaking to him in machine-gun-like delivery. She was begging him, begging in the most heart-wrenching manner for assistance. All he could do was drop his camera for a moment and shake his head sadly. Tears welled up in her eyes and she pulled now, almost as if trying to physically drag him to the scene. He continued to shake his head and then weakly responded in his stilted version of her dialect that he could do nothing. She shook her head and wailed, slapping herself on the sides of her forehead and falling to her knees. She sunk down into the packed earth and sobbed into it as if it were her mother's breast, her body shifting back and forth furiously as if trying to burrow into the ground to escape her grief, and her cries were like knives in his heart. He stared down at the sight dumbly, unsure what to say or do. His western mind was unprepared for this level of grief. It is like music. Don't you think, Jude? He froze. The voice was soft like silk sheets on skin. The person stood beside him, materializing out of the air like a shadow escaping the noonday sun. The anguish, the terror, the guilt. When death comes for humanity, it is the most feared and awesome event in their two brief lives. His eyes slowly turned to regard the person. He stood taller than Jude, black as obsidian in the sun, and wearing a simple white shirt opened at the chest with filthy khakis. His feet were clad in battered hiking boots. The boots were splattered with what he guessed were ancient blood stains. Imagine it, Jude. You come into this world and breathe for the first time. You have simultaneously taken one more step towards death. The newcomer turned his head slowly to face him, and it was so achingly graceful that Jude wanted to weep. The moment you are born, you are dying. That is the paradox in which you live. Jude shook his head slowly. Who are you? He asked quietly. There was an awesome sense of power around him, like standing next to a live wire, and he was dimly aware that the activity around them, the dying and the screams, were all slowing down and muted, as if the world were pausing out of respect for his conversation with the stranger. The stranger smiled softly as if at a private joke. I am a traveler in your world. I come and go as I please and where I go. Death follows me. You're not human. Jude replied without thinking and immediately had no idea why he just said that. I am more than anything you have ever known, Jude, son of Gregory. I am the sword, the scythe of the one above all, and in my passing entire nations have wept bitter tears. The firstborn tremble at my name. Unspoken, Jude heard a single name whispered with reverence in his head. Uriel. The black Adonis like being said nothing but pursed his lips as if contemplating his next words carefully. Follow me. Or what? Jude stammered. Follow me, Jude. I have many roads yet to travel, and this continent pleases me. The people here still know how to grieve. They are still connected on a primal level to death and mortality. Your sterile world repels and abhors me. 
Death in your world is a clinical state with consequences tied up in paperwork and inconvenience. Here, in this place. Uriel slowly raised his arms as if to embrace some unseen thing on the ether. Death is still felt. This is insane. No. This is life and death happening now. There is something coming. A great message that might make even your great empires in the West feel again. I wanted to bask in the cold glow of entropy one last time before I must leave this place. I'm talking to the Angel of Death, Jude whispered to himself in disbelief. I finally lost it. I've seen too much. Uriel suddenly reached out. At least Jude guessed he reached out because he must have done it between the blinks of an eye. For in the next instant Uriel's hand grasped Jude's chin tightly and forced him to look into his eyes. And in the angel's eyes he saw a pool of white within white and something else. Something dark and chittering like a mad insect. Focus, child of Seth. Jude's hair grayed at the temples, and he felt a palsy come over him, hands shaking and his bowels released their contents without hesitation. He stood in abject terror, rooted in place, and suddenly everything Uriel wanted and said was the sole thing in Jude's universe. Follow me. You will know my wake, for in it there is pestilence, war, and famine. Follow me throughout this continent and see my great works, for when I am gone there will be none like me again in this universe. I am the one above all scythe. Where I go, humanity dies. I am not just some quaint angel of death. I am entropy incarnate. I weep for your world, for my touch is far more merciful than what is to come. The Morning Star has always been too blunt of an instrument for my taste. Jude said nothing, but his tongue lolled in his mouth and his vision began to fade. He could hear his own heartbeat pounding in his ears and the roar of blood. His heart was slowing, inexorably slowing to a dull thrumming and he could feel ice collecting where Uriel's fingers touched his flesh. His blood had instantly recoiled at the touch and remained away from the points of flesh on flesh contact. Within your bloodline is carried the ancient gift, like the one borne by the Witch of Endor and all that ilk. You can see me for what I am. So follow me, Jude. I choose you as my final witness in these dark days. A prophet for a new age. Uriel released Jude's chin and watched the young man for a moment as blood rushed back into his face and graying cold clammy skin slowly regained its luster. His hair remained gray and his cheeks had sunk in slightly. There was no doubt these were scars that would remain. One did not touch the divine without scars remaining to mark its passage. Uriel looked back over the crowd of screaming refugees. The world apparently was coming back up to speed and volume and nodded as if coming to a decision. Peace be with you and my peace, I grant you. He whispered, and suddenly every single living thing in the town square down to the angrily buzzing flies dropped to the earth in an instant. Uriel nodded in satisfaction, turned in a slow, beautiful motion and strode away. In the glaring noonday sun, Jude saw the hint of ebony wings jutting from his back. He numbly looked around and then realized what had happened and acted as only he could. He lifted his camera. He snapped back to the here and now and saw that he had finished writing the address. He sighed softly and coughed. Blood speckled down on the white coffee table. Yes, one did not walk with the angel of death and remain untouched. He gently took the stack of photos and scanned them one last time before slipping them into the envelope. Each photo a place in Africa, each one a record of devastation and death, and each one followed by a photo of a black man, black enough to have been carved from obsidian like a walking statue and beautiful, so beautiful that in many instances the photos of his face simply blurred as if man's technology simply could not capture the sheer grace of the being. And in many of these photos... There were the onyx wings unfurled like a predatory hawk as it strode through the wreckage of its passing. Every prophet needed his gospel. Every prophet needed to warn the people. Jude Sanchez was no different. He had to warn the world that Baldrick's were not the only thing that stalked them from beyond. He sealed the envelope. Hampshire, England. The knock at the door came while Commander Nigel Sharkey Ward, DSC, AFC, R.N. retired, was eating his breakfast. Cursing the interruption at this hour of the morning, he made his way to the door. Yes, what is it? He asked before taking in who his visitor was. 
To his surprise, he saw a very young-looking sub-lieutenant. Ward noticed the wings on his sleeve marking him as a naval aviator, with two armed blue jackets, both wearing the brassard of the naval police standing behind him. Commander Ward, sir, the young officer said. Yes, how can I help you, sub? Your presence is required at Yeovilton, sir. The sub-lieutenant replied, handing Ward a sealed envelope. He was shocked to discover that it was from the First Sea Lord and Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Sir Jonathan Band himself. It informed him that the Royal Navy was returning the Sea Harrier FA-2 to service, and as part of this, was recalling as many retired sea jet pilots to service as it could. As the senior Sea Harrier pilot and pioneer in operating the aircraft, his services were required for refresher training. Admiral Band also offered him a promotion to captain should he accept this post. If not, he would simply be conscripted as a pilot at his former rank. Give me ten minutes to pack a few things, sub, and those two regulators won't be necessary. Bruntingthorpe Aerodrome, Leicestershire The aerodrome echoed to the sound of four Rolls-Royce Olympus turbojet engines being throttled up to full power. A great delta-winged shape emerged from behind one of the hangars and made its way towards the runway. Vulcan XH-558 was back in service. Taking their lead from the USAF, the Royal Air Force had been scouring the country's aviation museums for aircraft that might possibly be returned to service. A small collection of various kinds of Tornado and Harrier were already on their way to RAF St. Athan, or BAE Preston for refurbishment, while a small collection of Blackburn Buccaneers was currently being assembled. Finally, the Air Force's attention had focused on the only remaining airworthy Avro Vulcan B-2 left in the world. They were also now looking at the Vulcans and Victors maintained in taxable condition, as well as those held in static condition. Meanwhile, the volunteers of the Vulcan Operating Company had either found themselves back in the RAF or conscripted into the Air Force. The technicians, assisted by a team brought in from the rest of the Air Force, had been working hard for the last couple of weeks turning XH-558 from a display aircraft into a warplane once again. One advantage that they had discovered was that the modern electronics that they had installed took up less space and were lighter than the 1950s equipment that the aircraft had once carried, that left more capacity for fuel and weapons. Spares was a potential issue, though at least the VOC had assembled enough to keep XH-558 going for a while, and fortunately Rolls-Royce still had the details of how to build the Olympus engine. If push came to shove, though, some spare parts might have to be manufactured from scratch. If returning XH-558 to service was successful, it would serve as the model for XL-426 and XM-655, both of which were potentially airworthy, and for any of the other surviving Vulcans and Victors that were in reasonable condition. For the entirety of the past week, RAF armorers had been conducting weapons fit tests, confirming that yes, the Vulcan could still carry 1,000-pound bombs, and just as their counterparts in 1982 had discovered, that she could carry three 1,000-pound laser-guided bombs in its bomb bay. They had also double-checked that it could still carry another weapon it had once carried, too. As one of the aircraft chosen to carry the ill-fated Skybolt missile XH-558 had two underwing pylons that had been used in the Falklands War to carry Shrike missile and ECM pods. These pylons had been reactivated so that once again they could be used for weapons or jamming pods. Today, XH-558 was heading off to the RAF bombing range at Garvey Island to test her newly restored capability, her belly full with 21 1,000-pound bombs. Her pilot and co-pilot advanced the throttles forward to the stops, and the bomber began to accelerate down the long runway, once used by sack bombers on reflex alert, and roared into the air as if she was young again. London Military, this is X-Ray Hotel 558. Requesting permission to climb to flight level 30, and proceed on flight plan. Over. Roger that, 558. Welcome back to the Air Force. Over. Oxford, England. Professor Richard Dawkins was a deeply unhappy man. He had spent much of his career trying to prove that God, and by extension Satan, did not exist. He had even managed to convince himself that he had proven it beyond reasonable doubt. Several scholars disagreed with him and had even gone as far as to write books that argued that Dawkins was wrong, though the professor was so convinced of being right he had not even tried to debate with them, despite the apparent logic of many of their arguments. He was right, and that was all that mattered. The message had upset all of his work. God did exist, 
even if he had abandoned humanity to the tender mercies of hell. Despite all of his efforts to try and prove it was fake, the message had been all too real. The only crumb of comfort he could take from the situation was that his thesis that religion was inherently bad had been proven right, and at least he did not have to listen to the faithful say, I told you so, which would have happened had a benevolent, loving God revealed himself. Despite all that was happening in the world, Dawkins had decided to devote his time to writing a book that argued that the message had vindicated his work, glossing over the fact that he had been wrong about the non-existence of heaven and hell. Most readers would not remember that, he thought. Evidently, he had not been paying enough attention to the news. The government had implemented paper rationing to go with fuel and food rationing, and very few books would be getting published in the near future. In fact, very little other than military manuals and very truncated newspapers would be published from now on. To the intense distress of some, the Sun had decided to discontinue page three for the foreseeable future. Dawkins' stomach reminded him that it was time for lunch. He left the Oxford University College where he worked, intending to eat in the pub frequented by C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, idly wondering whether they continued their theological argument now that they were in hell. He passed two Thames Valley police constables, the thought of John Thaw coming into his mind as he did so. What did bring him up short was that both officers were armed, still something of a rare sight in Britain. The two police constables carried the standard Glock 17 as a sidearm, though one carried a G36C rifle, while the second carried a pump-action shotgun. The British police had searched through their armories for suitable weapons to arm as many of their officers, whether authorized firearms officers or not. Professor Dawkins. Dawkins turned back from staring at the two coppers to see a slightly disheveled, long-haired man in his mid-twenties standing in front of him. The professor was not worried. Lots of his fans and acolytes liked to speak to him about his work or ask for his autograph. It wasn't as if he was likely to be assailed by any religious fanatics these days. Yes, he replied. I think I have a pen here somewhere. Dawkins continued absent-mindedly. Good, good, the man said satisfied. This is all your fault. He suddenly yelled, taking the professor by surprise. You and your ilk denied the Almighty, and he has abandoned us to eternal damnation as punishment. Look here, you... Dawkins began to say, hoping that those two police officers he had seen earlier were not too far away, had heard the commotion and would come to his rescue, but was cut off by a sharp pain in his chest. He looked down to see the wild-eyed man pull an eight-inch knife out of his chest. The man raised his arm and stabbed again, and again, and again. The two police officers had indeed heard the yelling and had been hurrying to deal with it. Instead of seeing two men arguing, they saw one man lying on the pavement surrounded by a spreading pool of red, while the other was spattered with blood and held aloft a dripping knife. He looked straight at the aghast police officers. Almighty Lord, today I have truly done your work. I will gladly do my penance. The murderer screamed, his voice rich in exultation. The shotgun-armed constable brought up his weapon and shot him once. The heavy slug intended for use against Baldrick's made an incredible mess of a human being, blasting a huge hole in his chest and throwing the corpse out into the road. Enjoy rotting in hell, mate, the copper said as he worked the slide on his weapon. You've condemned an innocent man to hideous torture. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. This letter was received by the Institute a few hours ago. It provides us with eyewitness evidence that angels as well as demons have been behind much of the misery that has afflicted our world over the centuries. Excuse me. Randy turned to a secretary who had brought in a message flimsy. He read it, then turned dead white. Gentlemen, ladies, my apologies. I must ask to be excused. Please carry on with the agenda. He turned and left the conference room, the sharper observers noting that he staggered slightly as he did so. A few minutes later, Julie Adams knocked quietly on the door of his office and went in. Randy was sitting at his desk, his face in his hands, sobbing quietly. She slipped behind him and put an arm around his shoulders. She owed her sanity to this man, and some comfort was the least she could provide. What happened, James? An old friend of mine, Richard Dawkins, has been killed. He was attacked in the street in Oxford. He never stood a chance. A baldric. No, that's what makes it so horrible. It was some religious nutcase. Witnesses say he was screaming stuff about how Richard and I brought all this down on humanity, that by denying God, we brought about all humanity's damnation. That's ridiculous, James. The poor man was probably insane or possessed. Was he wearing his hat? Is it so ridiculous? Really? 
We were so sure we were right that all this talk of gods and devils and great sky pixies was just old, outmoded superstition, just ancient people without the knowledge to understand what was going on around them, giving the only explanation they could think of. We laughed at them, ridiculed their ideas and beliefs, and all the time there was a higher dimension. There were creatures who influenced our lives. The old legends did have a base of truth in them, and we laughed them off, just as we laughed off the people who tried to tell us we needed these tin foil hats. Now it's the people who refuse to wear them that are the dangerous cranks. So did we condemn humanity by our arrogance? When did heaven get closed to new entrants, James? Nobody knows. Everybody has different theories, but 1000 AD is the most popular. And you and your friend are really that old? Randy started at the suggestion and frowned. This isn't funny. No, it isn't, James. It's not funny at all. You're blaming yourself, your friend, and all those who thought like you for something that happened more than a thousand years ago. That's absurd, not funny. Got news for you, James. The world does not rotate around you any more than it rotates around any one of us. Your friend was a victim of the same mean, treacherous deception that made victims of us all. So stop blaming yourself and try to think out how we can help your friend. What? Randy was stunned by the comment. Well, we know he's in hell, don't we? Everybody who dies is. We know Kitten can find people in hell and contact them if she has enough to go on. You have pictures of your friend, personal stuff, things he gave you? Then give them to Kitten. See if she can contact him. Then we can work out how to get him out of there. Bring him back from the dead? Why not? We're sending enough occupants of hell in the opposite direction. At least let's try instead of wallowing in self-pity. Inner Ring, Seventh Circle of Hell Richard Dawkins writhed and twisted on the burning sand, trying to evade the flurries of searing flakes that tormented him. As far as he could see, he was in a featureless desert, broken only by the forms of other victims thrashing about in the same agony as him. He had no idea how long he had been here. All he could remember was the knife plunging into him, and then everything around him converging into a single bright dot, the way an old-fashioned television did when the station closed down. Then the impression of a tunnel, and the sudden impact of the pain as he had found himself here. This was it. This was hell, and he was stuck here forever. Then he mentally struck himself. No, he wasn't here forever. He was here until humans could blast their way down to him and free him. That was it. That was it all. He had to hold out until then. The burns from the sand and those accursed flakes made thinking difficult, and Dawkins believed he was going mad. There was a voice calling him. Richard? Richard? He knew the pain from the burning was making him hallucinate. Richard? Richard? It was still going on. Lala? It couldn't be. She was still alive. He was imagining things. No, it's Kitten. Is this Richard Dawkins? Who are you? You don't know me. I work for James Randi. You are Richard Dawkins. If you are, we're using you as an experiment. I'm Dawkins. Please help me. We're trying. Hold on. Headquarters. Randi Institute of Pneumatology. The Pentagon. Arlington, Virginia. I'm through. I got him. Poor thing. He sounds terrible. Being knifed and sent to hell will do that to a man. The speaker was one of four Special Forces men in the room, wearing orange-red BDUs and armed with the new M4A5s. Get ready to move, Lieutenant Meduse. Once the portal is open, we can't hold it for long. And don't forget the bolt cutters. Ready, Kitten? Here we go. James Kirkpatrick started turning up the dial, artificially boosting the signal they'd recorded connecting Kitten and Dawkins. Soon enough, the now-familiar ellipse started to form. As it increased in size, Kitten was threshing around helplessly on her couch, her partner dabbing her forehead and whispering comfortingly to her. Then, it was large enough, and the Special Forces H-Team stepped through. Inner Ring, Seventh Circle of Hell. Get a poncho over him fast. Damn these blasted flakes. What the hell is this place? Medusa was angry and hurried. This was nothing like what had been described to them. It's hell, boss. Sir, stay still, sir. We'll get you out of this. Just hold still. The tool. Steel bolt cutters, sliced easily through even the thick bronze shackles. Shit, we've got company! A figure, tall and black, had suddenly appeared. Medusa squeezed off a burst from his carbine at him and saw the figure lurch with the hits. Then a streak of fire shot across the burning desert and the baldric exploded. Well done, Frankie. They don't like them AT-4s. Behind them, the other two members of the team had freed Dawkins and dragged him through the ellipse. Medusa and Frankie Portello followed them out, 
and the ellipse closed behind them. Headquarters, Randy Institute of Pneumatology, the Pentagon, Arlington, Virginia. We got him! The voice from the Special Forces team was triumphant. All four were back in the room and the portal had been open for less than a minute. The body of Richard Dawkins was in the room with doctors applying instruments and probes. We're getting readings, he's, uh... The doctor was about to say alive, but stopped himself. With us. Richard, can you hear me? Randy was urgent, almost frantic, far removed from the gentlemanly, calm demeanor he usually maintained. James, how did you... what's happening? We got you out. Don't ask how, but we did. Mr. Randy, energy levels we're getting are fading. It's as if his life, if he wasn't already dead, was leaking out. Right. Kirkpatrick was already speaking to Kitten. Can you contact Lieutenant Kim, please? Then we'll open a portal to her. All right, please hurry, though. Kitten relaxed on her seat and closed her eyes, concentrating on her picture of Jade Kim. Over on the other side of the room, the H-team was loading up with supplies for the PFLH. No point in wasting a trip. Richard, we can't keep you here. We're sending you back to the Fifth Circle. We have a resistance team there. They'll shelter you until they can get you into hiding. Ma'am. Lieutenant Meduse was speaking to Kitten. Don't hold the portal open after we're through. Once we've arrived, we'll be staying there for a while. Kitten nodded with her eyes still closed. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell. Kim's eyes suddenly defocused. Message coming through, guys. Our resupply, hopefully. Lieutenant Kim. It was Kitten again. Yes, Kitten. Get ready, portal opening. There's a special forces team and a passenger coming through with some supplies. They'll explain what's happening. Get ready now. The black ellipse formed as a point and rapidly swelled to its full size, large enough for a man to step through. Five figures came through, four in red-brown BDUs that matched the foul air of hell very well. The fifth man was naked, his body burned but already starting to heal. Kim recognized that it was the enhanced healing power of hell. This person was one of the dead, just like Kim and her little unit. Ma'am, Lieutenant Meduse, Special Forces. This is Richard Dawkins. We pulled him out of somewhere else in hell and brought him here. Why? We haven't room for passengers. We needed to know if people can be brought from hell to earth and stay there. Well, they can't. He was, well, dying for want of a better word. The eggheads needed to know if Kitten could find other people. We needed to know if we can do transits like this. So many things. Look, we're staying on to help you here. In your reports, you mentioned a refugee organization. Can they look after him? Why can't I fight as well? Because you're not trained to. This is a job for professionals. Medusa's voice was curt. Can we get him to safety? Ma'am, my orders are to place myself under your command. Kim nodded. Being dead had its advantages. If this war went on long enough, she would be the most senior lieutenant in history. There is a refugee organization headed up by a woman called Rahab. We don't know if we can trust her. This will make a good test. Okay, Bubbles Mac, we better find Rahab. Medus, did you bring supplies? 120 kilograms of Semtex. Another M107, a lot of ammunition for same, and six M4A5 carbines. Oh, and a video camera. The brass want pictures and films of hell. Kim nodded. The Semtex wasn't enough, but it would do. Who are you, sir? Richard Dawkins. I was an author. I know. I read one of your books. Guess you must be pretty embarrassed, huh? Don't sweat it. We'll look after you. Marshall Field of Dysprosium. Hell. Had it been only two Earth weeks ago? Then his army had marched out, banners flying, horns and trumpets blaring, drums thudding. A sight to stir the blood and induce martial ardor in all who saw it. A huge army, sixty legions strong, four hundred thousand demons had sortied to defeat the humans. It was all supposed to have been so easy, so glorious. Trampling humanity underfoot, ravaging their cities, destroying their works and carrying their souls back in triumph to hell. And what was left now? How many of the 400,000 had made it back alive, or even half alive? 300? 400 at most, and the majority were wounded, some so badly they would be little more than helpless children. Neither the humans nor their weapons had mercy. Those who their weapons spared, they left crippled and feeble. The sounds were as appalling as the sight of the shattered fragment that was all that was left of his army. No martial music, no bombastic speeches either, just the wailing of the wounded and the bereaved. Abigor didn't know which was worse, the cries of the wounded or the howls of the females as they hunted through the survivors for their mates. Mostly those howls turned into screams of misery as they realized their mate was not on the tiny list of survivors. On rare occasions, 
the scream of relief was moderated, diluted, by the grief when they saw the awful wounds the humans had inflicted. Rare indeed for a mate to find her demon whole and untouched, not one in tens of thousands. Abigor heard the sobbing at his feet. A cavalryman was sitting down cross-legged on the ground, the head of his beast in his lap. The cavalryman was badly wounded, his side laid open by fragments, but his beast was dying. The fire in its angry red eyes was slowly dimming and the cause was obvious. The wound in its side was massive, blasted open and burned deep. A seeker lance had caused that, Abigor knew from seeing too many. Sire, he wouldn't stop. I tried to make him stop and rest, but he wouldn't. He just kept going, carrying me back here. I did try to make him rest, but he wouldn't, and now he's dying. In this case, the beast had shown better tactical common sense than its rider, Abigor reflected. If they had stopped, they'd have been caught and killed by the iron chariots. But it was true. The beast had saved its rider's life. What is your name, rider? Vishara Koromal, sire, of the right wing. Vishara Koromal, take your mate and go home. Go to somewhere quiet and remote where none who might seek would look and make your home there. On the ground, the light in the beast's eyes flickered and went out. It was dead. Do not let his sacrifice be in vain. Take your mate and go home. When hundreds of thousands are dead, one more will not be noted. Vishara Koromal nodded and gently laid the beast's head down, then took his mate and quietly left. Abigor looked around catching another three figures coming through the hellmouth. Two demons carrying a third whose legs had been blown off, probably by one of the mage bars the humans had scattered. That was new also, the sight of demons helping their wounded. They must have learned it from the humans. At hit, Abigor had seen how many humans would risk their lives to rescue one of their own who was in trouble. He'd seen the great iron chariots go places and do unimaginable, terrible things to help one of their own. It was strange. Exposure to the humans was changing the demons in ways other than the nightmare of the humans' crushing superiority and weaponry. Sire. Abigor turned. Behind him was a figure, not as great as he, but still larger than the pitiful remnants of his army. A lesser herald, but one whose wings were stunted and malformed. Sire, I am Memnon, lesser herald. I have a message for his infernal majesty. May I accompany you to audience with him? An audience with Satan? Abigor shuddered. To relay the tale of this catastrophe was certain death. You realize my company might bring you death? Who is your message from? From Yahweh. And death, I think, is the least of our problems. That was true, Abigor thought. It might be good to have company on this final walk. He found himself urgently wishing he'd died on the run to the Hellmouth just a few hours ago. Six hours earlier. Hellmouth, western Iraq. Abigor crouched in the hollow. The hellmouth was clearly visible on the horizon, the impossible geometry glimmering black against the dark blue velvet of the pre-dawn sky. For the umpteenth time that night, he hadn't slept. The quiet desert sounds kept startling him from any pretense of restfulness. He began to mull over the defeat and stopped himself. There was just no way of explaining how the humans had become so powerful. Sighing, he shook himself and peeked up. The huge portal was less than ten miles away. A straight run would get him there in less than an hour. He would cross through and... And then what? Report to Satan? Abigor frowned. If Satan had heard already, Abigor was as good as dead. No other duke would want to begin to associate with him. His position in the court was gone, taken now, probably by Belial or some other scheming coward. Could he stay with his former allies? The thought flitted through his mind then was easily dismissed as he began trudging through the soft sand toward his destination. The dukes who were former allies were just that, former. None of them would touch him with a thirty-foot pole now. Given the totality of his defeat, he suspected that nothing could save him. But what alternatives did he have? Stay here, where the human magic crushed everything in its path, and they sought out their defeated enemies to slaughter them like cattle? He had to get back to hell. He had to warn the others of the nightmare they faced. The sun peaked above the horizon behind him, and his shadow stretched far ahead of him. The cloudless sky was striated orange and pink, fading to purple in the western sky before him. For a moment, Abigor stopped and looked around him, at the last clear white stars fading in the west, at the beautiful dawn panorama unfolding in the east over the flat, unimaginably vast desert wastes. 
The ground here was as like a part of hell as any he'd seen, and yet above it stretched such beauty. The humans didn't know what they had, he thought. How could they appreciate such sublime beauty? And demons didn't know what they were missing either. With a twinge of sorrow, he contemplated again his ruined future back home under the dull, ceaseless striation of hell's skies. Suddenly, his ears perked, a small buzz in the distance. Could it be a human implement? He froze for an instant, and in that instant, he detected a now familiar deeper rumble. Horseless iron chariots. He broke into a flat-out sprint for the portal. Headquarters. Multinational Force Iraq. Green Zone Baghdad. Have we got the Global Hawk feed up? Asked General Petraeus. One of the technicians, Bert, replied, Yep, it should be on the main screen, right? There was a ticker of fingers on a keyboard and a mouse click. Now! The screen blinked, fuzzed, and there was the hell mouth, black against the pink-lit sand. The whole scene moved slowly as the cameras on the Global Hawk zoomed in on the portal. The entire Hellmouth surveillance mission had been on the back burner as the Global Hawks had been used to control the Allied forces that had annihilated the demonic army. That was over now. The Baldric army was shattered beyond comprehension or reconstitution. There were only handfuls of Baldrics free and alive between the Hellmouth and the Euphrates, and that had pushed intelligence gathering back to top priority. Nobody ever won a war by defending themselves. They won it by taking the fight to the enemy. It was time to begin striking back at hell, and that meant learning as much as possible about it, especially the terrain near the Hellmouth, which was, in the plans Petraeus and his colleagues were starting to draw up, the site of the first beachhead. For a moment, Petraeus wondered if this was how Eisenhower had felt in 1943, then stifled the thought. Eisenhower had known so much more about his enemy, and his enemy had known about him. The two situations were only comparable if you didn't think about it. Then, he noticed a small black figure far below the hawk, also making for the portal. What's that? He indicated the figure. Just a moment, sir. The feed on the screen jumped through the magnifications until the figure was clearly visible. A large baldric, running as fast as it could. Feed this through to the nearest armored unit with orders to intercept and... Wait, zoom in just a little bit more. Something about the figure had triggered his memory. The feed duly zoomed, and Petraeus recognized the baldric his counterpart, the lucky one he'd missed with the artillery during the main battle. Orders to intercept and capture. If this worked out, it would be a huge intelligence bonus. Hellmouth, Western Iraq. The roar of the Abrams engine almost deafening and the imperfections in the land bounced her around in her commander's seat, adding extra bruises to the impressive collection she had already collected. Captain Keisha Stevenson nodded as the crackling orders came through the radio and then repeated them on the company channel. Guys, we've got a target. Orders to capture. In the light of the Iraqi dawn, the Abrams tanks and Bradley vehicles under her command sped up and veered left, the Bradleys belching black smoke and kicking up sand that hovered in the air in their wake, slowly dispersing. Abigor ignored the pain in his side, pushing his legs as fast as they would go. The Hellmouth was growing larger, a black swirling void underneath the horizon. If the humans didn't notice him, he was only a few minutes away from home. He could almost taste the sulfurous air. But the roar of the iron chariots was louder dominating the sounds of early morning. He didn't let himself look over his shoulder, only gamely pushed faster. All he felt, his whole being, was now his feet pounding into the ground, his heart thumping in his chest, and the tingle of the magic in his back. He had long since abandoned his trident, all undercut by the gathering rumble of iron chariots. All too soon, they were close behind him, the cloud of dust they raised choking him. One pulled ahead of the rest and was almost beside him, its odd head turning so that the long tube was pointing at him. Abigor tried to run around it, failed. Then he switched, doubled back, and ran behind it, the hellmouth just a few yards away. His senses were overwhelmed by the cold and unyielding taste of the iron, not at all like the friendly warmth of the bronze or tin he was used to. As he dived behind the chariot, he could feel a blast of heat, uncomfortable even for his own thick skin. Even as he expected the deadly blast off human mage magic in his back, he continued to marvel at the human's ingenuity and ability to accomplish the seemingly impossible. Chariots without horses that generated their own heat, propulsion, and magic fire lances while carrying humans within them. Then, even as the muscles in his back cringed in anticipation of the expected blow, 
The blackness of the Hellmouth enveloped him. Alpha Actual. Sorry, sir, he got past us. No excuses, sir. He was so close to the Hellmouth, we only had one shot and we blew it. Want us to go in after him? There was a pause and Stevenson knew the message was going up the line and the response was coming down. Alpha Actual Command Prime was watching on I-5. Word is, don't blame yourself, that big Baldrick would make a great football player. Stay out of hell for now. Drop back one click and go hull down with a line of fire to the Hellmouth, the generals are thinking. And we all know that makes their heads hurt, Stevenson thought, and settled back as much as was possible in the turret of an Abrams. Biker, take us back one click to the ridge line we crossed. Time to have a rest. University of Alabama. Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And remember that problems 1, 3, and 4 of section 37 in the Munkras text are due next Tuesday. You may assume the Tychonoff theorem. We will finish proving it next class. Problem 5 is extra credit. Class dismissed. As the students in his Topology 1 class finished packing up their papers, Dr. Koronico turned to the board and began erasing the proof of a lemma for the Tychonoff theorem. A polite knocking at the door caught his attention, and he turned around adjusting his glasses and absent-mindedly smearing chalk dust across his cheek and nose. Yes? To his surprise, it was not a student wanting help with the homework questions. It was three men dressed in military uniforms. Dr. Koronico? That's me, yes. How may I help you? I'm General Shatton of the U.S. Army's Demon Section. I understand you are the foremost mathematical expert in... He wrinkled his nose, fished in his pocket, and pulled out a piece of paper. In higher dimensional topology. Dr. Koronico shrugged. Some people say that I am, yes. Well, we have a team of physicists working on a project for us, and they recommended you as the mathematical expert we need. We've already talked to the math department here. They're more than willing to help with the war effort, so they've granted you indefinite paid sabbatical. We will, of course, be more than willing to provide you with additional compensation for your services. As well, your landlord has agreed to let us pay your rent while you live in Arlington and work for us, again indefinitely. The mathematician blinked. So I'm working for you on what sort of project? Dr. Koronico, we have a problem. We've managed to open a portal to hell and we can communicate with those inside on an individual basis. We need to communicate with everybody in there, Baldrick's, humans, everybody. We know it can be done because they did it to us. There was the message and then that bombastic nonsense from Satan. We need you to work out the mathematics that underlies the situation. We need you to analyze the basis of how this communications phenomena works. The only way to understand something is to understand the maths behind it. At the moment we're doing it on a purely empirical basis, we need you to make sense of it. Once you've done that, we can start to use it properly. Kuroneko's eyes lit up. Secretly, although he was too polite to say so, he was amazed that an army general would understand the importance of basic theory. It never occurred to him that generals dealt with basic theory and applied mathematics as a routine part of their job. That sounds fascinating. When do I start? General Shatton smiled. Yesterday, if possible. Today at the latest. We're already loading your possessions into the moving van for you. He stepped forward and shook Dr. Koronico's hand. Welcome to Demon, Doctor. Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina. Man, what do we want with a piston engine bird that's 50 years old? The F-16 pilot leaned back on the O-Club bar, not noticing the slight air of reproof that went around the room. The two old B-29s sitting on the flight line might be relics of a bygone age, but their crews were guests of the mess, and the comment was out of place. We don't know that jets can fly in hell yet. In fact, we know nothing about the place at all other than it's pretty unpleasant. We know that there's a high content of particulates in the atmosphere, sulfur and pumice. The predator that went in came back pretty messed up, so prop birds give us another option. Also. We need every modern bird we can get up in the air. Every second or third line job that gets done by a museum piece is one more modern bird freed up for combat. That's why we've got C-47s back in the inventory as well. The scientist drank his beer reflectively. The tour around the museums hadn't picked up that many usable aircraft. There was a big difference between a plane that looked good on display and one that was able to be returned to flying status, but they had a few. By a quirk of history, the B-29s had done better than most, and even then only a handful were available for service. The non-flying birds and the aircraft, too old to be of even fourth or fifth line use, had their own role to play, though. They were in the hell jars being experimented on. Yeah, but prop engine bombers? 
The F-16 pilot spoke with scorn and didn't notice the frown of displeasure from his commander. I know, I know. Colonel Tibbetts put down his beer. He'd kept quiet to date, partly because he didn't want to rise to the bait, and partly because he had his own position in mind. He suspected somebody in Air Force personnel had a sense of humor and had searched through the Air Force list to find a Colonel Tibbetts to command the newly reformed 40th Bombardment Wing. We're really going to need you guys and the fighters to protect us, like we always have, I guess. Why don't we buy you a drink or three, show our appreciation. Next morning, Lieutenant Barham woke up in his quarters with a head that felt ready to explode. The party that had started in the O Club had then moved to the strip outside the base and turned into a real bar crawl. He didn't remember too much after the fourth or fifth bar, but his head was dreadful. Those bomber boys certainly knew how to party. He glanced at the flight line. Both the B-29s had gone, probably on their way to whatever experimental station they would be assigned to. At that point, Barham realized that it wasn't just his head that was hurting. His rear end was also feeling, inflamed. With a dawning sense of horror, he went to the washroom and looked in the mirror, and what he saw there confirmed his worst fears. On one buttock was tattooed the unit crest of the 40th Bombardment Wing and the motto, Old Age and Treachery Beats Youth and Skill. The other buttock had a plain view of a B-29 and the motto, Four Screws Beats a Blowjob tattooed on it. Barham was still dumbly contemplating the sight when the phone rang. The squadron commander wishes to speak with you, now, was the message. On the shore of the Styx River, Fifth Ring, Hell, Another demon had died, his head grotesquely shattered by the human weapons. Rahab recognized the signs by this time, the physical destruction that had been wrought from a distance that gave the victim no chance of surviving, not even warning that it was under attack. She wasn't quite certain how many had died to date, might have been twelve or more. She did know the number included some of the demons that had once ridden so imperiously on their beasts. The humans had proved her wrong, they could be killed. In fact, the humans had killed them quite easily. There was much to think on there. There was something else to consider as well. In her travels, trying to find the six new arrivals who were causing this mayhem, she had watched the demons and learned something else. They were scared. Too many of their number had gone out on patrol and never returned. Now they were beginning to skimp those patrols, to head through the area as fast as they could, not stopping for anything until they got back to the safety of the walls. Rahab found herself asking, just how safe were those walls? She had seen what was left of the mighty bridge over the sticks, a mass of destroyed masonry flung around the way an angry child might scatter playbricks. A bridge that had stood for untold millennia had been wantonly destroyed, with, it was rumored, the best part of a whole legion that had been unfortunate enough to be standing on it. There were work gangs trying to repair it, some of them humans driven by demon overseers, but the destruction had been so great it was defeating their efforts. She had watched while some of the repairs collapsed again, the foundations undermined by the power of the destruction. There had been other attacks as well, on the great road that led from the depths of hell up to the city of Dis, and from there out to the field of Dysprosium. Rahab had never been outside the great pit of hell, but she had heard the area outside Dis where the demons lived was quite pleasant by their standards. Getting there would be a problem for the demons now, though. That road had been the scene of one attack after another, the dead mounting as explosions tore into formation after formation. Rahab shook her head. It made little sense, but she sensed the demons were losing the fight down here. They were trying to protect themselves against ghosts who would strike and slip away before they could be found. The new arrivals didn't fight the demon way, for pride and honor. Rahab realized they fought for other reasons entirely. They fought to win and woe to anybody who got in their way. Rahab felt the slam in her back that threw her to the ground and knew the agony of fear. Had she been caught after all this time? A figure was holding her down, her arms twisted behind her back and she guessed what was to come next. An agonizing rape certainly, then returned to the hell pit from which she had so barely escaped once before. Her time of freedom was at an end, there was no point in fighting, and she went limp as she was rolled onto her back. It was a kind of demon she hadn't seen before one with huge, staring, lidless eyes, and a face below them that was featureless. It was red-brown, a varied skin coloration that merged in with the background. Then, as her senses overcame the blind panic, she realized something else. This creature wasn't a demon. It was human. More than that, it was a living human, 
one from outside hell. A living human that had voluntarily come to hell? It was rumored there had been others, but this was solid fact. Hello, Rahab. I see you've met Lieutenant Meduse. Sorry about the abruptness of the meeting. Rahab looked up. It was the woman she had met before, the one who had abandoned the hiding place with her friends. Now she was different. She was wearing the same red-brown clothes as the Still Alive had on. Rahab looked harder. She was also wearing a harness with strange green slabs on it, and she had a black stick in her hands, an oddly indescribably shaped stick. Who are you? Rahab needed to know. I'm Lieutenant Jade Kim, call sign Broomstick. These are the rest of my unit. That'll do for now. You might have noticed we have started a war down here. It's going to get a lot worse. That's part of the reason why we found you. Found me? How? It wasn't hard. I guess the only reason why the Baldricks haven't found you is that they couldn't be bothered with you, and there weren't enough of you to make any difference. So they didn't even try. That's changing. We've hurt them bad, and they're going to start fighting back. You need to warn your people and get them out of here. We don't have the numbers yet to protect a static population. Yet. Rahab was bewildered. None of what she was being told made sense. That's our first question. You wander all over the place. Have you seen any more like us arriving? If so, tell us where they are. Do you know how many people arrive here all the time? And this is a small part of hell, a segment of one circle, a small segment owned by a minor duke. A few more have arrived here recently. I can show you where. But what if they are not the ones you want? That's the second thing. First part. We busted a guy out from one of the other rings, tried to take him back to Earth, but it didn't work out. He started dying as soon as he arrived. So, he was brought back here. He's not a soldier, no use to us. We want you to take him in, hide him. Second part, same with any others that we bust out. If they're of no use to us, we want you to hide them along with the rest of your people. So you made a mistake, and now you want me to put it right for you. Rahab had the conceit and viciousness back in her voice. Why should I help you? Because we're all human. Because hell isn't going to last very long. Our people are coming for us. And Satan and all his foul legions won't stop them. The more chaos we stir up down here, the less resistance he can put up back there. And the sooner we will win. Because we are, believe it or not, on the same side. Or we better be. Medusa's voice was muffled by the scarf over his nose and mouth. The first few hours down here had been horribly uncomfortable for him, and his chest still felt raw and heavy from the atmosphere. The scarf and goggles had helped a lot, just as they had in the sandstorms of Iraq. Just an idle question, Rahab. What happens when people down here die? Rahab felt her stomach drop slightly at the veiled threat. The demons believe that we generate some sort of force that helps lift them to their afterlife. Humans? Well, I suppose we just vanish. Kim nodded. Not a good deal, is it? We can offer you a better one. Out of this pit, movement elsewhere in hell, whatever elsewhere is, and a life. We're on the same side. Just let's act like it, huh? Rahab thought it over. They were right. Things were changing, and like it or not, there was a war starting in hell. Very well. I'll take in your person. And any more you bust out. Just don't overload me with numbers and give me time to get them away before your war turns into a bloodbath. Turns into more of a bloodbath. Done. Kim turned around. Bubbles, get Richard out of hiding. Tell him he's got a new girlfriend. Throne Room, Palace of Satan, Infernal City of Dis, Hell. Satan relished the atmosphere of absolute terror that was building up in his great throne room. The word was spreading across the halls and circles of hell, through the streets of Dis itself, down the great pit that it surrounded, and into the garrisons that held the walls separating the rings of hell. Abigor had failed. Abigor had been defeated, his army massacred. He had been defeated by the humans, his army driven back inside the gates of hell. He had been ordered to crush the humans, and he had failed. It had amused Satan to dream up some really inventive punishments for one who had defeated him so badly, but there were more important things than petty revenge. He had to find out how this unimaginable thing had occurred. Was Abigor treacherous or just plain stupid? The audience stirred and shrank back as Abigor entered, a lesser herald trailing in his wake. In a way, it was almost amusing, the desire for the other demons to get out of the possible line of fire. Abigor walked down the hall, conscious of the eyes on him as he approached the great throne where Satan sat, watching him. He reached the foot of the throne and threw himself at Satan's feet. So, Abigor, 
You have come to tell us of your great victory and regale us with stories of the sufferings you have inflicted on the humans. Satan's voice was the silky smoothness that portrayed real trouble, and Abigor knew it. Infernal Majesty, I fear. Good. Abigor felt a flash of irritation at the interruption. I fear that I have grim and terrible news. My army was defeated, destroyed by the humans. Something has happened on their world, something that is terrible beyond belief. They have magic that is so powerful we could not stand against it. They can breathe on whole sections of an army and leave nothing but mangled flesh. They have lances and arrows that never miss their target, that follow the one they aim at no matter how much they run. Run? So you admit your army ran? After all but one in a thousand had died, yes, sire, we ran. All those who did not died. Most of those who tried to escape the humans died. The humans have iron chariots. A thrill of horror went around the room. Iron chariots had caused them problems once before, problems that had required a succubus, a peasant girl, and a tent peg to sort out. Now they were back in a new and more terrible form? The thought of iron chariots sent screaming rage flooding through Satan's mind, but he kept himself under strict control. There was so much he needed to know. Tell me all, Abigor, from the start. Sprawled on the floor, Abigor started to relate the history of his devastated army. How it had marched out of hell and across the desert to its first objectives. The strange attacks on the way, the flying chariots that had killed some of his commanders, the mysterious explosions that had wiped out whole command groups. Then, the enemy defense line, the fire lances, the exploding ground, the snakes of iron that tore his troops apart. The way the humans had breathed death, how they never came close to their enemy but killed from distances. How they had slaughtered Abigor's army, then chased it back across the desert, killing remorselessly as they did so. By the time he finished, the room was silent, and the demon dukes were looking at each other with profound unease. So now we know the reason for the destruction of your army, Abigor. Satan's voice oozed charm, then suddenly turned to a berserk scream. It was cowardice. Unmitigated cowardice. You claim that your army pressed home its attacks bravely, yet you are here alive to give the lie to that statement. Your soldiers were cowards who would not charge the enemy, but ran away, and you were at their head. You led the disaster, you led their failure. Your cowardice was the cause of your army's destruction. Here it comes, Abigor thought. A hideous death. But I am merciful. The oily cooing was back in Satan's voice. I will give you a chance to redeem yourself. Majesty, I thank you, but there is something we must do first. We must close that portal before it can be used against us. We would if we could. The words were not spoken but formed in Abigor's mind. It wasn't Satan speaking, but he didn't know who it was. Our mages have been trying with all the energy they can command. It is no use. We cannot close it. It may decay on its own in time, but we cannot close it. It is as much a fixture now as the very walls of Dis itself. That is not your concern, coward. Satan turned to Memnon. Tell me your story, Herald. Let us hear how you ran from the humans and betrayed our kind. Memnon stared at the leering, sneering figure on the throne. Satan had no idea. What he was hearing simply wasn't registering. He began to speak, the experiences of the last month pouring from him. Outside the portal to hell, western Iraq. Running. It was all he could think of doing. Legs pistoning like a great machine, his hooves kicked up sand and grit into thick clouds with each giant stride. His breath came hard and fast. Foam flecked at the corners of his mouth and his eyes were narrowed into slits as he pushed his body to its limits and beyond in a frightful dash towards home. His mind was racing along with his body. The memories of his recent sojourn here on this dreadful plane burned through his fear and panic. He had watched his wingmates annihilated by sky chariots. They never stood a chance and all their infernal might was no match for human magic. He did not have time to taste the shame that shot through him. It was not the time or the place to wallow in his misery. He needed to survive. He needed to get home. He needed to repeat the words. Uriel. Damn the nameless one. To unleash Uriel on this world in all his awesome wonder and glory was almost too much to bear. After all, who was he but a humble servant, a warrior for his duke? And now to be a messenger, a go-between for the angelics made him want to spill his guts into these desert wastes and scream with impotent horror into the night. But there was no time for that. There was only time to run and not think about the sounds around him. 
the cracks in the air that indicated some human was pointing his plastic lance and firing bolts of fire nearby, perhaps even at him as he rumbled by like a runaway freight train. Were his wings healed, he would be flying so hard so fast that the very sinews of his shoulder blades and joints would tear away. There were the more ominous cracks of artificial thunder as human sky chariots blasted their way overhead. Sometimes it was followed by the deep bass rumble of human fire magic as it burst over a concentration of Neverborn and spread them over the wastes like fertilizer. He had seen one such strike up close as he ran. One of the cavalry servitors tending to his dying mount looked up at him as he raced by. Several foot soldiers were standing by the noble one waiting for instructions. One must submit his will and being to a demon of higher order. It was the way of things. It was the natural order. The cavalry servitor demanded he halt and give a chant of greeting and submission. Memnon had actually considered for the briefest moment to do as he was told. Every fiber of his being seemed to tense as it prepared to submit as was custom and tradition. The artificial thunder rumbled directly overhead, and he remembered the death, the firebolts, the arrows of doom that could pluck them from the sky as easily as a hawk picked off a field mouse for supper. And he responded in a manner that still haunted him. Run, you fool! He spat, and his hooves did not falter, did not pause. He simply continued running, hot sweat hissing as it touched whatever it fell upon like an obscene rain. The cavalry servitor was stunned. Eyes bulged and tusks snapped loudly in anger and confusion. In the name of Abigor, you will submit to me now, or... Then there was the brief sound like parchment tearing or the clothes of some helpless human wench being rent by lecherous claws. And then the cavalry servitor, his mount and several of the closest foot troops exploded into a thick cloud of blood and bone. They were gone in a moment, as if they had never been there. Several of the surviving foot soldiers were crawling away screaming in agony as they left liquefied or shattered limbs behind. He looked up long enough to see a sky chariot with its wings whirling over its head roar past in a low trajectory, like a bird of prey surveying the carnage of its passing. Or, what, you fool? Everything has changed. Our world has been torn asunder. Memnon spat to himself in sheer disgust. He paused only long enough to make sure the chariot did not come around for another attack run, but the combination of the billowing clouds swept up by the chariot's passing and his own panicked running had obscured him from its sight. And unlike the other higher-flying iron and plastic chariots, this one seemed to lack the keen senses of its brethren, and that saved the wayward servant of the Morning Star. His body started to seize up and muscles cramped as he took those moments to slow down. He had pushed himself beyond all endurance and his body was now reacting to his fevered pace. At any moment he would collapse in an exhausted heap and sleep through the hazy pain to awaken refreshed. However, one glance back at the bloody crater where before several of his kith and kin had stood fired him up and he raised one arm to his mouth and he bit deeply into the bicep. Flesh was rent from his bone and blood gushed into his nostrils. He snorted in pain and pleasure, and that small spark of pain he was so keen on inflicting upon the useless wretches of humanity kindled a small surge in power pushed by will and fear, and the never-born exploded back into his breakneck pace. And so he ran and ran. He ran past the sight of his grand army shattered into bloody remnants and screaming broken brethren who were begging for release for a return to the fiery bloody skies of home and cursing humanity in whatever tongue they deemed fit. He ran through a charnel house of guts and sinews, hooves cracked exposed bone and ribs. He ran even as the air burned within his lungs like a furnace. He ran as he heard more thunderclaps and whistling booms. He ran until he could run no more and collapsed in heap, blood spewing from his ruined bicep, frothy saliva spilling from his mouth and foam flecking along his heaving flanks. There was no more left. No more to give and not even enough energy to take. Memnon was spent to the last dregs of his reserves, and he looked up to the sky to scream his defiance and await the human magic that was sure to rend him limb from limb. But then he noticed he was right at the lip of the portal to hell. Could it be? Was it not a failure? Had he pushed himself enough? Before him in a pathetic display a great beast dragged itself towards the yawning doorway home. Both hind legs reduced to splintered messes of dying meat and trailing entrails. Still it tried to get itself home. A leg from its rider was still firmly in the stirrup, the rest of its charge probably scattered along the wastes. 
Memnon growled and fell upon the beast in a scream of desperation and anger at the predicament he found himself in, reduced to feeding off one of the great beasts to survive. He let his anger and frustration out on the wretched beast as it bleated in its death throes, while teeth and claw rent muscle and sinew from bone. Memnon fed deeply and voraciously as his anger, despair, and shame burned in his belly worse than the rancid meat being guzzled in with such relish. He wanted to feed away the pain, the anguish of the defeat, the shame of running from prey, the despair of knowing that their magic had failed so completely and utterly, and the gnawing fear that Nameless One was moving behind the scenes, that Uriel would trod this world completely unleashed. What victory was there in that? It was whispered from the Elder Days that Uriel's power was so grand that his death touch obliterated not only human life, but also the human soul. His power, one of the greatest of all angels save perhaps for Michael the Great General, was the ultimate weapon because it robbed everyone, including the nameless of the prize of human essence. When the firstborn of Kemet were swept aside, their souls did not go screaming into hell or the etheric realms. They simply ceased to be. Oblivion. The very concept chilled the demon to its core. Nothing. Just the great darkness and void. At least in hell these pathetic humans drew solace from the fact that they still existed. Despite the pain and anguish, they still mattered. But Uriel robbed everyone of that solace. He was the nameless one's weapon of last resort, the great scythe that robbed all sides of the prize. Or so it was rumored by those higher than he otherwise why the dread at his coming, why the reticence of the nameless to unleash him. His thoughts paused in a moment of revelation. Standing at the hellmouth was a lord, the Duke Abigor. In that instant he felt something alien, something alarming yet exhilarating as he watched his duke move among the shattered remnants. He was still tall and proud, yet there was no longer that cold arrogance to his gait, the sneering pride on his features, the snarl of command on his lips or the lash of rebuke in his eyes. Haunted. He looked haunted and humbled, yet he was proud now, not a pride born of dukedom granted to him in the mists of ancient history, but pride in personal knowledge that he had faced the human magic and lived. Pride in that he was still here. He was a duke of hell, yes, but now he was a survivor. Memnon watched him speak gently to one of the survivors, and he heard a brief whisper in his ear. Follow him. Follow him till the end of your story. Memnon nodded numbly and rose, wiping the gore and gristle from his snout. He strode up to the lord and spoke. My lord. When Abigor turned to regard him, Memnon knew he had found his leader. Throne room, palace of Satan, infernal city of Dis, hell. There was once again silence in the great throne room. And what was Yahweh's message? Satan's voice was loaded with contempt. He said this. The one above all has spoken, yet he sees vile, repugnant defiance from humanity. The great chorus must not be disturbed. The chanting must not cease. Your ilk were given this world, and we see nothing but abhorrent failure. We do not want to take a more active role. Uriel awaits on the ether like a sword of Damocles. Last he moved upon man, the land of Kemet wept bitter tears. Do not force our hand. Cow them. Stop the defiance. Should they find a way to disrupt the chorus, we will end this charade once and for all. That and that alone, Majesty. The silence in the room deepened. This was unheard of. The Great Ones never interfered with the domains of others. When they did, it meant a war. There had been one between Satan and Yahweh already, and nobody wanted that experience repeated. Still, Yahweh never interfered in the work of hell, just as Satan never did so with heaven, or anywhere else for that matter. Despite those ill-chosen words, crushing the humans is a necessity. All our armies are being brought to full strength of 81 legions. That was almost 550,000 demons in each. Asmodeus, Beelzebub, and Dagon will command three such armies, including their own, for our renewed assault on Earth. A gasp went around the room. That meant Satan was committing 729 legions out of the professional army force of 999 legions, 939 now that Abigor's army had been destroyed. They would only have 210 legions left in Hell to train the reservists and conscripts, that made up the rest of Hell's nominal force of 6,666 legions. Almost five million demons would be turned loose on Earth. There had never been a military exercise like this, not even in the war with Yahweh.
Sire, I beg you. Abigor's voice was urgent, his mind filled with the picture of what must surely come. The portal is a death trap even for such a force. There is a ridge that dominates it and humans fight from behind ridges. By now they will have every chariot, every fire lance, every seeker lance they have aimed at that portal. As our demons funnel through it, they will be destroyed. The death will continue until the portal is blocked by our dead. I know. Satan's voice was still calm and oily. That is why you will take your army and seize that ridge line. My army has been destroyed. Barely three hundred are left in condition to fight. Then, make up the numbers with your mates and your kidlings, the youngest and the oldest. If they can carry a trident, they go. If they cannot, they can go anyway and fight with bare hands. You will leave none of your clan behind. If they can crawl to that ridge, they will go. Abigor shook at the sentence. It meant death for him and all of his line, that was clear. He rose to his feet, nodded, and left. And now, Harold, what shall I do with you? Majesty, I would join Abigor and go with him. So be it. Memnon turned and left, following Abigor from the throne room. Asmodeus, Beelzebub, and Dagon, you have many reservists in your ranks. Train them properly before launching your assault. There is no hurry. Asmodeus frowned. But sire, what about Abigor? Abigor, who? 